Hello, dampers. It's, uh, as I, as I like to say, time for another one of these. It's time for another one of these. <sighs> okay. So, in this episode of the Slice of Life podcast, my aim is to finish off some of the stuff I've started. So, by the end of this podcast, I hope to have completed, um, all of the Strike Witches, World Witches, um, series that I haven't finished yet, that I started in the last episode, and I hope to have completed Senden Bunker, and also hopefully Neon White, um, although I'm not sure if I'll finish that game, uh, <clears throat> right now I'm in a bit of a predicament, a bit of a predicament, and the predicament is, my, my ISP, my internet service provider, you know, the the they're making me want to call them very bad words, okay? These these absolute fuckers are bastards. They're bastards in hell. They're bastards in hell, and they're fuckers, and they're bastards. They're, 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 they're cutting off internet all the time. They didn't even tell me. I've had internet problems for, like, months now. There's been There's been issues where, particularly during the night... The internet will just shut off for hours. And I'm sure for most people this isn't a problem because most people aren't awake all night. But I stay up all night. And so I'm awake the whole time that the fucking... There's no internet. Now normally, it's just... It's not too bad. I mean, it's bad. It shouldn't happen. It's unacceptable service. But normally, it's like maybe 30 minutes like it it's very very annoying cuz i'm you know especially if i'm playing tf2 i'm in the middle of a game and then the fucking internet cuts out as happened today it's like oh i'm just set, setting up on on point as soldier just trying to set up on point just trying to upgrade this fucking teleporter and then the internet dies it makes me want to kill myself uh but um <clears throat> anyway so today it's been just partic- okay, right. So to to tell the longer story, I was ninety nine percent sure that this is a problem on their end because it goes down at the same time roughly every day. It's always at night time. It always starts around midnight and then normally stops at around half past midnight to one a.m. So it's like okay, and then oftentimes it starts. There's like a little bit of a hiccup at like four or five a.m. as well, and then it comes back. But today, it went out. It went out at like midnight, then came back. About 15 minutes later, which is like typical. And I was like, okay, good. And then at like 2 a.m., 3 a.m., it cut out again. And it hasn't been back since. The internet, just, just none of it. There's just no internet coming to my house. And uh, this is especially a problem because due to having these internet problems, I've been using more data than usual on my phone because it's the only way to access the internet when I don't have Wi-Fi. And I've run out of data on my phone. So I have no more data on my phone. I don't know how. I don't know how I'm on a, 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 a package with such little data. But apparently I am. So I've, I have no fucking data on my phone. And no Wi-Fi. And I'm stuck here for like hours and hours. It's not even like I can really do anything. Because it's like 6 in the morning. Nothing's open. There's nothing interesting. It's not like I can go somewhere and do something interesting. <laughs> not that I would do that anyway. I considered it. I've considered. I'm considering it right now. Um, but anyway. Uh, so so I got no data on my phone and I got no Wi-Fi and it's been like this for hours now, to the point where I and I've got nothing else to do. The only games I have downloaded, I mean I have a few games downloaded. The only one I'm actually interested in playing right now, is Neon White. But for some God knows why reason, Neon White, if you boot boot it up without internet connection, like, lags like crazy, like, gets like 15 FPS. If I boot it up with an internet connection, even if the internet then goes off after I've booted the game up, it doesn't lag. I get 200 FPS. But if I, I don't know why this, ha- it's, every time I start up Neon White on Steam, it has, it says downloading update, and it's like a tiny update, like 15 megabytes or something, like a really tiny update. And I imagine this is like some, 
verification DRM bullshit that's happening or, or something like that. I don't know what it is. But every time I start up Neon White, it, it always says downloading update and it's a tiny update. And then even if the internet goes off while I'm playing, it's fine. As long as it can da do that little tiny download at the beginning, it, it runs fine. But if it doesn't have internet at all when you're booting it, no matter what I do, it boots up and runs at like 15 FPS, unplayable, with like shitloads of uh, mouse lag, input lag. So it's like, yeah, it's really bad. It's not, I, I tried to play it like that, it's just too bad. It's it's unplayable. So I can't even play any on white. The only thing I have to do is to read Senmen Banker. It's the only thing I have downloaded that I am have any interest in playing. I mean, everything else I've either already beat or it requires an internet connection. Like, I mean, I even got so bored that I loaded up TF2 and I just... I had a random soldier rocket jumping map that I apparently downloaded at some point and tried to play as much as I could of that, but I really have absolutely no idea what I'm doing on like advanced rocket jumping stuff so I got through the first few little obstacles and then got stuck halfway through the map because it's like something advanced that I don't really know what you're supposed to do and then when you play it on a server there's a little hint button that shows you how you're supposed to do it but obviously it doesn't exist when you're playing offline so I even did that but mainly I've just been playing Send and Banker and this is good on the one hand because it's forced me to just sit down and play it without like having TF2 tabbing in and out the whole time. So I've just been sitting down and reading for like, what, fully five hours at this point. And I beat um, Mako's route. So I've played now Yoshino. I've played through Yoshino's and, what is it Yoshito? Yoshino. Yoshito. I don't even remember her name. The main girl and Mako. I've played through both of their routes now, and I will say, Mako's route is definitely the best, it's definitely better than the main girl's route, Yoshi, Yoshi, I think it's Yoshino, I should check, hold on, yeah, it's Yoshino, so, yeah, Mako's route, significantly better than Yoshino's route, Yoshino's route, pretty boring, to be honest, it was good at the start, and, to be honest, the some of the plot stuff, and some of the sort of second half of the Yoshino's route, I was kind of bored, just kind of, you know, trying to get to the end more so than enjoying it. Whereas Mako's route, I mean, the beginning section was much better, and then the sort of plot arc that happens in Mako's route is much better integrated with the romance. Um, so it feels like one cohesive story rather than, like, two separate stories like it did in Yoshino's route. And, uh... That's good. And also the romance is much better executed. Uh, like, I mean, she just as a character is more interesting. Yoshino kind of just has main heroine vibes in, in pretty much every way. Whereas Mako is a bit more of a nuanced character. Like, pretty unique, nuanced character. Her her problems in life, her, her, like, family history and her personal history are, like, pretty unique. Like, I can't think of anything that I've ever read that does exactly that. Like, there's some similar stuff, obviously, but nothing, like, exactly... I mean, it's pretty It's pretty good, I think. I was, it was pretty good. It got a little cheesy towards the end there. <laughs> and the uh, the H scenes uh, in... I mean, it's a Ubisoft VM. They all kind of have terrible H scenes. I mean, it's not terrible. The art is really good. It's just um, the dialogue. <laughs> the dialogue is uh, is a little bit bad. I mean, that's kind of visual novels in general. I don't read them for the age scenes, okay? They're just a little bonus that are sometimes good, but often I skip. Um, yeah, so the, the art's good, but I don't know about the dialogue during those scenes. It gets a little, little bit much. A little bit much. If you know, you know. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I guess now... I have I have a bit of a just a weird situation going on because it's like I need to find something to do to kill time until the internet comes back and I can just entertain myself with something else. Uh, I have a little bit of manga downloaded on my phone to read, but not that much. And honestly, what I really want is just a break from reading, which is why I'm recording this in the first place because I've just been doing nothing but reading for like hours and hours, and. It gets a little tiring, to be honest with you. Uh, yeah, I, I do not... I, I feel like that's reasonable, no? 
it gets a little tiring. I want to do something that isn't reading for, for a little bit. Um, oh, I do have this. Oh, wait, I've saved myself. I just remembered I have this Northern Lion video downloaded. I can watch. I have an hour. I have one hour of Northern Lion to watch to keep me entertained. Okay, I'll do that to take a break. And then I'll, if I still... Well, whatever happens, I'll end up going back, probably. And uh, and then I guess I'll... Uh, what am I saying? I'll, I'll play through the next route. But the... Oh, yeah! That was the whole point, is that I, I don't even... I can't go immediately onto the next route right now. Not just because I'm tired of reading and need a break, but also because... I can't look up a guide to see what options get you to the next route because I don't have fucking internet on anything. I have no internet on anything. My option is to literally go on my phone and buy more internet, which I already did. I already did. This is so fucked up. Is it yesterday? Yesterday I bought more internet. Yesterday I spent like three pounds something on 500 gigs more data because I ran out. And then today it was like, oh, you've run out of your extra data. There's, did I say 500 gigs? I meant 500 meg, megs, 500 megabytes extra data. And I'm like, hold on. There's absolutely no shot that I have used 500 megabytes of data since yesterday. How the fuck is that possible? So I don't know what my phone is doing. If it's like five guys, burgers and fries for phoning home. Right? Like, I don't understand what's going on with that, but yeah, my phone just used, I don't know what the fuck that was. So I have to buy even more data, and none of this gets reset, by the way. I still have, what, it's the fifth today, so I still have six days until the Wi-Fi is fixed, which they didn't even tell me about, right? So all of this problems at Virgin Media, which is my ISP, right, these fuckers... They didn't even mention that they were doing this stuff. I guess they were like, well, since it's nighttime, no one will be awake, so we don't have to tell our customers, which is bullshit, right? And then, so they didn't even mention it, to the point where I, the only way I found out was that eventually I was like, well, I called a guy over from Virgin to look at my router in case it was broken or something, and then he was like, oh, he texted me, he didn't even know. He fucking went home and then texted me, or he went back to the offices and then texted me with his personal phone number, I'm assuming, because uh, I don't know, maybe it was, a, I don't know how he did it, but he texted me and said like, oh, uh, by the way, yeah, they're doing works and they'll be finished on the 11th. That's how I found out. Like, surely it's the fucking company's job, sh like, shouldn't the ISP themselves, not just some random technician, be telling me this? Yeah, I feel like this is completely unacceptable. Like, this is absolutely bullshit. I need to... I really need to change ISPs, man. It's just absolutely ridiculous. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to call them up and I'm going to say, like, look, you either... I don't even know. Like, I, I guess what I'll say is I am completely not happy with the lack of service that you've been providing. Like, I stay up all night. That shouldn't be a crime. You, I pay you for internet. Either you give me a free upgrade to the next level of my plan or something, or I'm fucking dipping. That's what I'm going to say. I'm going to say either, f listen, give me some shit for free. I don't care what it is. Give me money off my bill. Give me some shit for free. Or I'm out. I'm dipping. I'm going. Because I'm guaranteeing you the other ISPs aren't like this. It can't be. I mean, maybe they are. But it can't be this. Like, this is bad, bad. So, I, I don't know. I feel like this is the only thing I can do. At this point. Is just threaten to leave. Like, I can just make some shit up about how I work from home. I work nights from home. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's affecting my my career. I mean, I could just I can definitely say it's like affecting my job, you know. I feel like that's fine because I can say like I I work online, like my job requires the internet. Even though it doesn't, I don't have a fucking job, but I I can say it. I my job requires the internet, like and I I prefer to be awake during the nighttime a lot of the time. So you guys are fucking me. 
at the very least, I shouldn't be, like, I don't know how much I'm paying for all of this time when the internet's not even fucking working. God, it makes me so pissed off. It makes me so mad, so absolutely mad. And I can't even look up what the Virgin Media helpline phone number is or whatever because I don't even have fucking internet. I guess I'm going to have to pay for extra data on my phone no matter what. Because I'm, I'm addicted to the internet. Of course I am. Unless, like, the only way that... I don't know, man. I don't fucking know. All I can hope is that up till now, it's it's only been a problem at night time. Most people who are, like, you know, most real people, they wake up at, like, what, seven something? It's almost seven something now. And at the very least, or the very most, most jobs are nine to five. And I feel like if they're fucking it up past 9 a.m., to the point where, like, isn't that going to affect maybe business customers and those are the people they care about? It's possible. So I highly doubt, I mean, I'm I'm hoping that it'll be back by 9. Like, that would be ridiculous if it wasn't. Anyhow, I guess I've got to go buy more data for my phone. And then look, fucking, I don't know what to do. Try and lodge, maybe I lodge a complaint. Maybe I lodge a complaint or something. I don't fucking know. I just need to do so. I'm tired of being helpless in this situation. I'm actually so tired of it. I'm, I'm, like, like everyone that I've ever talked to from Virgin Media has been super nice. I want to clarify this. If I ever call up their, their, like, like in the past when I've had to, to, to call them up and not had a robot, but like had a real call centre person there, perfectly nice. Every time I've had a technician come over, perfectly nice, right? But, man, these fucking, whoever, I don't know, man, whoever's, whoever's the, these technicians and shit, I don't, I don't know, man. Something's got to be done about this. I've got to do something about this. I'm tired of feeling like I, I'm fucking powerless in this situation. Can we talk about eggs? Big fan of eggs. Big egg man. Right? Big, big, big egg fan. Big egg man, big egg fan. Big egg man, big egg fan. Okay? Love eggs. Eat a lot of eggs. Don't eat too many eggs. Eat the right amount of eggs. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. That's what I do. I try, I eat the right amount, I eat the correct amount of eggs. Which is pretty much eggs every day. And, uh, my egg history... You know, when I first, uh, when I was a kid and I was making my own eggs for breakfast at first, I would make boiled eggs because that's what my parents made. And so I just continued to make boiled eggs. I got pretty good at boiled eggs. I mean, once you learn the timing for the brand of eggs that you buy for the rough size, you can't really fuck it up. Although I still manage to on some occasions. But I moved away from boiled eggs for a couple of reasons. The first reason I moved, and I, when I say moved away from it, you know, I what I used to do is have I'd for breakfast before school, I would have boiled eggs and toast. Uh, that would be my my breakfast. Once I switched away from cereal, so this is like relatively late in the time I was going to school. But not like super late, because uh, th- this is like before I got expelled from my first school, or from like middle school, but but right before, like near to before I got expelled, and on the weekends especially. On the weekends, I would have two boiled eggs and a cheese toasty. I would make because I had extra time to make a cheese toasty, and I would dip the cheese toasty in the eggs, and it was so good. Anyway. Uh, so that was my, yeah, by the time I got expelled, I was going to a different school and, uh, you know, then, then going to sick form. By the time I was in sick form, I just gave up on breakfast. I just, I was just skipping breakfast every day, uh, because I figured that I valued 
extra sleep more than I valued food at that time in my life, which, uh, I don't know if it was a good or bad idea, to be honest. Anyway, so boiled eggs was the first. The problem with boiled eggs is a couple of things. They're kind of a pain, right? Like, you have to peel the shell off, and that kind of takes a while. Uh, They're pretty easy to fuck up. Like, they're pretty unreliable. And on the scale of eggs, they take a relatively long time. Now, again, I like boiled eggs. There's no bad form of egg, right? I like I like them. It's got to be soft-boiled, obviously. I'm a soft-boiled kind of guy. In almost every situation. There are some situations where a hard-boiled egg is okay. But almost every situation, you're going to want soft-boiled, right? Obviously. Uh, so, you know, that's those are the two main problems with, hard-boiled, with, with soft-boiled eggs. Is it's a little too easy to fuck up. And it's kind of a pain to peel the shell off. Those are the main problems. Uh, so, eventually, my main egg of choice switched over to be scrambled eggs. Uh, now, I've had phases, right? I had a fried eggs phase, briefly. I had a fried eggs phase. Now, when it comes to fried eggs, although I've experimented with hot, basted olive oil fried eggs, I ended up settling on Jacques Pepin. If you How I managed to figure out how to get fried eggs perfect every time is there's a video on YouTube of Jacques Pepin doing fried eggs, and I basically just you know, beat for beat copied that, like, that's the best fried eggs that I can make, it's, it's, you kind of steam them to, to cook the top, which has always been my problem with fried eggs, is that you always get some raw white at the top, which I'm not, like, grossed out by raw white, I just don't think it tastes very good, like, the texture's kind of not what I'm looking for, it's not that it, like, grosses me out, it's just better if it's cooked, in my opinion, and so, the method where you fry it in butter, and then, put a little bit of water in, cover cover it to steam the top and cook those whites is the perfect fried egg method in my opinion. Uh, but, you know, I'm not <clears throat> a fried eggs every day kind of guy. M- my main secondary egg form is poached. In my opinion, poached eggs are probably, you know, the superior form of egg with a runny yolk. If you're talking boiled fried or poached, which are sort of the main three. All three are great. Um, by the way, the way that I eat boiled eggs with, with soldiers is, and what I think is the key, because I think what a lot of people might think it's kind of boring, what makes it good is, is, is Vegemite or Marmite on the toast, because it's salty as fuck and it seasons the egg when you dip it. So then... Even when you've dipped your soldiers and you have a little bit of egg left, the egg has like a little bit of marmite residue in it or Vegemite residue in it. And that is a really good combination because it's got the because egg needs salt. That's one of the things with boiled eggs, right? They're going to be unseasoned. Uh, so and it's kind of hard to season, right? Because if you season the top, you're just going to eat the top and then you just get all the seasoning in one bite and it, it, it kind of sucks, right? You can mix it up, but then you lose the, the contrasting textures. And also, that's an easy way to get everything to spill everywhere. So the key is to put Vegemite or Marmite on the toast with loads of butter as well. Uh, that seasons the egg as you eat it, because it's salty and umami and delicious. That's, the, that's, that's fucking where it's at. Anyway, that was a side sidetrack. Uh, but my personal preference is poached eggs. There's something about the texture that it, that is just unachievable. Like fried eggs, they're good, but they can be a little greasy. Uh, and the whites, I feel like in fried eggs, a little boring. For some reason, when they're poached, the whites just have a, a, a nicer texture to me. Uh, but none of those are my main egg. My main egg, as I imagine this for a lot of people, is scrambled. Because it's very fast, it's very easy, it's hard to fuck up too bad, and uh, you put it on toast, it's a great breakfast, right? Scrambled eggs. Nothing crazy. However, there are two main forms of scrambled eggs. 
you've got the soft French style scrambled eggs and the hot and fast diner style scrambled eggs. And, uh, you know, when I first started making scrambled eggs, uh, I didn't really know what I was doing, so I just sort of went somewhere in between those two styles. That was like, only lasted for a couple of scramble egg, right? Because I very quickly went on YouTube and found, you know, all of the YouTube people talking up these French Vavus scrambled eggs. And so for like a solid year, that's what I did. I made my scrambled eggs in a pot rather than a pan so that I could stir very vigorously and I cooked them super low and slow uh, for like, a, yeah, super low and slow to get these really, really small curds and very creamy. Now, <clears throat> on reflection, these were not particularly good French style scrambled eggs. And there were two reasons why I fucked it up. The first was, at this time, I hadn't figured out my cheese technique. When you're having scrambled eggs on toast, I think you need some cheese with it, right? You don't need it. You can have it with no cheese and it's okay. But uh, I think a little bit of sharp cheddar uh, really improves it. But at this point, I hadn't figured out the technique because what I was doing was I was grating the cheese directly into the eggs before I, I beat them so that the cheese was mixed in with the eggs and then cooking them. And while this is a valid technique sometimes, it fucks up the texture of the eggs, especially if you're doing French style. You, it's, it's, not, it's not, you know, I used to do this. I also used to put too much cheese in, which might not sound possible, but again, when you're mixing it with the eggs, too much cheese really fucks up the texture. So this is how I fucked up, right? I was mixing the cheese in with the eggs, and thinking that this was this would somehow work, and I didn't realize how much I was messing with the texture of the eggs. And they come out kind of, I don't know how to describe it, kind of spongy almost, kind of porous. It's it's hard to explain, but yeah. What you really want to do is you want to grate some cheese, you, you get your toast, you butter the toast, and then you grate a thin layer of cheese onto the toast, and then when you put the eggs on the toast, the eggs melt the cheese. That's the real plate, because then you maintain the texture. Uh, yeah, I didn't know that yet. I figured it out eventually. Uh, and I was still making, eventually when I did figure it out, I was still making these soft style French scrambled eggs. So that was the first error, which I corrected. The second error, I didn't correct until years later. And the second error, I didn't even know was an error while it was happening. I knew that like I'd had, you know, French style scrambled eggs at like a hotel before, like fancier hotels that I'd been to, and they, they tasted nicer than what I was making at home. But I didn't really think about it or think about why. Something about the texture was different. I have since realized what the difference is, which should have been obvious to me looking back. And the answer is, it's French food. Let me give you a tip right now. Let me give you a cooking tip. If you're making French food at home and something about it doesn't seem perfect or quite right, the answer, in 90% of cases, is you didn't put enough butter in it. Real French scrambled eggs are like 50-50 butter and egg. It's insane the amount of butter these people put in their eggs. And that's the key. I mean, when you do that, I'm not saying actually 50-50, but you want to put more butter in than you think you need. Because you're really creating like an emulsion uh, and it, it makes the texture, it improves the texture so much with all of the fat. I, it's not good for you, but it tastes good. You can go overboard with the butter and make it greasy, especially if, you're, if you cook it too fast because the, the emulsion will break in the butter, which is why it's important that you do that when you're, when you're doing quite a lot of butter. You want to be cooking it low and slow French style. Uh, and uh, spoiler alert, that's what I had today. Uh, I woke up and I was like, for some reason, I want creamy scrambled eggs. So I woke up and I did that and I put uh, slightly more butter than I would normally use. And damn, it was fucking delicious. Let me tell you, it was really good. Uh, yeah, that's the key. The key, is, the key is always more butter when it comes to French food. 
Uh, so that's that was my life for a while. That was my egg life for a while. It was was soft French scrambled eggs. I also over seasoned my eggs in this period. I put too much salt in them and didn't really realize I was putting too much salt in them. I only again something I figured out later. You actually need slightly less salt than you think you need for eggs. At least that's what I found. Uh, it, when it comes to scrambled eggs, slightly less salt than you think you need, and slightly more pepper than you think you need. That's that's been my experience. Uh, so then, I switched over to hot and fast scrambled eggs eventually. And the reason I did this was because one time, Lil Crazy Bitch was staying with me, and he doesn't like the scrambled eggs to be as undercooked as I like the the soft, creamy ones. You know, he wants them firmer, which is completely fine and understandable, right? He wants firm, firmer scrambled eggs. And so uh, when I made breakfast for us, I he told me this. And so I made hot and fast diner style scrambled eggs. Now, what you're looking for with hot and fast scrambled eggs is a very particular texture, which is large curds of egg. And what you want, ideally, which is something that's kind of uh, unique, is these curds should be firm on the outside. And then when you bite into them, there's they're still slightly gooey in the middle. Not like fully gooey, like French, but slightly gooier in the center than they are on the outside. And that way they kind of pop in your mouth a little bit. It's... It's kind of hard to describe without it sounding kind of gross because it's like egg, but it's not raw or anything, right? Like just a little bit of textural contrast with these large curds of egg. And the first time I made these, somehow I managed to get that like pretty much perfect. Like I kind of nailed the texture first time by accident. Um, and so when I had that, I was like, damn, this shit tastes good. And it's it, t- it cooks in like 30 seconds instead of five minutes. <laughs> why am I, Why don't I just make this? So then... I switched to hot and fast. And I did this, that, that was my main scrambled egg for, for basically up until now, uh, is that I've been a hot and fast guy. And I cook them fast, fast, right? Like I, I cook them on high heat. Uh, <clears throat> you gotta be careful not to burn the butter when you do this, but it's very possible. Uh, and you know what, to be honest with you, I think I lost something in the process because I was enjoying these diner style scrambled eggs for a long time. And I think eventually I got I got complacent. I got complacent and I just assumed, yeah, eggs should take like two seconds to cook. They should always be, you know, these... Uh, eventually got to the point where, you know, my eggs were questionably scrambled versus like some sort of omelette. Right, because I wouldn't even scramble them that much. I'd just kind of let them. They'd just kind of come out as one big mass rather than a scramble. And I, I got complacent with it. I didn't even consider that what I was doing was was problematic. Because I was like, well, they're eggs. They they bind together in one big mass. They they're very firm. Until today, when I woke up and I decided to make soft scrambled eggs for the first time in years. And I realized, holy shit, I've been fucking up my eggs this whole time. I haven't been fucking them up. It's just been a different type. I've been, un- I've been, I, I, I rebounded so hard from my soft scrambled to my hard scrambled that, that I didn't even consider that I, I, I'd missed out. You know, I, I overcorrected. What I'd done was I'd overcorrected. Now today I didn't make French style. I wouldn't say I went full full French on it, right? I didn't go full super low and slow French on it. I just went sort of normal, normal soft scramble. Uh, and honestly, best eggs I've had in a while. So I think that's the key. I think that's like what I want to be looking for from now on. Is this sort of uh, you know, that texture? Now there have been more details to my egg process. So, for example, I went through a po- for a, a period of about a year where I put hot sauce in my eggs, and uh, then I went through a period of about a year where I put smoked paprika in my eggs. Um, 
And more recently, I've been experimenting with a little pinch of garlic powder in, in my eggs, which is really good. I actually very much recommend it. You don't want to go overboard. It's subtlety is key here. Eggs have like a delicate flavor. So, but just like a pinch of garlic powder, it, it's really good. Um, also chives, you know, all of these French chefs, they put chives on their eggs. I never understood it. I was like, why would you put herb on egg? But then I tried it. I didn't realize what chives tasted like until I tried it. And damn, chives on eggs is a really good combination. There's a reason that they do that. Uh, yeah, try that out if you haven't. It'll level up your eggs. It feels like there's some sort of molecular reaction going on there. Because it tastes better than both chives. Like, there's some new flavor develops that isn't egg or chive. Like, when you combine them, <laughs> somehow some sort of chemical reaction is happening and releasing a brand new flavor that is, like delicious that's what i that's what i think i I'm, I'm just making talking out my ass i don't know if that's real but that's what it that's what it feels like because it doesn't like sometimes you combine two ingredients and you're like oh i wonder what this is going to taste like and it just tastes like the two ingredients right <laughs> i don't know if you've ever had this sometimes you're like what would happen if i put this in that and then you do it and it's just like oh it just tastes like that with this in it right but with chives and eggs, it doesn't just taste like eggs with chives in it. It tastes like something completely new. They blend together to create like something that is better than either of the ingredients. When I first discovered it, I kept saying it was like upgrading your eggs. It was like taking your eggs and just upgrading them. But I stopped doing it. I don't know why. I don't know why I stopped putting chives in my eggs. I should probably get back into that because it, it, it's good as shit. It's good shit. So the key to the best scrambled eggs is, firstly, at least how I want them right now as I'm talking to you. Because I just had these soft scrambled and I kind of want more. Because <laughs> these eggs are pretty small. Is The first step is to have good bread. right? When you're doing a soft scramble, you need toast. Oh, I also went through a, a short period, and this was a very short period, where uh, I was putting some a cornstarch slurry in my hot and fast scrambled eggs, because I'd seen that's what they do in Chinese cooking. They they mix in a, a cornstarch slurry. Um, and supposedly this prevents it from overcooking. I just found it kind of like made the texture a bit weird. I don't I don't super like it. Uh, it might be good if you... Oh, I've also experimented with cooking eggs in basically every fat you can imagine. Butter is the best. Like, there's no question. Um, lard is actually pretty good. Uh, but, yeah. If you... if you, <clears throat> I mean, yeah, you can try cooking cooking some scrambled eggs in lard. And, uh, yeah, it, it's actually pretty pretty good. Olive oil for scrambled eggs, it doesn't really work, in my opinion. Fried eggs, I'll do it, um, but not scrambled. I don't, I've tried it. I mean, I've done it quite a few times, like, especially when I run out of butter. And it works, like, it makes scrambled eggs, but they're not as good. They're not as creamy, and the texture's a little different. Um, yeah, I don't mind the olive oily taste. It's mainly the texture that changes. Uh, yeah, I... So here's, yeah, what you want, in my opinion, for a perfect scrambled eggs breakfast right now is you want white sourdough bread. Not what I had this morning, by the way. I had brown bread because of fiber. But for, for taste reasons, if you're going pure taste, I think you want white sourdough bread. Quite porous, right? Quite soft bread. So there's plenty of room for, for all of the, the butter and stuff to melt into it. Heavily butter that bread. Ideally, French butter, president butter, president butter, unsalted. Then some cheese, cheddar. Strong cheddar. You want to grate it over the bread in a thin layer. Use less than you think you need, right? Like slightly less. Thin layer of cheese. The reason for this is it's only, it won't taste good if it's not melted. And it only has the residual heat from the eggs to melt it, which is not that much. Sharp cheddar needs quite a lot of heat to melt. Um, so you really don't want to put that much because you, you want it to, to get melted by the eggs. So a thin layer of, of cheddar over the top. 
Um, and then if you really want to be crazy with it, which I don't do normally, but it is an option, you can get some ham and fry it. Fry up some ham. Tastes better fried for some reason in, in eggs. Yeah, get some ham and fry it, and then eat. But that's that's kind of a, a not like. The 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 ham with egg situation is kind of annoying to me. Because, uh, you can't put it on top. You can't put the eggs on top of the ham because then it doesn't melt the cheese, right? The ham acts as a heat barrier. But if you put that ham on top of the eggs, it becomes hard to eat. So I don't know where to put the ham in this scenario. It's very strange. So this is why I normally don't do it. The taste goes well together, but it kind of ruins the composition of the dish. So probably don't do that. Probably don't do ham. You just want sourdough bread, thin layer of cheese, also plenty of butter. Then you get your pan and then you low heat or medium heat or whatever. Plenty of butter in the pan till it's foaming. More butter than you think you need, right? Because we're talking good shit here. Again, unsalted president butter, so you don't over-season the eggs with salty butter. Two eggs in a bowl. Little pinch of salt. Lots of black pepper. Mix, mix, mix. When the butter's foaming, eggs in. Uh, then you want a, uh, what's it called? Silicon spatula. Stir non-stop. D stirring it non-stop. Then, before it looks like it's done, when it looks like it's almost done, that's when you take it off the heat and put it on the toast because the carryover heat will continue cooking it. So just before it looks ready, that's when you want to take it off the heat and put it on your, your toast. With the spatula, you can spread it out on the toast so that it covers the surface area because otherwise it'll just you know, be in splotches and it won't melt all the cheese, it won't cover edge to edge, so you want to sort of smear it a little bit over the toast. And that's it. Maybe if you really want to, an another extra crack of black pepper over the top. I'm a big black pepper fan. And that's it. That's your eggs. Now, you know what I've exp I've even tried MSG in eggs. Honestly, doesn't work. Really surprised me. I was like, MSG makes everything better, so surely it'll make eggs better. It doesn't work. MSG does not go well with eggs. Which surprised me. But yeah, that's that's the that's my egg story. Hi. I'm going to continue talking about visual novels. I read so much yesterday. I I did so much reading and it is very hard for me to keep reading. I really want to grind through Sendan Banker, but I don't know, man. I need a. I've been taking a break. I have no excuse. I should get back and read, but whatever. I'm com I'm here to complain. I'm here to complain about a visual novel, and it's a visual novel that I've complained about before on VNDB. Uh, where. Uh, I I got fucking roasted. <clears throat> I got roasted. By, by a bunch of other people on VMD, VNDB. Uh, how do I see this? Posts. There we go. Yeah. So, there's a visual novel, which is quite popular in the Slice of Life VN um, enjoyers. Right? It's one of the more well-liked Slice of Life visual novels and uh it's called Furedaba Friend to Lover Furedaba uh and I thought the common route was good uh I enjoyed the common route quite a lot you know what let me just read out my review that I wrote of it Furedaba feels like two completely different VNs hastily sewed together one is a genuinely funny, charming, and engaging slice of life about doing, as the title suggests, going from friend to lover. The other is a corny, boring, and bloated series of vignettes where you watch young couple do young couple things for a billion hours. 
Once you confess to a girl and actually start dating, all humour and charm goes out the window as the game deteriorates into an endless barrage of the most overplayed romantic beats, hackneyed jealousy plot points that go nowhere, unimaginative H scenes, and a whole lot of nothing. I love Slice of Life. When I say nothing, I mean nothing. Not comedy, drama, romance, anything. The MC throws his friends away like nothing as soon as he gets in a relationship. While I do think this makes sense as what his character might do, being so obsessed with getting a GF that once he does, his entire life revolves around her, it's completely uninteresting to actually play through. We don't do any more character building, no narrative arcs, literally nothing but the most stereotypical romance scenes you could think of. A relationship so perfect that it gives you absolutely nothing to latch on to. Clearly the writers realised this at some point, so they decided to force narrative tension in the most unimaginative ways possible. None of these moments have weight, because they are all instantly solved. In wanting the relationship to be perfect escapism, they cut out all the actual storytelling. When the characters state outright that they would never break up, there are no stakes at all, and therefore nothing to keep you interested in what's going to happen next. I know what's going to happen next. They're going to feed food to each other while saying on or rant for 10 minutes about how much they love each other. Maybe I'm just too cynical for this game, kind of game. If you want pure candy flavored escapism, then maybe this is for you. For me, it's a nothing burger, which is a shame because the common route and seduction period was all so well written and entertaining. You see, during that period, there's an actual narrative arc. The characters have goals and challenges to overcome. The plot eventually progresses. Even if you just want a girlfriend simulator, there are better options. Uh, so, yeah, that's pretty much my my opinion. The common route, really good. But once you actually get into the individual character routes, they just forgot to, like, give the characters chemistry. Like, one of the reasons that I liked Furarabha's common route a lot was because it was really funny. Like, genuinely made me laugh out loud on multiple occasions. Like, how can you go from writing a really funny plot and then just decide to drop all humour? It's it's joyless. Like, it's just... May as well just be the main character and the girl just saying, I love you, I love you too, I love you, I love you too, just over and over again. Like, that's pretty much all it is. Just in different ways. Like, the romance in Sen and Banka which I'm actually enjoying right now is quite different from that like you you most of the characters roots are about the process of falling for each other and it's all really well done like the characters all have genuine chemistry and you can understand it feels very natural the way they end up in a relationship you know and then once the relationship starts there's always something extra to it. It's not just them going around saying how much they love each other for 10,000 hours, right? Like, it's, there's either, there's some sort of plot aspect going on, or their their relationship's developing in some way. They grow closer to each other, and you actually see that in the way the dialogue's written, in the way they communicate with each other, in the stuff they tell each other, the stuff they talk about, the way they act around each other, the way they act around the other characters. Right, like the, when their relationship deepens, that's an arc. Right, even ignoring the plot stuff, if it was pure slice of life without plot stuff, which it sometimes becomes, you have still an ongoing, uh, you know, sense of of progression and interest because you're witnessing these characters who are believably in love, deepening their relationship, and there's even a narrative and emotional climax at the end of each arc purely to do with the romance which makes it way better than Furaraba which is just yeah <laughs> the cheesiest corniest dialogue you've ever read for 10,000 hours anyway the only reason I'm complaining about it is because Furaraba is so popular and I don't understand why it always gets brought up with like a bunch of other way better visual novels like uh, like Sankakurenai, for example, which... Now, Sankakurenai is an example of how to do it properly, where the common route is really funny slice-of-life stuff, and then the fucking character routes, they didn't forget how to write comedy, you know? Like, they, they, they're continually funny into the individual routes. 
uh, yeah, or um, for example, let me see, it's another one I've read that's kind of similar. Uh, have I read any of these? Renai Royale. Renai Royale is not as good as um, Sankaku Renai. Or, what's it? Skito Skito de Sankaku Renai. Renai Royale is not as good. But it's still better <laughs> than Fururaba. Uh, except for uh, this fucking, the sort of main heroine childhood friend character, what's her name? Hanamaru Mari, her route kind of sucks, but the other routes are, are, are good, um, especially the Emoto route, obviously, because that's always going to be the best route in any game. Uh, or, as another example, hold on, I'm pretty sure there's a different SME visual novel that I read. No? Do I not? Okay, never mind, never mind. What am I thinking of? Uh, I don't know what I was thinking of. Maybe mad. I don't know. Well, whatever. I gotta go finish this fucking thing now. While I'm here complaining about visual novels, uh, another moe game that is like very popular and well liked is Magikoi. Magi de Otashi ni Koi Shinasai. Uh, and because, yeah, obviously because it's like one of the most popular and well liked moe gay and like comedy focused visual novels, I decided to play it. And, well, firstly, it's insanely stupidly long. Uh, that's, like, the first issue with it, which is not really an issue. It's an issue with me, right? But the second thing is, I liked it well enough, but I honestly don't understand what all the hype is about. Like, <laughs> it was fun, I guess, but, like... Uh, I, yeah, I don't really understand why it's, it's like, so ridiculously well-liked. Uh, I mean, yeah, I just don't really understand what the, like, I don't really understand what what's so special about it, I guess. If I had to guess, I think people like Magikoi just because it's of its scale. Like, it's the biggest Moege. It's, like, longer than any of the others. It has more characters and more roots and more choices than any other Moege. Uh, like, that's... It's an it's an epic. Uh, I think that's the reason that most people... Like, why it's considered so special by a lot of people. But for me... I don't know, it didn't... That wasn't particularly impressive or I mean it's impressive on a technical level but what I mean is it it I think if you spend like 70 hours playing a game you're gonna like it <laughs> you know <laughs> like you're gonna have a developed a serious attachment to it by the end I don't know how much of that is actually because it itself is like super special Okay, so we're almost an hour in. Time to respond to some comments on the last episode. Uh, Kodai Demivi says, Fugjie. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, SafeXP says, Love these. Thank you. Anime Sama says, You're a content animal. I am. I am. I am the human content machine. I'm the world's main human content machine. I be pumping out 12 hour videos like it's fucking nothing because I got shit to say. Okay, I got some shit to say just for the fuck of it, right? Element of naivety says, feed me content. I have done so and will continue to do so. You're welcome. 
subscribe. You you guys are already subscribed. <laughs> uh, Kodai Demivi once again says, "His Babros, it's over." Colon C. I don't know what that is in reference to. I I don't remember. Dash says, "Ah, I'm about to consume." You're goddamn right. You're goddamn right. You are. Uh, Lewis says, "My fave content on the internet right now." Why? Thank you. I tr- I'm trying. I'm trying my best to be entertaining in these. Uh, Korosama says, "I don't know about Subahibi gatekeeping itself. There's an epidemic of Twitter Denpa e girls who base their personality on Zakuro after reading for twenty minutes." I've never seen these people. I've seen the lane people. I've never seen the Subahibi people, and I'm I I have seen Subahibi Twitter, but honestly, you're probably right. Uh, but to be fair, that kind of I guess what you're saying is, you have to be careful about this gatekeeping itself mentality because, what that really does is it makes something seem desirable and then you get posers, which I guess is probably true, uh, which is why. Maybe the problem with Subahibi is it's too cool. Like, uh, there probably aren't many posers in the Thomas the Tank Engine community, right? Which I I'm not like a super big part of the Thomas community. I I do like Thomas quite a lot. I don't really interact with the community at all. Um, <clears throat> I'm planning to do a big Thomas rewatch at some point. Uh, I started rewatching the classic era a while ago, and uh. Yeah, I did enjoy it. What I really want to do is I I've never seen the the Brenner era, um. So I definitely want to try and get through some some areas of the Brenner era, and uh, cause I I've watched I I say I've never seen it. I've seen like maybe two or three Brenner era episodes, and enjoyed them quite a lot. So yeah, at one point at some point I'm gonna marathon through the whole Brenner era. But what I'm saying is I don't I highly doubt there are Twitter egos who are you know, LARPing as Thomas fans. Is what I'm saying, right? If anything gatekeeps itself, it's Thomas the Tank Engine, Thomas and friends.、Uh, shame that like most of it sucks. Like you have the classic era, and then you have the Brenner era, and that's basically the only good parts. And now you've got like, what Big World Big Adventures, absolute fucking garbage. And now, um, uh, All Engines Go, which is like not it's like so dis. Like if you think your favorite franchise has been killed by like bad sequels or something. Like you don't even know the state of the fucking Thomas fandom, right now, right? Like, uh, just look look into this, okay? Just look into this. Watch watch like unlucky tug videos about it or something. Uh, it's fucking、uh, terrible. Sorry, Thomas ran over. Uh, unedited is better. Says four. I think I agree with you. Um. I'll probably stick to it, but we'll see. Because some people seem to prefer、uh, prefer edited, some people prefer unedited. Also, damn, that was like towards the end of the video. You you finished this pretty quick. Shouts out to you for you. You have no life, just like me. Okay, so Senmen Banker talk. Annoying Senmen Banker talk. To be perfectly real with you. That's <clears> why <throat>、oh, I got something stuck in my teeth. Okay, got it.、Uh, <clears throat> so currently reading through Lena's route. Is it good? No. <laughs>、um, this was the route I was least looking forward to, because Lena is the character I'm least interested in out of the main four. Um, not my type in any sense. Uh. Big boober blonde girl who I don't know, eh, not not very appealing to me. <clears throat>、uh, kind of, yeah, eh, eh, big eh, big fat eh was kind of not super looking forward to it.、Um, every other character has some aspect that I kind of like, like,、uh, you know, Yoshino is the main heroine. So it's like she's got that aspect.、Um, Mako has the best 
character or characterization, you know, the best um, story to her route. And Murasame has the best character design. <clears throat> Lena has nothing, really, except the biggest boobs, which is not something I particularly care about. Uh, like, her, her gimmicks are big boobs and she's foreign. <clears throat> and that's it. And I don't care, to be honest, about either of those things. <laughs> so this is going to be... This is unpleasant. Uh, I'm also just so sick of reading at this point. And to be honest, I'm sick of this world. Like, I'm sick of the world of Senna and Banka. <clears throat> I've just spent too much time here. And I'm starting to resent it. This is what always happens with visual novels. You know, towards the end, I just end up grinding to the point where it's not even fun. And I wonder, like, am I just forcing myself to do this because I aesthetically want to be into visual novels? But, you know, I had fun at the beginning, and it just makes me feel bad to not be able to finish it. Like, I enjoyed <clears throat> the common route. I thought the first route was fine. I thought Mako's route was genuinely good. And I thought Murasame's route had some good parts. <laughs> yeah, it had some good parts. It wasn't good the whole way through. But it had some good parts that I enjoyed. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, at some point, I just started to... Res in the middle of Murasame's route, I'm sitting here and I'm like, am I reading this because I actually want to know what happens next and I'm actually interested? Or am I reading it just because I want to finish it and get it over with? And at this point, you know, I know that I'm just reading it because I want to finish it and get it over with. Because I will feel guilty if I don't. Um... And I don't, I don't know, you know, and the, so that's the first thing. And here's the second thing, which is maybe even worse, <clears throat> is that the reason I even picked up this visual novel in the first place is because it has a bunch of art and a bunch of, it's easy, it, it would be an easy thing to get to obtain a poster for, because the posters I really want, I'll tell you the poster I really want is the character Luluna, Luluna, from Magical Marriage Lunatics. However, that game is not particularly popular, and that character in that game is not particularly popular. So the only like HD art I can even find of her is just a CG from the game, and it's okay, but she's, she's in her pantsuit. She's in her underwear, and it's too lewd to put on my wall. Like, I don't... It's just a little too loot. You know, she's not in, like, a sexual pose or anything, but she is in her underwear, and it's a, it's just a little too loot. Um, it's also not... doesn't look that good, in my opinion. That particular CG, not my favourite from the game. I would love a Luluna poster, but I can't find a good one. Um, <clears throat> I would love a Subahibi poster, which I will get. I would love a cross-channel poster, and I will get one of those too. I would also really like a uh, Sankakurenai Love Triangle Trouble poster. But again, it's really hard to find good poster artwork of that, that VN. And the reason why a lot of this is annoying to me is <clears throat> what I really want, like the real problem with Sam and Banka and why I'm kind of annoyed at it, is that, to be honest, the, the character designs aren't that great. Like, I'm, I, I don't particularly think... That, I mean, every character that I have on my wall has a particularly striking character. Like, that's the important part of a poster, right? It's not just that you like the show, but also that the character design is really good. And, uh, <clears throat> yeah. I'll tell you, I would probably get a Murasame poster, because she has the best character design. So I think that's probably what I'll end up doing. Um... <clears throat> Is going going with a Murasame poster, even though she's not my favorite character from the game. Uh, her her design is the best. Um, it's kind of there's there's not that much. I don't know. It's all 1080p though. You know, it's not like super great. Um, I can't find anything that's like as HD as I would want it to. Maybe this. Is, how HD is this? Is this okay? 
view larger version. Oh yeah, now that's big. See this, I would I would get this. You can't see it, but I found a good okay, I found a good image on yande.ray and um <clears throat> yeah. I think that looks good. Uh so I might get that. Um but honestly, I don't know if I enjoyed this game enough to really care about getting a poster for it. You know, which is kind of sad. Uh, I've also not finished it yet, and I'm talking like about it as if I have, which is not good, because that's how it starts, and then the next thing I know, I've forgotten the game exists, and I've stopped playing it, and then like a week later, I'm like, fuck, I forgot to finish that game. <clears throat> which I really need to fucking... I think I'm going to try and go back and and re-go through some of, some visual novels that I, I like dropped, because some of them I dropped... Most of the ones I dropped, I dropped because like I, I, well I say dropped. I don't I don't know what to mark as dropped. This is the thing, right? I need to blow my nose. I don't know what to mark as dropped on VMDB. Because I don't think it's that weird to play a visual novel and just play through the character which you're interested in and ignore the ones you're not interested in. I think that's a pretty common thing to do. Like I don't think that's that weird. And I don't necessarily like. If you do that. Did you 100% the game? No. But did you finish the game? I don't... I think maybe. I think maybe. I'm going to ask people. I'm going to ask Otago <clears throat> visual novel fans that I know and see what they think. But yeah, that's, that's kind of annoying. I thought Sendai Banker would be better than it actually is. Uh, but yeah, so the, the, the one I'm thinking of in particular <clears throat> is uh, Sanaba Witch, which... <laughs> which uh, I I read two roots of and then was like, I'm bored of this, I'm out, peace. But looking back on it, I think I would like to do play through some more roots, which should be chill, except for the fact that I fucking lost my save. <laughs> I lost my save because it was on my ThinkPad, which uh, I had to do it, which I lost the backups for and had to reinstall Linux. Um, because the computer crashed while it was installing a new kernel. So I lost my save, which I guess isn't such a big deal, because I would be starting these routes from fresh, so I can just skip through the common route and select the correct choices to get onto the character I want to play, which I guess is not, it's just kind of annoying, but not, like, too annoying. Um, but yeah, it's definitely suboptimal. It's definitely not ideal. Uh, the other one, I don't know, again, kind of annoying. Uh, I don't know about this one, actually. So there's a, there's a visual novel called Maitetsu, and it's like, I, I wanted to like Maitetsu so much, and I just didn't like it. I just thought the plot was bad. I thought the world building was really interesting, and I liked a lot of the characters. But there is some really overly heavy melodrama that goes nowhere, means nothing, and is just hammed up like crazy uh, and kind of completely ruins the plot for me. Like, it's so bad. Uh, <clears throat> and that's why it's, yeah, it's kind of... I, it has such a good aesthetic, and it's also, like, really technically well done, like... They, the sprites are animated and stuff. It looks really good. And it's about trains. So it's obviously based. But, um, you know, I, I just can't say I love it. Uh, which is just annoying, to be honest. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff like this where it's like, there's, there's I, I don't know what to do. I, I wish, like, I guess I just need to play through more visual novels until I fi find what I, I'll tell you what I need, I'll tell you what I've, I'll tell, you know what, I'll tell you what I'm searching for, okay, I'm searching for a waifu, right, and the closest I've come is Luluna from Magical Marriage Luna 6, but there is very little good art of Luluna to find. Um, I'm, I'm searching for 
for a character in one of these visual novels that really speaks to me and is like special, you know? And uh, I've, I've just not, not found one, to be honest. In these moe gay, I mean, you know what I want to do is play through Koini Kami or Soete 2? Because I might enjoy that game. Because I did enjoy the first one. It reminded me a lot of Gotcha Yusa. It's very clearly inspired a lot by Gotcha Yusa. And I love Gotcha Yusa. And I, I, I did like Koini Kami or Soete. Um, but I also don't remember it very much. Um, so I would, I would like to play through the sequel. Anyway, sorry, kind of getting off topic here. Most of this is just me procrastinating from playing this route, which I think, you know what, I'm considering just skipping at this point. Like, I don't know what I'm going to get out of it. I've gotten to the point where the plot has, like, kicked into gear in Lena's route, and it is not interesting to me at all. <laughs> I don't know, man. I'm, visual novel-wise, I'm lost. I think I'm uninterested in the Lena route, and I should just admit this to myself. Like, I don't think there's anything wrong with just playing through the character routes that you're interested in, in a visual novel. I don't know if there's anything wrong with that. If, if it's a very story, like, okay, I wouldn't say it's okay to say you finished Fate Stay Night without playing all the routes, right? Because they're not character routes, they're like, you know, it's different. They're plot routes. And I wouldn't say it's okay to say you finished Subahibi or um, Cross Channel without that, you know, right? Like in the very plot-based things where the routes all form one sort of continuous storyline, I don't think it's okay. In this situation, though, the roots are all like alternate universes. They can't exist with each other. They are literally, you know, separate timelines. Um, which, I don't know. I don't know if I feel okay. I don't know how okay I feel with this. Because I'm a pretty long way away from finishing Lena's route. You know what? I think I just grind it so I don't feel guilty. Right, I realized why Lena's route is, is particularly unappealing to me. And it, it's not just because she as a character doesn't have anything I'm particularly interested in. Because neither, like, this the visual novel isn't, like, super in line with my particular Moe tastes anyway in general like none of the like Mako who's the best route you know I'm not particularly interested in any characters of her um, you know archetype but it's it's because Lena has the least chemistry with the protagonist in the story they have the least in common they don't share any like super close moments or anything in the the common route they don't like nothing happens between them that would suggest that they would make a good romantic pet that's not the case for every other cat every single other character has some moment or uh feature where it's like these guys have a lot in common they could really get along enough to be a couple and <clears throat> That's, I think, why Lena's route starts earlier in the plot than any of the other routes. Because they need to retcon a whole bunch of time in order for them to develop chemistry together. Uh, which, to be honest, is a smart move. A worse visual novel would have not even tried and just made the entire route pointless. But it's still... Anyway, so I'm just fucking complaining about this. I know it's stupid because I can just choose not to read it and I'm doing it anyway for stupid reasons. Not actually what I wanted to talk about. Uh, what I want to say is I'm nearing a thousand subscribers on YouTube. And that's a very important number because once your channel hits a thousand subscribers, you can start monetizing. Um, and so I just want to make something very clear. And I hope that my audience holds me to it which is that I 
am very against internet self-censorship, right? That I hate it when people say stuff like unalive or censor swear words or anything like this, right? Like, I fucking hate this shit. The sterilization of the internet turning into this sort of hospital environment. The whole world is turning into a hospital environment, you know? I think Foucault would have a lot to say about a lot of things. <laughs> Uh, sorry, playing TF2 and just fucking owning and pwning some noobs right now. There's a sniper on me. Okay, I died. Yeah, so I just want to make it clear that I I hope my audience holds me to this. If I ever start, like, purposefully censoring swear words or saying stuff like on a live or any of this, like, self-censoring bullshit... Uh, I want you to, like, spurg out on me and tell me I'm being retarded. Like, I will never not say the word retarded, okay? Like, that's that's just a part of my vocabulary. It would take a serious event to make me stop saying retarded, and I, I can't see that happening anytime. Anyway, the point being... <clears throat> I don't, I, the point of this channel is not to make money. Everything on the internet isn't about money, okay? If I get to make a little bit of money on the side from this channel, that's nice. You know, that's a free bonus. But uh, if I ever start doing shit because I'm, like, censoring myself, because I'm like, oh, I could make money by doing that. I want you guys to, I mean, I don't plan on ever doing it. <laughs> but if I do, I want you guys to spurg the fuck out in my comment section and, like, you know, unsubscribe if I do some crazy shit like that. Okay, guys, I've changed my mind. I actually like this route now. <laughs> it's grown on me. It's grown on me. What can I say? I'm, enjoy I'm actually enjoying it, and it's a shame, because now by the time it starts to get enjoyable, I now am, like, tired and probably should go to sleep, but I kind of want to keep reading. So I don't know quite what to do. I guess I'll just read some more in bed, and then, I don't know, to, to, to head off to, to, to sleep. But, yeah, I've changed my mind. Lena's route actually good actually gets good it starts off bad but uh there's some some cute moments in there i think the plot is retarded but the character stuff takes a while to get get to work it didn't work at first i like the fact that lena is somewhat assertive that's nice all the other girls the whole time i was thinking they're so passive Murasame is a little more active, but the other girls, I mean, they're so passive in the whole romance thing, it's kind of off-putting to me. Um, until they start dating. But Lena, it seems, is, is, has taken a much more active pursuing role in the romance plot, and that's nice to see. I like that they had that, that it's not just all these, like, submissive fucking bitches <laughs> you know keep it interesting little dynamics in there have it a two-way street it's a bit weird but i don't know i'm not saying that it's weird or bad that it's you know what i'm saying what i'm saying is variety is the spice of life you know what i'm saying bitch yeah bitch i'm sleepy I would like to issue a formal public apology to Usersoft and the writers of Senmen Banker for my shit talking uh, this arc. I don't know why I did that. It's actually really good so far. Uh, maybe my favorite in the whole game. And I'm enjoying it a lot for the plot, romance aside. It has a really unique and interesting plot arc, which I thought. You know, the, the, I said the plot is bad at first. It turns out that that section was basically just a preamble to the real thrust of the plot, which is way more interesting. Um, anyway, yeah, no, it's good. Uh, and also, I've, all of the feelings of resentment I had towards this visual novel, where I was like, oh, I just want it to be over and I'm just grinding it, have all disappeared. I am now like damn, I don't want to go to sleep, I want to keep reading, and I think I said that before, that was like two hours ago when I recorded the last segment, 
I'm I'm like I want to you know before I was like I'm fucking tired of the village of Hori I'm tired of these characters I have been spent too damn long here I want to go home but now for some reason I'm like I want to stay here forever so I don't know what's going on with me man this is why it's important this is see I almost dropped this I almost dropped this and this you know what good thing I have like some sort of weird pathological guilt complex about dropping a visual novel because otherwise I would have not read this arc and it's a good arc so I'm now thinking what else have I missed out on when I dropped something which is weird but I actually don't think I missed out on much I might have been something but I'm thinking about it anyway yeah think good you know what? I think I can recommend Senran Banka. I think I can safely recommend it. There was a new Mr. Beast video. I fucking hate this guy. <laughs> okay, that's too extreme. You know what? I don't... You know what? I'm gonna be honest with you guys. I'm gonna be actually honest and give you my true opinion. I don't hate Mr. Beast. I don't hate his videos. I don't hate him as a person. I'm just sick of the fact that I have to care about him. That because he's famous, you have to have an opinion about him. I don't really give a shit. That's my main deal. The videos, they go in one ear, out the other, right? Like, I've seen a couple of his videos. I saw the Squid Game one. I just watched the newest one because a streamer I was watching was reacting to it. Um, So I just ended up watching it. And to be honest, um, okay, here's what I just want to say, right? I, because I, I, I heard people saying that the newest Mr. Bean video, one to one hundred people stay in a box or whatever the fuck, it's stupid. It's funny that someone can make that idea happen. It's like an idea you'd have as a kid and no one would ever make. And I like the fact that there's a rich guy out there who can just do wacky shit like that for entertainment. Like, that's cool. Um, uh... The thing that's, I don't, the only reason I'm bringing this up, right, is because the ending of the video, I've heard people, before I just watched it, I heard people talk about how it was, like, a really good ending. Like, the ending of the video is, like, intense competition, right? And I, I, I listened to someone describe it, and I was like, that just sounds like carrot in a box. And I watched the video, and it's carrot in a box. Now, you probably don't know what carrot in a box is, but uh, there's a British game show or not a game show, it's like a, a panel show, which is something that I'm, like, low-key obsessed with, is British panel shows. But they don't... I, I think Americans don't know what this is. Its closest comparison is... Uh, if you've ever heard of Whose Line Is It Anyway, that's, like, the closest thing in the US has to a, a panel show. The idea is it's like a game show, but instead of, like, regular contestants winning money, it's a bunch of comedians... And uh, the 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 points and there's no prize, and the points don't really matter that much. The main goal is to riff on whatever subjects are being brought up, right? And they're normally uh, based around certain things, often like t topical current events, often politics. The first one I believe is uh uh oh fuck I don't remember what it's called. Is it called Would I Lie to You? No, that's not it. That's one of the latest one. But what if I... I just woke up, so I'm kind of drowsy. Um, fuck. Have I got news for you? That's what it's called. And that one's based on the news of the week. Uh, but then, yeah, there's a bunch of other ones. They're really good. Like, they're all good. Some of them are better than others. Have I got news for you is one of the more, like, grown up for the, for, for, for the Guardian readers out there. Uh, I guess. <laughs> uh, you know, and then, uh, there's other ones, who cares, but one of them was a it's got a really fucking stupid name, because it's all about context clues that you don't understand, because you haven't watched the show, but it's called 8 out of 10 cats does countdown, and the idea is it's the, the, the regulars from a different panel show called 8 out of 10 cats, and that one is called 8 out of 10 cats because it's about statistics. And so that's, it's got a stupid name. But it's the contestants from that show 
the comedians who are like regulars on that show playing Countdown, which is a different British game show, which is fucking amazing. If you ever watch the IT crowd, there's a great, there's a Countdown episode in the IT crowd. Uh, but Countdown is a not a panel show. It's a game show. It's a very, it's a, anyway, whatever. I, I don't know why I'm explaining all this. I didn't need to explain all of this to you. Anyway, on, on on an episode of 8 out of 10 Cats Does Countdown, they do a little gimmick segment, a little funny gimmick segment where, where uh, they do an, an extra game. And the game is there are two boxes. One of the boxes has a carrot in it, and one of the boxes doesn't have a carrot in it. Only one of them is allowed to look at the box. They have to try and figure out which one has the carrot in it. It's good. And it's very funny because... Uh, well, it's just very good. The guy who wins, he lies extremely convincingly, and it's fucking hilarious when you find out that, yeah. But it's very funny to me that the 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 super intense Mr. Beast ending is just a a shitty version of the carrot in a box bit from one random episode of this British panel show. One reason I'm really enjoying Lena's arc right now is because it has a super realistic and, uh well-written sort of cultural exchange. Like, I was saying, oh, she's just sort of a generic blonde European girl, which I've, you know, read and seen in a bunch of anime and visual novels. But in this situation, they really... So she's actually from Finland, right? She's from... She's from I, I don't buy... They say she's from Lapland, which is, like, really fucking far north. That's kind of sus. Like, I don't know about that. I mean, I guess it's technically possible. Uh... I don't know why I'm, like, sus of this, but, like, very, very few people live up there. Uh, I, at least, I think very few people live up there. Maybe I'm overreacting to this, but sure, she, she's from, like, Lapland. And, you know, in the common route, they barely mention it. In fact, they don't even, they just say she's from Europe. That's literally it. But in her route, there's, like, a whole bunch of it is about um, this sort of very... I, I believable, I guess is the word, w- way that they're sort of, you know, the, 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 the main characters are learning about Finnish culture, like showing them different snacks and telling her, telling them about like the, the sort of, you know, ways, ways of life up there. And, uh, Lena learning about Japanese culture and it's, it's very comfy and very well done. Like, you know, as, a European. I, look, I don't know that much about Finnish culture. I know I have a, a friend from Finland, um, but, like, that's about it. But I know a bit. And uh, they've done their research. Like, everything they're saying is correct about Finland. It's all relatively basic facts about, like, what sort of food is eaten there and, like, the environment, you know, culture and stuff. It's not, like, anything too crazy deep but it's not you know they've they clearly actually looked up stuff about finland unlike chrono clock where the british character is just got nothing to do with being british at all <laughs> like uh and this is one of the so so one of the things that was weird is that like lena is supposed to be very like compared to the the other characters much more outgoing and sort of bold and forthcoming because she's european and i was like but she's finnish right <laughs> finnish people are basically like japanese people you know they're very uh i mean nordic people in general scandinavian people in general pretty reserved pretty introverted right uh culture which is fairly similar to japan but they explain it they talk about how like oh she's actually you know for even for where she comes from she's relatively outgoing compared to the norm and it's like oh like it's what seems like generic foreign girl character is actually a well-researched you know situation and it's it's there's there's a lot of good humor that comes from this there's a lot of good slice of life and romance that comes from this and it seems like, you know, you get this very, um, I, I, I don't necessarily want to call it realistic. I'm struggling to, to, I think like 
emotionally resonant. You get a very emotionally resonant, emotionally resonant, um, sort of like I'm struggling to think of the words. I just woke up not that long ago, so my brain is still not kicked into gear. The way this sort of crossing of cultures comes along, it's very natural. It feels like very much how the. That these characters are more than just flat; that they have depth to them, that they come from a place. They have relations with the people around them. They have stories to their lives. They have internal worlds, you know, which I, it, it shouldn't be too crazy, right? But a lot of visual novels don't do this very well. Like this is a big complaint with Furaraba, right? Is that when you go on the the character routes in Furaraba, fucking none of them are like this. That none of them, none of the characters, have any sort of particularly unique internal worlds or histories or uh, chemistries or relationships with uh, the external world. You know, like where Lena and Marco particularly have these, you know, things that seem on the surface to just be. Archetypes and tropes, but once you go into their roots, they're actually unique individuals who don't fit so neatly into those archetypes, and I think that's really great.、Uh, I bought anime posters <laughs> yesterday. I caved and bought some posters.、Uh, I say anime posters; they're actually mostly visual novel posters. I bought a Senran Banka poster. It was a Murasame poster. Um, who's not my favorite character, but not my least favorite character either.、Um, but she, as I said yesterday, she has the best character design, so、uh, that's the one I chose to pick. I it, it was also、uh, a character with that I could I could find high quality art of. I bought a Yamano Susume poster.、Uh, now Yamano Susume is interesting because. I mean, I really like the aesthetic of the show, and especially the first season, where it's short episodes. I think is animated beautifully, because、um, it was like a testing ground for new young animators to sort of flex their skill. And so, I think the show looks amazing in the first season. I kind of fell off the show in the second and third seasons, and kind of ended up dropping it.、Um, but I think I still look back on that first season of Yamano Susume with a lot of,、uh, you know, joy. I still really like that first season a lot. So. Uh, I'm happy to get that poster,、uh, and then I also got a Subahibi poster because, of course, I'm a little worried about it because、uh, even though the image should be high res, it gave me a little bit of a warning that said like it could be blurry. But I decided to I could have downscaled it even more, but I thought I wanted this poster to not be tiny, so I decided to try and push the limits of what I could get away with in terms of the poster scale. And I'm hoping that it's not like blurry and pixelated, because、uh, that would fucking suck.、Uh, yeah, and then I also got another one, maybe which I'm forgetting. Did I even get another one? Hold on a second. I'm forgetting what I ended up buying. Uh. Um, oh yeah, I got a coiny、uh, cameo soete poster. I got a I got a coiny cameo soete poster,、uh, which is very cute. It's a cute poster.、Uh, that's a good visual novel. It's underrated. Listen, if you if you want to read a good moege, I think if you're like, like if you're listen if you've been listening to me talk about this shit and you're thinking like. You know, maybe you've read,、uh, I don't know, Higurashi or、um, fucking Sayano Uta or something, and you're sitting here thinking, I want to read a moege visual novel. I think,、uh, you know, if you if you like、uh, Gochi Uta, you will like Koini Kami Osoete. The English title is Love's Sweet Garnish. Yeah, I think you're just a hundred. I think you're basically guaranteed to like it.、Uh, it's not like the best thing I've ever read,、um, but it is 
I mean, it, it's very diabetes tier, slice of life, moe stuff. Uh, and then also, if you want to read a, a moe gay, I mean, pick basically any uh, Yuzusoft title. They're all pretty good. Um, <clears throat> yeah. But yeah, no, if you, I think, uh, I think if, you, since I know a lot of people who watch my channel are pretty into, uh, Gochi Yusa, I think Koini Kami or Soate is a good, uh, starting point for Moege, because it's, I like to dive in at the deep end with stuff, you know, I'm, I'm not a big fan of half measures, so that's going to be my recommendation, is like, may, maybe it's a little hardcore Moe, but if you're a Gochi Yusa fan, you're already into hardcore Moe, blob nothing happens shows uh like season two of gotcha yusa is like the most diabetes moe show that i'm aware of uh which is great it's why i love it yeah so i really need to read uh the the second the sequel to quite uh, yeah i really need to read the sequel which I'll hopefully do at some point. I actually have a whole bunch of it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of stuck, right? I'm kind of uh, in a weird, awkward position with visual novels where after I finish uh, Send and Banker, I'm, like, worried about what I'm going to read next. Oh, I also finished Island Diary. I don't know if I, ever, if I actually told you guys that because uh, I said I was going to finish it, and I don't think I updated you. I did finish Island Diary, and I actually haven't marked it on VMDB, so let me go ahead and do that now. Uh, Island Diary. Oops, I spelled it wrong. Uh, let me mark it as finish. I'm going to give it a solid 5 out of 10. I'll give it a 6 out of 10. Decent. I think decent describes it. It was decent. Um... Yeah. Happy to give it a 6 out of 10. Pretty short. Uh, but yeah, I didn't hate it or anything. I uh, can't really strongly recommend it since it's very short and not super great. But yeah. Um, excited to finish Sen and Banker. Excited. So, oh yeah, so what I was going to say was... Uh, I'm I'm kind of stuck between which visual novel to read next because I I think after Sen and Banker I want to try and finish those Strike Witches seasons that I've been putting off, um, and then which will be like a break from visual novels, and then I'm kind of stuck between King Koi and maybe I'm not sure I kind of want to read King Koi I kind of want to read. Um, Wait, what was it? There was another one that I was thinking of. Uh, one second. I think King Koi should be up there in my list, which is the shortened name for Kin Kinido Love Loverich. Uh, oh yeah, I'm stuck between King Koi Koi Nikami Osoete Two, and perhaps. Maybe Noble Works, I've thought about. Or Riddle Joker, actually. I think Riddle Joker is supposed to be really good. Uh, a lot of people... I've, I've heard people say it's the best... It's like... Because I think Riddle Joker is the newest Yuzusoft game. And uh, well, I've been a fan of every Yuzusoft game I've read so far. So I think I would probably like um, Riddle Joker. Although... Again, none of the character designs are super standing out to me. Ah, that's not true. I kind of... They look all right. Oh, I've got a lot of time ahead of me. Uh, I, I think I'm going to... Right now, I'm thinking I'm thinking it's King Koi. Because King Koi is very well-liked. Uh, and often recommended in as like one of the better Moege. So that makes me want to read it. Although... I don't personally have any sort of categorical attraction to blonde hair, which is kind of the point. If you don't know, Kiniro means blonde hair in Japanese. All the all the characters have blonde hair. Uh, I guess 
pointy cameo saw a tattoo is short, relatively short, whereas King Koi is long as fuck. Like, at least according to VNDB, uh, man, I need to come up with a shorter name for ko- Koi ni Kami Oso Ete Tu. Koi ni Kami Oso Ete Tu. I, what would you shorten that to? Koi Kan, maybe? Call it Koi Kan? Yeah. Koi So Ete? I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, uh, that one is, according to VNDB, about 13 hours long. Whereas Kinilo Love Rage is about 45 hours long. Uh, and I'm... But uh, Kinilo Love Rage is rated much higher than Koi Ni Kami Oso Eta 2, which is not rated super highly. Uh, oh, I should mention a, a notable fact about uh, the first one is that it's actually the first um koi kanmi i guess is the shortened version that koi kanmi was the first uh vn created by this studio canvas garden um which is like an amateur studio and it's pretty i think they uh like did a really smart thing, which is that they immediately went for the English speaking market. Like they like they their first ever visual novel and they're like amateurs at this point. Like they're not even a professional studio. It's really high quality, by the way, for being a first VN. Um I guess these people have probably worked on stuff before. I don't know that much about the individuals behind it. But uh it's definitely smart to I mean they teamed up with what is it, Denpersoft? They do a lot of English distribution. But yeah, I think that's a really smart sort of marketing tactic, I guess, to get the word out there. Because there's obviously a general lack of translated visual novels, even though there's a lot. Um, when it comes to Moige, there's not like that many. You will run out eventually, maybe. A lot of the the ones that are considered really good aren't translated. I mean, this is the general problem with visual novels, is that like if you really want to be a hardcore visual novel fan, you kind of have to learn Japanese. And it's not super hard. Uh, You can learn enough... If you do your Anki every day, you can learn enough Japanese to read visual novels in like four months. Uh, Like, they're not super advanced Japanese most of the time. Some of them are. Some of them more like literary ones. But most of them you'll be able to read and understand if you just spend it like a good few months doing your daily Yankees, which I'm not willing to do. <laughs> Maybe one day I will, but, uh, yeah, reading untranslated vision, I don't need to do it yet, because there's so many translated ones that I haven't read and that, I, that look interesting to me that there's just no reason for me to go through and do that, except for Sakura no Uta, as the only untranslated visual novel that I really desperately want to read. Uh... So yeah, I'm kind of questioning which one to read next between Kinyo Love Rush and uh, Koi Kanmi. Two next. Uh, I think, I I don't know, I'll make a decision at some point. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I ought to finish Senven Banka first. This is the problem with visual novels, is that VNDB is such a great website. I will just spend hours on this site just looking through everything. Because everything is so well tagged and documented and everything is interlinked with themselves interlinked. And I would just spend hours on this fucking website <laughs> just thinking, oh, I want to read that one. Oh, I want to read that one instead of actually reading. Definitely a problem for me. You know, there's this meme. I think it's less popular now, but it was pretty popular a few years ago. And this idea was like, oh, all of the rich and powerful people, they don't care about solving existential issues like climate change because they're just going to dip off to Mars once the Earth goes to shit. They're just going to dip. They're just going to go to Mars. And uh, I don't know if the reason it's become unpopular now to say this is because people realize how dumb it is. But uh, yeah, even if climate change gets really bad, it's nowhere near as bad as living on Mars. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like, uh, the Earth can only be so hostile to humans. If you live on Mars, you can't even go outside. There's no air. The, the temperature is so low, you'll freeze to death. There's no atmosphere. Your blood will boil because of the... Like, I don't... 
there's no universe where the Earth, I mean, if it could happen, theoretically, hypothetically, long distance future, terraforming Mars into a livable planet, it's so far in the distant future that none of the rich that are alive today could possibly live to see it. Like, if Elon wants to go to Mars, if he wants to dip off to Mars, his life is just going to be, like, kind of worse than it is on Earth. Like, it's just not going to happen. What's really going to happen, well, I don't know. I honestly, I'm not even going to make predictions about what's going to happen. But I'll tell you, if a bunch of rich people do decide to dip off to Mars, it won't, they won't be living a life of uber luxury. Or if they, they won't be able to convince themselves they are, but space travel is so expensive that you can't bring a, like, every gram of extra weight you put on a spaceship is like, uh, I don't even know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, right? Like, it's, transporting stuff to Mars is very, very, very expensive. Even if you're a multi-multi-billionaire, you know, it's the sort of thing that uh, governments need to do. And even then, even if, let's say you're Jeff Bezos or, or uh, Elon and you have that much money and you really can just bring all of your shit to Mars, what do you, do? like, once you're there, I don't know. I don't know, I don't know, it, it, it's a shitty place to live, you don't want to live on Mars, you don't, you don't, like, it's a, it's, it's more like doing an Arctic exhibition, exhibition, expedition, than, you know, just like, oh, I'm gonna move house, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not like, uh, what happened in, I think, was it Norway or Sweden recently, uh, where they raised, uh, wealth tax by like 4%, and, uh, like, a lot of the richest people just left the country, uh, and in the end, like, a lot of their highest paying taxpayers actually left, and they ended up, it, it ended up so that they're actually making less money from taxes than they were before they raised taxes because a bunch of the rich people left, um, and that's, that, that's, I think, what people are thinking of, right? is this situation where it's like, oh, if, if life becomes slightly harder for rich people, they'll just move. The problem is Mars is not, like, moving to Monaco. <laughs> you know, you, it's a, it's a, it's, yeah, I, I'm glad that this meme's kind of died, but I think uh, even, like, King Gizzard made a song about it called Mars for the Rich, which is a good song, but it's, it's not a real phenomenon. I don't, you know, if it did happen, it would be very stupid. Like, it would be, it would be them making their lives worse out of the sake of, like, hubris. It wouldn't be like, oh, they're just going to leave us to rot and while they live up in it, the Elise, like, the Elysium movie, right? Like, they're just going to leave us to rot on a dying earth while they escape to Mars. No, it's not going to be that situation. It's more like, uh, it's more like a, a rich person who goes off to fund some sort of weird expedition where they're doing, like, really weird difficult shit I guess like uh <clears throat> the the royal family here in in England where they like send all of their children off to go fight in Afghanistan and shit and like yeah I mean are those guys actually ever in any real danger maybe I don't know I honestly don't know that much about the the, the modern I don't fucking care man it's so weird how much the British media cares about the royals here. It's always been so strange to me. It's something that I just don't... I don't think I... Like, the only person I've ever met who cared about it was my mom. And she would she was just, like, super into gossip, tabloid stuff in general. So she would just read anything like that. Uh, but that's, like, what it all is. And, I, man, I don't understand it. I don't, I don't understand it at all. Then again... You know, I've read, I've, I've seen my fair share of Twitch streamer drama and, and YouTube drama and stuff, so maybe I can kind of understand the, uh, the appeal. I don't know. Hey guys, I just got back from, uh, touching some grass, actually. Well, I didn't really touch any grass, but I did go outside. And, uh... <clears throat> Yeah, a couple of things happened. So I, I was going out to meet up with my dad, as 
we do once in a while. And, uh, yeah, we, so, let me think of the things that happened, notable things. I think there's only really two notable things that happened. Uh, so first thing is that I was going, this was in the morning, right? It's like midday now, but we were meet, we met up at about 9 a.m., uh, which for me, I woke up at 4 a.m.-ish, so not a problem for me to get there. But the problem is that meeting up at 9 a.m., which I forgot to consider, means catching rush hour. And rush hour in London is very unpleasant as an autistic, anxiety-ridden person because <laughs> the trains get incredibly, incredibly packed, as you can imagine. I, you know, I don't know what it's like where you live, but yeah. I remember going to school in rush hour every day and hating it and having panic attacks constantly because of it. And I had forgotten that it existed uh, until now when I was rudely reminded of the fact that human beings degrade themselves like this every single day. Like, why can't jobs just stagger starting times? This idea that everyone starts work at the exact same time every day is so insane to me. Why not just have it so that, like, certain jobs start at 9, certain jobs start at 9.30, 10, 11, maybe earlier than, you know, maybe some jobs start at 8. It's still close enough that everyone can still hang out after work at around the same time. It's not that crazy. Why don't they just do that? Why don't they just, the government should just incentivize with, like, like some small tax breaks doing that to take pressure off of the system? Why don't they just fucking... I don't know, that's insane to me that everyone has to work at 9 till 5. What the fuck just happened? So, yeah, you have the uh, entire city commuting at the same time. And trains get very busy. Uh, so, I, the first train I was on was a national rail train, which is... Those trains are relatively infrequent. We're talking, like, every... 12 minutes or something like that 12 15 minutes so i kind of had to get the train that i was going to get even though it was very packed but then i was changing onto the elizabeth line and uh, that was the the weird part to me so when i showed up to the elizabeth line platform the first train that came was incredibly packed and i just thought i don't know why no one else thought to do this but i just looked at the board the next train one minute the next train is in one minute you know what? Fuck it. The platform is completely packed. The train is completely packed. Everyone's going onto this train. It's so full. Packed in like sardines. I'll wait one minute and see if the next train's not so bad. Next train, virtually empty. Why all of these people decided they had to pack onto this fucking train instead of wait one minute to get on the next one? I have no idea. I don't understand it at all. Uh, but yeah, I got on the next train and it was completely fine. Love the Elizabeth line. Great, enjoyable train to be on. So, uh, that's the first semi note thing I wanted to talk about, is I don't understand why people can't just wait one minute to get the next train, and I also don't understand why everyone's job has to start at the same time. It doesn't seem to make any sense to me. Uh, <clears throat> but the second thing is, while I was out walking around central London with my dad, we walked past a comic, comic book store, and uh, as we were walking past, I happened to see in the window on display, I was like, is that a Shintaro Kago art book? Of course, it was a Shintaro Kago art book. I was like, whoa. And my dad was like, you want to go in and take a look? So I was like, sure. Went in to take a look. They actually had, a, I guess, a bunch of new Shintaro Kago things imported or something, and that's why... There's like a little small section where they were all on display. It was an art book and then a couple of his manga. But they were all in hardcover form and they were all very expensive. And uh, so, you know, I was thinking about maybe getting one. Uh, but instead, uh, we went into the basement where the manga section is. And this place I've been to before, it has a pretty small manga section. Honestly, for how big of a city London is, there are, like, three shops that sell manga. I can list them all right now. They're also all in the same area. It's There's that comic book store that has a small manga section in the basement. Uh, like, the basement is... How do I describe it? It's like, you guys have a general sense of the scale of my room, 
It's like, imagine two of my room next to each other. It's about that big. And all four walls are covered in shelves. Plus there's a big section in the middle for like individual issues of comics. And uh, so in that basement, on the shelves and the walls, two of the walls are manga, the rest are all comics. Uh, so that's the manga section in that comic store. And they had, you know, mainly the sort of stuff you'd expect, but th th I think they're going in a little more of an artsy direction. They had, a, they had you know, as well as the Shintaro Kago stuff, they had uh, pretty much everything Nisi Oisin has ever written. So they had, like, Pan Pan, Dead Dead Demons, uh, and Solonine. They didn't have Girl on the Shore, because I, I think uh, it's illegal to sell in the UK, <laughs> given what that manga contains. Uh... And then, you know, they had a bunch of other stuff. They had, like, a whole bunch of One Piece, a whole bunch of Haikyuu, all of the shonens you'd expect. They also had a couple of, um, uh, fucking isekai. Like, they had solo leveling. They had a few issues of solo leveling, which was interesting. And, uh, they had a bunch of Osama Tezuka stuff. Uh, they had a few sports manga that I had never heard of. Um... And, yeah, it wasn't that bad of a selection, although mostly shonen-focused. There was a couple of, like, romance stu stuff um, and a couple of classics. But then, you know, I was sitting here looking through all of these manga, and I was, like, there for kind of a while, because I was trying to see if they had anything interesting. Um, oh, they also had a big volume, like, a, a big omnibus of, of Blame, or Burama, which, I I mean, Blame is, like, my favorite manga, so I, I, I don't know why. Maybe I should have got that. I don't know. But instead, what I found... What I, I, I was there for long enough that I was, like, kind of feeling weird about it, and for some reason, I was just like, I need to buy something now. I could have very easily just not bought anything. I don't know why, but I was, like, sitting there, and I was thinking about um, this fucking guy who's ruining my life. I'm telling you. I, I know he doesn't know who I am, and has never, like, watched any of my videos, and definitely doesn't watch these 12-hour podcasts. But this fucking guy, Artificial Night Sky, a.k.a. Paz, ruining my fucking life by being, like, too much of a based otaku, and making me feel inadequate. Like, I watched his video, and he's like, he, he's like, uh, you know, like, we, people who, like, still, like, there's, yeah, even though there's, there's still some of us who, like, like to collect physical media, even though it's completely obsolete, like, we just like the feel, and... And, like, he has this large collection of physical otaku media. And, you know, all these posters and shit. And now I'm spending all my money on fucking posters and shit. And, god damn it. Anyway, I was there and I was looking. Obviously, they don't have any Moe stuff. Which is really the problem. Like, I'm always looking through. I'm like, you know, Blame is really good. I like Shintaro Kago. I like Osama Tezuka. I like Nisi Oisin. Wait, did I, have I been saying Nisi Oisin? I meant to say Inio Asano. Bro, I'm getting them mixed up in my fucking brain. I'm retarded. I've been saying Nisi Oisin instead of Inio Asano the whole time. Apologies. Apologies for my mistake. I, I, they both got Is in their name. Fucking Inio Asano is the one I'm thinking of. Who wrote Sovereign and Pum Pum and shit. Sorry. Embarrassing. Anyway, I spotted on the shelf they had volumes 2, 3, and 4 of Nichijo. Um, which is the only, like, slice of life thing I could see on all of the shelves. And for some reason, I just randomly was just bought volume two of Nichijo. I have no idea why. I'm holding it in my hands right now. Look, I, I've never read the Nichijo manga. I've only seen the anime, and I love the anime. I've seen it twice, maybe even two and a half times. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I love the anime. Uh... I have no fucking idea why I bought this. <laughs> I have no idea why I bought this. I And it was expensive too. It was 11 quid. I guess it's not too crazy expensive, but... Uh, yeah, I don't know why I did that. I just wasted my money on this for no reason. I don't need this. I don't need this. I mean, I don't even have like a shelf, like a manga shelf to put it on because I don't own any manga. And I'm not, I'm not going to start a physical manga collection because it's impossible to find any good manga physically like they're not gonna have fucking there's no let me tell you about the manga options in london let me tell you so you've got that place which has th these two shelves then there's another comic book store called forbidden planet which is the biggest comic book store in london their basement is mostly manga but they only have bullshit they only have 
popular shonen stuff uh, and like popular seinen stuff. They don't they don't have any moe at all. There's no moe. That was my Discord notification, not yours. Um, nothing moe. I've looked through their I've looked through their shit every single fucking time. Even they have some figures. It's all Dragon Ball and like the shonen stuff. They don't have any moe. The, the, all of these comic book shops are allergic to moe. It's so annoying. There's nothing. It's impossible to find any moe goods anywhere. So Forbidden Planet, you know, it has a pretty big manga collection. If you're a huge shonen fag, and they have some other good stuff, you know, I'm not saying that they they have like all bad stuff. It's just not the stuff I'm into. It's just not moe. No one sells any moe manga in all of London or moe merch at all. So that's your other option. And then the third option is there's a big giant bookstore called Foils. And they have a big manga section as well. They're more of the like artsy side of manga, the literary side, because it's a bookstore. Right? And they have a bunch of really good shit. They even have some light novels, actually. Foils has a small light novel section where they have... I, I, I went there ages ago. I don't even remember what they have. But I remember they had uh, Back in Monogatari or like a few different volumes of Monogatari. Uh, I don't remember what else they had. They might have even had No Game, No Life. I don't, I'm, I, I'm not sure. I need to go back and see if I can check because that that would be kind of cool to own I guess actually if they have no game no life I will buy that because I have read the no game no life this is how retarded I am you all know a story here fun story about me being absolutely stupid no game no life one of my favorite anime but as everyone knows cancelled and never got renewed and ends on a sequel right I mean sorry ends on a, a cliffhanger uh, so the anime is great, but uh, then, you know, it ends on this sort of cliffhanger and then never got, season two never, right, never got continued, probably will never get continued. Uh, except in the form of the, the movie, No Game No Life Zero, which I think sucks and is also a prequel. Uh, I hate no, no Game No Life Zero, I did not enjoy that movie at all. So, eventually, I thought to myself, you know what, I want to know what happens next in No Game No Life is never getting a second season. I'm going to read the light novels. So, I read the light novels up until the point where the anime ends and then never finished them. I read diligently the light novels up until the end of the book, which is also the end of the first season, which I think is either the second or third book. I forget. Uh, I think maybe even longer than that. I actually don't remember. But I read all the books up until the end, the part of the story, which is also the end of the anime, and then I just never finished it. That's a, I don't know why I did that. But if I actually owned the physical copies of the books, I would hella reread through and finish No Game No Life. I doubt that they'll sell it in foils because, uh, you know, controversial content for normies. Um, but I definitely remember that they had back, they had the monogat they had some monogatari series volumes. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'd need to go back and check what light novels they have. But they also have a yeah a manga section. I remember they had a bunch of Inio Asano stuff. They had my lesbian experience with loneliness and its sequels. Uh, and they had some other stuff. I don't remember. It's been a while since I've been there. I think they had a bunch of Os uh, Osamu Tezuka stuff. I think they had maybe uh, Devil Man. Uh, maybe it might not. Maybe they didn't have Devil Man actually. Yeah, but what I'm saying is, zero moe. It's that no one is selling young comma manga in London. No one is selling any moe figures. Right? There's a few shops that sell like quote unquote anime merch, and it's just Dragon Ball shit and Naruto shit and Death Note and the stuff you'd find in like a hot topic. Like it's actually shameful. Like, it's to the point where I have been considering, like, for, like, three years, I have this fantasy where I'm like, I'm going to open up a fucking otaku shop in London, and it's going to be actually good. Problem is that none of the shows I like are popular. Like, you have to sell all of the fucking... Like, the reason that none of the, these places sell Moe stuff is because I think Moe fans are pussy-ass bitches who don't go outside, which is true, because I'm definitely one of those people. What the hell? Strange. Anyway, sorry, something weird happened. 
But yeah, so I ended up just randomly buying this volume. I didn't even buy volume one. They didn't have volume one. <laughs> I, I'm probably, you know what I've probably done is probably some guy came in, bought volume one, and is now going to come back to buy volume two, and it's not going to be there because I fucking stole it. And that's very funny to me. But yeah, I am probably never going to read this. I don't know. I don't even really like reading physical manga. I'm so used to reading it on my phone. Um, damn, the, I didn't realize the art style of the manga was so close to the anime. It's like identical. Uh, also, none of the puns are going to work in English. Why did I think this was a good idea? Nichijo is like the pun thing. Oh, whatever, man. I don't know why I just did that. Waste of fucking money. But yeah, that's my that's my story. That's my story of touching grass. But on the way there and on the way back, I was actually reading um, this manga. Really good manga. Shouts out to the Anon on, on A who recommended it to me. Uh, I've been reading uh, Transistor T Set. Highly recommend it. It's about it's a slice of life um, set during the period where Akihabara was transitioning from the electronics district to the Moe and Otaku district. Like, it's set in... It, it's basically like a Worlds Collide cute girls Yuri thing where one of the girls owns a maid cafe and the other one runs a electronics hobby shop and they're, like, right next to each other and they do Yuri stuff and there's, like, it's cute. It's very cute. The art's very very comfy and good. And it's quite funny. I like it. I've also been reading um, uh, Yumeguri Yure... What the fuck? Yumeguri Yuri Meguri. Oh my god, that's such a tongue twister. Yumeguri Yuri Meguri. Uh, which is, uh, as the description says on manga decks, gay girls and onsen. It's a, it's a slice of life by Ichigo Aoi uh, about onsen enjoying girls who do Yuri stuff vaguely. And that's also a really good manga, but there's too many onsen scenes for me to read that in public. <clears throat> it was very comfy, though. Uh, what else have I been reading manga-wise? I'm waiting for people... Like, a lot of the best manga is just not getting updated. Like, I'm, I'm really into... Well, actually, it got kind of bad, so never mind. I was enjoying Ani Toi Moto no Shitai 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 Koto, but yeah, it kind of got bad. Um, and then I've been enjoying uh, Onerori Kaba Club, but that's not getting updated. No one's translating it actively or something. Um, and obviously I'm still keeping up with Shimaji Simulation. Um, and there's a couple of isekai that I've been that I I read and I'm like sort of keeping up with like Kuma 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 Bear and Kamitachi Niho Hiro Hiro Wareta Otoko the the slime one and not slime girl isekai this the 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 guy who controls slimes isekai and uh, <clears throat> what else there was another one fuck oh yeah Kuma Desuka Nanika that's the other one. Those are the isekai I'm keeping up with. Also, obviously, still reading the Onimai manga. Um, and uh, also a manga called 16-Bit Sensation, which is another one set in the 90s. It's set in 1992, and it's about uh, some these cute girls who make a bishoujo game in the 90s. And it's very comfy. I recommend it, actually, although only two chapters are translated right now. Okay, well, I'm going to go back to reading Send and Banker now, because that's good. And that's what we do around here. So, this has been a very otaku-focused episode so far, and so was last episode. Uh, and I know only about half of my audience cares about that, but still, 50% is pretty good. <clears throat> I guess I should talk briefly about Counter-Strike 2's new update. Not that I'm in the beta, and also everyone's already heard about it. If you care, and if you don't care, then you don't care. Um, but the basic 
big deal update is that you now, instead of selecting your weapons from a weapon wheel, uh, before the match starts, you choose a loadout with, uh, what is it, five weapons from each category, so you get, f I think it's five, right? Hold on, let me, let me double check this. Uh, yeah, so you get five pistols, five mid-tiers, they're calling them, and five rifles, which means you can now do things like have both the M4A1S and the M4A4 in the same loadout. Uh, if you choose to do that. So probably the meta loadout is going to be M4A4, M4A1S, AWP, maybe like a... I think it's probably... I mean, those those three, 100%. Then maybe like a Galil slash Famas and Scout, I think is probably the meta layout pistol-wise. Or maybe Org. Uh, depends. Uh, but then... Do, I don't know, do I like this? Do I not like this? Um, I have a nostalgic attachment to the radial menu. Like, I really like the circle menu, uh, even though it's objectively bad uh, and, like, user-unfriendly. I'm just so used to it <clears throat> that, you know, I kind of like it. Uh, but it was, you know, at the end of the day, it's a menu that only exists because the game was designed for, like, the Xbox 360, and then turned into a... It was originally supposed to be a... I don't know if you guys know this, but uh, CSGO started life as a, a console port of Counter-Strike Source. Uh, and that's, yeah, that's the only reason it exists. And that's why that menu exists. Uh, so this is probably more PC-friendly. It's also much closer to how Valorant does things. Uh... You could say that choosing your guns at the start adds more strategy. I think in reality it just changes the strategic choice away from... Uh, like it traps you in a particular playstyle, right? Like you, you're you going to... I mean, there's there's obviously going to be a very like meta pick for like what sort of weapons to use. <coughs> to choose, I guess. Um, and there's some room I guess mainly in the mid tiers and pistols for like individuality but generally speaking I think I've, there's going to be a meta that's set for them and like everyone's going to use that uh, which is kind of annoying like I think it, it creates a problem in my opinion where uh, like you could choose to go for like a meme like no one's ever going to equip the M249 in this situation right because it's a meme gun. Whereas, you know, it was fun to, to mess around and get the M249 sometimes if you're, like, destroying. You know? No one's going to use the Sonoff on purpose. It's fun to just have these as, like, options because you never know how a match is going to go. Like, you never know if you're going to join a match and get matched up against absolute noobs and then destroy so hard that you want to do a bit of trolling with the, sh the Sonoff or something, you know? Uh... So it's kind of annoying. However, I think what this does mean, what a lot of people are saying, is that it means they're gonna they're gonna add new guns to the game. Uh, it opens up the possibility for them to like add a whole bunch of different guns to the game, and that's good if they do that. The second thing that's good about it is I'm so glad that I don't have to choose between the M4 and the A1, like the M4A4 and the M4A1S anymore. Not that I'm ever gonna. Not, well, I mean, I'll probably play CS2 when it comes out. But, like, I hate the fact that you have to choose one of them. Like, I would much rather have the option to switch it up depending on the round. But more importantly than that, the fact that you can have the Deagle and the Revolver. Because here's the thing about the Revolver. The Revolver is secretly a really good gun, but it only works if everyone on your team uses it. If you have a full stack of a revol full Revolver armor eco, it's super powerful. Because two body shots... Right, you have even if one person like tags someone with a body shot and then trades out, the other person just has to hit one body shot with a pistol. It's super easy, right? Like the revolver is unironically viable, but it only really works if the whole team's using it, or like at least you know just like yeah, like the whole team's running it, and you're never gonna. You, there's no way to get a whole team to run it because everyone has the 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 deagle equipped. 
Um, <clears throat> so that's good. More people using the revolver is good. Big fan of the revolver, personally. Even though I, I don't equip it because the beagle is just better in every way as a solo player. I really like the, the mechanics of the revolver. Like I think it's a cool thing to have in the game. So that's good. They also added a refund option. This is something that like everyone likes in general. I actually don't like the refund option because I, I've had a lot of good memories where I've like misclicked, bought a weird weapon by mistake and then popped off with it. Like that's a really fun experience for me. Is like accident, accidentally buying like a, a an MP9 or something, like buy, buying the wrong weapon on a round and then popping off with it by, like that's kind of sick. Uh, I don't know if that's actually a good thing to have it in the game, but I I kind of have some fun memories of that. But yeah, I don't think the refunds are like a terrible idea. You know, I think that's fine. Uh, yeah, I guess those are the big change. That's the big change to to Counter Strike. Uh, I mean, Dust Two got switched out with Mirage in the map pool, so that's whatever. Uh, was there anything else? I don't think so. Counter Strike. Guys, I don't know if any of you guys play TF2, but please, I just like spread the message of just teaching people just how to play 5CP. No one knows, like, I'm not good, okay? I don't play Sixes. I don't play Highlander. I'm not a good player. I'm like an average TF2 player. But I feel like people just forget how to play the game. The second the map is 5 CP instead of fucking it, like, you know, payload. I don't know why. I don't really understand it. It seems like people just refuse, like, sometimes people just refuse to push for no goddamn reason. Like, if, if we're on last, if we're, or like, if we're holding last, okay, the only thing that's going through my mind is I'm, I'm, my eyes are fucking glued to the top of the screen where it shows how many of the enemies are dead and I'm paying like maximum attention because when I play 5CP I really like to play sticky jumper demo generally speaking because the maps are super conducive to like really fast rollouts on like process and, and stuff like that Um, so if we're holding our last right and they've just had like a fail push or something Maybe, like, most of the team is dead, some of them are still alive. And the ones that are alive are trying to push last. I'm fucking sticky jumping right past the enemy team. I'm equipping the pain train, and I'm capping second. Okay? Because my team won't fucking do it. It's insane. Like, the amount of people who will just sit on their last and not even try to retake second when they get an advantage. All you have to remember is this... Super simple phrase when you're playing 5CP, okay? On 5CP, you push when you have an advantage and you hold on a disadvantage. It's really easy to tell when you have an advantage or a disadvantage. You either have more players dead or out of position or your medic's dead. You have a disadvantage. If you have Uber, if you have two medics, you know, in casual, you have two medics both doing well. If the other team has a lot of dead players or if the other team has a dead medic, you have an advantage. If the other team has Uber, it, they, yeah, they have an advantage. It's very easy to tell what team has an advantage or not. It's not some crazy game sense thing. I mean, it will take a while to learn, but by the time you're playing Uncle Topi or whatever, you probably already know it, right? You can probably tell what team has an advantage. But for some reason, I'm constantly fucking stuck... Whole, and my whole team refusing to push off of last, just holding for no reason. Why not just push? I I don't know. It's it drives me nuts. I I don't even hate the control point game mode. I don't even hate it. You know, it's it's got it's it's got a lot of options for movement, as sticky jumper demo, which is very fun. And if you can equip the pain train and do some wacky back capping, that is also very fun. Uh, 
not fun when the enemy team has two really good snipers and you have like one medic and you know three demo knights or whatever that's kind of annoying that kind of sucks also um for some reason i'm always the guy that switches to ng to hold last or well, i'm often the, that guy no one else will do it i i i will be the one who will switch to ng or uh heavy with the blast beast to hold last a lot of the time i find it fun for some reason heavy i do okay with ng i never am able to get it to work almost never the only time i'm able to get uh, like ng to work is on i'm actually forgetting the name of the map right now uh Hold on a second. Which one am I thinking of here? Uh, snake water. Snake water. Yeah. Snake water. I, I seem to do well with like with ng especially kind of a um what the fuck yeah well it, snake water last is de is decent to hold as ng a lot of the time but on like process and sunshine and uh those are like the the, the most popular ones Maybe, uh, yeah, anyway, I don't know why, but every time I'm pushing against an F or, or even Granary, right? Like, every time I'm pushing last and they have a level three, it's impossible. My team can, it, it, it's, it, it's like a fucking Hulk that is impossible to take down. And, but every time they're pushing last and I have a level three, they just fucking roll me instantly and nothing. I don't know why I'm so bad. I, like, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I'm not the best engineer player. I've watched, I feel like I've watched a bunch of Uncle Dane videos and learned nothing. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't know. Spies. Like, what happens is I, I set up my fucking level three. And then I guess they run into it. And then everyone on their team switches to spy, and then I'm like getting fucking targeted, and I can't do it. But then I don't know, man. I feel like the main thing is that when you're on last, you you really don't want to be on last. Last is not a good place to be. If you can just be on second, that's that's perfectly fine. Just be on just. I don't know, man. People are way too comfortable just sitting on last as if they're gonna actually be able to hold it they're not you're not it's not gonna happen also i feel like no one resupplies enough when they help you hold if you you have infinite free ammo and health and the enemy team doesn't why are you not going back to your spawn constantly to resupply i don't know but the main thing is why are you not pushing I hate this. This is all I'm trying to do. Spread this one message. If you're a TF2 player, or you know one, just try and remember the basic rule. Push the second you have an advantage in 5C on any any point, push. Don't just sit there once you take mid. You you I, I don't understand it. You take mid, right, at the beginning of a match. You take mid, and you can see... Oh, all their players are dead. Fucking go to second immediately to roll them. Don't sit there on mid waiting for all their players to respawn and come back. Why are you doing that? It, I don't know why. It's, it makes no sense. It, it's complete nonsense. Like, you could be turning this advantage into a big advantage. And instead, I, it's happened so many times. It keeps happening all the time. And look, I'm not saying I'm the best player. Technically speaking, okay, I miss my pipes. On I get demolished by scouts. I get demolished by air blasting pyros. 
and I, you know, miss air shots on rocket jumping soldiers. I and then you know half the time I fucking miss my pipes on a, a heavy who's standing still and revved up, right? Like I'm not the best player, and I'm not claiming to be. I'm not the guy that's winning out. I sometimes I am. I remember two days ago I was playing on uh, process. I think. Wait, no, was it Process? What map? What's it called? I forget the names of maps are very easy. It was not Process, it was uh, the other one that's popular. Uh, fucking Sunshine. Yeah, I was on I was on Sunshine. Wait, what was it? Did this happen? Did, did I dream this? <laughs> did I dream this? Did this actually happen? I'm pretty sure this happened. On Sunshine, and I, I, I had equipped... I was doing... Uh, Iron Bomber, Sticky Jumper, Pain Train. And my entire team was just sitting there on their second, not doing anything. Uh, refusing to push last for some unknown reason. And I just fucking Sticky Jumped down under the, the underground section. And then from, from, like, from that underground section onto their last while they were pushing out. And by the time the medic soldier combo that had just respawned noticed me and turned around it was already too late and I just solo capped their last and that felt good but it also felt like I, that was also the third time in that game I had tried to do that I I had tried to flank behind them and back cap three times and respawned after doing that three times, and my team still had not made any progress in pushing. I don't know why. I think, you know, if I really want to think about what I'm missing in TF2 right now, it is, I am not good enough at playing Medic, and I am not good enough at playing Soldier. I have tried to get better at Soldier, and I am just very bad. I Like, being good at Spy, I don't care. Like, yeah, maybe it would be nice, like... To learn the basic muscle memory of like t- t- sapping an NG, like backstabbing an NG and sapping the nest, that might be nice to learn. But you know, ever there are there are always going to be some tryhard spy mains that'll do your job. I don't know, but medic, like having a good medic on your team is basically a guaranteed win. Like if you can be a, if if your team ha- like I. I love playing like that's when the game is is at its best. Like it when when you have a goated medic on your team and like you can just actually rely on them and they're always in the right place and they have uber regularly. Man, it feels so good. It's like the game so everything comes so naturally. You don't just randomly die off of bullshit. You're not constantly having to run away to go back to health packs like having a good medic on your team who's actually doing their job properly like and doesn't lose uber like actually when you need to push and your med just has uber ready every time because they're just that good that's the fucking game man you just roll it it, just because one guy is good at the game but man medic is the hardest class in the the world to get good at because i play medic and every time I get to like fucking 97% Uber and then some soldier rocket jumps out of nowhere. I didn't even see him. A scout comes from behind. How did these scouts get behind you? I don't even understand it. But sometimes, you know, I've, I was pushing a same session as I actually did that. No, maybe it wasn't. It was a few days ago. I, it, I don't remember exactly when it was. And I was on, uh, I was... We were attacking... What the fuck is that map called? I, I'm i so bad with ma- remembering what, what maps are called. Man, it's actually... It's cringe. Uh, fucking... Honestly, I don't remember what it's called. Hold on. Ah, here we go. Here's the list. Uh, what is it? Swiftwater. Yeah. 
Swiftwater last. We were pushing Swiftwater last. And yeah, I went, I was, I was, we were failing. We were failing, we were getting shot down by two level threes. Swiftwater to last is a point that is very confusing to me. Because it feels like when I used to play it, it was the worst last in the game to hold. Like, basically, if the team got to last, they were gonna, like, the attacking team was guaranteed to win, pretty much. Because it was pretty easy to attack, right? Like, it didn't, the sentry spots weren't particularly, they didn't have any cover, flanks were too easy, you know, like, if you're attacking and you're, you basically, by the time you get to last, you basically won. Uh, like, it's really hard to hold. Uh, but now, I don't know what's happened, but it seems like now, the opposite is true. Now, it's, like, ridiculously strong and impossible to push. Because it's so spammable. And I don't know what happened. Like, snipers can shut down the that entire ramp section. If you get your level 3 sentries up, you know, like get two level three sentries on that last and it's you can't the problem is you can't destroy them because you can set them up in a crossfire situation where you can't fight one of them without having to be shot by the other one so your only choice is to push them with uber and that's the situation we were in and so i was like we only had one medic so i was i was i'd been playing um well, I think I was playing heavy the whole round. Yeah, I was playing cart heavy the whole game. But, no, no, I was playing pyro. That's what was happening. I was actually, yeah, yeah, yeah I remember now. I was dominating as pyro. I was actually fucking destroying as pyro some for some reason. I wasn't even doing, like, combos or flanks or anything crazy. I was basically just playing WM1 pyro. And for some reason, it was just going super well for me. My air blasts were all working out. Uh, you know, it was just going really well for me. But Pyro is completely useless for taking down NGs or anything like that. You know, there was nothing I could do. So I was I was like, fuck, I got to switch to like Medic or something because we can't push this last with just one Med. So I switched to Med and yeah, I'm building Uber. I'm building Uber. I'm like, I'm trying to stay as safe as possible. I get to literally like 90 something percent. I don't remember. And a scout comes from behind the entire team, and he's, like, right next to... I don't know. I don't understand. How did the scout get there? The only way to get around to the back would be to push through everyone. Did he, like, drink bonk or something? I don't understand. I didn't see him. He was just somehow behind us all of a sudden. And then he just fucking killed me. And I was so mad. I was so fucking mad about that. How did that scout get behind it? Anyway, this this is the shit that happens when I play Medic every time. I, It's so frustrating. It's just constantly, like, almost having enough time to build Uber, and they're just not quite getting it. And then you finally pop Uber, and you always pop it on the wrong person who just doesn't fucking do anything. By the way, I am that person. Never Uber me, because I have... N I am so bad. I mean, the real problem is... I'm almost never playing stock demo. So if you Uber me, I have four bullets. <laughs> I have four bullets, and I'm not going to... Let's be honest, I'm not going to be able to do shit with them. I, I... You know, the point of an Uber is you're supposed to take out multiple enemies. I don't have that capacity. It takes me two bullets to even... Two perfect pipes to kill one enemy. Assuming I don't miss... So, you know, max I'm ever going to be able to do with Uber is take out two guys, and then I get time to, like, reload once, and I might be able to do some damage to a third guy. That's, like, the maximum I can do. But most likely, I'm going to be taking out a sentry if I'm Ubered, right, and I'm pushing. I'm going to be taking out a sentry. That's going to take four pipes, three pipes, right? I, don't, I just don't have enough time to reload and, and do something else. So do, don't do it. Don't Uber me. If you see me in a game and you have a medic and you have Uber, use it on someone else. Un unless I'm playing pyro or heavy or something else, right? Um, 
The only exception is if I'm playing fucking bro, bro, bro. Most fun you can have is playing stock demo with a crits medic on Dust Bowl. I remember one day I was playing on Dust Bowl, trying. This is when I was trying to learn how to use the sticky bomb launcher properly. I'm still not very good with it. Uh, but yeah, I was playing stuck <sighs> on Dust Bowl, and there was a Crits Creek medic who was on our team. And uh, I guess this guy just just fucking loved me, because man. Crit stickies are so overpowered. I would just wipe the entire team with crit stickies, and it was so fun. You can take out, like, a heavy with one sticky. It's insane. Uh, so that was a good day. Anyway, sorry, I kind of ranted for too long. I was just trying to tell people to goddamn push on fucking control point maps. Let's do some more comment responses. I have... Epic, sexy morning voice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, from the last episode of the Slice of Life podcast. Um, sunset in... Oh, God. My, my katakana. It's been a long time. I don't remember what that says. Fuck. I need to really do Japanese again. If you guys don't know, by the way, um, let me tell you the story of me and the Japanese language. So when I was a kid, and by a kid I mean when I went to, so I went to primary school. I went to primary school. In the US they call it elementary school. Um, and the, the primary school I went to was an international school for complicated reasons explained in the video the conspiracy against me in school or whatever the fuck uh, but I went to this international school and there was a l relatively large group of Japanese students at this school which is kind of rare there aren't that many Japanese immigrants in the U or in London in general not that there aren't I mean there's immigrants from every country in London you can always find some community but um, there were way more, uh, when it comes to East Asian immigrants, then more commonly Chinese, especially from Hong Kong and Korean. There's not a super large Japanese population in London, although there is, it, it does exist. But what I'm saying is there were a higher number of Japanese students in my school than you would typically find in a school. And the reason for that is it's an international school their parents were all in the UK for business reasons um, and so there was a, a, a yeah, a sizable group of Japanese students and most of them didn't speak English and so they were all speaking Japanese to each other and trying to learn English and I thought they were very cool because they sort of hung out with each other they spoke in a language that no one else understood, you know I was like six at the time so I, I didn't really know what was going on they had their own playground games that were different from the ones that we played they seemed really interesting that's how I got interested in learning Japanese I asked my parents at some point if I could get Japanese lessons and then basically for my entire primary school life I took Japanese lessons actually even beyond that I think probably from the age of around eight all the way up to the age of around 13, I'm pretty sure I took Japanese lessons. Um, and uh, yeah, I forgot almost all of it because that is not how you, as I've discovered since then, uh, that is not how you learn a language. Doing a one hour lesson once a week is, you know, no, it, you know I used to think, oh, I just didn't study enough. Of course, uh, it's all my fault. But, oh, you know, now that I know more about language learning, no human being can learn a language with one hour of lessons once a week if you're not doing, like, unless you're doing relatively intense self-study outside of that, which I was not doing. Um, there was some homework, but the homework were re re pretty, pretty simple worksheets. Uh, so, yeah, and I, I never... I was pretty slow learning 
just because yeah i mean it's impossible to learn that much of a language when you're just not doing it that much i feel like on the internet it's pretty widely known how you learn japanese at this point you do like full immersion and anki deck for space repetition stuff and that's pretty much it and sentence mining all of the the stuff that people tell you about how to learn japanese ajat input focused you know uh but i did you know at the time even though i was doing very little practice i still did learn some stuff mainly basic vocabulary uh basic grammar and how to read hiragana and katakana uh although i forgot most of it because i stopped getting the lessons and then it took there was like a solid what like five year gap probably longer before wait let me see yeah there was a pretty long gap between me stopping japanese lessons and then getting into anime uh and obviously getting into anime is not enough to actually teach you japanese i mean i've definitely learned some japanese vocab from anime but uh i think the main thing that it's done for me in terms of underst understanding japanese is uh i feel like it's given me kind of an intuitive understanding of sentence structure but yeah i'm not going to claim that i fucking speak japanese or anything uh not that it would be like impossible to learn i think you know a lot of people they want to go very hard on japanese anyway sorry i'm kind of getting ahead of myself what i'm trying to get at is i don't fucking know what this katakana says uh Anyway, this person says, uh, if truncate silence shortens the duration su sufficiently to fit more content within the 12-hour limit, I support it. Otherwise, it has no impact for me. Uh, it, it actually does shorten the duration sufficiently. Uh, the, the last time I used truncate silence, I hit 12 hours, then truncated it, and it truncated me all the way back to like nine and nine and a half hours. So just cutting the silence cut uh like an hour or two and a half hours off the video uh but you know now we've got one vote for one vote against so i don't know what to do uh tdj hugh says how that's my fucking question for next time how uh, i have no idea uh, I, I'm, I, I honestly, n no idea how. Don't ask me. Okay, I'm going to say something a little controversial. I'm not the biggest fan of Noam Chomsky. This isn't the controversial part. I'm not the biggest fan of Noam Chomsky. I disagree with him on linguistics. I disagree with him on politics. Uh, I think he got bodied by Foucault in that one debate. Not the biggest fan of him, right? I disagree with him on Ukraine. <clears throat> I don't think he's the worst guy ever, but I'm not the biggest fan, right? Okay. But I'm now going to defend him because you may have heard that Chomsky was found to be on the flying list to Epstein's island. <clears throat> I do not think that Chomsky was involved in any of this sketchy business that Epstein was involved in, any of this, you know, sex trafficking stuff. I think that there are a lot of people who went to that island who weren't involved in this, particularly <clears throat> scientists and intellectuals. You can find a whole load of these intellectuals, scientists, physicists, social scientists like Chomsky who were invited to this island for these parties and stuff. And they're not rich. I'll tell you why they were there. So the idea is... Epstein's whole gig was that he was basically providing a whole bunch of these services and parties for the super wealthy, super rich people. And one of the, th the, the main thing that he would do is he'd be trying to make them feel really important, right? That's how he had his in. He, his whole deal is he wants to make these rich people feel like they're super important and deserving of all of their wealth. And so he'd invite all of these intellectuals to these parties 
so that they could be like, oh, no, this isn't like, you know, they're thinking to themselves, oh, I'm rich asshole or whatever. I'm going to this party to fuck underage girls or whatever. <laughs> and uh, but, you know, in reality, look at all of look, I'm invited because I'm on the same level as uh, Noam Chomsky and all of these other intellectuals. That's, you know, I'm a master of business. They're a master of their sciences. We're all here in this sort of elite place. And the, these intellectuals are going because uh, Epstein's giving them money to, to fund their science or to fund whatever. I, because he, he wants to create that environment where all of the super rich people <coughs> feel like they're important. That's the setup. I don't think that people like Chomsky and all of the physicists and stuff that, that were going there were going there because they they wanted to participate in all of the sketchy dealings. I think they were going there because they wanted to cozy up to Epstein because Epstein was giving them grant or giving them money outside of the grant system, which is, you know, what they ultimately want. Um, <clears throat> you know, is it appropriate for these people to be doing that? A hundred percent no. Uh, Chomsky should not have been doing that. He has a, He's one of the most well-known academics in the world. He could get money to fund whatever the fuck he wants to fund. He's not in financial trouble. He doesn't need to be doing this. He shouldn't have done it. Uh, strange that he decided to. Kind of weird, right? Big anarchist guy? I guess I'm going to go hung out, hang out with all of the super wealthy billionaires. Weird decision. Strange thing to do. Um, but I don't think that he was, you know, very odd decision, but I, I don't think that he was doing any of this, uh, you know, extremely bad stuff. That's my personal opinion. So I had a pretty uneventful day today. Nothing, uh, super interesting happened. Main interesting thing that happened is my new anime posters arrived, which I'm very excited about, and I'm looking at them right now and enjoying it a lot, which is a poster of, well, you'll see it all in the video I made today, which is a, a room tour, but uh, got my Yamano Susume poster, which is really, I really like the design of the poster, it's super detailed, and the, the composition is very good, it like demonstrates the personalities of all the characters, while also being like natural and the art looks great. It's a really good poster. I like it a lot. Uh, got my Subahibi poster, which is also amazing. Um, got my Koini Kami Osoete poster, which is cute. And my poster of Murasame from Senden Banker. Speaking of Senden Banker, I also finished Lena's route today. And I think I can safely say that contrary to my initial thoughts, Lena's route is probably the best in the game, although it is almost certainly best left for after you've completed all the other routes because it adds a lot of context and stories and it kind of relies on knowing what happens in the other routes to sort of flesh out your understanding of what's happening in Lena's route. Um, I would generally recommend reading Lena's route last if you're going to read the visual novel. Uh, <clears throat> this is confusing. Why is this computer still turned on, even though I turned it off? There we go, now it's turned off. That was odd. Uh, yeah. Uh, so that's pretty much what I did. Played some Team Fortress 2, as I am known to do. And didn't really do much else besides that. I started... I mean, yeah, pretty uneventful day. Main thing that happened was anime posters. And it's very annoying because I told myself I wasn't going to buy any more posters after this. But now I'm looking at my wall and there's like, the just based on the spacing, there's a, a clear gap that like really looks like it wants to be filled. Right, like that's kind of an eyesore. <laughs> uh, there's like a very clear gap. I think I just need like one poster to put in there and it would just to fill that gap and it would look way better. Um... So I'm going to, like, I don't know, try and make 15 bucks <laughs> in order to buy a poster so I can excuse it for myself. How am I going to make 15 bucks? Um, no idea. I will have to uh, figure something out. I can make some money, probably. I don't know. 
patreon.com forward slash no thank you link in the description help me to afford more anime posters I actually will not be spending your Patreon money on anime posters, just to be clear. I know I joke about this. Patreon money goes directly into funding music 100% of the time. Uh, I, I try and not spend any Patreon money on, like, frivolous shit. I try and, like, keep track of my income. And I spend, I spend Spotify money and, like, streaming service money on posters. But the Patreon money, it's not very much, but I try and save it up and keep track of it and then... I try and spend it on, like, for example, when the string broke on my bass, that money came from Patreon that I used to buy more strings. Um, when I bought my Mac, uh, some of that money came from Patreon. It wasn't enough to afford the whole Mac, but yeah. I try and spend Patreon money on music stuff exclusively. Uh, obviously I'm not keeping track of everything perfectly, like, it's all the same money, it's all going into the same account, but I do try and, like, I don't know, just for my own, because it just doesn't, it just doesn't feel right, you know, if people are donating to me because they like my music, or they like my videos, and I'm just spending the money on anime posters, it feels weird to me. Anyway, uh, internet's fixed these days, that's good, but yeah, nothing really particularly special happened today. I have a new video idea that I'm kind of considering working on, but it would be kind of effort, because it requires writing a script and editing. Uh, it's definitely something I can do in a day, but it would require setting aside most of a day to make, to write, record, and edit. Uh, probably take pretty much a whole day to do. And I don't want to do that until I finish this visual novel. Uh, so, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm. It's taken me so long to finish, to read this thing. Like, I should have finished this, like, three days ago. The only reason I didn't is because... I've just been reading it super slow since I spent half the time, like, reading it on the, on the second monitor while I'm playing TF2, which, you know, I just tab over when I die, and it's a very slow process. Uh, anyway, yeah, that's pretty much it. Very happy with these posters. They all look super, super sick. Visual novels are too damn long. You know what's fucked up is that, like, the two best visual novels of all time, at least according to consensus, one of them is literally longer than the entire Harry Potter series combined, and it's called Umi Neko When They Cry, and the other one is supposedly the best visual novel ever made, but you can't read it unless you read the prequel, the first one, which is not very good and is equally long. So you have to sit through... 50 hours or so of the first Marv Love game before you can play Marv Love Alternative, which everyone says is the best visual novel ever made. I don't know if I will care about... I have not got any plans to, like, read Marv Love anytime soon. It's not that high up on my priorities. Uh, I'm trying to make my way through some of the, the Moage type shit first. But, yeah... You know, Kendo, Kendo is kind of a major, or well, like a, an important part of the plot of Senran Banka. Uh, I realized I don't think I've ever actually seen a Kendo match, so I looked one up. I looked some up on YouTube. This is the lamest sport ever. <laughs> this is an absolute, well, maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm missing something, but it's incredibly lame. Like, they, they, I don't even know what to say. It's very lame. There's no other word for it. It's extremely uncool. And, uh, I don't know, man. Like, they spend most of the time just with their sword hilts vertically pressed up against the other guy, which I guess is kind of like a clinch in boxing. It's like the same kind of thing. Or like a bind in Hema. But it's different because in Hema, when you're in a bind... There's, like, a whole bunch of strategy to it. Whereas in, in Kendo, the only way they ever get out of that clinch-type situation is when they just both decide to step back. And only sometimes when they're deciding to step back, one of them just hits the other guy on the head. And I'm like, well, why didn't you just put your sword up there so you wouldn't get hit on the head? Like, all you have to do is not get hit on the head, and they only hit you vertically. 
it can't be hard to block. I don't understand. Is there rules against when you're allowed to block? And it doesn't make any sense to me. You just have, like, isn't they're not even that, like, they're fast, but it's not like, I mean, you can, you can, you can see it coming, <laughs> you know? Now, I don't know. I would definitely lose a kendo fight to someone who was good, obviously. I don't really even know the rules. Um, but I don't know, man. <laughs> It seems like they're not even, like, blocking isn't a thing. No one even really tries to block. It's, it seems to be very much about spacing. But, like, there's not really any strategy, it looks like. Because it's all just a one-hit type of thing. And it's only really in the head, it seems like, that they go for, go for. I guess that gets you, like, the most points. Or maybe the only way to get points. So there's, there's not really much, like to it <laughs> there's not much to it it's not they just sort of stand there and then one of them tries to hit the other one on the head that's, that's it it's very lame I don't know what to say and the, yeah I was very surprised I always expected Kendo to be a little more interesting than that like I, I thought it was kind of like a fast paced quick draw quick draw kind of situation which I guess it kind of is at first but most of the times, it's not like that. Like, even when they do feints, the feints are very simple. And it always, it, it seemed to me, you know, I watched a Kendo match, and one of the guys, he won a point off of the other guy, I guess, with a feint. But the feint was, like, super obvious, and the other guy didn't even try. He literally just stood there. I don't understand what's happening. Why didn't he even, like, it was very clear from their spacing from each other that he wasn't going to be able to hit him from that angle. Like, if he's swiping down and saying, here, at the same time, and stepping forwards, it's very clear that he's going to miss. The, it's like, is that why he didn't bother defending? I don't know. I don't understand. A weird sport. What a weird fucking sport. Maybe, like, there's rules about when and how you're supposed to defend. That, that's my only guess. Because otherwise, it doesn't make any goddamn sense. I don't know, man. I have done it. I have officially finished Senden Banka. It took me 75 hours, uh, but I did it. I fucking finished the game. <laughs> Holy shit. Uh, I think I need to... I don't know what I need to do, to be honest. I don't know... Um, <laughs> I don't know, because that's. I can't be playing these games for that long every time. I need to, I need to, like, focus on the game when I'm playing the game. I mean, I don't know. Maybe I don't need to. Maybe I don't need to think about this too much. But anyway, yeah. I finished Sen and Banker. Uh, it was good. I think I would definitely say it was good. Um, would I say it was very good in parts? Yes. Um, overall, honestly... It's been so long since I played through the common route that I barely remember it anymore. I, I remember the plot beats because they get referenced, but I don't remember the actual experience of playing it that well. Um, I remember enjoying it, but I don't remember if I thought it was amazing. I think I would give it a high 7, like a maybe like a 7.5. You know what? I think I'm going to give it a 7.5. Uh, I think I'm pretty happy with that. Um, it was good, yeah. Uh, routes in order of best to worst I would say the best routes are tied between Lena and Mako uh, Mako has the best character or characterization characteristics uh, the most interesting person I suppose of the bunch the most interesting character arc yeah that's what I would say Mako has by far the most interesting character arc of anyone, uh, whereas Lena has the most interesting, uh, well, uh, how it how her story ties into the rest of the plot is the best, and the specific activities and conversations and just general dialogue and writing is the best in her route. Uh, followed, so those two are sort of tied for the best. Uh, probably Lena might be slightly higher, I'm not sure. They're both good uh maybe lena's h scenes are slightly better so that's the only thing that might tie tie me over to to her but yeah 
Um, the next best is Murasame, um, and then uh, uh, Yoshino. Uh, there's nothing wrong with uh, well, yeah, Murasame's route is fun. I talked about it. Yoshino's route, while it's not bad, it's the most generic out of the main heroines, and that means it's just sort of the least unique and the least interesting in terms of the story that happens and in terms of the romance. Uh, although there's definitely chemistry there, um, and it's by no means bad, I think it's the least special. There's the least sort of, you know, it's very really main heroine vibes, is what you expect from the main heroine's route, which is oftentimes somewhat generic. Uh, and then for the side characters, uh, the side heroines, you've got Roka and Koharu. Uh, Roka is the, or Roka is the better of the two. Um, her, the story is just better, she's just a more interesting character. Koharu, despite being kind of an on, uh, an Emoto type, which is a character archetype I generally like, I didn't find particularly interesting. Uh, even though she's kind of Emoto type, they don't really play the Moe up very well, in my opinion. Didn't didn't give me any strong feelings of Moe, which was a little disappointing. Um, whereas uh, Roka has some really good gap Moe. Even though, obviously, they're side heroines, they're not as good as the main heroines, and they're not, you know, the roots aren't as long, the stories aren't as complex, the characters aren't as deep. Uh, I thought Roka was a nice little comfy story just in its own. Like, honestly, I would, yeah, like, if, if it was just a, if just, if just the, the side heroine route, which you sort of branch off from the main story into a route that has its own story, where you end up running a cafe with these two, and then that can branch into either one. Like, honestly, that on its own would be, like, a pretty comfy visual novel. Like, it was pretty comfy. Uh, and, yeah, Roka has the, the more interesting characterization and the, the better writing, in my opinion. So, yeah, that's Senlen Banka. I would say uh, it was pretty good, yeah. Uh, I think they... Used a lot of aspects of Japanese folklore very well in the story that sort of tie everything together nicely. The side characters are all interesting and not just like 2D. Well, they're 2D, but you know what I mean. They're not flat. They have depth to them. Anyway, I, I don't want to talk about this for too long because I've spent nothing. I've done nothing but talk about this visual novel for the past like five hours of this, of whatever. Uh, yeah, but I finally finished it. Hooray! Now I've got to decide what to read next because I'm, I, I'm, I was enjoying that. Uh, yeah, I was enjoying. So okay, blah, blah. so my main decision, right, is between here's my here's my three competitors. We've got um, King Koi, right. Kinero Love Reich, that's one of them. Uh, and then Koi Nikami Osoete 2, that's another one. And also, possibly, I'm, I'm kind of interested in Renai Karichamai Karichai Mashta. Renai Karichai Mashta. That seems kind of interesting to me. I'll have to look into it. Uh, but anyway, you guys don't care. Visual novels are so hard for me. It's such a hard... Okay, what I, what I mean is... Visual novel recommendations are so hard for me. It's so hard for me to know what's going to be good. It's impossible. Like, I know some studios that I like, right? Like, that's... But even then, you know, they often vary between the ends. And the real tough thing or annoying thing is that I don't know whose reviews to trust like you'll see visual novels with perfectly believable reviews on either side so for example the reason that I didn't just like, like so so Kinero Love Reich is like a very highly rated moe gay. it's one of the highly most highly rated moe gay generally considered to like you know widely praised but you go on VNDV almost all of the reviews are really positive, but then some of them say stuff that is 
really specifically stuff that I don't like in visual novels, and that's what scares me. That was my Discord notification, not yours. So, for example, you know, every almost all of these these comments are are uh, positive, but then once in a while, someone will complain about forced melodrama. And, you know, I'm one of these people that fucking hates forced melodrama. Although, I will say, for some reason, it's way more tolerable in visual novels than it is in anime for me. And I'm not sure why. Probably just because they're longer and have more time to, like, flesh out the characters. So, maybe I should just be playing fucking King Koi. The character designs aren't super appealing to me. That's another thing. And the third... The, the, these are the three things that are keeping me from just diving straight into Kinyo or Love Life. Uh, the fact that it d- definitely is more on the slice of life drama side of things, especially it seems like I'm trying not to read any like spoilers, but it seems like further on the the, the drama side of things, particularly with one of the roots, is what I'm reading. I don't know which route or when, but people say like the last route that you read has this big some sort of twist in it that is very drama filled. That's the first thing. The second thing is that it's it's long. It's it's probably equally long as uh, Senran Banker was. Maybe a little shorter. But yeah, it's it's all, it's another long one, which I don't know if I can do another long one right now. And then the third reason is, yeah, the character designs aren't super appealing to me, which, you know, a little annoying, because I didn't really like... You know, whatever. If I'm going to do romance roots, I want to be... I want to find the character designs appealing. So th- those are the three things I'm. Those are the three things that are putting me off of reading Kino or Love Rush right now. My other options are Renai Karichai Masha. Now the reason that I want to read this is, firstly, it's sh- relatively short. VNDB lists it as twenty six hours long, and secondly, it's by the same studio as Skitoski de Sankaku Renai, which is the funniest visual novel I've read, and I really liked it. Which, you know, gives me good vibes as to whether this would be funny, right? And I mean, people say it's funny. So, uh, you know, that's a positive. And then also, uh, Koini Kamio Soeta 2, which is probably a more diabetes kind of thing. So, you know, I'm stuck between, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I don't know if I even should be diving. Maybe I should be taking a break from visual novels for a while. I honestly don't know. Um, and the problem is, you know, I if this was anime, I would just watch the first episode. Because, you know, I have the same problem with anime where I, I don't trust anyone, right? Like, oftentimes some of my favorite shows get reviewed, like, 6 out of 10 on Mal. Like, but if it's an anime, I can just watch the first episode, and then I can generally tell from the first episode if a show's going to be good or bad. But visual novels are very different. They're much, much longer. They take a much longer time to get going. You can't just read the first chapter and know if you're going to like it or not. And even if you can, reading the first chapter is like a pretty big commitment. It's still like five hours <laughs> or so. So, yeah, this, this, is, this is kind of the annoying thing. Um... So I just gotta fucking I don't know, rack my brains about it. I might I might ask on the uh the visual novel subreddit or something. I don't know. Maybe they have a Discord I can ask in. It might be kind of obnoxious to ask. I'm sure people come around looking for recommendations, noobs like me. But uh yeah, I don't I don't fucking know, man. I've always sucked at playing medic in TF2, like I've switched to medic when a team needs a medic on a few occasions and I've always sucked. And then the other day I saw a video of a good medic and I realized the only reason that I've sucked at playing medic is, well, there's a, there's, there's a few reasons, there's a few reasons, but the number one thing that I wasn't doing that I should have been doing was just using the, the, the bow, the, the crossbow more often. Like that was lit, that's literally the number one thing that lets you output more healing. And that's why I've, that's like number one, the instantly improved 10x at Medic has just been, uh, fucking use the crossbow. And it also makes it way more fun because the crossbow actually requires aiming. And the second thing 
that's helped me improve a medic is just generally trying to pay attention to like people's roles in the team like who right now not only is low on health but also like needs that health the most right like in terms of a like how do i put it on a on a on a macro scale right not just on a on a person by person scale but on a scale of like for your team's strategy like as medic you're setting the pace for the entire team right like if you want to push up you hit your healing the aggressive players if you want to if you want to hold you're healing the defensive players you as medic set the, the the pace for your team previously i was scared to switch to the crossbow too much for a couple of reasons firstly i was scared of missing my shots i have since realized that it really doesn't matter if you miss your crossbow shots like nine out of ten times missing a crossbow shot is no big deal and secondly i thought you had to play like super passively all the time that's one thing uh because i was thinking that your main role was really building uber but i've realized your main role is making your team survive longer keeping people from dying <laughs> which sounds obvious like i i thought building uber was my main goal so i should hang back to make sure that i'm like you know surviving as long as possible so that i can build uber and then pop uber on you know some some random guy and it would always fail and the the reasons that it wouldn't go super well i've since realized is that i wasn't you know although i was helping my team i was basically just acting as a moving like a slightly moving dispenser i was just a human dispenser right not not acting as a proper medic because i wasn't healing my team properly you know i was just sitting at the back people would fall back to me for heals and then run back to the front line when really i should be on the front line if i want people to be pushing right and then the second reason it wouldn't work is i talked about how i always died with like almost full uber again i was paying way too much attention to uber and not enough attention to healing uh, and like keeping people keeping people up uh and the problem is that when you hang on the back line in order to conserve preserve the fact that you know your your uber so that you don't die the problem is that there's a whole bunch of classes you know who have mobility options that get them directly to the back line and if you're a medic sitting there you're like their number one target so hanging back is a really good way to get a, you know some of your uber filled but it's not a good way to actually survive for a long time and and use that uber right because uh eventually some sticky jumping demo or rocket jumping soldier or bonk drinking scout is going to end up behind you and you're going to die to them and there's nothing you can do about it uh and that's yeah that's a problem i'm about to die now <laughs> I think that was a pretty fun comical death. I I I I rocket I I sticky jumped and then I got shot in the air down to one health and I was like fuck I'm going to die now and I landed directly in front of I I literally called for medic in the air and landed directly in front of the medic and the medic just like saw my body land on front of him and just like looked up dramatically it was pretty pretty amazing. Oh damn, we're actually about to win this game. That's crazy. It's unexpected. Oh no, maybe not. If no one kills this fucking pyro, we're not going to win. It looks like I'm not going to be able to do it. Okay, there we go. So yeah, those are the two things. It turns out to maximize your survivability, you don't want to be alone in the back, healing people like a dispenser. You want to be basically in the middle where there's a bunch of people around you to defend you. and secondly use your crossbow like a lot uh building uber is not your main job your main job is keeping your teammates alive for longer uh those are, and and that your positioning and who you're choosing to heal sets the pace of of your entire team which is honestly a lot of responsibility and uh very difficult but medic 
when you're playing it correctly is very intense gameplay wise and that's what I you know had always but it, it, it all comes down to that goddamn crossbow and having like this is why medic has the highest skill ceiling of any class because you don't really output damage very well right like even you have a, a weapon that's really hard like not easy to aim which is the crossbow it's not really hard to aim but it's really hard to output damage with right you do like 40 something damage generally speaking at least that's the number that pops up on my screen <coughs> uh, so you can't hold your own which obviously you're a medic uh, but yeah I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about oh my fucking god are you kidding me there I was okay let me tell you what happened so I was fucking playing Kinero Love Rush great so far okay great no complaints amazing game so far right I'm sitting there playing it and I'm like uh I'm kind of getting bored of sitting on the desktop. I think I'm gonna go to my room and use Steam Remote Play to, to play this on my uh, ThinkPad. Which is something that I've done with uh, Zenman Banker. You know, it's something I've done with other games and visual novels before many times. It's not a weird thing to want to do. It's not even when, what went wrong, right? But there I was, so I was like, okay, I'll go try this Steam Remote Play this game and and I can go sit on my bed and play it because that's that's more comfy for me right now so I get on my ThinkPad set up and then for some reason on my ThinkPad uh, the option to play uh, the, to stream the game isn't showing up on Steam and I'm like huh that's weird normally it shows up if it's running on another computer that's very strange uh, so I'm like thinking I don't know what's gone wrong here uh, strange. So I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm like, what's going on? So I think the first thing that comes to my head, I'm like, well, I could restart the, com I could restart both my computers. First of all, I'll try doing a, a pseudo Pac-Man SYU. You know, I'll, I'll just try, uh, you know, uh, updating my system because that could also be a problem right there's like the two two if you run into a troubleshooting the two things you try first is update the system and uh you know up update your system and restart right so and i'm like well i'll update first because then when i restart the changes will take effect so it's like killing two birds with one stone so well, there's nothing strange about that right uh one second anyway i i, I run a quick pseudo pacman syu on my ThinkPad and on the desktop, and uh, ThinkPad everything goes fine. Desktop, I come back because I just went to piss while I was up, while I was doing it. Come back, it's on my fucking login screen. I'm like, that's not good because I remember the last time that I ran an uh, uh, an update, that I tried to update my system and it booted me to the login screen halfway through, and it had deleted my kernel and I had to reinstall my OS. <laughs> I remember that happening. Uh, let's hope that didn't happen this time. Uh, it happened this time. Uh, my fucking entire computer got bricked. Linux moment. This has never happened before, by the way. This is like a new problem. I don't know what it is, but uh, whatever. So, and this is Manjaro. I was running Manjaro on the desktop, right? This isn't Artix. Uh, and Manjaro is like popular, right? I don't know what the fuck happened. I think my current opinion is it's a bug in BSPWM. That's my current opinion. Um, obviously, I don't actually know that for sure, but that's my theory. I think it's causing, I think something is causing BSPWM to crash. And then that kicks, that like ends the process. That's, this is my, this is my schizo theory, right? Because I'm using a terminal emulator on my desktop. So I think when my wind, like, I think when some background thing gets updated to point to a different thing like something maybe the kernel something is getting updated to point to a different thing it causes bspwm to crash which which boots me out to the 
this is my theory. I have no idea if this is what's actually happening. Because that's the only commonality. I mean, the only other thing is that they're both Pac-Man, but I don't know. Uh, you know, I don't see how that could be a problem. That There are loads of very important corporate servers that use Pac-Man and don't run into this problem. Pac-Man's generally very stable. It's considered one of the better pack package managers, right? Like, I don't. I highly doubt it's an issue with that. I don't... The only thing I can think of is it's either a bug in BSPWM or it's a bug in my particular setup for BSPWM. Um, and that's what's causing it. Because uh, now it's happened twice, which is not good. So I've just had to reinstall my OS, except this time I just picked my... I have this USB, I just picked it up, I was like, this probably has Linux on it, I didn't even check. It turns out it has Artix on it, probably from when I reinstalled it on my ThinkPad, and so I just installed Artix now instead of Manjaro, because um, fuck it, it doesn't really matter, right? Um, so now I'm fucking installing Steam again on the desktop and stuff, and I gotta get all this stuff set up. And it's very annoying. Uh, yeah. Now I'm I'm really hoping that my save got saved in the Steam cloud. It shouldn't matter, right? Like, surely, sh surely it doesn't matter, right? Uh, I I know the Steam cloud saves are a real thing. Let's hope that this works, because obviously I won't have it downloaded now. Uh, okay, it's updating Steam. Uh, well, this is a fucking pain that I didn't want to go through. Now I have to reinstall Team Fortress 2 and Keen Koi. I don't think I have anything... Fortunately, I don't think there's anything important, particularly on this computer, that I'm aware of that I remember. I had some notes. I had a notes file, but I think it was just random shit. Like, I I can definitely remember writing many notes in that file. I can almost never, I can remember very little times when I've actually checked back on the notes in that file, which makes me think there was nothing important there. I don't have any super important documents. I, I mean, I have a bunch of TF2 clips, but, you know, they're, they're just bad clips of bad my bad gameplay. Uh, let me log into Steam with the, the QR code. How do I do that? There we go. Uh, just scan it. Okay, that should work. Yes, I am now logged in. Now let's find out why well, I have to install all my games now. I have to install all of my games. Team Fortress 2, install. And... Uh, King Koi. Oh, it won't install now. I guess I have to go properties, compatibility, force the use. Okay, now we can install it because I can just use Proton. And hopefully this works. It says cloud status up to date. So we'll see how this goes. But yeah, other than the fact that my entire computer just crashed. Uh, and, uh, well, not just crashed, but bricked. There is a way to do this, by the way. Like, if this happens and you, like, there is a way to inject a kernel into the computer, like into your old OS, it's just a massive fucking pain. And I've, I've tried it and never been able to get it to work. I know it's theoretically possible, uh, but yeah. Yeah, very annoying. I might end up, it, because I theorize that this is an issue with VSPWM, even though I like VSPWM so much and I have this config that works out super well, firstly, tiling window manager on a desktop doesn't really work super well. I'm just being honest with you. Um, I, I, I now I've I've never you you know up there there yeah, holy shit. Floating window manager desktop better is what I'm getting at here. Like here I'm not on a like keyboard focused approach. I'm on a mouse focused approach because I have a mouse on a desktop. 
So there's not really that much point in having a, a tiling window manager, which the main thing that I actually use from BSPWM is uh, the, the workspaces. And I'm pretty sure there's a way to, I mean, XFC definitely has workspaces. Also, it's amazing how XFC just works. Like I didn't have to configure the double monitor setup. It just instantly knew and got it and it's working seamlessly. Like XFC is a wonderful piece of uh, software. Um, yeah, it, I mean, Artix downloaded and installed in literally two minutes. Like this was really not much of a pain at all, to be honest with you. Like I'm, okay, let's see if this game works. Play. Okay, let's see. Does it remember my save? Continue. It remembers my save! Fuck yeah! Let's go! Okay, we have... I mean, literally, if I just get my old wallpaper back, this is basically everything back to how it was. Like, I just need to install a few more programs. Like I'm gonna probably install. Hmm, let me see if I, if I, because the the number one thing that I like about my main setup is having a D menu. Like D menu is more like Pog menu. Am I right? Um, I might try Rofi. I might try Rofi. Don't you like Rofi requires like a bunch of configuration. D menu just works. Uh, wait, no, you have to use D menu underscore run, right? And then, yeah, this all works. So that's nice. Because I, I don't like this, like, start menu stuff. I guess you can use the start menu search bar kind of like D menu. Like, yeah. All right, whatever. I'll just stick with this for now. Let me just get a wallpaper that isn't the default XFCE mouse wallpaper. Um, and then, <sighs> that's fucking annoying, that's very annoying, but also nowhere near as annoying as it could have been. To be perfectly honest with you, I'm, I'm although having to reinstall an operating system is annoying, uh, I do want to say, I had the computer back up and running, Steam installed, game downloaded, save saved, and back reading in like, what, five minutes? It was astonishingly fast. And honestly, I'd been meaning to switch from Manjaro to something else on that desktop for a while, because Manjaro has a couple of minor annoyances. And I'd been thinking about switching off of BSPWM on that computer as well, because as I said, it's not that great for a mouse-based workflow. So honestly, not that bad. The only annoying thing that I went through was I decided, because I've also been using Cube Browser on that computer, which again, not that great on a desktop with a mouse. So I decided to install LibreWolf as my my browser, and I, I had to compile it from scratch, which took fucking forever. It took forever to compile, but it's done now. So the only annoying things left to do are like signing into stuff, uh, but that that's fine. Um, yeah, honestly, also, I'm currently playing Kini or Love Rush on my ThinkPad streaming from the desktop, so it works now. <laughs> it works now. Um, and speaking of this game, I know I said I'd finish Strike Witches. I will do that. But speaking of Kini or Love Wish, I, I need to pronou decide which way I'm pronouncing this. I have a migraine. I've had a, like a weird fucking brain thing all day. I'm kind of out of it, but... Speaking of this Kinyo Loverish, I'm just going to call it Kinkoi, because that's what it's called. That's what the English title is, for some reason. Kinkoi. Which I guess is a good name.
So I'm just going to call it King Koi. The thing about King Koi is, it's fucking amazing. <laughs> like, I am very glad I decided to play this over the other two. Um, although I did, I, I, I did download, um, well, I actually, I've had Koini Kami or Soate 2 on a hard drive since I played the first one. I downloaded them both at the same time. So that's, I have, I have everything I plan to play downloaded already. And I have the other one that I, Renai Karichai Master or whatever it's called also. So I can play anything I want, really. I can do whatever the fuck I want, bitch. I can do whatever the fuck I want. But I'm glad I decided to play this one. And by the way, I actually bought this on Steam. Using the last of the money from selling all my CSGO cases. Uh, which is the best decision I've ever made, to be honest. Selling all these... Like, the thing is, if it was this easy to pay for anime, I might even do that. I don't know, but... Yeah, CSGO is like universal basic income for retards. Um, <laughs> it just drops you these cases, and then you just sell them and make real money. I made a hundred quid, and I bought like literally three visual novels, a video game, and like a, a few TF2 cosmetics with it. It's crazy. I, want, I need to, now I'm thinking about selling more stuff. I don't even own more stuff. Anyway, uh, I, the only decent item I have in TF2 is my Deagle, because it has some stickers on it, and even that's probably worth about, I mean, I don't even know how much it's worth, but less than £10, 100%, maybe less than £5, I'm not sure. Uh, it's kind of hard to judge these things, because I don't really know much about CSGO skins and their prices. Uh, yeah, but King Koi is amazing. Okay, I I I don't even have to play through like just for how good it's been so far. It's it's I'll tell you the the positives and the negatives, okay? Main positive for this game is the dialogue. It's so natural and well-rounded, I suppose. Like it doesn't feel like shitty visual novel dialogue. It it feels like I'm not going to say it feels like real people because it doesn't. It still feels you know, anime or whatever, but naturalistic is the best word for it. Like the main character, sort of. This is I, I don't know. This isn't what this phrase means, but the main character sort of code switches depending on who he's talking to in a very realistic way, in a very like believable way that like feels, you know, flows very well, and like the way each characters they all have sort of unique chemistry in a really uh yeah I don't have any other word for it than natural like and, and emotionally believable like it just it all fits very nicely you can tell they put a lot of work into this game like there are, this game has so many like unique cgs for situations that like Clearly, they did a lot of work in this game, right? Like, the voice acting is also generally high quality. The music's a bit generic. Uh, my main complaint about the game is a matter of taste, which is, uh, although the art is all very technically impressive, um, and there's also a lot of it, and it's highly detailed, there are a lot of different expressions, the sprites are, you know, expressive and... Lots of different outfits, lots of different unique CGs and stuff like this, right? Uh, there's some stuff about... I just don't like it. <laughs> I don't really like the art style. I also think that some of the anatomy is just a bit off, uh, which is not unusual for visual novels. But yeah, some of the anatomy is a little bit off, especially around the neck area, which is something that people have trouble with, seemingly, in visual novels. It's not distractingly bad, but it's definitely not my favorite looking game. The background art is painfully generic, even... I mean, when I say generic, I mean, like, it doesn't have any style. It's, like, very workmanly. 
workmanly is that even a word it doesn't have a, it doesn't have a style it doesn't have an aesthetic it just is like draw this place you know and even if the place is interesting which sometimes it is right like you know every setting and environment isn't soup like they they're doing some stuff they've put some thought into the architecture and the framing like it's not like the buildings or the the rooms or the the outdoor settings are the settings themselves are generic it's the, the the art style in which they're drawn is just very generic which is also typical of a lot of visual novels like it's not bad per se it's just not interesting uh and i i think the same can be said about the art and character designs um yeah i i'm really not a big fan of the character designs in this game uh except i mean ria is definitely the best designed character no fucking question no competition not even close the only character with a good design um yeah that's the main thing the game's lacking which to be honest isn't that important because the focus is really on the dialogue and and storytelling which you know and I, look i'm not saying it's like a fucking literary masterpiece right like there's a lot of unsubtle foreshadowing and and stuff like this uh which is you know fine oh, in my opinion like i don't know it keeps it, it build the, the, they they know how to do the thing which a lot of people don't uh, Usersoft can manage it, and apparently these guys can manage it, but I've read other Moe game where they can't manage it. Furaraba couldn't manage it, uh, which is having a slice-of-life Moe plot with intrigue. Uh, I don't know why this is so hard. Uh, like, th- having simultaneously a bare-bones plot, which is focused around slice-of-life elements... While still keeping uh, the sort of drip feeding of information that keeps you wondering what's going to happen. And hoping that information will be revealed in the future. They don't do it very subtly, uh, but it's effective nonetheless. Yeah, I am really enjoying this game right now. I I literally started reading it and I was like, I just want to see what this game is like for the first... I, I wasn't even expecting to read it and it's like what how many hours later seven hours later i'm (laughs) i've just been reading it the whole time i finished the common route of king koi and i'm now doing sylvia's route i think one strange thing about this vn is that they've put all of the plot and character details and like interesting stuff into one character Who's the last, like, which is the last route that you do, or at least you have to, like, unlock it, right? Like, they've put everything that's set up to be an interesting mystery or something. It pretty much all revolves around Ria, uh, which is just something I've never seen before in a visual novel. I'm okay with it. I'm excited to do Ria's route. It always gets mentioned in the reviews as being the highlight of the whole thing. Uh... But yeah, I can definitely recommend Keen Koi so far. I'm loving it. Oh yeah, another thing that happened, probably not notable at all, but um, while I was out, remember I was mentioning how I ended up in that comic book store and I bought the, the Ninchi Joe manga? Remember that? Uh, well, when I left there, we continued walking down that street and I realized almost like I walked past it and then, just like at the last second, realized what it was. It was the Nothing store. And if you don't know, I own and use the Nothing Phone 1. And I was very surprised, because I read the... I mean, I just didn't expect to go past the the Nothing store. Which is such a stupid name for a brand. Let's be honest here. I just wasn't expecting it. Also, it's crazy to have a store when you have two products. <laughs> I don't think they even sell anything there. I think it's just like a, a flex because they just have Investor Buddy. Uh, 
yeah, I, I, I just uh, was like, hey, hey, look, it's my phone. It's the store that only sells my phone and nothing else. Uh, so that was interesting. I considered going inside, but what would I even do? Uh, but yeah, I, I, I read that that, that, that store existed. The, the, here's, here's the question. Do I have brand loyalty to nothing? Do I have, like, some sort of, uh, attachment to the brand? You know, when I bought the phone, I did. When I bought the phone and I first got it and I had this excitement and I was doing all this research, because they have, one of the things that Nothing does is they have a YouTube channel where their CEO, like, makes videos and their stuff and stuff. It's like, they have really good social media presence like that. And, you know, I was watching that stuff and on their website and all of this sort of thing. I think there was a moment there where I was like, oh, you know what, this is a pretty cool company. Uh, I think that moment's, like, passed now. As much as I think this is a, this was a, a good investment, like, I'm, I've never regretted buying this phone. I don't, like, I have zero problems with it. I think it's a very well-designed piece of kit, and it was mainly the reason I bought it, again, was because it's one of the better value-for-money phones you can buy, uh, at least it was when I bought it, because, uh, as the CEO openly says, they don't make any money off of it. They, uh, they, they sell it for a price to which they can break even, and that's it. Uh, because they're, they've got investor money, and they're hoping they have to... I mean, you know, it's nice seeing a CEO be very open about the process of this sort of thing. The way it works is, right now, they're selling all of their shit for as much as it costs to make, and they're making z zero profit. Uh, the idea being that... Uh, they have to get a certain amount of market share, and once they are basically big enough and they can do big enough orders from the manufacturers, they'll be able to get better deals with the manufacturers in China, and then they'll be able to start making a profit. I'm assuming they'll also mark up their prices as well on the consumer side. Um, so right now they're selling everything at a break-even type of deal, <clears throat> you know, just in order to try and capture as much of the market as possible, which is what every tech company does, and uh, normally they don't talk about it, even though it's a well-known practice. So it's kind of nice seeing a CEO actually talk about it. Uh, as for the, the guy's philosophies, because, like, another thing he talks about a lot, and the, they generally talk about a lot on that YouTube channel, is their, like, design philosophy, because they're, they're big into, like, marketing themselves as sort of a design-focused company, um, and they're, they're, I think they're probably quite influenced by Apple over any other, uh, you know, electronics manufacturer or anything in terms of, like, having an iconic-looking design and rather than focusing on having the best software order. I mean, the guy said, I remember in one video, he said, like, you can read about the stats of a phone as much as you want and compare the stats of different phones or, or whatever, but... Uh, that doesn't, like, give you the full picture of what it's like to actually use a device. Um, and so, you know, he's like, did, he used that as an excuse at the time to not really go into the stats of of, of the, the, the hardware of their phone, even though the hardware's fine. Like, there's absolutely nothing wrong with the, the phone. Like, it's not like it's using cheap low-end hardware and just looks cool. Like, it's, uh, it's exactly what you'd expect for a mid-range phone, uh, which is what, I, I mean, it's my, it's exactly what it is. I don't know why it's so weird. It's kind of weird that he talked around it like that, but I guess it means that he's not, like, bullshitting. I don't know. Maybe he is bullshitting. You know, that sort of thing, I don't agree with. Like, at the end of the day, a computer, which is what a smartphone is, is just a tool, and what matters is th what the tool can do, not whether the tool has a cool design on it or not and what, what company's name is on the tool. Uh, that's how I see it, at least. So, uh, yeah, I disagree with that. It's just that it so happens that their design philosophy generally lines up with what I want, which is the idea being the phone or whatever doesn't get in your way and just becomes, like, nothing. Um, hence their name. But... The way they go about it is a bit different from the way I would go about it. 
like to me, the most nothing device I have is my ThinkPad because everything that I use on my ThinkPad was basically designed by me, or at least customized by me for my keybinds, my workflow, and so I don't even have to think about using it. It's just second nature. Uh, but if you gave it to some random person, it's incredibly unintuitive because you don't know all my keybinds, right? Uh, you wouldn't even know how to open a program, probably. Uh, and if you did show it to someone, they'd be like, why is it Windows key D? You know, a Linux user who knows things would be like, probably be able to do, understand, you know, they would know that instantly. Or like, why is launching your browser Windows key F? Um, and I, you know, I'm like, well, that's because I used to use Firefox and Firefox starts with an F. And uh, then when I switched over to Cube, uh, yeah, for whatever. The point being, that's the, for me, you have, in order for technology to really get out of your way, you have to just, un, you, you're just, you're switching out the time, right? You either, or like the effort, the thought, you're front loading all the thought. It's like having a high upfront effort cost. You have to put the effort in at first when you like set everything up and then you never have to think about it again rather than like constantly having to put a tiny little bit of thought into it. I mean, that's why I use TUI on my phone because it's more natural to me to, to type the name of a program than it is to click a button with an icon, even though I think that's unintuitive to a lot of people these days. Uh, yeah, so I don't agree with their design philosophy, really. Like, I think that their idea was neat, but their execution leaves a lot to be desired. Uh, the, I, what I do like about it is the, the way that the back design on the phone is supposed to work, or they generally have these, like, transparent cases. They have it on their earphones, too, right? So kind of like their, their unique style, their, their USP or whatever, right? And the idea being that it's not just a transparent case that shows you the actual electronics, it's supposed to show you like a representation of the parts of the internals of the device rather than the physic the actual hardware. And the reason being that if you just like if you actually show people the actual hardware, it's normally quite boring and you don't really understand what it does. Whereas using like lights and patterns to like represent what's going on on the inside uh, actually is m in some ways like more transparent than just it being actually transparent. And I agree with that. Uh, you know, I think transparent cases with just circuit boards, as much as it was a cool design in the 2000s, uh, yeah, I think it, they're, they're right in that it, most circuit boards, especially you're just going to be looking at the back of them, right? Like it's not super it doesn't look that cool and it's not really useful. Like it, it is better to have a design representation of the internals, which is also like partially the internals, but mainly, you know, rather than just itself. I do agree with that. Although I also, you know, think it just makes it look cool. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'd, I'd, I, would I buy another product from this company? Um, I don't, not, not just because it, no, unless it was good, no, I would, if it, in like five years when this phone dies or however long it's going to take, you know, I will do exactly what I did lot this time, which is I will go on the internet and I will, uh, watch a whole bunch of videos until I find a phone that's recommended in all of them in the mid range level and buy that, that is what I will do. Uh, I, and if it, if it just so happened that nothing is still the best option, then I will do that. But I highly doubt that will be the case. So, you know, I will probably not do that. Do I have any plans to buy their wireless earbuds? I thought about it. Um, but after looking at a bunch of, you know, I mean, to be honest, no, <laughs> I don't have any plans to do that. I thought about it because I, here was my thinking, although I made that video about why I would never use wireless anything. Um, uh, I, I, I've, you know, I also need some sort of noise cancelling headphones or something closed back to go outside. And I considered, hey, I mean, if I need that already, why don't I buy, like, 
maybe earbuds that are wireless is the best option. Um, I'm not actually convinced of that. I was just thinking about it. And so I was like, well, you know, these guys do sell earbuds and the phone comes with like a bunch of compatibility stuff with the, their branded earbuds. So let me just check it out, see if it's in, see if they're any good. And all of the reviews basically said they have some like problems and, you know, th like none of them said they were terrible, but, you know, there are 100% better options on the market. So even if I was planning to buy those wi some sort of wireless earbuds, which I'm not, uh, I am pretty sure I wouldn't buy the nothing ones. Uh, just because they seem to have problems. Now, that being said, I don't remember if I watched reviews for the the Ear 1 or if the Ear 2 had even come out when I was looking this up. Um, so I would have to... No, yeah, I definitely remember that they they talked about the, the Ear 2 and saying that it had some problems. So yeah, I don't know that I would be super interested in doing that. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, all in all, do do I have brand loyalty to nothing? Uh, no, I, I would not say so. Ideally, by the time this phone dies, a company like Pinephone has got their shit figured out to the point where using a, an open-sourced hardware or Linux phone is actually viable. Like, they are very, very... Just like everything in the Linux space, everything slowly, very, very slowly catches up and becomes usable and you know that's all I can hope for is that eventually you know I won't have to buy a proprietary device and I can use one with a free o OS on it without Google bullshit and tracking and you know all of that will be nice and something that's repairable and then you know ideally if it's repairable maybe I never have to buy another phone again That would be nice. Remember phone blocks? Remember that? I remember that. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I feel like one of these companies could really do a good job marketing itself as, like, the forever phone if they just had, like, like offer really, really good parts options and f have a high focus on modularity and repairability above, like, everything else um, and then just market yourself as the forever phone and just say, the last phone you'll ever need, because if any part breaks, you can really easily repair it yourself. Here's all the guides, here's everything, blah, blah, blah. Uh, like, if, I, if I, I mean, you could say, you could charge more for it, because you'll say, like, yeah, we're charging more for it, but it's also the last phone you'll ever need. Uh, but you can even upgrade the hardware when, it, when new hardware comes out. I, I, I'm, you know, I know that there's a laptop company that does that right now. I forget who they are, but there's a laptop company that, actually, the, yeah, I think it's a laptop company that has, like, a removable graphics card slot. I don't remember who it is, though. Uh, yeah. Uh, also, here's one thing about the Nothing Phone that I thought would really bug me, but has been zero amount of problems. It doesn't have a headphone jack. And this was the number one problem that I had with the phone when I bought it. It turns out I just never plug my headphones into my phone anyway. Because the only things I do on my... What do I use my phone for? Calls, messaging, uh, and reading manga when I'm out. That's it. And GPS, like maps. That's literally all that I need a phone for. Honestly, in um, in Senen Banker... No, 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 no. That was actually in this... In, in this... Yeah, in King Koi... The the uh, Sylvia, she at some one point she's like yeah I have a phone and she pulls out a flip phone like an old flip phone and then you know the other characters are like that's an old ass phone bitch and then she's like I like the way that you can close it like and that's cool which it is, uh, and then the main character says yeah I mean all you really need a phone for is email messaging and GPS like honestly smartphones are overkill. And I'm like, you know what? You're actually so right. Smartphones are such fucking overkill. Like, and who's using all of these extra? Fe like, you don't need all of this shit. I I don't I don't need. I mean, the only thing that I really extra thing is the ability to read manga, right? Like, as long as it can do calls, some sort of encrypted messaging protocol, email, and GPS, some sort of maps thing. Like that's. 
yeah, like this, I, I never really thought about it before. Like, obviously I've thought about it, but what I mean is I've never thought about it in that framework that it's just overkill, that it's like this thing that is so ubiquitous and yet also what are people even using it for? I guess people like scroll social media all day. Is that, is that the thing? Because I don't have any, I mean, unless YouTube counts. But yeah, I don't have any social media on my phone, and I haven't for years. Um, it's, it's, it is, it really is overkill, isn't it? Like, it's definitely overkill. What are people using their phones for? It's crazy. So I'm watching this new casual TF2 video, which is called How I Feel About TF2 Is Changing. I think it's not a bad video, but I think he makes some uh, claims in it, myths that I see around a lot that I just don't agree with, uh, particularly sort of singling out the Zoomer generation as being this TikTok addicted, um, low attention span, uncommitted, you know, sort of deal. And I, I've seen this, perpet I mean, everyone talks about this, right? Uh, when in I just don't see this as being true <laughs> at all. Uh, like people talk about it with video games, like in, in this video, you know, like uh, oh, people, you know, if you TF2 is like too slow and focused or whatever, and the Zoomers they want to play Fortnite with all the flashing lights, you need flashing light. Like you know, what people were playing back in the nineties. People were playing fucking Quake. Nothing is more like fast-paced Zoomer movement brain than Quake. There, it doesn't exist a game like that. You know what I mean? Like, I've played a, a bit of Quake. I'm I'm not a Quake guy as much as I wish I, I was. I've never taken the time to become a Quake guy. Uh, I've played a bit of Quake. I've played a bit of Unreal. And, like, Matt, I mean... There, there's nothing more zoomery than these, like, five... You know, you're, 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 you're born, you run around the map... You jump, you shoot, you, you, first guy you see, it's a free-for-all death match, first guy you see, you shoot him, you get in a fight, the fight lasts 5 seconds, you die, you wait 10 seconds, you respawn, you do it again, right, like, and then once in a while, you know, kind of like the same way, kind of like a condensed version of the Battle Royale game loop. I've never played a Battle Royale game, so I might be wrong. But in Battle Royale games, 90% of these games you lose, right? And then once in a while, you get that Victory Royale Pog or whatever. I don't really understand the appeal myself, but this is the idea. Just like that, in a game like Quake, these arena shooters, 90% of the time, you run out, you die. You get a couple of kills, you die. But that 10% of the time or maybe less, once in a while, you go crazy. You're running in a route, you know, around the map where you're going for the, the guns, picking up guns, then you're picking, you know, shoot a guy, then you're going still in your route to the health pack, pick up armor, pick up more weapons, pick up ammo, shoot a guy, pick up ammo, shoot a guy, weapon pick up, kill a guy, go back to the health, get the health, get the armor, kill a guy, and you, you can go on these sort of rampages and you know and then you eventually die to me that's like a time compressed version of playing 50 games of Fortnite until you win or whatever I don't, I don't really know how Fortnite works but yeah and nor do I really know how Quake works so all of this is kind of talking out of my ass here um, you know TF2 is neither of these things it, it's kind of not similar to either of them also a lot of comparisons to between like fortnite and valorant now i don't know much about valorant all i know is that it's based off of counter-strike counter-strike is not a i don't know as much as counter-strike is the biggest shooter in the world right now as far as i know um or at least one of them it's also not a stereotypically zoom appealed game according to all the stereotypes it's I mean, especially compared to, to TF2, it's a slow and tactical game. It's not as tactical as, like, Rainbow Six. Uh, it's kind of a middle ground. 
But, you know, it's and I'm, if I'm assuming that Valorant is based on it, I mean, I know it has abilities and it's supposed to be faster paced. That's all I really know about it. And a lot of the mechanics are sort of dumbed down. Uh, but still, I mean, I imagine we're still talking about a relatively tactical shooter here. Where if you die, it means you're out for the whole round. Uh, so I'm not really sure about that. But I kind of went on a tangent there. Not really what I wanted to talk about. This, like, Zuma brain, TikTok brain thing, it's not real. Or if it is real, it has, it's not localized in any particular generation. You know, I looked up... The, the TikTok user base, right? Like the average age of the TikTok user base. Um, and while generally speaking, you know, the, 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 the largest demographic is ages 10 to 19. That's only 25% of users. 20 to 29 is 22.4%. And 30 to 39 years old is 21.7%. And 40 to 49 is 20.3%. So, you know, there's only 5% more Zoomers than literal 40 to 49 year olds on the app. It's absolutely not localized for towards this, this like really young generation. It's only a 5% distinction between them and fucking 40 year olds, right? I, so if there is an attention span problem caused by TikTok or latched onto by TikTok, it has nothing to do with the generation and, you know, just it's just a, the entire world. Uh, but I, I don't even really agree with this. You know, I think, um, not to bring up this guy, but I saw a, a, a Michael from Vsauce, he said people complain about TikTok sludge where it's like, oh, there's a video and then there's a family guy clip or whatever, right? It's like, oh, they can't watch the video without the phone. And he said, you know what people used to do before phones and before the internet? People used to have a conversation with someone and watch the birds at the same time. Like, oh my God, their attention spans are so short. Like, I think this is real. I think this is just a human nature thing. I don't think that people's attention spans have become shorter. I think that uh, these predatory apps, predatory platforms... Uh, and these corporations, what they've done is they've hired a bunch of... Um, it's, it's kind of a weird confluence of things. There have been developments in behavioral psychology and at the same time a large demand from this industry for behavioral psychologists. So these two things have sort of fed into each other like an Ouroboros where there's more money being pumped into the field at the same time as the field is going through massive... Uh, changes and so these companies have just gotten better at better at making addictive platforms it's not that like no one in the 90s would have done this if they could could or like no one would have done it they just didn't know how to do it yet because these these there wasn't this uh cross discipline interdiscipline uh, holy shit i'm fucking <laughs> having a stroke there wasn't this interdisciplinary uh effect where the tech sphere and the behavioral psychology sphere and the economic sphere were, were all coming into each other but you know there had been uh, a bunch of crossover between politics and psychology before this right i mean if you've seen hyper normalization you know about how it was used in the soviet union and the same things have been used in america and there was definitely uh, marketing and psychology it's just that uh, behavioral psychologists have one gotten much better at manipulating people and secondly uh, have been hired on mass by the tech industry like that's what's actually happened nothing has changed about human attention spans and I think one of the reasons people are it's just that everyone's more aware of it nowadays right because we're all interconnected we all talk about it all the time um, but, I mean, it can be instantly disproved that Zoomers have short attention spans because there are YouTubers like Quentin Reviews that exist. Like, a lot of the most popular YouTubers right now are making multi-hour-long documentary-style videos, like Defunct Land, Quentin Reviews, uh, Summoning Soul, you know? All of these people are making long-ass documentary-style videos and getting millions of views from Zoomers and are widely praised. You know, I like them too. Uh, none of this would make sense if 
there was a world where attention spans had been like drastically reduced and it was especially concentrated in the younger generation well then why is the younger generation all watching summoning salt videos that are like an hour long they're really slow really specific about one particular video game it doesn't make any sense um and the mo some of you know and the people in the past also had situation I think what is the what is it is it the people like what evidence do you have that attention spans have gone down uh, that's what I'm curious about casual tf2 I'm accusing you right now if you're watching this video four hours in tell me right now send me your studies what evidence do you have that zoomers are losing their attention here's what I think has happened and why everyone thinks this when I was a kid I used to be able to just sit the fuck down and just read a book all day my parents never let me have a games console, they never let me have any of this sort of thing, so all they let me have were books. And so I would sit down and I would read like a book a day, and this was like most of my youth. Now all of these books were like YA fiction bullshit, uh, because I was a child and I had terrible taste in literature because I was like 12. But I used to stay up, you know, late at night under the covers with a flashlight, uh, which we call a torch over here, but I'm saying flashlight to avoid confusion, which is how we end up with this Americanization of language, which annoys me, but anyway. Um, staying under my covers, I had like a one that you strapped to your head, so you know I could turn the pages with both my hands and have my, my, my torch strapped to my head. Uh, and, and I would stay up reading, and I would read constantly, I'd read on my lunch break at school, everything was reading. And then, you know, at a certain point, I just read less and less until eventually I stopped reading that many books altogether. Uh, and when I tried to read a book, you know, I would have these problems where, uh, I don't know if you guys have this, but sometimes when you're reading a book, uh, you, you like, you read a sentence or a paragraph, and then you, you finish it and you realize you didn't actually pay attention to what you read, and then you have to go back over and read it again. Uh, like that sort of thing, or these sort of thoughts would start entering my head and distracting me, and you know you grow up and this starts happening to you and you're like what the fuck my attention span has been fucked by the world i used to have this great attention span where i could sit down and read a book all day and now you know i get bored after reading a book for like an hour or whatever except none of this is fucking real the only reason that happened is because i found better things to do like none of these the, the thing is when i'm reading an interesting book i can still read there's there's a few different things that have happened. There's like it's like a confluence of like fifty different factors because you know there was a while during like my late teens after I'd stopped reading, where I was sort of like oh books who cares and then you know completely out of nowhere I decided to read Slaughterhouse Five and I read that in a day in the exact same emotional and physical state of concentration and flow that I experienced when I was a kid. It's just that when I was a kid I didn't know about good books yet, so I was reading this bullshit. And I had no standards, so it was all fascinating to me. You know, I read these terrible books like iBoy. There's a book called iBoy. It's about a kid who gets an iPhone, a teen, a cool teen. An iPhone gets dropped into his head and he turns into a superpower. It's a terrible book, and I thought, it, you know, I read that, and even as a kid I thought it was like, I was questioning it. Anyway, uh, um, you know, so that's the first thing, is that I think the... The fact of the matter is that we, when you, we were kids, we didn't have any ideas of good taste. We didn't have interests or, or personalities developed yet. And so we were fine reading bullshit, and it was just fascinating because it was reading. But then we grow up, we develop tastes, and suddenly we need something a little more intellectually stimulating. This is why, you know, you watch uh, a lot of kids' shows, like TV shows, generally fairly vapid. If you imagine the sort of things that would entertain a baby, probably won't entertain a grown person. This is that's just how life works. Like we need you need a little more intellectual stimulation oftentimes, and there were simply fewer of those kind of books. But when you find one and it's well written, uh, you can still concentrate on it. However, there's a flip side to this, which is that when you're uh, you know 13 years old and you're reading The Hunger Games or whatever, The Hunger Games is basically like reality TV. You know, it's written in this extremely accessible style. It doesn't really make you think about anything that much. It's a pretty simple, straightforward story with not too many characters or plot points to take, take track of. It's extremely fast-paced. You know, it's not challenging, is what I mean. And that's fine. It's not meant to be challenging. It's a book made for children. When you're an adult and you're reading these books, you know, you're reading books that are made for adults. 
Like, of course I'm not going to be... Of course it's going to be harder to spend all day reading a really dense, complicated, and, and intellectual, cerebral book. Of course it is. It's just mentally taxing. It's just much more mentally taxing. And that thing I said before about, um, oh, you're reading and then you, your thoughts start wandering and you, you stop paying attention, that's just because you're thinking. That's called thinking. That's good. You're supposed to be thinking. <laughs> your thoughts are supposed to wander. That's thinking. You want to be thinking. <laughs> like, when, when you're reading a book and then your thoughts start to wander... And then you, you realize, oh, fuck, I've just been staring at this page lost in my own mind without reading anymore. Oh, I lost focus. I'm such a Zuma brain. No, what happened was the book provoked a response in your brain and you started having ideas. And then you zoned out because you were daydreaming, which in reality is just exploring ideas you had in your head, which were probably inspired by the book you were reading. Like, it, that's not a bad thing. You're just, like, mind-wormed to believe that you're supposed to be able to, to focus on one thing forever, right? Like, that that's what it means to, to be a, a, an intelligent or smart person, rather than, you know, allowing your thoughts to expand, I suppose, and, and, and build off of each other into strange and unpredictable directions, which I think is desirable, at least. That's my opinion. You know, maybe we could all stand to do a little more just sitting there and thinking. I think, you know, a lot of people, they say they get their best thinking done on, on in the shower or on the toilet, but the real reason for that is just because those are the times when we don't have any distractions with us. In reality, you know, I think a lot of a lot of people uh, could, could do with spending more time doing nothing uh, and just thinking about stuff. This is why when I go on the train, you know, when I'm, like, going out somewhere and I'm on the train, I bring my phone with me and I'm like, oh, I better download some manga to read on the train. And then I'm on the train and I don't even read the manga because I'm just looking out the window and just thinking about the world. And I don't know if that's weird for me to do. Everyone else on the train is on their phone. Um, and I think the reason for this is because a lot of people have very mundane day jobs where all they have to do all day is, like, some rote mechanical task that isn't intellectually stimulating and so they're daydreaming and thinking all day whereas for me you know I'm doing all sorts of other stuff with my time that I actually want to be doing and so those times where I'm just sitting in a train and I have this view passing me by are good times of silence to just introspect and contemplate anyway I'm kind of getting off topic here but isn't that kind of what we're talking about I don't yeah I don't believe in this zoomer brain thing I don't believe in it I don't think it's real. I think I think people are just more aware of it now. I don't I don't think that there's any change that's actually happened to the human psyche. I think the only change is that these apps have become more addicting and they are using these predatory psychological manipulation techniques. And the solution to that is to realize that you're not missing out on anything when you uninstall these apps because even me, you know, I'm not saying that I'm some sort of Christ-like figure who is free from all sin. You know, I, I, op I, like, someone posts a link to a Twitter post somewhere because they're like, hey, check this out, this is interesting, and I click on it because it's my friend, and I'm like, yeah, that is interesting. Next thing I know, I've spent half an hour scrolling Twitter, and I, what have I gained from it? Nothing. But it's just that these websites are designed to, like, feed you, to, to keep, keep you in this zombified state. I, I don't know. But it's nothing to do with my brain, you know. It's, it's just the fact that these fucking websites are... are designed by psychologists to have this effect on you like they're it's not you being bad it's that they're, they're the ones that are morally bad you shouldn't be expected to be able to resist this kind of thing it's kind of like you know forcibly holding someone down and injecting them with fentanyl uh you know on reg in regular intervals until they become addicted to it then withholding the fentanyl from them and then when they start to go through withdrawal symptoms saying Look how weak you are. It's like, no, you're, you're the, the fucked up ones for tying me down and kidnapping me and possibly getting me addicted to this drug. It would be, you'd have to be a, a particularly exceptional person to be able to resist these sorts of things. And even if you were, you know, what I'm saying is no one, no one's like that. Like the people who, I don't know, man, I don't know. What I'm saying is, <clears throat> yeah, I don't, I don't buy this shit. I don't buy it. Okay, and another thing, the casual TF2, this, this fucking uh, shakes my fist angrily. This guy, man, 
he talks about uh, if you if you just want to get like some sort of fame and fortune real quick without putting any effort into into beauty, you just just use sex appeal and anime imagery to sell your thing. And listen, as a hardcore otaku, okay, I did nothing angers me more than than exactly that. The fact that all of these Western video games and and mobile games and all of this sort of thing abuse what I see as this pure art form uh, and turn it into these these money grabbing Overwatch clones or whatever, right? Like to me, anime imagery is like Hidamari sketch. That's the peak, right? That's the, it's, it's, it's not this, like, corporatized, clean, over-designed nonsense like you'll find in any random mobile game or, or, uh, Valorant or whatever, right? Like, that, that, that stuff annoys me probably more than it annoys people who don't like anime because I know what the real shit is and the real shit has soul. Okay, the real shit is made by, like, some Japanese guy who's just so passionate about this thing that they decided to, like, draw a whole manga and they're like, you know, it's crazy that these people... And they're supported by, like, tiny groups, you know? I, I'm, I'm talking to you, Casual TF2, because I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how aware you are of the, the machinations of, the, of the, this, these industries. But, like, most anime is not the the most popular shows of every season. Most anime is supported by DVD sales because people or Blu-ray sales these days. In Japan, they sell these Blu-rays for ridiculous amounts of money. We're talking a Blu-ray box for a standard anime costs over a hundred dollars, a hundred to a hundred and fifty dollars for those Blu-ray boxes. And these shows are almost entirely propped up by the fact that usually in the thousands and low thousands, not tens of thousands, right? Like, in the single digits of thousands, people, fans, will buy these Blu-rays, and that funds the entire production. Uh, it's not some giant... You know, there are these anime that are giant corporate productions, but generally speaking, you know, most late-night anime is not supported that way. It's basically this small cottage industry of fans and creators that are highly interlinked because fans then go out to make fan works which are called doujin uh doujins and those fan works you know these people they they create what are called doujin circles so basically groups of fans who create fan works who sell that fan work to other fans at conventions which is a huge part of it right and then when they make some money off of that they can fund maybe a, a passion project of, of some sort of original work, and that's how you generally, you know, get people who make original stuff. Or a lot of these people call sort of so soulless uh, uh, isekai stories are really stories that are written by some random guy who just really wanted to be an author and looks up to all of these other uh, light novel authors. And someone completely out of passion, not getting paid, writing this stuff and posting it on this website called Shorsets Kaninaro, which is uh, where, where a lot of these stories get posted, and then some producer somewhere, publisher somewhere, you know, reads through these things and says, hey, we'd like to publish your thing physically. Um, and But, you know, in reality, it's still like a, a passion project. So the fact that that's the culture that is really creating anime aesthetics that's the culture. It's it's a very fan centric culture of people doing stuff purely out of passion, and it's relatively small and funded by very passionate fans. Uh, the fact that that culture is then co opted by giant corporations because they just see oh, anime booba, it sells well, and then fucking people who don't know any better just eat it up. The, the sorts of people that, that are watching Oshino Ko right now and think it's the greatest shit ever made. You know, these sorts of people eat that shit up. It makes me madder than it could possibly make you. Because you don't even know that it's possible for these things to have soul. 
And that, you know, that's sad because that's what these people have done. That's what these corporations have done is they've taken this this thing, you know, you go back and you watch Otaku no video from the 80s, the OVA, about the first the first otaku created OVA, well, it's not the first otaku, but it's a, a OVA about being an otaku in the 80s, right? Like this first time capsule of culture, right? Where they, they, they go to these conventions of this cosplayers dressed as Lum from, uh, from fucking that thing. <laughs> I'm forgetting the name of right now. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> all the way up to Azor Ken, more recently, which is like the modern day equivalent of that. Uh, or maybe like Anime Gataris or something like this. I, I guess Azor Ken's more recent. Uh, you know, these soulful creations celebrating a subculture, which is, by the way, uh, a subculture which is almost as old as like punk. Right, like this is this is has been as as consistent of a subculture, as as something as influential as like punk, right, and it's been around for almost as long. The fact that it, I mean it it's it's the same as like these corporate soulless people scooping up pop punk, in the, you know it's the same fucking thing, and and now you know you got kids who don't even know what a minor threat is right they 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 don't know what a what a, what a bad brains is or whatever um and they just think that punk is is 5 seconds of summer or i don't know i don't keep up with oh my god this guy who's this guy i this, i saw this the worst music i've ever heard um who is this he has a really dumb name he has a really really stupid name uh fuck i'm not even going to look him up i don't even know what he's called this modern pop punk TikTok ass motherfucker who's the most obvious like industry plant I've ever seen. Oh god, this guy. I don't know what he's called, but man, this makes me mad. I fucking hate that man. And I hate the industry but you know what I mean? It's the same thing. It's the same thing. Taking this like that the, the fact that, that guy exists doesn't make the the local punk scene here or wherever you may be any less valuable or authentic or but then in some senses it does make it less authentic because it sometimes becomes kind of a simulacra and that's very saddening and depressing but anyway kind of went on a tangent there yeah it makes me mad it makes me mad that there's these people co-opting this aesthetic for for selling to, to people as like anime big booba and taking all the the passion out of it that's what this guy well whatever i won't talk about that guy but um <clears throat> yeah and it's not I don't know it's got nothing to do with zoomers to me it's got everything to do with capitalists um, like no one would make anime if they didn't enjoy doing it because making anime is the most painful experience in the universe you know how hard it is to draw hand draw animation like Matt, these guys are ridiculous. They're crazy. I don't know why they do it. They're actually insane. They work insanely long hours for insanely low pay just to create fucking, you know, generic isekai number 3,271. Uh, and, and I have nothing but respect for them. I have nothing but respect for them. But it has nothing to do with these with Zoomerism. There's plenty of Zoomer art that's good. You know, like Enna... Anna is Zuma art that's good. That's a that's a Zuma art that's good. I, I, I don't know. I don't like what is this? I I don't even fucking remember what I was talking about now. Oh yeah, this guy, this casual TF2 fella. He's he's talking about how like other games they don't have maps or places that you would actually want to be in in the same way like you would just want to sit and hang out in two four. And I understand what you mean. But I, ju I think that's just because you're a TF2 fan. And here's what I mean, is that before I even played TF2 properly, you know, I had like a, a hundred hours on Heavy as a kid, but before I got into TF2 like I'm into TF2 now, uh, and I was into CSGO for many years, I would literally do what you're describing. Like, I would go and start an offline server and just wander around in DE Nuke or Inferno or any of these maps, right? Like, there's nothing... That, like as 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 much as I don't w want to say this, 
Like, there's nothing particularly... Like, maybe, you know, CSGO is special because these maps are, like, very old. They've been around, you know, since the 90s, many of them. Um, so perhaps you could argue that. But, I, you know, I would love to hang out in, in Dust 2. I would love to go to Dust 2 and hang out in real life. Hell yeah. Just as much as I would love to go to, to Badwater in real life and hang out. Uh... Or, or turbine. Actually, I never want to go to turbine. Not in real life, and not in in a video game. Not not ever. I never want to go to turbine. Um, I don't know why I said that. Keep me as far away from that that godless place as I can possibly get. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I don't know. I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't, I don't, I agree, I mean, look, this thing about, like, people not having fundamental, now I'm just responding to the video, this thing about people not having good fundamentals at anything, again, I agree with you, I just don't think it's a uniquely modern problem, I just think this is a problem that's always been the case, I, 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 yeah, and the solution to that is, is, uh, is jazz, and no, I will not explain what I mean by that at all, but it's real, and if you, if you get it, you get it. The solution to these people not having true fundamentals is to partake, participate in some jazz. A little bit of jazz. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so the casual TF2 video, it ends with something I do agree with, which is don't just accuse things of being a nostalgia cope. Sometimes people are nostalgia coping. I know people who nostalgia cope all the time. But this isn't. This video is not a nostalgia cope. I agree with that. Oftentimes, things in the past really were better. Just like Casual TF2 said, uh, I can distinguish from the, between the things in my childhood that sucked and the things that were actually good. Most of the shit in my childhood I know sucked. Looking back on it, which makes the things that were good stand out even more. Like the fact that I was super into SpongeBob as a kid, and Avatar: The Legend of Aang, and. Uh, also, super into, uh, let me see, actually, those, I'm trying to think of, like, TV, oh, yeah, yeah, so, as a kid, I was, so, these were, like, my three favorite, one well, of my favorite cartoons was Spongebob, Avatar, Legend of Aang, uh, uh, Ben 10, and Johnny Test, and when I look back on those shows, it's really obvious that Johnny Test sucks compared to the other ones, and Ben 10 is also not very good. <laughs> Uh, that like Avatar and Spongebob hold up really well and I remember them even looking back on it like with my perspective now as an adult I can look back and be like I remember occasions sitting on my couch and watching Spongebob and laughing I remember occasions watching Avatar and thinking it was super cool I remember playing with the Ben 10 Omnitrix in my own house and imagining I was in the Ben 10 universe and I was, and you know, but I don't really remember any particular moments from episodes that stood out to me, or I, and I especially, I mean, Johnny Test, I don't remember anything about that show, I remember the sisters were hot, or whatever, was there two sisters, it was they twin sisters, and they were hot, I think, is the only thing I remember about that show, um, I remember the theme tune, vaguely, I don't even, I just think that he says, like, there's like ad libs in the background, like a rap, like a Migos song where he's going like test, test, test. I think happens in the theme tune. I have no idea, and nor do I want to look it up. Uh, that's that's my memories of John. So clearly, you know, there's. I agree. There are things that were. I mean, in large part, a lot of it is is comes down to economics. The games industry was different when TF2 came around, and even in that games industry and the modern games industry, Valve is unique. Like. One of the things Casual says in this video is, like, why, you know, like, TF2 took nine years to develop. When's the last time, like, anyone did something that took, like, nine years? Can you imagine working on one project for nine years? And the thing is, no one else can afford to. Only Valve can afford to work on something for nine years. Because any other company doesn't have the infinite money to throw at a project for that long as a, a bet you know, like, no one can, can sustain that, there's very, very few studios in any medium that can do it, this is why, when it comes to anime, Studio Ghibli has the highest and best production 
quality of any studio because they have the most clout of any anime studio. They have the most money. So if fucking Miyazaki says he wants to make a movie, they can make that movie for 50 years and not run out of money because someone will step in and fund it because they're like, oh, it's these guys. Okay, yeah, we trust them enough to do whatever. And that's why Miyazaki movies look like Miyazaki movies. It's also because he's a perfectionist, but he can get away with being a perfectionist because he's working for Studio Ghibli. And they had to prove themselves at first, and that was a whole thing, but whatever. So did Valve, so does all, right, like, yeah. But any studio, if you gave them the time, budget, and expertise of Ghibli, would make something maybe not narratively as interesting or unique as a Ghibli film, but they would make something of comparable production quality to a Ghibli film. Uh, it's just that no one else has that, right? Like, one of the reasons Ghost in the Shell standalone complex uh, is so much better than other TV, anime, action shows from around the same time is because Ghost in the Shell standalone complex had twice the budget of a typical TV anime due to the fact that it was a pay-per-view. And so Madhouse, was it, uh, not Mad, was it Production IG? Production IG, I think, uh, could afford to put more money into it. And that means hiring more animators and spending more time. And they could only afford to do that because they were working on a property which has clout, Ghost in the Shell. Uh, because Ghost in the Shell sold really well overseas and uh, that meant it had a lot of money in it, and so they could afford to do this. Other companies can't afford to do this. Uh, games comp- this idea of like, like, you know, games don't come on a disc completed anymore, they, they come out incomplete. I agree, this is terrible. This isn't just a matter of studios having low budgets and, or being stressed with. This is a matter of poor management. These companies should be making lower budget, smaller games rather than aiming for everything to be a giant open world with RPG mechanics and cover shooting and spam A combat and puzzle elements and fully voice acted 4K. Like, they shouldn't be doing this. They should be making smaller projects that are within their means. Uh, And, uh, yeah, that's what they should be doing. I agree with you. That is poor management. Uh, Yeah, I don't know where I'm going with this. Uh, so yeah, TF2 is good game. TF2 is good game. Let's all agree on that, okay? Can we all agree on that? I'm glad. Uh, but the fact that it's good game is only possible because Team Fortress Classic was good game, which is only possible because Team Fortress Quake was good game which is only possible because Quake was good game, which is only possible because Doom was good game, uh, and that's it. And that and do, that was only possible because Wolfenstein was an alright game, but they just weren't any other games like it at the time. <laughs> but Wolfenstein was an alright game, Doom was a good game, Quake was a, a really good game, and then, yeah, that's how you, that's how you ended up there. It's not that the people who made TF2 were like these exceptionally innovative people who just could, everyone look everyone stands on I'm very into this everyone stands on the shoulders of giants art there's no such thing as original art or innovative art or anything like this everything is is built off of other shit everything is derivative highly you know it's it, the only real thing people contribute is just mishmashing stuff they're into uh, and then like the, the, the when they're incompetent at doing that that's what gives it its unique flair is when you just try and mishmash like if you're big into you know you're you're big into to to team fortress classic and quake and you're also big into 1960s aesthetics so you mishmash them together and then you get tf2 which doesn't really look like anything out of the 1960s it looks like tf2 you know it doesn't it it's clearly inspired by that but it doesn't actually look like that because it's a CG render, it's a video game, it's a three-dimensional environment, first-person shooter developed by Valve, released in 2007, you know, it's not a poster from 1960s, so 
in that way, it was incompetently created. But that is what makes it. You know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? It's it's not that like people don't have these fun these grasp or no one has the grasp on the fundamentals these days. People find it too easy to to do whatever they need. To. I disagree with this. Right? I think in you know there are many examples in the past of people who didn't have strong artistic talent. Uh, I I think it's more nuanced. Is what I'm saying. I don't actually fully disagree. I just think it's a little more nuanced. Like there, it's hard to to pry apart these two conflicting forces which is on the one hand there are undeniable biases towards us thinking that there was more exceptional art created in the past right number one being but well, maybe a couple right but let's say first of all this fact that many of the mediocre or poor art pieces created in the past simply were forgotten, right? We don't notice them. We don't know about them. They just bled into obscurity. Uh, and so we only see the, 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 the stuff that survived through time and held up, and that's why we, we look back and think it was great, right? So that's the first bias. The second one is these works have had time to, to pick up a claim and to influence culture. And so stuff that might have seemed maybe either generic or banal at the time. Like, let's take Bach, Johann Sebastian Bach, that one, that Bach, right? Bach is without a doubt, well, I mean, in my mind, the, the greatest composer, right? I, I don't think there's that many people who would dispute this, at least in many aspects, at least in many aspects, the greatest composer. But at his time, the style of music he was writing was seen as kind of passe, kind of outdated, old-fashioned, stuffy, kind of. It was like, it would kind of be like, uh, culture moved slower back then, but it's kind of like if you were making, uh, you know, like, like Perturbator, like, the, the uh, or, or, what, what's that fuck, I don't know the guy's name, but like this, this synth wave, 80s synth wave music, like if you were to make that right now, you know how that's like, well, that's kind of a move, a kind of an out, like, not just because it's nostalgic for the 80s, but the specific resurgence is now kind of lame and outdated. That's what Bach was working in, right? His, th this counterpoint style was, was, you know, reaching the end of its lifetime. Like, there were still people who make uh, synthwave music these days, right? They're still, they're still out there. But uh, they're kind of old and stuffy at this point, right? The, 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 that's, that particular moment in culture has passed. And it was the same in Bach's time. There were still people writing counterpoint, but it was kind of past, right? And then here he comes, and he takes a look at the entire history of it, and he makes the best, by far. Like, he just perfects it, right? Like, that's... Uh, and now no one even really cares about these other guys, right? The other Baroque musicians who came, you know, because they're all outshone by this one guy who came along. And, you know, while he was famous in his time, it would have been difficult for someone alive at the time to really pry apart what separated Bach from his contemporaries and his predecessors, right? Like, they would have maybe known that he was good. I mean, they definitely did. He was famous in his time. But he wasn't, like, Bach, but yeah. That came after centuries of analysis and understanding and cultural influence to the point where now when we go back and listen to Bach, we have the culturally ingrained capacity to actually understand and appreciate the music on the level that it was intended to be, that didn't exist at the time. And I think that that's the case for a lot of art we're going to see living through. Obviously none of it's going to be on the level of Bach, right? That's to be expected. But we might not have the tools or capacities to look at contemporary music or contemporary art and judge it correctly because we're still surrounded by the same culture and so we don't know what's stood the test of time yet we're only going to know that after time passes that's how time works uh, so I think that's a thing to be wary of however 
I also think it's clear that there's a lot of oversaturation and a lot of money chasing in this whole situation and a lot of cultural shifts that have made it so that I think really exceptional music has become harder to come by. Like stuff that's being made right now. Nothing has like, like the last big event band was Death Grips really. Maybe a hundred Gex, but a hundred Gex had one pretty good album when it came out. You look back on it and you're like, it's all right, right? Like, <laughs> but really Death Grips was the last one. The last band that I can remember or at least that I noticed, where I was like, this is, and it was a big cultural event. There have obviously been other great bands. They're normally sort of genre bands, right? Like, there's a lot of modern black metal that I really like. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, there's some stuff like Uboa, who's amazing, right? Still making music. They're, it's not that no one's making good music anymore, but a lot of this stuff around the 2016 kind of time, uh, it wasn't just that the music was good, it was also that it became sort of a cultural thing. And there was also a time when internet music was a bit weirder and a bit um, more or less polished, right? Like uh, the sort of cloud rap you'd find on SoundCloud or the the internet genres like, like Vaporwave and stuff were a little more, uh, I don't really know what to call it. I, I feel like they had more soul. They weren't just slapping OTT on everything, right? They, they were a little less ironic, a little more genuine in some sense. And I think that's something that's been lost, and that is a bad thing. And when I say lost, I don't think it's lost forever. I think it's just a moment that's going to pass, probably. Might not, and that will be sad, but this is probably the sort of... I mean, although I say it's going to pass, who knows? When, when AI comes along and can, can make really, you know, all of this music... Who knows what's going to happen? I, I certainly don't. I mean, I'll keep making music for fun. Uh, but, but I don't know what will happen when AI can convincingly make m music that's good enough for, like, 90% of normies to listen to. Uh, yeah, I, I can't say. But, um, yeah, I do th I think, like, like hyper pop or whatever Daria core, even those stuffs outdated these days. Like whatever, whatever people are making, what are people making these days? Jersey stuff like this. It's a little uh, less interesting. I agree. I I don't think it's just me being a boomer. Like I genuinely, th I mean, it doesn't have the cultural impact that it once did. Even your your hundred Gex, right? Like they they had this one album. It seemed to be very popular for a while, but you go back and you listen to it, and it doesn't hold up very well, to be honest with you. And then you know you go back and and you or you go now and you listen to their new album, and it's tr it's fucking garbanzo, it's fucking garbaggio, you know, it's it's trash, it's dog shit. And you go back and you listen to the remix album with me on it, and you're like, hold on a minute, no thank you is the only good song on here. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, because I'm the last real artist. <laughs> and that's why my album, Idolatrous, coming out June the 17th, is going to be the album that puts music back on the correct track. And you should all go and, and buy it when it comes out on Bandcamp and stream it on your streaming services. And, uh, and that'll be it. And it's totally not uh, sounding like stuff you've heard before. Totally. 100% doesn't sound like anything I'm being I, I, I'm using sarcasm here but I also don't want to give a spoiler as to the genre that the album is um, yeah so I, I, I agree when it comes to video game when it comes to video game you know people are still making amazing shit cruelty squad came out still pretty recently rec very recent memory and that game is fucking amazing um, you know, there's still plenty of great games and first-person shooters, even to be more specific, coming out in the modern era. They may not be on the same level as TF2. They may not be made by these these big studios. I mean, a lot of people like Splitgate, right? That was also relatively recent, although I don't know anything about it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, what? 
AAA gaming is just a dead meme at this point. Like, everyone knows that. That shouldn't be that strange. I don't know why that's surprising to people. AAA gaming is a dead meme. No one's forcing you to play AAA games. You can just play other games. I still- I'm the only person that still plays Rats Instagib. I still play that fucking game. Good game. I'm not gonna stop playing it. Uh, I've, I've, I've played some Zonatic. No one plays that game anymore either. It's full of hackers as well. <laughs> but, uh, I've played a little bit of it. Uh, but mainly, I'm playing these Japanese visual novels. Right? And, and those are not AAA games. They're barely games. Uh, in fact, I would say they're probably not really games at all. They're more like books. And, and I'm enjoying myself. And that's what really matters here. I'm, I'm experiencing something. I'm experiencing an artistic experience. And you can too. By subscribing to this channel. <laughs> you can experience an artistic experience too by subscribing to, to Casual TF2. And watching, uh, I don't know, how it feels to play Medic or something. I don't think casual, I don't think casual knows I have a YouTube channel. We've talked before. Here's what I remember: the first time I talked to Casual TF2, who is one of my favorite YouTubers, by the way. I don't know if I mentioned that. Um, but the first time I talked to Casual TF2, we were in a Discord call on his server, and and then I had only recently gotten into Team Fortress 2. Right? I've probably talked about this before. But he, I said, I have 3,000 hours in Counter-Strike. And then he said, rather timidly, almost like he was hesitant to ask the question. Perhaps because it came, you know, maybe he, he thought it came off as kind of insulting. He said, are you, would you consider yourself a normie gamer? And I was a bit confused about this. Because in the CSGO community, you know, at least... In the, the point when I was most involved in caring about the game, CS:GO was not considered to be a normie game. Call of, it was like you insult people for playing Call of Duty and Fortnite, and then later Valorant. That like CS:GO is the hardcore version of that for hardcore gamers, and that those are like the normie games for casuals. But then you know this kind of threw me for a loop because then I was like, oh I guess. You know, Team Fortress 2 players see Counter-Strike players as the normie gamers. And so I was, like, not sure how to respond, because I don't really know if I'm... Am I a normie gamer? I, I think a nor in You know, my conception of a normie gamer is Valorant player and probably someone who plays, like, AAA third-person adventure action games, like like a story narrative-driven, like, like, like a... God of War game, fucking Last of Us type things. That's like a normie gamer in my mind. So I don't think either categories, putting 3,000 hours into one video game doesn't, I feel like immediately would uh, preclude you from being considered a normie gamer. But then I suppose on the scale, from, like, if I heard that someone put 3,000 hours into League of Legends, I might think that they were a normie gamer. So then I, I was thinking about all of this, and I was like, I don't know. Because I also, at that, I wasn't really playing video games outside of CSGO for most of that time. So I don't, I don't really know if I'm a normie gamer. Um, but then, the other thing to consider here is that TF2 is also a very popular, very well-known video game. Being into Team Fortress 2 doesn't preclude you from being a normie gamer either. Isn't TF2 like always in the top 10 most played games on Steam every month? You know? Like what does it even, like is this phrase meaningful is my question. Uh, and if you watch my video, what is a normie and what isn't, uh, what I what I, the conclusion that I come to in that video is that, that, to, that the, the thing that makes you not a normie is when, is when you enjoy the bad bits of something. Is liking something not just because it's good, but also because it's bad. Um, and I think 
you know, in some sense, TF2 has more of that than CSGO. But also, TF2 is not really bad in, in very many meaningful ways. Uh, I, I don't, I think the opposite of a normie gamer would be like, like a, uh, someone who speedruns maybe some semi-obscure game. Not an obscure game to the point where they're just doing it to get on the leaderboard, but something that's like a mid-tier speedrun. Like, like maybe, uh, let me think, what's a mid-tier speedrun? The Hobbit, perhaps, video game, or, uh, something like that? Or maybe, uh, a, a retro game enthusiast, perhaps, or uh, maybe someone who's really hardcore into uh, fighting games. No, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what any of this means, but uh, was I insulted by being accused of being a normie gamer? I don't think so, no. I, I was just mainly it just mainly made me curious. What does what does any of this even mean? And you know, maybe I am, or maybe I was. But the, am I not? This is the real question: is now that I've put seven hundred or so hours into TF two, and I play it every day, am I no longer a normie gamer? That's my question to you, casual TF two, if you're still listening, and I will be curious to hear the answer. Uh, yeah, that's my, those are my, that's my main memory of talking to Casual. Seems like a nice guy, though. Okay, Casual TF2, you can stop listening now. I'm going to go a bit back to talking about uh, my erotic Japanese slideshow video games. So, one thing that King Koi does a lot as a narrative technique is really, really on-the-nose foreshadowing. Like, uh, they will, pretty much every single, I think, did I mention this before? I already said this. I don't know, man, I'm going insane. Let me tell you, I ate too much. I ate too much fucking carbs, and now I'm dying. I ate too much carbs, pasta. Too much pasta. Noki, actually. Is it pronounced how, I don't know... Th- how to pronounce it? I call. I've always called it gnocchi. I've heard some people call it gnocchi, which I guess would make sense. Gnocchi, and I've heard some people call it gnocchi. Gnocchi. I have no idea how it's put. The potato pastas. You know the ones I'm talking about. Anyway, ate too much of that. Tasty, but too much. Actually, it wasn't. It was pretty tasty, but it tasted kind of odd. It, I'll tell you what it tasted like. It tasted like a fucking cheese toasty. That, that that doesn't make any sense to you. It only makes sense to me. I don't know why I mentioned it. There's a specific reason, and I'm not going to bother explaining it because it's too complicated. But anyway, uh, this fucking video game, if you can even call it that, they like to, every single plot beat, like, telegraph it from a mile away that it's going to happen, which... Uh, I don't know, it's an interesting style of writing. It's it's surprisingly effective, because the point is not to, like, surprise the audience. The point is to create a tension between what the audience knows and what the characters know. Um, like, it's, it's very obviously intentional like that. And it's, yeah, it's surprisingly effective. I mean, I feel like they're pulling this trick maybe too much, <laughs> you know? Like, maybe they should... Uh, Maybe they should have held back a bit, but it does keep you engaged and keep you reading because you want to know what happens when the characters find out this piece of information. You know, you're like, what, what will happen when he finds out that this is the case? You know, uh, and that's, uh, I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a, this really makes it into a bit of a page turner. You know, looking back on it and comparing it with King Koi. Senden Banker was maybe not that great. I don't know. I'm trying to think about it, like, objectively. 
but I'm really struggling to. Because also, it's hard for me to like... Oh, I see why this isn't charging. It's not plugged in. That makes sense. <laughs> Let me do that. Uh, where the fuck's the plug? Where's the goddamn plug? What the hell? That goes there, that goes there. Aha! There you go. Sorry for that interruption. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm struggling to really... Like, I'm, even when I finished the game, I was kind of struggling to make an assessment of Senren Banker. I think one of the reasons is because, you know, you beat the game, or sorry, you, f you finish the four main heroines' routes, but then you go off and you play the side heroines' routes, which are much less climactic. Like, really, the end of Sen and Banka is the end of Lena's route, which was good. But then it's like you have the ending, and then you have this, it's kind of weird pacing wise so I'm not sure what to do about that uh, yeah I think that's part of what's making it hard for me to judge I don't think it was bad by any means I don't think it was bad I don't think I would have finished it if it was bad. I've read bad visual novels. I've read 9-9. Nine nine. Now that's a bad visual novel. I don't know why that game is so hyped. It's not that hyped, but it's relatively hyped. I think I, I think I heard it's fairly popular in Japan. No idea why. I thought it was fucking dog shit. I read 9-9 nine nine because, well, the second... Nine nine visual novel has is is emoto centric, and um, yeah, so I read through all both of them, just because the second one was emoto centric. So if you ever doubted my commitment to emoto, uh, now you know. But anyway. Yeah, I've read that, and that was trash. I've also read May Club, which was trash, but that's much older, so it's kind of hard to compare. It's like a... whatever. Yeah, Sinan Banker. I don't know, I feel like I need to... Like, something's clicked in my brain with visual novels, and now I'm able to read them. Which makes me want to go back and finish the roots in a Son of a Witchy that I didn't finish because I only did two roots in Son of a Witch and those were the ones I was most interested in at the time but maybe I missed out on something I could definitely go back and do that uh, the Ascendant Banker uh, King Koi is like a user soft visual novel, but better. At least so far. I mean, I say so far, I'm pretty deep into Sylvia's route now. I'm like, probably if I had to guess 70% of the way through, I have no idea how accurate that is. It's just me guessing. I might be further, I, I don't know. Might be less. Uh, hmm. I'm honestly not sure. I'm not sure what's gone through my head right now. I'm trying to evaluate these things. You know what the real problem is? The real problem is just that I don't... I don't know that I have enough context. Like, maybe I just need to read a bunch more before I can go back and... King Koi is definitely better. One of the best visual novels I've read, in my opinion, so far. Like... There's a feeling, a particular feeling, 
of not just the, like, I think this is the difference between a 7 out of 10 and an 8 out of 10, is that a 7 out of 10 is very good, but an 8 out of 10 is excellent. And I think the difference is that an 8 out of 10 gives you this particular feeling of attachment. Like, there's some extra emotion that goes onto it where it impacts you in a deeper way. And Senden Banker, aside from Lena's Root, didn't have that. Lena's Root did have that, which makes me want to rate it higher. But all of King Koi so far has had that feeling. So, yeah, I don't know. We gotta stop. We gotta stop with this fucking shit where, where somehow people turn... People on the internet managed to turn their problems into, like, these pseudo-grassroots movements using their influence. It's so annoying. Uh, like, two recent examples are, um, uh, one that was pretty minor. So, on Twitch made a change to their TOS, which meant that, like, you, this, it, the big thing everyone's complaining about is that it limits the size of logos for sponsors on streams. Uh, and for some reason, you know, of course Twitch streamers are going to complain about that. But why are you mad? Do you want to watch a stream with a logo taking up half the fucking screen? What's wrong with you? What? Why are you mad about that? You you are the viewer. This, this rule is meant for you so that you can enjoy the stream without seeing 50 fucking corporate logos. Why do you want to watch corporate logos on your stream? But no, because your favorite streamer was like, oh, but but I'm not going to make an extra million dollars from my fucking sponsorships. You, you got mad and said, oh, it's a stupid rule. Why is it a stupid rule? Explain. Because your streamer can't make, like, millions and millions from, from sponsorship deals? They're already rich. What are you complaining about? People give money to them for free. They're millionaires already, and you... Pay the money, even though their content's already free. What are you doing? You're a subscriber with Twitch Prime, motherfucker. What are you talking about? These guys don't need... These guys don't need the money from sponsorships, I'm telling you. It doesn't cost anything to sit down and play a video game for eight hours a day on stream. It doesn't cost anything to do that. What do they need the money for? None of these, like, what what the fuck are you talking about? This is so stupid. How clearly these streamers were just like, oh, this hurts my business. And suddenly that became everyone's problem. It's not my fucking problem. Don't put logos on your stream, you fucking bitch. This shit happens all the time. Another example. Um, another recent example. Reddit has made some changes, uh, which... Uh, I believe, I, I, I haven't really read up on it because I don't use Reddit, but I, I think what's happening is that they're, like, making people pay a shitload of money to use their API. Now, that's bad in general, but it's not, it's also not, like, that bad. <laughs> like, I, I think it's bad. I don't think Reddit should be raising, I think that's what's happening, right, is that they're raising the cost to, access, to use their API. But, uh, also... You know, the thing that everyone's complaining about is that, oh, it's killing third-party apps. Uh, in what universe is that a bad... Th like, who cares? Who cares? Who fucking care? Why do you care? Why are you... Bl why are you... Like, there's there's this, this... The only reason I know about this is because there's, there's these... The few subreddits I use, like, for, like, niche stuff, right? Are, uh, you know, people are talking about it. They're like, oh, all of Reddit's gonna black out on this particular day. Is it today? Actually, let me see. Uh, yeah, that's today, actually. Uh, that, like, oh, all, everything's gonna, gonna shut down in protest. It's like, why do you, as a random-ass meme subreddit or whatever the fuck you are, right, why, why are you complaining? Because some third-party scraper or, or mobile app that, that allows people to post low-effort bullshit can't can't access the API has to pay for it. Why are you complaining? It's why is it your problem? It's not. Why are you shutting down? And people just like to get involved in these movements as if it matters. It doesn't fucking. It's stupid. Look, I don't know. I don't think it's a good thing. I'm sure there are plenty of useful things for people who who care about that. So I don't know. Maybe maybe there's some useful Reddit APIs out there, but or some useful third party Reddit apps or something. Uh. Obviously, I support the idea that you can, like, 
you know, Reddit is not a, a private, I think, oh yeah, that's the one that I, that it, there's, there's the old dot Reddit dot com, right? Something like that. Um, which, which, you know, that's, that's how, uh, I use the website. If I ever use the website, there's also a Tedit, which is like a, a FOSS Libra front end. Maybe those things use the API and that's why it's bad. Honestly, I don't know. Uh, so in that case, I can understand complaining. But why, like, I don't know. I, I feel like that's a small percentage of these sorts of things. Another example here. This is a bigger example. Those are just two recent ones. But here's a bigger one. And again, just like, so the Twitch ads one is pretty straightforward, right? The only people that hurts is billionaire streamers. So, I don't know, or millionaire streamers. Uh, like, I don't know why everyone's complaining, and like corporations who want to sponsor them. So, I don't know why everyone's complaining about that. The Reddit one, a little more, little more gray area, you know, that I think there are some, some probably some good services that use this Reddit API that, 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 that might get killed. So, you know what, I, it's somewhat understandable, even though I think the majority of the stuff that would get killed off is probably bad. Also, Reddit, famously unprofitable. I understand why they're trying to generate a profit, even though I don't care, right? Uh, but but here's one that's also kind of a grey area it, and it's a big one it was a PSYOP it got a lot of people it got me ne remember net neutrality remember this whole meme about net neutrality so the problem with this one right is that people on both sides are bad it, it was basically uh, a fight between the, the, the ISP giants who I hate and the, the giant tech platforms who I hate. Like, that was really who was arguing here. Um, and the ISPs, their point was, well, look, uh, you guys, you know, Netflix, Google, Twitter, all of, you know, the big tech platforms are using up, like, all of our bandwidth. Like, mo the majority of this bandwidth use is coming from you. Like, you guys should have to maybe pay extra, right? Like... Because all of the traffic is coming from these specific group of websites. You're using up shitloads of our bandwidth. And you're also massively rich. We're giving you this basically for free. Like, why shouldn't you have to pay extra to, to use... Because you're using way more bandwidth than anything else. Like, you're the billion dollar companies that are dri driving all of this traffic to your sites. Why shouldn't you, you... You should have to pay extra, right? And then all of these companies twisted that. And they were like, ah, but it's going to get put... And they, they they made this thing up where they were like it's gonna it's gonna end up getting put onto the consumer, where uh, you're gonna have to pay for different plans like a cable plan. Uh, you know I I don't think that was ever the the point right that was that was a. Uh, this is the thing about net neutrality right Did you notice that when it was a whole big thing it wasn't just this grassroots Reddit campaign, or whatever. All of these giant companies got involved, like Netflix, like all of these, these giant companies got super into it. Why? Why did they get super into to, to publicly petitioning the FCC or whatever? How come? Well, Ajit Pai, remember that guy? I remember this was a whole big deal on the internet when it was going down, right? Like, the reason is because in reality, you know, it's quite likely that they were the ones that were going to have to front the costs, not, not the consumer. It, it was going to be these these corporations. Uh, however, it's not impossible that it would have ended up in this sort of like uh, cable plans. You have to pay extra to access Netflix or whatever the fuck. It's not impossible that it would have ended up like that. So there was some legitimate concern, but that wasn't the main goal, right? The main goal was to make it so that the 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 giant centralized tech platforms pay their fair share for the bandwidth. And it's also because ISPs are greedy. So, in the end, no one was the good guy here, right? Like, I hate ISPs equally as much as I hate all of these other people. I mean, especially in the UK, uh, ISPs are all dog shit. Uh, not just in terms of, like, you know, uh, offering bad services, but also in terms of, like, privacy uh, and security. They are not very good. So, in the end, it was a fight between uh, fucking, you know, all evil people on all sides. And yet, one of these evil people 
uh, was, a, 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 you know, had the support of the FCC, and uh, the other one had, uh, you know, user bases they could weaponize. So that's, that's why uh, net neutrality had this big deal, is because all of these tech companies got scared that they would have to pay extra to, 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 to ISPs. They'd have to, to shell out to ISPs to, to, because they were the ones that were using most of the bandwidth, right? So they, they got scared. And so they were like, let's just stir up this like guerrilla marketing campaign against it. Uh, and again, it's it. I'm not saying that 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 like net neutrality is a bad thing. Uh, it's it, it, again, it's not impossible that if you abolish net neutrality, you could end up with a, some sort of situation where uh, where where consumers have to pay for different packages for different websites. The thing is, if that were the case. All of these companies, like, if that were the most likely option, all of these companies, um, you know, wouldn't, um, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be pushing, so they wouldn't care, is what I'm saying, right? You wouldn't see Netflix, Google, Reddit, Apple, or whoever, I don't remember all the companies that, that made a stink about it when it was happening, but they, they wouldn't be complaining, because they, they'd be making more money, they wouldn't give a fuck, right? Um... <clears throat> But they did, they did kick up a storm about it, which makes me, you know, a little sus, a little skeptical. Um, man, it's crazy how much shit is just fake. Like, uh, it's crazy how easy it it is, or at least was at a certain point to, to, to like just weaponize the internet. I mean, the net neutrality thing is one of them. Uh, the bacon, remember, like, lol xd bacon random, how the whole internet was obsessed, or at least the reddit side of the internet was obsessed with bacon, and that was all started because there was a surplus in the US bacon industry, and they wanted to sell more bacon, so they just sort of created this, and it, by the way, the bacon industry, done that before, you know how bacon and eggs is considered, like, a standard breakfast, that's because, uh, at some point, I think in the 50s, um, they did this, there was the same situation, they had a surplus of cheap pork cuts, which, uh, you turn into bacon, and, uh, so they pushed this massive advertising campaign that basically said bacon and eggs is the best breakfast, and, like, scientists say bacon and eggs is the healthiest breakfast, because there was, there was just a surplus of bacon in the, the US meat market, and, uh, that's why bacon and eggs became a very popular American breakfast. However, that's not the whole story, because bacon and eggs will have been a popular breakfast throughout all of European history, simply because in the morning you have eggs, because that's the first thing you do in the morning if you live on a farm, you milk your cows and you collect the eggs from your hands, and uh, you probably have bacon as well, uh, because you might have slaughtered a pig at the beginning of winter, and you will have cured the meat so it can stay. So you will have had, you know, bacon was a staple of European peasant diets, and so were eggs after chickens, you know, were imported from China, uh, because chickens are, like, one of the best livestock to keep ever. So, yeah, bacon and eggs will have been a popular kind of thing, but it, you know, it probably wasn't the, you know, what I'm saying is here, it was just one breakfast out of many. So, it's all, none of it's unprecedented, it's all crazy, it's all wacky. I'm tired of this shit. I'm tired of seeing these so-called, like, grassroots internet movements. With the net neutrality one, I understand, right? Because they were lied to, people were lied to, people didn't really understand what's going on. But, with the, the fucking, the ones, the ones that I just mentioned, especially this Twitch one, like, why are you, as a Twitch viewer, mad that your streamer can't make more money? Are you insane? Like, why do you want massive logos taking up the screen? Like, what 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 benefits does that bring to you? Why are you why are you complaining about it? It doesn't make any sense. It's it's really strange that this happened. It's like these people they're all like robots. They just follow whatever influencer tells them to think. It's it's very strange. Like, I think people especially on Twitch, are very used to uh, this narrative that uh, 
the 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 dialectic, I guess, is uh, a tension between Twitch corporate and the streamers slash viewers. That like those those are the two parties that are in in tension with each other. Whereas in reality, Twitch streamers and Twitch viewers are also in tension with each other. And oftentimes, what's good for Twitch streamers is good for Twitch as a business, right? Like, the goal of a Twitch streamer is to extract as much, like, purely market forces, right? Like, not looking at their individual personalities. The goal of a Twitch streamer is to extract as much money from their audience as they possibly fucking can. And what does that mean? That means running a shitload of ad breaks, right, which are ridiculous on Twitch. It means getting people to donate as much as possible. Uh, oftentimes, Twitch takes a cut, It's you know, if you donate in bits and stuff. And it means getting people to sub as much as possible, which Twitch also takes a cut from. Um... So, so it's basically, I mean, this is how these websites are set up. Same with YouTube. All of these content generating web platforms, I might even call them, are set up so that the, what you know, ideally what benefits the streamer or the YouTuber or whatever also makes money for the platform. Uh, because that's, you know, they take a cut. I mean, it's the same with anything. Same with Steam, for example. You know, you want your game to do well on Steam. So does Valve, because the more your game sells, the more that, you know, they get money from that too. Uh, It's supposed to set up this, like, you know, collaborative relationship. Uh, The only reason, like, I mean, this is much, it's much clearer than the antagonistic relationship between Twitch corporate and Twitch streamers. Like, in reality, Twitch corporate, there's a lot of Twitch streamers that are, you know, there are some that maybe aren't, aren't so well liked by Twitch corporate, but in general, they have much more in common than the viewers, right? The viewers are the ones that have this sort of antagonistic relationship uh, it, oftentimes, and it's complicated because it's it's also this kind of gig economy kind of thing, and this weird, like, neo-feudalism thing techno feudalism thing right where uh you know there are twitch streamers like xqc or mizgif or whatever but there's also twitch streamers who are just average people who just have a twitch channel and stream to like 10 viewers or whatever right and there are twitch streamers who are somewhere in in the middle of that the idea being that uh every like this this very very weird blurred line between customer employee and product Right, like what is Twitch's Twitch's employees are the people who work at corporate, the people who program the website, but also, you know, the people like uh, XQC, for example, who have contracts from Twitch, right? Like they they work they essentially work for Twitch. Twitch pays them directly. Like you know, they're by all me- by all normal means they're employed by Twitch. They're not just streaming on the website because it happens to be there. They have a contract, right? But then. What about people who are streamers who get that whose main job or main source of income is Twitch but don't have a contract but they're partnered? They're still, you know, getting money through Twitch, right? They're still, in some sense, employees. And then you look at the user base, and the user base is not just buying a product, but also their data is being sold, they're being harvested, they're being farmed, they're being uh, commoditized, right? Uh, and also, Twitch's goal is to somehow convince you that you too can become a streamer if you use their platform and stream on their platform, right? And so, this really fucked up, blurred line between, like, what is the product of Twitch? Are you the product? You don't have to pay to use the website, technically, which means, you know, you're the product. They they definitely are harvesting your data. No question about that. So yes, in some sense you're the product. In some sense the stream is the product. Right? It's Oh, they're doing drilling now. But yeah, it's this really really fucked up system that's going on here. And this is the case for like the entire tech industry or at least a lot of it. 
where these traditional capitalist constructs of you have an employer, you have a worker, and you have a consumer, they break down. The only one that stays is the employer. But the other two, worker and consumer, they blend together, which is why, you know, people call it techno-feudalism, because you're no longer, you know, you're, you're on these platforms and you're no longer, <clears throat> you're generating profit for the capitalist class without getting paid. You're like a serf. And you, in some senses, you can't leave. And yet these companies, you know, quote unquote, don't make a profit. They, they, they only mark their profits. You know, you, you look at, at the, it's, it's this, you, you look at like these companies that might be US based and you look at their yearly profit, yearly turnover, they're getting, oh, oh what a coincidence. We, we don't make any profit. Um, and these the CEOs, it's like, oh, well, I did make some profit, but I actually donated it all to the charity that I own, which is tax exempt. So, you know, in reality, I didn't make any profit. And then you look at like the Cayman Islands and it's like, well, but yeah, we made a profit there. Right? But in reality, these are the obviously these companies are fucking making a profit. Don't believe this shit when they tell you, oh, YouTube doesn't turn a profit. Reddit doesn't turn a profit. Twitter doesn't turn a profit. All of this shit, right? Don't believe this stuff. Okay, these companies are all really profitable. They just don't market on paper, so they don't pay taxes. So the corporations don't pay taxes, right? Just like the the medieval barons and and lords didn't pay taxes because they're they're the feudalist class. They're the 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 aristocratic class essentially, and the people who own these corporations don't pay taxes. Uh, you know they have all of these different methods to avoid taxes. Uh, and then you and I, we work for them without getting paid, and we pay our tithe, right? Like, this is how it works. It's all this this weird, like, post-capitalism system that isn't, you know, it isn't... Uh, and, and the thing is, none of these companies even... Like, profit doesn't even matter. It's not just that they don't mark profit, but like, oh, well, you know, it's all the same, because even if they don't mark their profit, they're still making a profit. What does a profit even mean anymore, right? Like... What does it even, are they, what does it, you know, what does it even mean to make a profit when a lot of these super successful companies, uh, like, like Uber, for example, their entire business model relies on not specifically not making a profit, running at a loss for years on purely investor funds and so that they can undercut the market and drive their competition out. Like, what does that mean? Or, for example, when something like Twitch which is owned by Amazon, it doesn't need to make a profit. It can just make sort of pseudo profits in the form of social capital, right? Like, even if YouTube didn't make Google any money, there was no fucking universe where they would ever... If, if, if YouTube act... Look, we have no idea, right? Because all of this shit is impossible. It's all secret. It's all obfuscated. But, like, let's say theoretically that YouTube lost money every year. Google would never shut it down because that level of cultural control, the level of control over culture where you basically, you, you as Google, as Alphabet, own the number one content platform in the world. All, all internet video belongs to you. Even if that's operating a loss, that is worth it. You're, you, what you're really doing is just paying for this level of social control. So none of that matters. You know, half these companies operate a loss anyway and run on investor funds. And those investors, where do they get their money from? Well, a lot of them, they either conjure up their money basically magically out of thin air, which is this crazy thing as to how, like, banks work, right? So that the money gets conjured up magically. It's, they literally call it, I believe, a ma the, the magical money multiplier, right? You can look this up. Or, you know... The, the economy crashes and the government just gives them money. <laughs> the government just gives just prints off more money and just gives it directly to these investors who can invest who will then prop up these businesses. So even calling them businesses doesn't even make sense anymore because they don't make any profit on paper. They don't have to make any profit in reality because they're run by investors and these investors don't have to make any profit because they're backed up by the government who will bail them out with the corporate welfare, um, you know, whatever happens. And then the companies, they have employees, 
but they also have pseudo employees and they have serfs, i.e., me and you, and it's all very strange and gig economy and and all of this stuff. And when they run a, a service, what service do they really run? They don't. They they run a a platform, right? And a platform is like have owning valuable land in in the digital space. They're basically, I mean, digital landlords. That's the idea. Is they run this platform, i.e., they own, you know, a place where people can go to to live, to to communicate, to socialize, to to experience, um, to create, to share, whatever, right? But they're not they're not selling you something. You don't have to pay to use it normally because you're the product. It's very strange. It's this very strange system that, frankly has absolutely nothing to do with capitalism. <laughs> it's completely different. I didn't mean to start talking about this. I, was, I just wanted to talk about this, this fucking stupid Twitch logos rule, and I've ended up explaining techno-feudalism to you. But there you go. Uh, that's, that's how it do be in this, this, this fucked up world. Uh, none, none of it means anything anymore. Even, yeah, I don't know, man. It's it's very strange. It's very strange. Life is full of strange dichotomies, strange self-fulfilling prophecies where two sides of a coin are secretly the same side or something along these lines. You'll see what I'm talking about. I'm thinking about mood and stuff like that. So, like, for example... Uh, Boredom and depression are obviously extremely related things. It's impossible to have one without the other, in my opinion. Uh, I don't think it's possible to be simultaneously depressed and exhilarated. Right? This seems self-evident to me. Uh, and so if you want to cure depression, you ought to, you know really cure boredom and simultaneously the other way around is also true this makes sense to me and the same thing is true on the flip side where, where it's like if you uh, have uh, anxiety it's it's uh, linked to the opposite right like uh, when you feel very stressed you also feel very I'm trying to think of the correct word stimulated or excitable I'm not sure but the thing is about depression and boredom is that it's like this weird self-defeating thing where you're you're depressed because you're bored but you're bored because you're depressed you can't do anything to stop it like your brain doesn't work properly and you know that if you could just force yourself to do this thing then maybe you could stop feeling depressed, but you don't really want to. And I think that's the key, is that, like, there's this particular form of comfort in that, and it's something that people don't want to admit. Uh, but I think it's fine to admit. I don't think there's any problem with it. I think you can just say, you know what, it's there's a, there's a strange comfort in it. Uh... Like, when I'm particularly depressed, I can just not bring myself to do anything other than lay in bed all day and watch, like, trash YouTube content. Like, like Minecraft stuff for kids, or, or Mr. Beast Reacts, or these sorts of terrible, terrible stuff. Because it's like the... You don't have to put any brain into it. It just sort of happens at you, and, you know, you th 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 you could just zone, completely zone out, and, and you, you don't have to... It doesn't require any energy because I don't have any energy, because I'm depressed. That's the whole point. And that's all I can bear to do, right? is to just lay in bed all day and, and watch that stuff. But then, of course, I'm not going to feel any better after doing that. Uh, the problem is I don't have the capacity to do anything else. I don't know where I'm going with this. I'm not depressed right now. At least I don't feel like it. I don't know. I think right now I'm just hungry. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I fucking ate too much yesterday, and I my my guts are feeling all fucked up today so I'm like I do a, do a little bit of a fast to try and clear my system out 
But I don't know if this is gonna actually do anything. I don't fucking know what I'm thinking. I'm just, I, I just feels, it feels like if I eat something right now, it's just gonna make me feel worse, even though I feel bad because I'm hungry. So I'm, I guess I'm just trying to do a bit of a fast. I'm not sure. It just started raining. Like, it's been super hot, and it just started raining, like, super intense here. And, uh, so I went to get, and it, when I say super intense, I mean, like, crazy, crazy. You can probably hear the thunder in the background, maybe. Um, crazy raining. So I went to get my phone to record it, just because I, I don't know why, I just, instinctively, I guess, I was just wanted to record the crazy rain. And when I started recording, <coughs> I was recording it, and then I saw, uh, Chili, you know what? I think I'm going to not share this on YouTube. I think this will just remain a private moment for those people, and something that I feel guilty for voyeuristically, accidentally seeing. Felt like a private moment. I'm gonna keep it. I'm gonna keep it. Yeah, that's weird for me to talk about on the internet. Hi guys, this is your reminder that all of this uh, tech sphere stuff is built on an unstable foundation, and it is all collapsing in real time. And this is your reminder that it is very free and easy to simply leave. Uh, <clears throat> what I mean by this is that all of these platforms, such as Discord and Reddit, just as two examples that are currently collapsing, um, at least in some aspects, all of these platforms are easily replaced by protocols. Discord is the easiest. I would probably go with Matrix. Lots of people are on it. You can also use XMPP, but uh, I think Matrix is going to win out due to having easier to use clients, at least in general. Seems like Matrix makes an easier transition from Discord users. So yeah, Matrix, rather than being a platform owned by a corporation, it's a protocol. Uh, and no one owns it. Not really. So no one can just shut it down or fuck with it, is the point. And if, if the developers make a, a terrible decision, for example, someone could, could fork it and create a new implementation without that. Uh, this is the wonderful thing about free open source software. Is that it's not just controlled by one corporation. And it's important not just because these platforms suck, right? Like, they often suck. For example, uh, you know, Discord, I've heard it, it's doing something where it's hiding more and more stuff behind the paywall of Discord Nitro, right? Twitter is the same way, but, like, Twitter is slowly making more and more stuff hidden behind this paywall of, of whatever subscription service, what do they call it, Twitter Blue or something? I, I don't remember. Um, and, uh, you know, Reddit is making these changes to their API, requiring people to pay even more money or whatever. I don't know if that matters. I don't know anything about Reddit. Uh, the point being that Discord is the easiest thing in your life to replace in terms of just pure, on a pure software level, because, uh, at this point, Element, I mean, it, it vibes like Discord in many ways. It's not hard to wrap your head around if you're not tech literate. Uh, you know, and it has, it has many of the same features like voice calling that you know from Discord and, and, and might use on a regular basis. Uh, yeah, I think Element added um, these, these new group calls. Uh, let me let me see if I can find this actually. Hold on, because uh, I saw this. I I think I saw this. One second. 
That's right. There, there's a beta right now for something they're calling video rooms, which looks to be closer to a Zoom replacement than a Discord replacement. But, uh, you know, it'll work. It'll do its job. I mean, you can already do this. It's just using Jitsi. I think they just created a, a sort of first party version. Uh, like, you can already do group video calls inside Element, but they just they just embed Jitsi, and it works much better than it used to. Uh, so yeah, that's probably the easiest one. Uh, when it comes to Reddit, it's a little harder because you, as the end user, don't really have much control over it. Uh, I mean, when I say this, you're probably thinking, I don't even use Reddit. The main the thing that Reddit is useful for is uh, when your computer breaks and you want to paste an error message into Google to see how to fix it. Uh, and when doing that, I'd say about like 60% of results that are useful are on Reddit and the other 40% are on some sort of forum for some specific thing. Uh, you know, ideally, we just pay more close attention to these forums. I don't know what you can do necessarily as an end user for that, but if you happen to be an admin or owner of some sort of Reddit group like this, uh, I would recommend, you know, maybe transitioning to a forum. I should say, one of the most useful things about Element, before I forget it, is bridges. That, like, if you are in some sort of Discord server, you can't convince everyone to leave, you are able to bridge that to Matrix. Like, you can you can you never have to use the discord app you can you, you, you anyway that's something i use quite a lot uh but i imagine you could probably do the same well i guess maybe not now that the reddit api is like a million billion dollars so maybe not so that's something a little more difficult but uh you know it's definitely very doable like forums have existed since the internet invented <laughs> the forums have existed for a long time they don't that they, they, even though reddit tried to kill them, they haven't completely gone away and they can easily come back if Reddit goes to shit. Uh, forums aren't any better than Reddit in terms of like how they operate. The reason they're better than Reddit is because they're not controlled by some giant corporation. And why that's good is it means like, imagine te five years from now even, I was gonna say 10, but it could be as little. Imagine five years from now, Reddit goes bust. Like Reddit just fucking dies. Most likely, some other website will buy them up, but let's say somehow no one does, or something happens where a website buys them up and decides to wipe the slate clean for some reason. You know, all of these posts with all of this information can just disappear overnight. Whereas if this sort of thing is hosted on small independent forums, uh, yeah, sure, one forum could go down. There could be one admin who decides to go, go insane and nuke the whole place. Uh, these sorts of things happened back in the days of forums, but uh, there was usually teams, people could have kept backups, and secondly, even if that does happen, worst case scenario, it's just like someone nuking a subreddit, right? Like one community gets nuked, but you don't lose everything. Whereas these sorts of things we think of as stable, right, the, the, uh, the corporations that run these platforms aren't actually stable. I mean, you can see this, it, it's happened with Tumblr uh, in some sense, you know, with a lot of stuff of Tumblr getting deleted. Uh, it happened with MySpace as probably the biggest example. And to some extent it's happening with Google right now. And it's also happening in some respects with Twitter where they're deleting, you know, inactive users or whatever. Um, I think the same thing happened with Facebook. Like these sorts of things happen all the time. Uh, they won't happen if, or they can't happen at this scale if your um, systems are more decentralized, because that's the main advantage of decentralization, is resilience, that even if one part of it goes down, the rest of it can stay up. Whereas with centralized platforms, uh, you know, they're, they're not resilient. If, one, if the, the single point of failure goes down, that's it, everything's lost. Not good. So that's, yeah, Reddit a little harder. Because the replacement exists, but it's up to, it's not up to you to move. It's up to some guy who's in charge of something to move it. Um, you know, I remember back in the day, yeah, I remember back in the day when there were still forums that were popular. And if you had a tech problem, here's what you did. You either went to the forum where someone told you to fuck off. That's what happened. Because they, if you asked a beginner question, they would be like, 
They would just tell you to read the fucking manual or whatever. And then maybe f uh, two months later, some nicer person would show up in a thread and be like, actually, here's the answer you were looking for, or something like this. Um, or uh, you would ask in the IRC, and the same basic thing would happen. Like, they would have an IRC chat, you'd ask your, your question, and maybe you would get lucky and someone would answer, but maybe you wouldn't. Uh, so I don't know if it's any better as a system. The same things happen on Reddit. We just don't see them, I suppose. Uh, I don't know. Same thing happens on Stack Exchange, for sure. What was the other one I was talking about? I said Discord, Reddit, Twitter? I mean, Twitter's easy. You don't need Twitter. You don't need to replace it with anything. Don't go to Mastodon. You don't need to. Just stop using it. You're not getting anything. Like, are you really getting anything out of being on Twitter? Like, when you really think about it, do you, do you act, is your life actually improved? No. You should probably just stop using Twitter. Um, if you really desperately need something that is exactly like Twitter, then use Mastodon, I suppose. But you should probably just stop. Um, and instead, I, what I would recommend is if you want to create text posts that people can read and read your friends' text posts, encourage people to just microblog on their own blog. Because that's what Twitter is, right? They call it like a microblogging th platform, right? Well, you, you know, web, there are many ways to make a website for free. Two examples are NeoCities, if you want to do a bit of HTML and CSS, or if you can't even be bothered to do that, there's a, a, a website called, I think it's called txti.something. Hold on, let me see if I can find it. TXTI Texty. TXTI.es. Oh, it's shutting down? What the hell? When did this happen? July 1st. Damn, it only just shut down 12 days ago because of bad actors. What are the bad actors? The one that was listening for the war. I guess people were using it to do fuck shit. Huh. Well, there's there's probably um some kind of alternative to this. I mean, NeoCities is fine. Okay, well, I'm going to consider this to be a good point in favor of self-hosting your website. Even though I host my website on NeoCities because I'm lazy, uh, ideally, you would be hosting it on... I mean, if you really want to be ideally, you can host a website on, like, a headless Raspberry Pi that you set up in your house. I don't know if that's ideal, actually, but it's definitely doable. Or just, you know, host a website with a hosting service. Um, yeah, this is an example of exactly what I'm talking about. Hey, it looks like I made my own point. This, th there's nothing about big or small corporate or independent shit that means that it can't just go down at any time and you lose it all. Uh, it might seem like these corporate platforms are more stable, but they're not. Everything's fucked. Uh, so I don't know what my point is anymore. Man, I'm going fucking dying. I'm going dying mode. I don't know what's happening to me. I think I've reached the end of my fucking mania or something. Because I'm finding it super hard to focus on anything today. God damn it. I don't want to talk about this for too long. I watched Emesis Blue last night. Which, if you don't know, is a big uh, TF2 source filmmaker movie that is on YouTube. I recommend watching it. It's an hour and 48 minutes long. Uh, you could probably... You know, you could watch it. You could watch it, and it'll be it'll be there. Wait, what the hell? What the hell happened here? I'm very confused about this. Why is this video privated? 
Okay, well, whatever. Emesis Blue. I have some thoughts about it. I don't want to talk too much about it, but... Uh, a lot of people... This is just something that happens every time a big fan project exists in any community. Like, oftentimes, people will be like, Oh my god, this is so amazing, this could be a real film. You know, or like... Uh, for example, I saw a comment that, that was like... Um, Emesis Blue is a film that could genuinely become an important part of film history. Imagine if it's the catalyst for more weird SFM or avant-garde horror films like this. And look, Emesis Blue is a good fan film. It is a very good fan film made by a very small team of people. But I'm just going to be frank with you. No. If you're not a Team Fortress 2 fan already and familiar with the world of SFM... YouTube tradition this film is not like traditionally competent uh, there's a lot of really good like the director whoever directed this I don't know much about the, the the behind the scenes but whoever directed this clearly watches a lot of movies there's a bunch of movie references in the film right? it clearly has a good eye for like visual style visual flair lighting there's a lot of like good use of lighting the real flaw that I find with this, with with Emesis Blue, I mean, there's a couple of, of giant flaws that kind of let the whole thing down. Three main aspects. So the directing, excellent. The animation, generally speaking, really good. There's a few bits of jank, but SFM's a janky program. It's it's never like distractingly bad. It's fine. The music, really good. Uh, that just the general atmosphere and pacing. All solid, all around. The stuff that lets it down is the momentary editing. This is the number one thing. I think almost no one besides me gives a shit about this. That there are many, in my opinion, jarring or off cuts in this in this film, where the distance between the like temporal distance between two sides of a cut is just too far. And so, like, for example, you'll have one camera, you have one shot where where someone's walking to a place and then it cuts to show a different angle and and it, he's just, like, slightly too already far towards the place. And you're like, we, we just skipped, like, a second. And it feels weird to watch. It feels like the guy just teleported when you watch. Because the idea is that you're supposed to, like, not notice a cut like that. And a lot of them are, are well done, you know, but there are too many cuts that are, have this same problem, where uh, the, the temporal distance between the two sides of a cut is just, just a little too far. Like, you can use a cut to speed up time a little bit, that's fine. Your brain will fill in the information. But if there's also... I mean, the worst one is there's one where... I think it's in the scene where Medic is walking up to the scout's house and there's like a wide angle pulled back shot of him walking towards the door. Then it cuts to a like mid shot or like to a slightly closer angle, still in wide though, uh, of him walking towards the door. So it cut, it's basically as if the camera just stayed where it is and just, or like stayed in the same view, but just moved forwards to follow the Medic. Like the camera cuts from a, a pulled back position to a closer position as he is like approaching the door and so it's really weird because it's it's almost like a jump cut from from breathless you know the like the car the driving scene from breathless it's almost like that um and then because the medic in one shot is like a good five paces away from the door and then the camera cuts forwards without changing angle and he's now like at the door and it's just a really jarring cut that i don't think is supposed to be a jarring cut and I know I'm just bringing up this specific example. There was a whole bunch of this throughout the movie, and it kind of is weird to watch. Like, it, it, it's often, you know, if it's done for the for the sake of, of like... Obviously, there are times during the, the sort of horror scenes where they break the rules of continuity editing in a, in a, in a good way, which, which helps to accentuate... You know the 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 disorientated feeling. Uh, but these there's also times when it happens, and I'm just like that's that feels like a mistake. That doesn't feel intentional. 
Uh, like, there's a few times when... I mean, actually, one of the big problems in general with the editing and directing of the film is there's not enough establishing shots. Uh, like, there's often times where you're watching people go around an environment and you it's really hard to figure out where characters are in relation to each other and what the room as a whole looks like and, like, what where everything is. You know, you you need, like... Like have it would be really nice to have some some wider shots, some establishing shots, some some clearer, uh, you know, shots where where multiple uh, subjects are in the frame, so you can see where they are in relation to each other. I'm thinking especially about the scene where medic takes out the NG, um, in the the sort of spoilers in the sort of two four intel room. And it's like, I know what the 2-4 intel room is like, because I've just been there in in the game a million times, right? Like, we know what it's like. But if you're not a TF2 fan, that scene, I mean, it feels confusing to watch, because the room is, like, changed from how it is in the game. But then also, like, the, there's never an establishing shot. Well, there is, but it's very, like, it, it only shows, like, half of the room. And it, it's just, that, that whole scene... Even though I felt like I could generally follow the action, it also felt a bit like the scale was kind of changing, that, like, I wasn't quite sure where things were in relation to each other, and, yeah, it was just a little... There's a lot of stuff like that. I mean, this happens... It's. I mean, it happens in that scene, but it happens in a lot of other scenes in the film, where uh, there just needs to be a little more focus on trying to communicate effectively the space of whatever whatever you're trying to trying to express to the audience like I feel like that's something that was missed out on and this is I think just the general problem with the directing and editing in the film is that this guy's watched a bunch of films and knows how to construct a really cool looking shot and there are some edits and cuts and shots in this film that look really good and are extremely effective there's one that I specifically remember where Medic climbs onto the 2-4, uh, like, like, the place where the snipers hang out, basically. And then he goes into the sort of room where the, the, the resupply is. He's, or, like, that, not into the resupply room, but the room that leads into that, and then it also leads it down. You know what I'm talking about? It's like you exit the resupply, there's a sort of room, there's, like, some hay, people put teleporters there. And uh, one side goes to the sort of courtyard area, one side goes to the bridge and the battlements area, and there's another door that goes down to the stairs to the intel room, and there's another door that goes to a little drop down. You know that that space? He's walking into that space, and the cut, there's a, there's a, a, a very natural sort of cut on the motion of medic walking, where it goes from sort of, I think it's like a dolly shot of him walking in, and then it cuts to a, like, over-the-head shot, where it's sort of a tracking shot from directly above of him walking, and it's it just a really nice, like, the way it's framed, and the way that the cuts flow into each other, it's like, even though that's a fairly odd um, it's not a standard cinematic language kind of shot, you know. It's like a, uh, a it's like a, a very specific kind of framing. It's not something that you would normally see. I mean, it's not like super unusual, but you know what I mean. It's not like a standard type of thing. It's done very well, where they sort of all the shots flow into each other. It feels like like the sort of edit and the sort sort of thing you would see in a real movie. And I think the reason for that is that there's a strong continuity of motion between these two shots. There's the, 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 the heavy focus on the motion of the medic walking that keeps, even though you know, there's a very big disparity between what you're seeing from one shot to another, the focus of the frame being on this central motion of medic walking in a straight line, you, it serves to, like, you know, keep you... Keep your brain to un understand continuity. <laughs> that was a badly constructed sentence. It has, serves to, you know, if, if you, you don't get confused. It doesn't feel disorienting, even though it's like a, uh, it, it, 
you write uh this is like a pretty typical rule of like editing and stuff you can watch or whatever but uh you know these kinds of things where you focus on one strong motion in order to keep the cuts feeling consistent and continuous rather than these weird discontinuous there's a lot of like yeah so i'm not saying they fuck up every single edit i'm just saying there are more weird editing mistakes i i mean calling them mistakes is maybe even a little strong just it feels like this guy it, i mean it feels like a guy someone's first film which i guess it probably is right like it feels like someone who's who really knows how to make a shot look pretty with great you know edge lighting and uh very bold framing but hasn't had a, they didn't they need to hire an editor is what i'm saying that they sort of a lot of the editing in the film doesn't it's it's really the editing is the big problem here it's not the directing it's mainly just uh yeah the timing and and flow of shots going into one another hire an editor next time maybe uh so that's that's something I'm I'm very passionate about that sort of thing. I think most people probably won't even notice or care about these this stuff. I just wanted to be an editor for like two years, uh, and like when I was uh, doing a film course. So I'm kind of like autistic about this stuff. Uh, but anyway, that's the first thing that I that kind of struck me as as kind of amateurish and weird. And then maybe the thing that most people will notice. Uh, I think above all of that is the voice acting, man. <laughs> the voice acting. Some of the, the whoever does Soldier does a pretty good job. Whoever does Scout does a really good job. Um, Medic is pretty good, but Spy's voice acting, man, it's so bad. Like this guy just drops the accent every second line. Like he's trying to do a French accent. He clearly does. I've never heard a French person in his life except for the TF2 spy. Like he doesn't know what he's doing. And then there's a scene where I was like, his voice is just completely, this is, he's British now. Like, I guess the voice actor is probably, like, English. Because he just, he just completely forgets to do the accent in a particular, in one scene. And then, like, halfway through reading his lines, he just randomly decides, oh, shit, I'm supposed to be French. And then he starts doing French again. It's really weird. And, and yeah, that's definitely, I think, the, the most amateurish part of the whole production is just this voice acting. Um, like, look, I'm not a voice actor, but I'm, and I'm not particularly good at doing a French accent, but I think I could have done a better job than whoever did Spy. No offense to this guy, uh, but, you know, there's not that much dialogue in the film. <laughs> I, I don't even really care if the accent's bad. As long, as long as it's consistent, like, it's just really, really jarring to hear someone's voice change completely randomly throughout a movie. It's very jarring. Yeah, I think that's the that's like the, the probably the most obvious flaw with Emesis Blue, and then another thing is uh, the script or just the writing. I mean, most of the dialogue I would say is passable. Like I wouldn't say it's good, but I would uh, you know it it generally serves to have information get across. And sometimes you know there are attempts at comedy that almost work, but. One thing that's very odd is how there are there are really long stretches of the movie with little to no dialogue, which is clearly a stylistic choice, I mean, I think, right? But it's a little confusing to me because these scenes are sometimes, they're really effective, right? Sometimes it creates like a lot of tension in a very, hot, like a horror or, or thrilling kind of scene and that stuff works super, super well. And that that's a I understand why they went with that choice. Like it, it it's great, but there are other times when it's used in like an action scene, or or something like this, where these characters who were talking up a storm two minutes earlier have suddenly just only have the capacity to grunt, and it's very strange because it feels like a situation where people would be talking to each other. Like it it feels like someone stepped in and forced the, it it just feels really unnatural the way they just sometimes will go into a scene and then all the characters forget how to speak it's really weird when you when you're watching it like i don't i don't know if that comes across 
Like sometimes it works, but yet there are, there are times when I'm watching it, I'm just like, have these guys just forgotten how to talk? <laughs> it's really, I don't know. They, they go on. They, they, I don't know, man. It's strange. It's strange. All of that being said, you know, I'm not trying to say the movie is bad for a, for a fan project. Again, in terms of like a feature length fan film, like this is like amazing. Right, like let's not. I, I'm, 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 I'm judging this against professional productions here. Of course, you know, if we're actually taking a step back, it's not going to be like that. What I'm saying is, t- maybe these t- TF2 fans who are sort of, you know, very hardcore into this movie, saying, "Oh, this could be like a real film movement." I don't think so. <laughs> like, it's not really on that level. It's a, it's a very, very good fan film. Um, and very ambitious, and actually pulls off a lot of what's going for, and it's really, uh, you know, YouTube analysis bait, where they leave a lot of unopened, unanswered questions, and Easter eggs, and these sorts of things, where it's like the exact sort of thing to that that works really well to bait, uh, like some map hat type figure to come in and and make up a bunch of shit to try and piece together the lore, and it's also very lore heavy. Um, like, they leave a lot of stuff open, but then also they imply a whole bunch of lore, and they imply, like, timelines and stuff, so it's, it's you know, very good for for a YouTube analysis core, um, which is a, a smart marketing decision. Uh, does it actually work for the film? In my opinion, it's sort of a 50-50. I think... Uh, Sometimes it can create a, a nice sense of sort of psychological horror where you're not really sure what's going on and it creates a, a very uh, interesting atmosphere, spooky atmosphere kind of thing, mysterious, intriguing. But then having none of these questions be answered or having you know a lot of these questions be answered in very open-ended ways, um, it also feels a little unsatisfying, which is always going to be the trade-off you make when you, you go over that kind of approach. Uh, sometimes it feels unsatisfying, and sometimes it's just straight-up confusing, which, uh, I mean, yeah, the, maybe it's just a personal taste kind of thing, but I did find some of the plot aspects of this movie to be a little confusing, to be a little uh, sort of self-contradictory where where characters would sort of say one thing or imply one thing and then uh also you know say something else or something else would happen that seems to contradict it and it feels like that's intentional but it's also a little confusing when you're watching the movie now to be fair i was kind of tired when i watched the movie i was about to go i watched it before i went to bed which is probably a bad idea given it's a pretty spooky film uh so maybe that's why i didn't like i found some of it confusing but i think it is just genuinely kind of like kind of meant to be very open-ended and and leave you with a lot of unanswered questions yeah anyway that's that's my emesis blue thoughts uh yeah okay damn jamaica don't play jamaica don't play games with they shit shouts out jamaica they don't play games uh i decided i thought you know what it's a it's a it's a hot Summer's day. It's a hot summer's day. And, uh... <coughs> excuse me, excuse me. It's a hot summer's day. And you know what would be a nice thing to do today? Uh, is get a, get a, a nice cold alcoholic beverage and take a chill evening of, a, of light buzzness. Light buzzness. Well, I... Went to the shop to purchase some form of... Oh, oh, I missed the air shot. Okay, got him though. You know we don't play games around here in this video game. <laughs> you know in this video game we don't play video games. Um, I ain't playing no video games. I play video games. Anyway, what I'm telling you is... Um, overproof rum... <laughs> <laughs> Overproof Ray and Nephew's rum is what I smoke. Uh, and uh, this, this, well, it's interesting. 
to be sure. Uh, I'm drinking Ray and Ting, is what I'm trying to tell you. Ray and Ting, a classic Jamaican beverage. The national drink of Jamaica, arguably. Uh, it's, let me tell you what it is. It's Ting, which is a grapefruit soda, and Ray and Nephew, which is uh, an overproof navy rum. It is 63% alcohol. Uh, I saw that the shop nearby had these big ass bottles of Ray and Nephew, and I was like, can't pass that opportunity up. Because it actually tastes really good. Like, it's not just that it's really strong, it also t like tastes really nice. Um, I've had it before, but I generally avoid it because it's so strong, you know. I say, you know, it's it, generally speaking, alcohol here, at least spirits, are like 40%. So it's like, you know, significantly more alcoholic than your average alcohol. Um, <clears throat> I'm about to die. I died. Uh, so I generally, am, but you know, I was like refreshing beverage time. Anyway, sorry, I'm getting off topic. What I'm trying to tell you is that, damn, I didn't even drink very much at all, and I feel fucking sloshed. Uh, anyway, <laughs> that aside, I want to talk about Errant Signal. Now, Errant Signal is someone who I believe is generally a pretty good video game video essayist on YouTube. I've been watching him for a long time. Um one of the first video essay channels I ever subscribed to on YouTube, actually. Maybe. That might be wrong. Uh, but I definitely have been watching him for a long time and enjoying his videos for a long time. But he, <clears throat> he just posted a video in his excellent Children of Doom series, where he's going through the, the video games influenced by Doom, right? Like the, the, the chronological timeline of all of the games in the the lineage of Doom, even starting before Doom itself. And this one is a an hour long video about Half-Life 1, which you may know is one of my favorite video games. And uh, disappointingly, I think he, he misunderstands the game on every level, which is very sad. I've heard this guy get criticized before, but hearing him play, like, just completely miss the point of Half-Life. To be fair, okay, you know what, I'm being way too critical. To be fair, I'm the only person in the world that actually understands the point of Half-Life. Me and Leadhead, and Leadhead only half gets it. Uh, and you can tell that he doesn't understand the point of Half-Life, because he's complaining, or at least criticize. Okay, let me be clear here. Half-Life 1 is not free from criticism, okay? It has massive fucking problems as a video game. Uh, you know, Zen sucks. On a rail is one of the worst things put in a video game ever. The gunplay, you know, at times is extremely janky, uh, and that leaves much to be desired. There are plenty of problems with Half-Life. But the environments and storytelling are not those problems. You know, Errant Signal says that the game has, has no story to speak of. It's more like a theme park ride than a narrative. I think no one, I think this is a, probably a common sentiment because people miss out on the, the subjectivity of the whole thing. People don't realize what you're playing. And I, I actually, I know the exact reason for this. It's because of Half-Life 2. It's because Half-Life 2 is coloring these people's perceptions of what Gordon Freeman represents and what, uh, you know, the, the, the world is. Because it just completely, you know, made a bunch of shit up and changed everything about Half-Life. Uh, like, retcon it. And it makes, you know, like, if you go from Half-Life 2 back to Half-Life 1, you can, you can make everything make sense in your head and then the story seems weak and the characters don't really seem present and everything because the, those elements are so sort of overblown. I mean, I'm, I'm even being too harsh on Half-Life 2, but they're, they're very, you know, much central aspects of Half-Life 2 in a very, like, forward way where 
the game will trap you in a room and force you to listen to exposition for 15 minutes every, you know, so often in gameplay. Whereas Half-Life 1's not going to do that. The, the actual narrativizing, the moments where the game stops and says, look at me, I'm telling you a story right now, which is not, this is not a critique of Half-Life 2, by the way. Every video game does this. They normally just do it in cutscenes. But, like, the Half-Life 1 doesn't, right? I say every video game. Obviously, not every video game has cutscenes, but... Yeah. Half-Life 1's not going to stop the the pacing of its its world in order to tell you to sit down while, while they exposit at you, or, or while characters do, like, some sort of wacky, um, you know... Uh, <clears throat> moment where they, they, they like mog the camera. Half Life One's not going to do that. What you have to understand is how in Half Life One is you have to, you have to forget Half Life Two exists, and try and understand who what Gordon Freeman is on his own terms. See in the game, and I'm not just schizo when I say this. Okay, in the game, Gordon Freeman is like a Nick Land esque figure. Okay, he's this 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 very smart you know, genius scientist, or at least he's not a genius, but he's, you know, an academic. He's got a PhD. He works at the science facility, right? Like, he's this, he's this, like, academic guy who's, but he's also, like, completely off his fucking rocker in this insane survival situation. It's kind of like, um, like Rambo 1. If you've ever seen the movie Rambo, the first one, it's kind of like, it's kind of like, um, you know the scene in, in uh, hmm, I'm not sure what to, what to compare it to. It's like a lot of things. Why can't I do this? Oh, it won't let me. That's a shame. It's like a lot of things. But he's this, he's this guy who's lived this like very academic life. And then suddenly, he's in the midst of an alien invasion. And this is the key fact. He is high as balls on morphine the entire time. When you play the game, you don't even pay attention to it because it just becomes like noise in your head. Your brain doesn't register it as words. Every two minutes, your suit, the HEV suit, is saying to you, morphine administered, okay? The HEV suit is keeping you in this state of like opiate bliss the entire time. Meanwhile, you know... All of this crazy psychedelic shit is happening around you where aliens that shoot lasers from their faces and shit like that is, is popping up. It's got like body horror elements to a much larger degree than Half-Life 2. It's like the, the Nihilinth. If you get a good look at the Nihilinth's model, it's like some H.R. Geiger meets Cronenberg shit. Like, it's, like, sewn up with giant staples and, like, body parts attached to it and with, with visible stitching, and it's crazy. Like, these, you know, you've got the, the vortigaunts where the, the, the metal of their sort of weird encaging, enclosing slavery chains is, like, fused to their skin. Uh, and then it all takes place in this impossible House of Leaves-esque, impossibly large underground military structure and what does Gordon Freeman spend most of the game doing is f shooting US military personnel you Gordon Freeman is an insane super intelligent bunny hopping entity who is high as fuck and engaging in a one man war against the US military and winning okay if that's not a, f a fucking story like, I don't know what the fuck is. You want Alex Vance to take her tits out and be like, oh, I'm fucking Alex Vance in front of you every 10 minutes? Then play Half-Life 2. If you want to play a video game where you are Nick Land shooting the US government, then play Half-Life 1, okay? I don't know how... He's complaining that the environments don't make physical sense. That's the goddamn point, you fucking idiot. <laughs> They're not supposed to make them. It's, all, it's like... It's, it's like compl Hold on a minute. The TARDIS is bigger on the inside. How is that possible? That doesn't make any sense with physics. What the hell? That's not possible. You're telling me there's that it doesn't explain, the game doesn't explain why this military base seems to be like both impossibly large with gigantic brutalist architecture right next to like 70s office spaces, 90s-esque, uh, you know, machinery, with retro-futuristic 
um, computer technology, meanwhile working on hyper-futuristic military weaponry, and yet none of the architecture makes any logical sense. Corridors lead to places where, you know, departments are, are impossibly far away from each other and all this in a sort of Kafka-esque manner. And you think that's not intentional? You think this is like some mistake or some weird thing that's like, oh, the designers just didn't really put much thought into it. Like, maybe. I don't really care what the designers were thinking when they made the game. They made what they made. And what they made is this, like, incredible environmental storytelling that reflects, uh, you know, the, 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 the strange psychological goings-on in Gordon Freeman's brain combined with this, like, criticism uh, of the military-industrial complex as this, like... Or it, even to call it a criticism is, is maybe too too flat. It's, it's, it's just sort of an, an analysis or, a, a, <clears throat> you know, what it's, what it's really saying is just like the, these spaces that it occupies, this, this part of society is so impossibly large and impossibly well-funded and incomprehensible, it's like, like to mere humans, to people who aren't a part of this like world, it's just like impossible to comprehend what the fuck is going on there, right? Like all of this is going on and reflected in the architecture and you're saying, oh, this, this is like some weird flaw with the game where like, oh, the spaces don't, you know, they make pseudo sense, but they don't really make sense if you think about it. That's the, the point. And then you've got, you know, Gordon Freeman in the middle of all of this, just killing people. Like, this guy's never killed anyone before, and all of a sudden he's, he, the second, the absolute instant that the military turn on the scientists, you know, you, you fucking fire back with, without a second thought, okay? Like, hold on a minute. So this game is intentionally framing the U.S. military right next to literal inhuman aliens who attack without any sort of thought, right? Like head crabs, for example, who then possess the bodies of their, their victim. Like, hold on, you think this could be saying something? Or is it just like some weird design choice by, you know, a studio that hadn't made a game before properly? Unless you can't, I guess like Ricochet? Did Ricochet come out before Half-Life 1? I don't know. It's like, no, obviously not. You're bunny hopping you know, across, you're, you're bunny hopping through unforeseen consequences like a speed demon and then telling me that this, this, this is like some mistake in the game. No, buddy. You're the one that's mistaken. Yeah, I, I just don't think this guy understands Half-Life on the level that I understand Half-Life, you know? And maybe I'm the crazy one here. Maybe I'm the only one that reads this deep into this game. But I, I think it's all part of it. That's all f colors my experience. I can say that much for sure. Okay, when I play the game, that's how I feel. Okay, I, I recorded that segment, then pressed play on the video, only for him to say, literally, the instant I press play, something like, and even though it doesn't feel like a real place, for some reason, it works. It And then he was just to, literally saying a bunch of the same shit I said. Not to the same degree that I was saying it, but he was basically saying, like, actually, none of that is uh, a negative at all. So my criticism is misplaced. I apologize, Ellen Signal, if you're watching. I know you're watching. I know you're a huge fan of the Backwards No Thank You channel. I know you're a huge fan and you watch all my videos and you're subscribed to me and you, you're a Patreon, patreon.com forward slash no thank you, and you're in the Discord. Uh, and I know you, you post in the crazy world all the time, uh, you know, but so so because of that I would like to apologize personally to you and and your family which I have dishonored uh, and so <clears throat> you you actually may not understand the the true scope of Half-Life 1's flawed beauty but uh, you're, you're as close to understanding it as as many people ever get including me. So, that's all I have to say on that subject. Let me tell you a little something about video games. You know, I never, 
even though I'm not a 90s kid, I'm not a millennial, I'm a Zoomer, uh, because I was only allowed handheld consoles as a kid, and my, my first video game console was the Game Boy Advanced SP, you know, my first experiences with games for the first few years that I had ever played video games was pixel graphics and 2D until I got a DS. Um, and uh, you would think that would give me, like, nostalgia for pixel graphics, but it doesn't. Like, I don't have any particular nostalgic attraction to them. And I think that's because, like, the only games I played, as far as, like, the only, I only remember three video games uh, from my Game Boy days. The first was Pokemon Emerald, which I never beat. I never beat any of these, let me make this clear. I was really young. Um... And, and yeah, I was also, yeah, I mean, what do you expect? I never beat any of these games. Um, but Pokemon Emerald, which I got relatively far in with uh, a, a, a Blaziken called Ah, because it was my starter Pokemon. I didn't know how the keyboard worked, and it was the first time I'd ever touched a Game Boy. So I just spammed A. I had a, a Blaziken called Ah, and then I had another Pokemon called Ah, just a single A. I don't know what my other ones were called, but yeah. I may I remember I don't know how far I got, I don't remember, but I remember making it relatively far through the game and then getting lost and not knowing how to continue and just spending ages being really frustrated just walking around the entire map, not knowing where the fuck to go, backtracking all the way back to Pallet Town, all the way back to where I, I just was completely fucking lost. I had no idea what to do. I probably would have been able to beat the game if I'd known where to go, but I just got lost. I 100% would have, I, because I was, I mean, the fact that I backtracked all the way and then all the way back, I had been walking, you know, I'd been fucking essentially grinding against wild Pokemon. So my Blaziken was ridiculously overleveled for the areas I was in. So Pokemon Emerald's main game. I also remember playing a game called SpongeBob and Friends Unite which apparently in the U.S. is called Nicktoons Unite. Um, I also never beat this. I think I got to, like, the third level, maybe the fourth one at my furthest. Uh, and I remember not really liking it that much. Even though you play as, like, a bunch of characters I liked, like SpongeBob and Danny Phantom, I thought, I thought the game just sucked. It probably did, you know? Although, apparently, the, 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 there's, like, multiple versions of it. But anyway. And the other game I remember playing is, apparently, Astro Boy Omega. And this game, I remember just knowing was, like, impossibly hard. So, the furthest I ever got in this game, it seems to, it seems to be, and, like, looking back on this, the first level is, like, there's, like, a tutorial section. And then you beat that. I definitely remember this, 100%. And then you, you go fight like a... It's like a really, really easy first stage. I remember doing this. Yeah. I remember that. I remember all of this. Yeah, this was cool. The game looks great. Like, it, as in, like, visually. It looks really good. The sprite work and stuff is really good. Then you fight these spider guys. Right, I remember this. And then you fight a spider, like, mini-boss. I, I did that. This is, like, the first ten minutes of the game. Then, you fight a real boss, who I guess is, like, a giant mechanical spider. And I remember that. And this is where I would often die, but not all the time. And then once you get past this, this boss, this is 15 minutes into the, into the game, according to this, this long play. You have this flying level, and then you do this flying level, which I also was relatively easy. And then this crazy shit happens where the sun gets really big, and it turns into a boss who looks crazy. And then you have to fight this, like, giant mechanical one-eyed cyclops, trippy-looking ass, illuminati-looking ass boss as it like orbits you and the first stage of this boss i could do but then what it would happen is as you damaged it it would get bigger until a certain point and 
I could do that, but then once you damage it a certain amount, it would shrink again and then grow tentacles. And this was the part that was like that I never got past. Is it would shrink again and then it would grow tentacles, which looks super freaky deaky. And then again, the more you damage it, the bigger it gets. Except now these tentacles are stretching out. And like eventually it gets so big that it's like filling most of the screen. And I just had no idea how to deal with this. There's a dodge mechanic? I never knew there was a dodge. Oh, so I guess you're supposed to use this dodge mechanic to like get iframes to move through the tentacles. I just never knew that existed. What the fuck? Okay, so that's clearly why I could never beat this, is because you're supposed to like use this dodge or like dash mechanic to like use your iframes to get through the tentacles as they as they take up the screen. Because otherwise, if you touch them, you take damage, and so I would just die. I never got past that ever. Uh, and so yeah. And I don't remember any other Game Boy game that I had. I think I might have had a Mario Kart game, but I, I don't really remember it because I only remember Mario Kart DS. Look, the Zuma menace needs to be stopped, okay? This scourge of, of people who don't know how to use the voting systems needs to be stopped. Look, I've we, we've had some conversations about voting systems on this channel many times about rating systems. But there's one thing I think everyone can agree with. You go, you go to Oshinoko on, on myanimalist.net right now, and you go to the stats page, you'll see that over 50%, 54% of votes are 10 out of 10. That is, frankly, fucking insane. I've seen the show, okay? I saw the first episode. It was alright. I don't think there is any universe where this show is literally perfect. What are you guys talking about? Someone needs to put a stop to this. This is like the opposite of review bombing. There's some sort of coordinated attack on my anime list to make this show like the highest rated. It's insane. It has a 9.0 on Mal. What is going on here? I, I'd kind of given up on, on thinking that music was a viable career. Like I kind of accepted at this point that like my popularity peaked with the, the 100 Gex remix and that I was just gonna make whatever the fuck I wanted to make for my own artistic pleasure without focusing on marketing myself or anything like that. But it's it seems to me that I could probably make enough money from music alone to like mostly support myself. Um, so I don't know what to do with this information. Given that I spend so little like, I live so minimally. Like, all, all my... I mean, I go through my bank statements. I spend, like... You know, some months I spend, like, 200 quid the whole month. And that's... Like, half that is groceries. In fact, it's oftentimes more than half. And then the other half is bills. So it's like... And, you know, when it comes to bills, I don't have any subscription services or anything like that. So just, like, you know, the standard gas, electricity, internet kind of things, right? So it's like I'm spending 100 quid on food, 100 quid on bills, and then basically nothing else. Uh, it's like if I can make 200 pounds a month, it's not that crazy, right? It's not that crazy, you know, and then try and aim for that level of frugality. I could easily break even. I don't know, man. I, I generally like this guy, Adam Ragusia, on, on YouTube, food YouTuber. Although, these days, I, I liked his podcast a lot in the past. But his podcast has kind of gone off the rails. He's just stopped talking about food completely. And he just, he it, it was originally this podcast where he would, like, answer people's, like, food science type questions. And food history questions. And he would do, like, three per video, and it was really good. And he did a couple of one-offs where he would just talk about one subject for the whole video and do, like, a deep dive. And those were also really good. But now every video is like that. And half of them aren't even about food anymore. And half of them are, like, his wife's there. It's always kind of weird when his wife's there. Not because she's, like, a bad person or anything. She seems chill. But something, like, I think maybe she's, like, nervous in front of the camera. 
or like he's nervous talking to her in front of the camera. Something about their dynamic on camera feels weirdly off. And like, when I say off, I mean like kind of stilted and unnatural. Um, not sure why. Uh, but I mean, I don't hate those videos. It's fine. But I, man, sometimes I watch this guy and I'm like, what's going, what's going on? Like, for example, his most recent video, I actually couldn't watch because he was just talking about microphones the entire time and like giving like the most absolutely like baby's first introduction to what a microphone is. <laughs> for like and it goes on forever like i click the video and it's like it's got this kind of interesting concept like he's talking about this phenomenon of people zoomers using lavalier mics as like handheld mics which is something i've noticed and thought it's kind of neat and i'm like damn you really gonna squeeze an hour-long podcast out of that okay interesting how he does it is by just going into excruciatingly high levels of detail about the most basic things which maybe it's not basic to someone who's never used a microphone before but like I mean he he also just gets stuff wrong that's the painful thing and now the fact that he gets stuff wrong is like making me kind of question like what has he been saying this whole time has he been getting stuff wrong the whole time like he says um you know, he says, uh, oh, these, these lav mics, they come in all sorts of different, uh, sorry, uh, these, these lav mics, they come in all sorts of different types, you know, they've got, uh, uh, dynamic microphones, condenser mics, and, and ribbon, and I'm like, are you insane? You think they're making ribbon lav mics? I mean, maybe they are, But that sounds insane to me. Why would they make a ribbon? Why would you possibly need or want that? I highly doubt that lav mics are ever ribbon mics. If you don't know what that means, the ribbon microphones are the the, the oldest, like, style of internal workings of a microphone. It has, like, a, a, a foil ribbon that hangs down in the middle of the mic, and that's what vibrates to you know, and it passes an electric current through it, which has, um, sort of pickups, like a guitar pickups on either side that, like, pick up the vibrations of the ribbon. And what I know about ribbon mics is two things. Firstly, well, three things. I know three things. Firstly, they're the first type of microphone, so they're generally quite old. Secondly, they're expensive as fuck. And thirdly, they're really delicate compared to other types of microphone. At least two of those things, the fact that they're delicate and expensive, makes them completely unsuitable for being a tiny lav mic that gets strapped to someone as they run around and shit. That doesn't make any sense. Why would you... I mean... uh, No, it it actually wouldn't work, because the microphone needs to be still to work. Because otherwise the ribbon would, like, flop about. Surely. You can't have a ribbon mic that's a lav. I mean, unless I'm completely wrong... But I, I don't think that that would possibly work. And then he starts talking about the sound quality of, like, a, a boom mic versus a lav mic, right? Where a lav mic is, like, you know, right close to your face. And then if you're holding it in your hand, you can get it even closer to your mouth versus a, a boom mic that you might see on a, you know, a shotgun mic on a film set, which is generally further from the actor's. Um, and he talks about, like, why that affects the sound quality. And he gets some stuff right. But, I mean, unless I missed it, because I didn't watch the whole video, because it was just, like, he's just, he he was just talking about how the quality of the sound changes because it's picking up much more of the room noise, which is true, but the main, you know, the major thing is the proximity effect, which is the, the fundamental way that microphones differ, differ from, from our ears, is that uh, our ears perceive sound the same way no matter where the source is. Like, you know, it, the, we might get different uh, amounts of sound waves hitting our ears, but we perceive that sound to be of the same quality no matter where it is. Whereas microphones have something called the proximity effect, where the closer the source is to the, the mic, 
the the more bass frequencies it picks up like the the more bassy the sound is i mean you can test this right now if you open up your mic i mean look i'll do it right now okay here i am putting my here i am i'm gonna like talk a bit louder here i am putting the the laptop mic further away and now i'm gonna get closer and quieter and here i am closer and quieter to the microphone you can probably hear that my voice sounds a lot bassier right now and yes part of that is because i'm lowering my voice but also it's the proximity effect because i'm closer to the microphone so i have a sexy voice over voice i don't think he even talks about that then he just name drops he name drops mics like it's like it's nothing you know he's clearly what I'm, what I'm seeing in this video is someone who's trying to sound like they know a lot about microphones without really knowing like that much about microphones. Like he, he name drops, uh, you know, the RE20 and the SM7B, which I guess he comes from radio. So like those are the two main mics used in radio and, and VO. It's like, you know, they're good mics. Don't get me wrong. I would love to have one of either of those. Um, but it's also like if you know any microphones you know those <laughs> because they're well at least especially if you're a zoomer because they're the most common YouTuber mics especially the SM7B uh, anyway yeah I don't know this the video was strange because it had nothing to do with food and he made other videos that had nothing to do with food um, yeah I just wanted to complain about that um, what else did he make? He did he did this other Oh yeah, he he did this video. I didn't even watch this one. He did this video about obesity as a slur, which was just like I don't even know the, the he, he he's I don't even know what that like I feel like I watched the whole video and he I somehow came away knowing absolutely nothing more about the the topic than when I'd started watching it. Somehow he talked for an hour about something and yet taught me anyone any that did, didn't say anything because he's he's trying very hard to like both sides of the issue, I suppose. Um like I don't really know. It's kind of confusing. He's simultaneously like, uh, words have meanings because of the way people use them, not because an authority decides how people use them, right? Like he's being like a, you know, a descriptivist. But then he says, however, campaigning to try and get authorities to, to use words the way you want to use them so that you'll influence everyone is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. And I'm like, doesn't that kind of go against, like, isn't that kind of confusing? I mean, he's saying it's a natural part, like, I think he's just confused a little bit about, like, the the study of linguistics, right? Which is like, if you were studying ornithology, for example, you wouldn't go out and try and tell the birds to exhibit certain behavior patterns, because you're just there to write down what sort of behavior patterns those birds are engaged in. In the same way, linguists aren't supposed to, right, yeah? But if you're a bird, well, actually, I don't know where I'm going with this. I don't think this metaphor really makes sense. <laughs> I don't think this analogy is, uh, makes any fucking sense. I started, I started talking <laughs> without thinking about where I was going to go with this analogy at all. Anyway, I have nothing against this guy. I don't know why I'm shit-talking him video's fine. I'm sure the video's fine. By the way, still reading King Koi, I actually finished um, Sylvia's route yesterday. Or was it today? I don't know. The days, they blend together. It's all the same to me. I've been reading Ella's route. Um, bit of a problem with Ella's, Ella's route is uh, that the central arc plot intrigue is based on a twist that you already know if you've played Sylvia's Route. So I don't know if you're supposed to not know it, but 
it goes on for a le- little for a long time. I mean, this is just another example of this visual novel, like really strongly telegraphing upcoming bits of plot and intrigue and stuff, uh, with zero subtlety. But in this case, I don't know if you're supposed to know. Because you can unlock, you can, like, the, 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 you, this route is okay to play. <laughs> oh my god, I'm fucking having a stroke once again. Um, you can play through Sylvia, Reyna, and Ella's roots right off the bat. So you could play this one first, theoretically, and not know this. I feel like it just doesn't work as well if, you, if you've if you played through Sylvia's route already. I don't know if this piece of information gets revealed in Reyna's route, because I haven't played it yet. But yeah, after only after you've played those do you unlock the other routes. So, um, yeah. It's, it's not bad. I wouldn't, I would say, I didn't really talk about it, but I'd say the, the like, Sylvia's route was kind of, better early on and towards the second half or the the final third i wouldn't say it got bad but i would say it got a little more generic a little less interesting a little less unique um yeah a couple of good age scenes a couple of pretty well one good age scene the other ones weren't that good in my opinion um yeah anyway I, i will uh I will simply continue to play this until I know what's going on. Um, one of one of my projects on this channel is to continually try and espouse to people how to make a proper carbonara. Um, and like I'm telling you, guys, please go make one. Go make car- carbonara. It's arguably the best pasta dish. It's easy as fuck. It's simple as fuck. It's delicious. And it's delicious and it's easy. Um, you you just have to know you just have to do it right. Cause the problem is everyone fucks it up. I don't know how. It's like the easiest. It's got three ingredients. How do you fuck it up? Okay, here's how you make a carbonara properly. The first step is you have to make two other types of pasta first, so you can learn the essence. First, you gotta make, a, and you can even skip this step. You can even skip this, but. You can you can make a a, a cacio e pepe, cacio e pepe. That's just pasta, pasta water, pecorino romano, and black pepper. You can substitute pecorino for parmesan. Italians probably won't get mad at you for that. With cacio e pepe, you should probably go with pecorino over parmesan. But any Italian hard cheese, you know. Even Grana Padana. It's not ideal, but it's possible. Um, <clears throat> yeah, look up a Cacio e Pepe like, recipe or something. I think J. Kenji Lopez alt might have one. That's good. Uh, yeah, and then what you want to do, I think this is key before you make carbonara, is you have to learn how to make pasta alla gricia. Which is basically a carbonara with no eggs, or a uh, cacio e pepe with guanciale. Uh, <clears throat> now, it's hard to find guanciale in your, if you're not in Italy. I definitely can't find it, so, you know, I normally end up using pancetta, which is not, like, criminal. I don't think Italians will get that mad at you for using pancetta. And if you can't find pancetta, it is acceptable to use streaky bacon try and find bacon that's as fatty as possible however try and avoid smoked bacon try and use unsmoked bacon i've used when i had nothing else i have made a carbonara with smoked bacon it doesn't ruin the dish like it's still fine but it just loses something it's just an extra flavor that kind of distracts from the 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 point It, it it makes it a little too too much, I guess, because it's already, like, really rich and really heavy, and the smokiness just kind of adds to it in a, in a not a good way, yeah, 
I would recommend going with just cured, non-smoked bacon. If you have to use bacon, pancetta is better, and guanciale is even better. The point of making these other pasta dishes first is to understand the principle of carbonara, which everyone gets wrong, which is that carbonara is non-egg-based pasta. It's a pasta dish based on the emulsion between the pasta water and the fat from the guanciale and the cheese. The eggs are just a binder. They're not the primary ingredient. This is what people get wrong. Second thing people get wrong. Don't put garlic in it. Carbonara doesn't have garlic. Don't put it in it. Don't, don't do it. Don't put garlic in it. Don't do it. Don't put garlic. Don't do it. No garlic. Okay? Here's the ingredients. You want pasta? That's step one. Pasta. You want egg. I like to do one whole egg. This is for, for one portion. I like to do one whole egg and one egg yolk for extra richness. But also just because I find if I use two whole eggs, it's too much egg for one person sized portion. Even one, you know, like you could probably get away with just using one egg if you really wanted to. Um, yeah, personally, I find for one person, uh, one egg plus one egg yolk is good. But that's, that's still, you know, on the relatively high side. But anyway, I guess the point of this is to understand the, the difference in sauce attitudes between the Roman pastas and the modern, like, American, Italian-American pasta dishes that have, like... Now, listen, I've got absolutely nothing against Italian-American-style pasta. I love that shit. It's just different. Like, the style of Italian-American pasta is, like... Lots of tomato sauce, uh, you know, just like pasta's kind of swimming in sauce in big portions. Whereas the Italian style is more like the sauce is just kind of a, a coating. And it's normally fat-based. Because because it's fat-based, right? Like, really, the basis of the carbonara is the fat from the guanciale. That's what's providing, uh, you know, the bulk of the the texture and stuff. And that clings to the pasta. Like, when you make the pasta, you fry the guanciale, and then you, you just before the, the pasta is done, you dump the, the pasta into the pot with the guanciale, and you coat it in the guanciale fat. Like, that should taste good on its own, basically. Like, you want to, like, eat one of those when you're making it. Take a strand of pasta out when it's just coated in the fat from the guanciale, and that's the essence. That's the essence that you're going for, really. I mean, the cheese also, but yeah. Um, yeah, man. So you don't need that. It's it's not like a super covered in sauce type of thing. It's more like a coated in sauce rather than like a very sauced, right? Um, and the eggs are just an emulsifying agent between the, the fat. You, you want a lot of fat, okay? You want... You, like, I, I will often, because normally I don't have guanciale, I'm using pancetta. And the pancetta that I can get, while it has fat in it, it's, in my opinion, doesn't have enough fat. Uh, so I'll often, and this is not traditional, although it's not, like, illegal, as far as I understand. I will add a little, uh, when I'm frying the pancetta, I'll fry it in a little bit of olive oil. Not too much, obviously you can overdo it with the fat. But I, I will, you know, you don't, if you're using guanciale or really fatty pancetta or even really fatty bacon, you don't need to add oil because it will already render so much fat out that you don't need to. And, you know, honestly, I probably don't need to add oil when I'm cooking the pancetta. But I just find, I mean, I've tried both ways and I find that the just the, the brand of pancetta that's available at my local shop doesn't quite have enough fat content or at least it doesn't render nicely to the way I'd want. So I do put a little bit of olive oil in. Um, yeah, I don't think that's illegal. Uh, but but I don't know if the nation of Italy is going to come after me for that. Uh, but the, the, that, that guanciale fat, the pork fat, that's like the key, man. That that The way that goes with the cheese, that's what it's all about. And then, then okay, so we're going through, through keys, right? The keys, which is no garlic. The pork fat is the key. 
The next, the eggs are just an emulsifier, not the focus of the dish. The next key is black pepper. Lots of it. Lots of black pepper. That is the second flavor profile. There are, f there are three flavors in this dish. The first flavor is pork fat. The second flavor is black pepper. It's not a seasoning. It's an ingredient in this dish, okay? Don't treat it like a seasoning. Treat it like an ingredient. Put lots in. It's one of the primary flavors of the dish. Um, and then the, the next one is cheese, of course. And it's it's very possible to overdo it with the cheese. Uh, I've over I'm I I'm often you know I like the, I like I'm I'm a fucking cheese fiend. I eat shitloads of cheese. I love cheese, so I'm always te I always tempted to to to. But you're not gonna fuck up if you put too much cheese. Okay, it's not gonna ruin it. It's just gonna be nice still because it's just it's a very forgiving dish. But uh, I have one time fucked up by putting too much cheese in. It ruins the texture. It it, it ruins the emotion. You know, you there is there is an asp, and it, and it was too salty is like the primary thing, um, because th these Italian hard cheeses are very salty, especially pecorino. So you 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 know, use the right amount of cheese, which is quite a lot. It's it's quite a lot. Okay, this is not a, necessarily a a dish that is good 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 for your arteries, but it is good for your soul. Um, yeah, I think that's basically it. Oh, and maybe another key is that when you're cooking it, oh, sorry, when you're not cooking it, but so after the pasta, so you boil the pasta, you fry the pork, you then put the pasta into the pan with the pork and the fat, and you coat it in the fat, and then... You take your slurry of egg, cheese, and black pepper, and you dump it over the pasta, and you use the carryover heat from the pasta and the pan to cook, to like, you know, make this sort of sauce, right? To, to cook, cook the eggs and melt the cheese and so on, right? That's, that's the general t technique. And so the big way to fuck up with carbonara is to scramble the eggs, which is having the heat too high. It's also possible, oh, by the way, pasta water also is a key ingredient here. Um, yeah, it's, it's possible to scramble the eggs, not a mistake I make very often, uh, because as long as your pan is off the heat, I find, and you're stirring enough, I don't know, I found, I found it's basically impossible to scramble the eggs, uh, although I've had... Other people make me carbonaras that had scrambled eggs in them, which was not particularly nice. Um, I on the side of caution, because you can always cook the eggs more, but you can never unscramble them. So, like, you know, if the pan is too cold, you can always just, like, give it a quick three seconds on the burner to heat it up again, for example. I've, I do that all the time. But if the pan is too hot, you're just fucked. You, your eggs are scrambled and you've ruined the whole dish. So, you know, air on the side of caution when it comes to judging the pan temperature. Uh, but the other thing is that it, it's easy to overcook the eggs because you're um, just looking for the wrong thing. And what I mean by that is uh, you actually want to pull it before you think it's done because the eggs will firm up like, the sauce will continue to thicken and firm up after you've actually served it and it's on the plate. As it cools, it'll thicken, just because things generally thicken when they cool. And also, there will be some carryover cooking that will happen after you remove it from the pan. So you, you want to take it off the heat, or I guess the, the heat's not technically on, but you want to serve it, like, just before you think it's actually firm enough to be the texture that you want. These are my carbonara tips. And the other thing is, think about emulsions, right? And this is one I do. You might have heard these other ones, right? But I've never heard anyone give this advice properly, which is 
when you're making mayonnaise, if you ever made mayonnaise from scratch, you know that you don't just like take the, the oil, you don't just like, you have to be vigorous with it is what I'm saying, right? To split up the oil when you're making mayonnaise into like little bubbles that will emulsify properly. You have to be vigorous with it. I find the same thing is true with carbonara. Like, if you really want the um, the pasta, water, and fat to emulsify properly, you have to mix it fairly vigorously. Anyway, that's my carbonara tips. I'm going to make one tomorrow, and I'm going to enjoy it. What I do here is I turn myself inside out, you see. I externalize all of my insides. That's what this podcast is. I call it the Slice of Life podcast, but really... It's a Inside Out podcast. Um, this fucking Reddit. <laughs> Sorry, someone just sent me a really funny message. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, yeah, uh, this fucking Reddit blackout. It, I didn't realize, it. I was like, oh, it's just Reddit, who cares? I didn't realize how, like, used to, or how useless, like, all of these search engines are if you can't append Reddit to your search query. Like, if you can't search for something and look at and then with, you just get fucking these crazy SEO, like, uh, abusing... AI generated or click farm generated posts that don't have any use of it. listicles. It's just all listicles. All of the internet is just these listicles. Like Google did this to themselves. I don't understand how they fucked up. So it used to work. I remember when Google worked. And now you had to find anything written by a human. You have to use append Reddit. Like. I don't know, they're all concerned about getting this barge thing going, but how about instead of getting this barge thing going, they try and, like, fix their fucking service. Like, there's no good, um, search engines. That's the thing. Like, everyone's known for a while that Google is bad, uh, but I've tried a bunch of different search engines. Like, I've tried Google, I've tried DuckDuckGo for a long time, I used DuckDuckGo for multiple years. Uh, I've used Ecosia, I've used Cyrix with a, an instance that I know oh, it's complicated, but yeah, I probably set it up wrong, but anyway, I've used that, I, I, I've used Meta Engines, which are probably, well, they used to be good, now they're terrible. I've used, those are like, I think the biggest ones, I've even used the Brave one, which is absolute dog shit, um, and yeah, none of them are good. DuckDuckGo one is maybe... I've used Bing. Honestly, Bing is surprisingly good. Um, Let me, like, search for something. Let me see. Let's do, like, a test. What's a good test for a search engine? Um, let's say I search for... Uh, hmm... Let's let's say a tech problem. Okay, so I've I've been experiencing input lag on TF2. Let's search for uh, TF2 input lag Linux on Google. I will search for it on Bing as well. Input lag Linux, and we'll see. Okay, so Google pops up a Steam community post. I mean, this is relevant. This is probably good. Um, the Steam community post massive input lag in TF2 blah 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 it doesn't really give me an answer it's also the website's in Spanish it looks like yeah normas y directi directis directrices sobre discusión yeah, I don't know why it's giving me that in Spanish. And then the next result is, is Reddit. But this is just obviously not... Oh, no, Linux gaming is not privated itself. Okay, that's good. Um, yeah, I guess these are. this is basically what you want. It's, to, it's not terrible. Now let's try Bing. So Bing gives me a pop... Uh, it's, a, it's giving me a bunch of pop-ups. 
So the, 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 the thing right at the top is this pop-up that is an extract from this teamfortress.tv forum post, which was also, I think, the, the, third, the third link on Google. Um, but instead of that, it's just extracted what it thinks is the relevant part of that. Uh, this is correct, but it's not, I mean, it's not giving me the technical information that I would particularly want. Uh, then it's, then on the side, it just says Team Fortress 2, 2007 video game, and then an extract, the first lines from the Wikipedia page, and then a timeline, some images, related people, like nothing to fucking, and it's giving me c compare TF2 to Valorant. And it's got an option to compare it to CSGO as well. That's weird. And then there's a bunch of, like, facts. And then there's a quiz. What is this? Why is there all these fucking feature creep on a web browser? On, a, on a, uh, a search engine? It says, what class do you enjoy playing the most in Team Fortress 2? And then there's just, like, this fucking quiz. I guess it's, like, data harvesting. Weird. Anyway, underneath the initial... but This is terrible. I'm just gonna be honest. If you scroll down, it's it's actually beyond the, the terrible pop-up boxes that are telling me shit that I don't need. It says people also ask, and it's just other Google searches that aren't what I'm asking for. And then it's linking me to the, so the number one actual result, which has a picture of a light bulb next to it. I don't know what this does. It says explore this page. And it gives me a weird sort of pop-up box when I mouse over it. That's interesting. Don't know. That seems useless. And it's telling me it's like a gaming.stackexchange post, which is probably reasonable. I mean, the actual... If you scroll down, it's not too bad. It's just that it's got all of this stuff. Okay, let's try DuckDuckGo. No, that's not the URL. Oops. Okay, let's try DuckDuckGo. TF2 input like Linux. Uh, a bunch of the same links and nothing else, nothing fancy. Yep, this is fine. This is exactly, it's basically what I wanted web browser to do. Uh, let's try Ecosia. It's also basically the same links. Okay, let's try a different question. You know what? I'm not going to do this. This is boring. Who cares about this? I'm, I'm not, in, not that interested anymore. <sighs> so that sucks. Anyway, the fact of, that this Reddit thing is fucking stupid. All of these like subreddits that are going dark, they, 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 they need to just... Like, why aren't they migrating anywhere? Why are they just like, we're just going to disappear until Reddit doesn't capitulate to our demands because Reddit has no reason to do so? Um, so we're going to black out in protest. Which, you know, I mean, fair. But rather than just disappearing, you'd think you could migrate. You could just self-host a forum. There are so many... W I've, I've set up a forum before. Okay, no one used it because I just made it to see if I could do it. I didn't even, like, link it anywhere. I just wanted to see what would happen. Um, it's not hard. Forums are good. I like forums. What's wrong with a forum? Like, you don't need some centralized place to be an aggregator because RSS exists. I feel like the, like, why doesn't anyone use RSS? I don't understand. Every single website is like, oh, you need it to be centralized because of RSS. Oh, sorry, because everyone has a feed and knows where to go. But everyone can already have a feed. It's called RSS. It's a standard. It's very popular. It's very easy. Why not just do it? It's the, the mind boggles. I just watched this video. Uh, it's Adam Conover and Dan Olson. Now, I'm a big fan of Dan Olson. I have been for a long time. Uh... Let me see. I can tell you when I found Dan Olson, because I remember. Uh, I found Dan Olson, aka Folding Ideas. Uh, six years ago, seven. 
let's say six years ago, about. Uh, which I guess is not that long, but it's pretty long. I like his videos, mainly the, I mean, I found him because he'd make a good video about film. And then he started doing videos more so about politics. And not all of them are good. I've talked about this guy before on my channel. Like, for example, there's a video called Minecraft Sandboxes and Colonialism. And I thought that one wasn't very, a very good video. I thought that was a very, like, surface level analysis of what was going on in the game. And how he was interacting with it. But generally speaking, he hits way more than he misses. Um, there's also, he made a video on the Snyder Cut before the Snyder Cut came out. and Or before it was even announced to be real. Or to, to be in the, you know what I mean. Uh, and that hasn't aged. Well, I guess none of the what he says is, is technically factually incorrect, I guess. Uh, but it turns out the Snyder Cut was like really, well, at least in my opinion, really good. Most of it. There are some parts that weren't good, but I gen I I thought that was the first superhero movie I've seen in many years that actually had like a creative vision behind it. Uh, I'm not the the biggest Zack Snyder fan, um, but I think when it like when he when his shit works, it works. Like, uh, Man of Steel, bad movie, very bad movie. Let me see, what movies of his have I actually seen? Um, the, the, the Watchmen movie? Uh, not, not great. I don't think it's as bad. I mean, I'm a big fan of the comic. Uh, I think everyone's a big fan of the Watchmen comic, to be honest. Uh, and, and I've always, you know, I think a lot of comic fans hate the movie. Uh, obviously the, the ending's dog shit. Uh, but I don't, you know, I, I'd give it like a 5 out of 10, it's, it, it is what it is, I guess. Um, what else did he do? Uh, 300, I fucking love 300, although I, I, when I say that, what I mean is I loved 300 when I watched it as a teenager. I have no idea if I would like it now. Um, I should probably go back and rewatch 300, I bet that would be a fun movie to watch. Uh, Sucker Punch is a fucking terrible movie, one of the worst movies ever made. Um, uh, yeah, and I don't think I've seen any of these other films, have I? Hold on. Oh, I, I've seen, um, the sequel to 300. Was that by him, or did someone else direct that? Wait, why is it not showing up on IMDb? 300, some music video, Watchmen, Legend of the Guardian, Sucker Punch, Man of Steel, Batman v Superman... I never saw any of the shit. Snow Steam Iron. I've never heard of that in my life. Oh, it's a short. Um, yeah, I don't know any of this stuff. I thought there was a sequel to, to 300. Did he not make that? I watched that in the cinema and I thought it was okay. Um, anyway, this was not supposed to be a rant about three, the fucking Zack Snyder. Holy shit. What I wanted to say is I watched this video of Adam Conover and Dan Olson talking about tech hype cycles and you know a lot of it's stuff that we already know like anyone who's like a like I find this kind of annoying how a lot of these the the the, the Adam Conover type of guy talks about stuff that is incredibly obvious as if it's like some sort of um deep insight uh but, uh, you know, that doesn't mean that they're wrong. I think they're just, it's a little circle jerky is all I'm saying, right? Because it's stuff that I think ev everyone who watches this video is going to already agree with because you're on this guy's channel. And everyone involved, you know, both of these guys are basically just sitting there jerking themselves off about how right they are about the world. Except they are actually right about the world. Like, nothing they're saying is wrong. It's just um, not super interesting, which is fine. They're allowed to do that. I just personally wouldn't watch it. I, I fucking watched it on two times speed and uh, like skipped through it because it was very boring. Um, but I do want to say one thing. So the video is about um, the the phenomenon of the, the tech hype cycle where, where they go, you know, every tech company is sort of trying to reproduce 
this phenomenon where, um, you know, they want to be the next iPhone, essentially. That's what they, they, they think, right? It doesn't matter if you're the first. The iPhones weren't the first smartphones or whatever. It just, like, make the biggest splash and, and like, be a, a tech disruptor with some new technology, right? Whether or not the technology is actually new doesn't matter. Just to market it correctly. So the examples that they're talking about are crypto and NFTs, which I agree with. And then a lot of these gig economy type of apps like Uber and Uber Eats or DoorDash or whatever, which is, yeah, all, all their analysis on that, I thought, was very much correct. But the thing that I'm, I think that, that this Adam Conover guy specifically has a, a pretty rough take on is AI. Uh, so he made a video before called AI is BS, which I watched when it came out. Um, and, you know, he's still talking about it, and, you know, I, I just wanted to use this as an opportunity to bridge off into some of my, because I feel like the, the hype has died down, right, like, right now, I think, you know, there was a, a moment in time where you, where AI was a very cool new technology, (laughs) and it was doing all sorts of (laughs) shit, excuse me, oh my god, (laughs) Sorry about that. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, yeah, what was I talking about? Oh yeah, this fucking thing, right? I know everyone's sick of talking about it because this is the thing. This is literally how they get you. Is everyone's sick of talking about it because it's all anyone talked about for like a month or like three? It seemed like this technology was evolving crazy rapidly, and and it was this revolutionary new thing. Or whatever. Like, it was... It, and it is, you know, to be clear, I think if there's any, like, normie YouTube commentator who has a, a good take on AI, it's, it's, a uh, What's his name? Hank Green. Right? Where he's, he's, he's very... He's real... He's a realist about the technology. But he also says, like, it's a new thing. There's never been something that can't do everything, but the things it can do are very believably like a human and you can't tell the difference between it but this is like a completely new thing that that we've never had to contend with before and that is you know i think that's a pretty reasonable point to bring up adam conover's take is that vr is oh sorry ai is the exact same as the metaverse it's this nonsense tech thing that's been made up by these corporations to sell us something that we don't need or or whatever uh And uh, just in the name of, like, trying to be the next big thing, when in reality, it it can't do anything. And I I just think this is, I mean, I think it's wrong, plain as day, to say that these large language models or, you know, stable diffusion image generating models or whatever can't do anything. They're like, they don't work. I think very clearly they have um, a much uh, more apparent they're much better at doing the thing they claim to do than like crypto or nfts were at doing the thing they claimed to do like crypto sucked because it was money that you couldn't use to buy anything except other crypto right like you you couldn't use crypto to transact because the price was fucking ridiculously volatile and uh especially bitcoin it takes like five minutes to complete a transaction and the transaction fees are high. So crypto was money that didn't work as money uh, and was incredibly resource intensive to, you know, manufacture and and use to exist uh, required ridiculous compute power. And NFTs were even worse because they didn't even really claim to do anything other than, uh, I guess, I guess the like theoretical claim is that it's a way to like create digitally scarce art oh, or images or, or whatever but in reality you know these they 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 just link to like urls or whatever like they're not you don't actually own anything other than something on the ethereum chain that like says you own it but it's not the same as yeah i mean it's it's obviously nonsense right like neither of them do anything other than pretend to do stuff and act as speculative assets whereas large language models they can do stuff 
right? Like they they clearly, very obviously, we've all interacted with them by now. Like they they will they will they work in in a basic sense. They work, right? They they do what they say they do. It's not like money that doesn't work as money or ownership that isn't ownership, uh, or, or scarcity that isn't scarcity or whatever. Instead, it's this thing, th this is the computer will talk back to you in natural language. And it works. It talks back to you in natural language. Um, <clears throat> now, a lot of this, this, the specific stuff that's marketed, okay, th that's my, my, my counter to this, like, oh, AI is nonsense, it's just this, this, meme product that doesn't really do anything. I feel like it's obviously not true. However, um, it's, it's, it's good to be skeptical. And, uh, you know, I'm much more skeptical about this AI technology than I was a few months ago when that video came out, simply because, and this is, this seems crazy, but it's, I like, it's just, it's gotten worse. Like, I don't know if I'm the only one that's experienced this, but it's gotten, like, way worse. Like, I remember using Bing when I first got accepted into the, the, the whitelist, and, uh, um, you know, you could, it was really fun, like, it was genuinely fun, like, you could, and that's something important, is that it wasn't just, like, a tool, it was a fun toy, which is kind of like that's not some stupid n n inconsequential aspect ideally you know making the web making web browsing something that's enjoyable or fun is good um, and it served up useful results and it was creative like i remember i asked bing hey can you generate some song lyrics or whatever at some point it didn't do a very good job of it but it but i took one of the lyrics that it generated and then ended up just like, well, that one line is pretty... I, it generated a whole poem song thing that was really bad. Like, it was very basic rhymes and rhyme... It was just... It was kind of like a Dr. Zeus... Not even Dr. Zeus. It was like... It was just bad, right? It was like something a child would write. Like, the words technically rhymed, which is impressive. Uh, and the sentences made sense. And it had a theme. But it, it didn't have... I mean, yeah, obviously, it's not going to be able to think... Uh, or write in a in an artistic manner, but one of the lines that it wrote, I was like, "Hey, that's kind of catchy." And then I I started with that, and then wrote my own lyrics based off of it, and then ended up throwing the song away because it was garbage. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the lyrics like that's fine. I th I don't think that's bad. Like lots of people have been saying, "Hey, this AI stuff's good for inspiration." I also know another good thing that you know a lot of programmers have found a lot of um, success using AI at to to as, as like an assistant when programming. But anyway, it's not what I wanted to talk. about. What I wanted to say is like this Bing stuff, right? Like now, I go and I ask Bing to do anything that isn't just a web search, and it just literally says like, "I am not." that is not my job, I don't do that, I am here to search with a web for you, and let's start this conversation again, and then it ends the conversation. I think these these technologies are way too easy to jailbreak. Like, the, it's just impossible, it's just really, really, like, in order to make them secure, so that they can't be, you know, no one can jailbreak them, uh, they've had to neuter them to a ridiculous extent, to the point where they're just not useful anymore. They just don't even do anything. It's like, well, if I wanted to search the web, I would just use a web browser, like, a, a, sorry, a search engine. It's not like the Bing AI is any better at searching the web than I am. Like, when it, when it, you know, gets, at first, I was using it to do this for a while, and then after, you know, um, like I would ask it something. I would, I would, I would, I would use it as a as an alternative. This this Bing one, as an alternative to a search engine, right? I would use it to search for stuff on the web, and then after a while, I just got, I just, it wasn't like this was even something I was really thinking about. I just stopped because it wasn't really good at it. Like it would, it would compile a, an answer from from some various sources. But what I was always doing was it just clicking on the links that it would use because I wanted to read the full thing, right, like, I, I, and then I, you know, I guess at a certain point, I just was like, well, why am I even using it if I'm just 
Like I could just be using Bing normally to click on these links instead of having to like read through a paragraph of AI generated stuff. So yeah, it just doesn't, I don't know, it seems kind of pointless to me. I, I, I don't think search engine is a, is a good use of AI, not to mention, uh, not a business model. <laughs> uh, AI search engines, uh, not so not a business model. Not something you could, like doesn't make sense. Uh, how are you making money off of this? Uh, how I don't know. It's strange. Um, and then here's another example of the same thing. So Bard, right? Google's one. When it first came out, day one, I tested it out and it was fine. It it was comparable to 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 the Bing one. You know, I thought it was comparable. I didn't test it very extensively. I was just like, asked it a couple of search queries and a couple of questions, like in conversational manner. And we just, yeah, I guess that's comparable to the Bing thingy and then stopped using it. And then like a month later, I came back and, and I did the same thing. And it just started hallucinating like crazy. Every time I asked it anything, it would just respond with something completely unrelated. Like, it was just incapable of doing anything other than hallucinating. And so I was like, well, what the fuck? And I immediately stopped using it. So, like, I don't know what has happened. I think, like, I, I don't know. These these things, they suck. <laughs> they don't work. It's, it's all of this. All of this just doesn't work. This is the thing. All of these, like... None of this shit, like, people get terrified. Who are, the TikTok algorithm, the YouTube algorithm, like, it's scary how well it knows what I want. It, I don't know, these people must be living on a different planet. You know, I go on, I, I've, I've, I've occasionally, when I'm on the to toilet, I've said I've talked about this, uh, when I'm on the toilet, I, well, once in a while, I watch YouTube shorts. And YouTube shorts clearly has no fucking idea what I'm interested in. Because it constantly tries to show me, like, Andrew Tate shit. It constantly shows me... Um, fucking Joe Rogan clips. It thinks I'm obsessed with uh, fuck. What's that guy's name? The 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 black science man. <laughs> what's his name? Neil deGrasse Tyson. Him. It thinks I'm obsessed with Neil deGrasse Tyson. It just shows me Neil deGrasse Tyson videos over and over again. I don't watch any of them. I don't care about that guy. It just constantly shows me this stuff. And then today, this is the craziest shit that's ever happened. Today. It showed me a video with like two views or something with like five likes or whatever. It showed I'm, I, this is crazy. It showed me a video with like five likes of what is very clearly like a twelve-year-old girl doing a weird dance. Like what the fuck? What the fuck? I don't want to watch videos of fucking children doing dances and pedo shit. Get this shit out! Like, bro, that's fucked up. <laughs> this shit is just there. I don't know, man. And then, like, that's that's just one example, okay? The, the main YouTube algorithm also has no fucking clue what I'm interested in. I go on the YouTube homepage. Uh, I'll do it right now. I go on it. It's all videos I've already seen or videos I am completely uninterested in watching. Examples. Okay, we've got... It's showing me this video... Pro chef's reaction. It's a it's a it's a chef reacting to an Uncle Roger video. I am completely uninterested in that. Then it's showing me uh, a video which is the machinations of myhouse.wad. How it works, part two. I watched that part one of that like three days ago, and it and I stopped watching it before the end because I was like, okay, I get it. It's all like teleports. This is that's what I thought it was, but it's I guess it's cool to know a little more information. And I stopped watching it because I was like, I get it. It, it works with these like teleport things, and then it just it wants me to watch this. Then I don't know what is this. The Yiga Clan won't live to eat them. This is a video with 1.6k views. I think it has a, a thumbnail is what appears to be Hulk Hogan's body, with I think that's Link. With Link's face lying on a, a background of bananas. No idea what that is. It's also 30 seconds long. Not interested. It's showing me the newest episode of The Yard. I mean, that's just for my subscriptions. A video from the technical difficulties. Also just for my subscriptions. A Did You Know Gaming video. Never watched a Did... Nope, don't care. 
uh, a video called 18 plus Ben Shapiro's book is beyond disturbing true allegiance review uh, why do you think I fucking care uh, Pink Floyd in Mario 64 sound font germ eclipse half-life Alex combine analysis like I don't care about any of this this is all like either videos it like it's literally all videos for my sub feed which is what the sub feed is for I don't need to see them here or videos I have zero interest in or videos I already watched like hey it's recommending me the Uncle Dane video I ran a TF2 community server for for one year and here's what happened I only watched that like months ago I've already seen that video or this papers unpacked strategy on an infinite chessboard between an angel and a devil. I watched that like a year ago. Uh, the best of the worst, wheel of the worst, twenty five. I watched that when it came out. Uh, th- like, what is this? It's just showing me videos. That it's it's like terrible. The the algorithm doesn't know what the fuck I want. I think the only reason people think this stuff works is because it's constantly showing you content. It's like every video has a sidebar with fifty other videos in it. And one of them is going to be something you want to watch, maybe, right? And then people are like, wow, every single one has... And it's not even that. Like, really? That's an exaggeration. It's more like like one in every ten videos will have a video that you maybe want to watch. And even that's an exaggeration. It's probably... It's even less than that. How often do I click videos in the sidebar? Like, very rarely. Like, it doesn't work. And don't get me fucking started on this Twitter algorithm. Okay, the... Twitter thinks that I love the NFL, basketball, and football leagues, and it shows me that shit constantly. Then it thinks I'm, like, a right-wing extremist, and also, like, uh, really into, like, uwu femboy posts. I, 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 and, and NFTs, and Romilio NFTs. It's showing me... Uh, that's actually the main thing on my Twitter feed, is, like, Romilio NFTs. I, I don't care about Romilio NFTs. I'm not buying that shit, motherfucker. I'm not buying a, a fucking uh, Romilio NFT. I'm not buying a Milady NFT. Okay, I've known about this shit forever, and I've never bought one. I've known about this shit before fucking anyone, and I found out about it basically when it first started, and I was like, that's interesting, and then, and then, ever since then, it's just fucking haunted me like a nightmare, I don't care, I'm not buying your NFT, I'm not buying your fucking NFT, what do you think this is, it's terrible, the Twitter one is the worst, actually, of any of them, like, it's so bad, so what I'm saying is, like, none of these, the all of this data, what is it for? All of this data harvest, it's all just magical nothingness. It's, I don't understand, it's magical nothingness. Like, these companies, they're stealing your data, but they're, for what? To train AIs to just hallucinate nonsense? To train AIs to recommend you shit that you're not interested in? to sell to advertisers that you don't even see because you use adblock because they, they've made the internet unusable without adblock like what is it even who's how, none of it works <laughs> it's insane it's actually insane and like today okay today i downloaded a podcast to listen to on my mac um and i was trying to play it and it, it was playing in the default music app on on my Mac, which I've never used before. Whenever I have to listen to something, what I always do is I just press spacebar on it when it's in the the finder window and it opens like a preview. Um, And that preview is, it's it's like uh, fine, you know, it's a little, um, that's what what the app should be. It's just a a play button, a pause button, uh, and then it plays this thing and it has a, a, a like, a bar at the bottom, a navigation bar that you can use to skim through the video, and it has a volume control. Like, that's that's what it should have. And, uh, hey, look, it turns out you can even change the playback speed. That's good. I guess it has other options, too. You can even trim a, trim a recording in it. That's useful, I suppose. Like, this fucking music app, like, you can't... 
you know what I did was I was I was listening to this video or this podcast and it got to a boring bit. So I went to skip through it by just pressing the arrow key, which is the skip forward five seconds key on every single player to ever exist, ever. The the arrow key skips forward five seconds, right? And except on Apple Music, it doesn't. It just turns the song off. <laughs> Why does it do that? Why does it turn the song off? I guess maybe it's trying to skip to the next song that doesn't exist because I don't use that app. So it just turns it off. And I'm like, well, this being uh, an app developed by the richest company on earth, surely, surely it will remember my place when I go to play it again. No, it doesn't remember your place. MPV remembers your place. I think CMOS even remembers your place. This fucking app doesn't even remember your place. It doesn't even remember, like, what the hell? It's so bad. And then, if you want to actually scrub through the, 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 the recording, if you actually want to scrub through the audio to find where you're at, it makes you use this tiny, tiny window at the top of the screen where you have, like, no ability to be precise. And makes you do that with your mouse because you can't control it with the buttons with the keyboard and then i was still listening to this podcast in the background and i i there was a video that i wanted to watch so i went to press the pause key on my my f f key row on my keyboard right and the pause key is on f8 i pressed it because i was thinking in my head like this pause key it works with like youtube and it works with like you know a bunch of other applications Surely it will work with Apple's own music app. It doesn't do anything. The pause key doesn't do anything. Like, what the hell? I don't... How are they so bad? I don't understand. All of this shit is just garbage. I don't understand how anyone who uses just a normal computer can insult Linux users for like programs being janky and not working. Sometimes the Linux programs are janky and don't work. But in that case, they have an excuse. It's one guy doing it for free. Why the fuck are like all of these programs that billion, billion, billion dollar tech companies, trillion dollar in the case of Apple, right? I think Apple is worth like over a trillion. Two point nine trillion dollars and you can't make the pause key work. <laughs> you can't make your music app remember where you are in an audio file. You can't make your music $2.92 trillion and you can't make your your music app remember where you are in a file. Are you kidding me? This shit is insane. This shit is fucking ridiculous. How do people put up with this? I don't know, man. It's driving me nuts. <sighs> man. I don't know, man. I think... Okay, here's the thing. Here's the thing about Adam Conover AI take. Why am I even talking about this? You people don't care about this. Fuck you. This is my podcast. I'm the one that takes up space on YouTube's data centers with my 12-hour podcasts. Okay, you don't have to listen to it. I could do anything. This is the crazy thing, is I could do anything right now. No one could stop me, because the only people... No one at Google is listening 7 hours and 31 minutes into this podcast. I could could say anything. I could could drop the N-word right now and not get banned. I could do anything I wanted. But instead, I'm going to talk about Adam Conover's AI takes. (laughs) It's not just him, but a lot of... Okay, this this is like one of my things about the anti-LLM people. Now, as I said, these things are broken, they suck, they don't really have that many use cases, they're, they have some use cases, it's whatever. In my opinion, they're kind of, right now they're in the stage of kind of neat. I don't know if they'll ever get beyond that. Oh, and the other thing is, as Adam Conover rightly says, uh, the main thing that they are going to be used for for a long time is just spam. That the best thing that these things these things are optimized to produce really good spam, and that fucking sucks. Um, 
but here's the thing. Okay, so Adam said uh, that, like, uh, oh, an AI can write you a believable piece of text, but it doesn't know what a pineapple is. And here's my contention. Here's my, my thing, right? He said that a lot of people have, have bought into this hype and drank the AI Kool-Aid. And, I mean, my question to him is, as I said in uh, in one of my previous videos, uh, oh, it's just a, a large language model with access to the internet. My brother in Christ, you are a large language model with access to the internet. And what I mean by that is... Uh, we don't know enough about how consciousness works to really decisively say that, like, the way these large language models work doesn't at least approach a part of how consciousness works. Like, we, I'm not saying it does or doesn't. It could be completely off. He could be right. It could just be a stochastic parrot that, that doesn't have any capacity to do anything beyond, like, just a little bit further than what ChatGPT can currently do. Or whatever, right? Like, this is totally possible. Or, it could be the case that this is a part of how our human consciousness works with regards to language. Because these AIs, they're black boxes, we don't really know how they're functioning on the inside. And so are our brains, you know, in terms of how they generate qualia. We don't really know how that works either. Uh, but, it seems like language is probably a big part of it. Because humans are the only animals that we know of that experience consciousness. And humans are also the only animals that we know of that have complex language. And so it seems likely that these things are interconnected. And it seems possible, uh, another thing that is really important for consciousness, generally speaking, is this recursion, self-reference, strange loop type behavior. And it seems quite... It seems like language is in some way important for that. Uh, the specifics, we don't know. Uh, but it seems like being able to use words like I enables you to do metacognition and enables you to do self-reference. And that's how... Like, that's got something to do with how consciousness happens. How meaning can be born from a bunch of meaningless molecules and cells arranged in a certain pattern. That it has something to do with self-reference, and that that self-reference has something to do with language. Um, which is, I think that's my opinion, but it's always my informed opinion. Uh, <laughs> I'm not saying that that's, I'm not saying by any means that that's the totality of what we're talking about here. It, uh, it, it could be a very small, com language could make up a very, uh, or even if language makes up a, a re reasonably large component, the way that the like these language models work, we don't know how they think, right? Like most humans have an internal monologue. It doesn't seem like AI have. I mean, we don't know, right? We don't know what, what would it even mean for for a large language model to have an internal monologue, like. Um, but then there are humans who don't have internal monologues, and some of them are relatively functional in society but then again there are AI that often pass for human writing that you wouldn't be able to distinguish so um, the, the, the point is we don't like it's I'm skeptical of people who are just saying like these are just stochastic parrots they don't have any ability to understand or or reason or anything they're just auto auto correct on your phone times 10 um because like we don't know that there isn't a part of our brain that is auto correct times 10 that is essential for consciousness like i'm not saying there is but i'm saying you can't really brazenly go out and say oh it's just this thing that's clearly meaningless without ag acknowledging that well, you don't really know that uh, again, I'm trying to make kind of a nuanced take here. I'm not saying it for sure is or it for sure isn't. Like, it's possible that Adam Conover is right. It's also possible, like, that, that, that this is actually a huge, really important part of consciousness. That, like, actually, if you pump enough, uh, uh, you know, nodes into this neural net, eventually... It just becomes conscious. 
with like a large language model that it, it like there's there's no longer any meaningful distinction between a large language model and a, and a conscious human at that point i don't think that's the case i don't believe that to be true but i i don't have solid evidence to say with a hundred percent certainty that that's not true uh yeah that's that's like one of my big contentions is that like again there were clear reasons why like the metaverse is bullshit because it doesn't do what it says or crypto is bullshit because it, money that doesn't work as money uh you know second life that's worse than second life or vr chat that's worse than vr chat uh or or like you know all of these these other things whereas in this case we're in a situation where we don't really know if this ai stuff is doing what it's like trying to do right now it sort of looks like it it's like almost doing it like a little bit it's not like fully doing it but then also you know crypto was kind of almost doing it but not fully doing it so it could be that kind of situation but we don't know because we know what real normal money looks like and we know what it's supposed to do but i mean we don't even really have a solid definition of what consciousness is or what like an agi would be um i i again i don't think that llms are necessarily the like oh we just have to keep adding more and more trading data to these llms and making them bigger and bigger and eventually we'll get an agi like i don't i don't think that's the case um but uh if you were to tell me that an llm could be a component to an agi that would that would be believable to me um yeah i don't know maybe i'm completely wrong here but let me know in the comments I think the majority of my audience is American, and uh, it's always shocking to me when I talk to Americans and they mention some sort of health issue that they have, and my immediate response is like, oh yeah, you should see a doctor about that, and then they're like, well, I, I can't, I don't want to go into medical debt, and that's always, I always forget, like, I, I know it logically, but then, I, like, in the moment, it's just such an obvious first thought for me. That I don't even think about it. I'm like, oh yeah, you should probably go like see a doctor, and then they're like, well, I, I I'm not capable of doing that. I don't have the money. That's always weird to me and like insane. Uh, but this is not a segment where I just shit on the American healthcare se- uh, system. Uh, these, uh, like everyone always talks about how bad the American healthcare system is, and the UK, we have. National Health Service, which is one of the greatest things we've ever done as a country. Um, it's so it's the something that pretty much you know Brits we're not like super patriotic, but pretty much everyone fucking is suddenly turns into a patriot when the NHS comes up. Um, and the problem is because we're comparing it to the American system, like we're not really hearing about how or no one no one talks about how fucking bad it is and i will tell you why it's bad it is bad for a very simple reason like the solution to, so, okay let me I, I mean i can tell you the the big problems with the nhs uh there are not enough stuff there are not enough spaces in hospitals there there are not enough hospitals there are, I mean, big staff, staff are underpaid, okay, all the doctors and nurses and shit were striking recently, they might still be kind of striking, because they're, they're, they're hugely underpaid, their pay has, like, dropped significantly in the last, like, 20 years, I think it dropped by, like, over 25% in real terms, accounting for inflation, so these people are, like, ridiculously underpaid, um, the, the hospitals that they work at are, like, underfunded, so they don't have access to the newest equipment and so on and they don't you know meanwhile the population keeps growing especially you know like in london for example it's not like there are you know enough there's just not enough there's not enough of anything and so the same doctors that are being paid less have to work more and see it's just not possible the system is at its absolute limit and so you end up with these crazy waiting times. I mean, between me getting referred for an autism diagnosis and getting diagnosed with autism, actually finally getting it, there was well over a year. Like, it, it was like 
a year and three months, give or take. Uh, but even for relatively uh, urgent things, if you go to the GP and the GP is like, oh yeah, we're going to need to refer you for that, you're looking at two weeks, probably, before you actually get to see someone. Uh, it's not always the case. Obviously, if it's something more serious, they will... They will if it if it's something you know a high priority thing you'll you'll get speed run through the system it can happen I've seen it happen it happened to me even when I was a kid and I had a serious medical problem uh, but you know it has to be pretty fucking serious and like ambulance times you know like if you if you call an ambulance and you're not dying of a heart attack you're gonna be waiting for like I mean it's it's insane and like people act as if there's some crazy complicated problem it's it's only one problem it's a it's actually a, a i mean the root of it is one single problem which is there's not enough money the 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 tories have just taken money out of the nhs very slowly over the past like 12 years that they've been in power and before that was new labor which were basically the tories under another name and they were doing the same thing the NHS has just been like a like a frog in a in a pot of boiling water. You now slowly turning up the heat. They've just been slowly doing this for years, just seeing how many corners they can cut, and they've reached the limit. This is how many corners you can cut. You've you've reached the limit now. You you gotta you gotta put more money into it. That's the fundamental problem. Like this is the issue with when you put the government in charge of anything. Is they're fucking cheapskates, and they'll cut corners whenever they can. I don't think putting corporations in charge of it is any better, but there is the option for to do to to have private healthcare in the UK. But uh, some employers will give you health insurance, especially if you work in an American company. So if you work at an American company in the UK, you might have access to, you know, uh, pri privatized healthcare in the UK with your insurer covering it. Uh, but that's not a super common occurrence. Uh, yeah, so obviously once, th if, if the money does get injected into the NHS, there's still a bunch of bureaucracy to decide, like, you know, but exactly where it goes. But uh, at the at the bottom line is it can't hurt. <laughs> no, like, as long as it's not going into some bureaucrat's pocket and it's actually going into the, the system, it's going to save lives. Like, there's no question. And I, I don't, like... To me, it's insane that, like, every Prime Minister's question time isn't about this, you know? Like, this this is, like, a huge thing. This is a huge thing. And yet, it's, like, barely a topic of discussion in politics. Neither party wants to address it. Because I'll tell you why. Because uh, Labour doesn't want to do it either. They don't want to spend the money on it. So that so fucking Keir Starmer doesn't even bring it up because he doesn't want to spend the money to on 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 the NHS to fucking get it working again. It's a depressing situation, to be honest with you. It's like the 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 by far the best thing about my country just slowly dying in front of me, and it's being killed on purpose. Let's make this clear. Um, like, like these people, like Rishi Sunak, they make these backroom uh, deals with American healthcare companies and sell off large portions of the NHS for mutual profit. Like, this is not some secret. This is a very open public thing that they're doing. Um, you know, it's insane. It's these people. They they they're just doing it f out of they just want money like it's nothing else they're just completely okay with literally letting people die if it means they can make an, a buck it's absolutely fucking insane these people are evil and the state of the system right now is just so bad like these i don't like you don't understand <laughs> these hospitals are like at capacity like you can go in to a and e and you can be like literally dying and there's just no like there's just no beds there's no nowhere for you to go like it's 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 bad i mean it's not all the time like that but it is like that sometimes and it's like insane 
there's just not enough doctors to see these people. That the, no one's becoming a doctor because the pay's lo you know not even good enough. It's fucking ridiculous. Ha 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 ha! Things have happened. YouTube has sent a cease and desist letter to Invidious. Now, if you don't know, somehow. Uh, Invidious is a third-party, free, open-source front-end for YouTube, which removes all of the tracking nonsense. You don't need to... It's basically YouTube without Google. It's the best way to use YouTube. It's... It, I mean, it is what it's... It does what it's... It's what YouTube should be. It's just a place where you can watch a YouTube video with no ads, no Google tracking. You don't need an account. There's no cookies. There's nothing. And it's also a federated, open source thing, so there are many, many different instances of, of NVIDIAs which you can choose from, all run by hobbyists and sustained by donations. Um, and yeah, it's it's basically the best thing to ever happen to the internet. <laughs> well, I don't know if I'd go that far, but it's pretty fucking great. It's a great service. I, if you don't use it already, uh, I highly recommend checking it out. You can create uh, accounts for an invidious instance and then import your YouTube subscriptions uh, if you want so you never have to use the YouTube site you know it's it's great uh, so YouTube sent them a cease and desist which we all knew was gonna happen eventually YouTube's not gonna be okay with someone offering a better version of their site for free now there's a couple of issues with this uh, I'll start with the less funny one, and then and then I'll go on to what's actually fucking hilarious about it. Uh, <clears throat> you know what? Maybe I should just make this into a standalone video. Maybe I should make a standalone video about this. Yeah, I can't be bothered to make a standalone video about this. <laughs> I'll just talk about it here. Uh, so the first thing is YouTube sent the cease and desist to uh, the people who run the Nvidia's code base. Uh, but because it's a federated free open source project, even if worst case scenario that goes offline, right? Like the they force GitHub to remove it, or they even like let's say fascism, they arrest the people, right? It doesn't matter because the code is out there. There are many many different instances. They would only succeed in shutting down one instance. The code would be forked. You know, it's it, it's impossible for the it like it's just not how it works. They can't, they physically can't do it. Like even even if they were successful, and these guys got scared of their cease and desist and took down their 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 instance, the first party one. I think it's uh, nvidia.snoopjer.org or something. It wouldn't matter because there's a million other instances running Nvidia that are all equally good, run the same software, and the code base is open source, so it's fine. Um, but, so that's the first thing that they, they, they didn't really, they clearly, YouTube's lawyers just sent a cease and desist to basically, out of obligation, they didn't really think it through. Uh, like, I don't know, maybe, probably scare tactics, right? They, they, but even, I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, even if these people, even if the people who started Invidious wanted to shut it down, they couldn't. They, like, no one has that power because the code is already out there. And these other instances are completely independent. They're, they're maintained by completely disparate, independent groups of people or individuals that don't have any relation to the originators. That's kind of the point. Uh, but the second thing, and the reason why I think it's very funny that, that YouTube did, is their cease and desist hinges on the... Uh, idea that Invidious breaches the terms of service for using YouTube's API. That our API says, or if you're going to use our API, you have to have like a very. Or what, let me actually get up the specifics. Um, one second. Ja, 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 ja. Is it this? Nope. Hold on a minute. 
Uh, aha, here we go. Found it. Okay. So there's the, it's on GitHub, by the way. The 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 guy who created Invidious, the French ghosty, posted it on the Invidious GitHub. Uh, the entire email that they received. Um, but yeah, they say that uh, the if you're an API client, you have to display a link to YouTube's terms of service, and they also have to term state their own terms of use by da da da, uh, and it has to be like prominently displayed on every page, which Invidious doesn't do. And secondly, um, uh, anyone who uses the YouTube API has to meet the or comply with what they call the minute the requirements for minimum functionality for YouTube API services. Um, so API clients must not place any limitations on the YouTube functionality required by the RMF, which is the requirements for minimum functionality. Um, now that is basically all the ads and tracking, right? Like that's that's like hey, you can't strip the Google stuff out of it. Uh, so and, and like just a couple of other like minor details, you know, like but it's basically like here's the way. It, like you're not allowed to just use this data however you want. You have to comply with all of the stuff. Keep keep all of our Google stuff in it, right? And and various other things like oh, you can't fuck with the player or whatever. Now all of this sound okay. I, I, this 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 makes like sense, right? Like oh, if you well, I guess you know they're sending a cease and desist to these guys for using the the API client and breaking the terms of service. Like you'd expect this, right? Except for one minor detail, <laughs> Nvidia doesn't use the API <laughs> at all. <laughs> Nvidia does does not use the YouTube API. And like it, they just made this all up. Invidious just scrapes the web page. It doesn't use the API, and that is fucking hilarious to me. The, the, it's so funny. The, the videos was just like, "How dare you come over here and use our API?" They're not even using the API. Isn't that crazy? So the 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 cease and desist isn't even valid. Like even it, how did they fuck up? I don't understand. How like the code base is public? You can just look it up. The how did the, I? I don't know what's going on with that. Very strange. But very funny. Oh well, it looks like Lewis Rosman already made a video about this, so I don't need to. Even if I wanted to make a standalone video, there would be no point. It is absolutely wild. Like this really gives me a good sense of how terrible most people's ability is to like tell fact from fiction on the internet and like understand even anything or do like any level of research is the giga chat guy that like i know so many people i hear that are like bro it's a real guy like you don't understand like he's a real guy and then people are like oh man it's so crazy since i found out the giga chat guy is a real guy and that his girlfriend's this photographer, and she posts all his pictures online, but he doesn't, he refuses to do interviews, and he doesn't have any social media, and, it, and these people are fucking retarded, like, it takes two seconds of research to find the unedited pictures of the Giga Chat, like, that, that are commonly used for the Giga Chat memes, like, his girlfriend is a, it's, it's a guy, some Italian guy, who's relatively fit, and handsome, but his girlfriend is a photographer, and she took a bunch of pictures of him, and then, basically as an exercise in photoshopping skill, she photoshopped him to look, like, very buff. And obviously, she's a professional, so she did a good job. So you look relatively good. It's also easier to cover up your flaws if they're in black and white. Um, and so, th she just does this as, like, a meme to post on Instagram. They're, like, to, to edit pictures she take or her, her boyfriend's pictures to make him look like ridiculously superhumanly buff like this is not difficult to find out um it's also very obvious when you look at the pictures that no human being could possibly look like that uh, especially in certain cases like the, mo the most popular ones aren't the ridiculous ones but there are other like official giga chad images um like there's one where he's on a hike uh, with a bunch with like three other guys who all look exactly like him because they're all photoshopped to look like Giga Chad and it's it's quite funny but it's it's also like a pretty obviously fake when you when you look at that picture. Uh, 
So, like, so people see this and they're like, oh, so this guy, like, is the only bodybuilder in the world who doesn't have an Instagram page. Hmm, that sounds legit. And he just coincidentally refuses all interviews, doesn't have any social media, claims to not care. Also, there's only like five pictures of him in existence, and his girlfriend is a professional photographer. That's not sus at all. This must be legitimate. This guy is crazy ripped. It's like, what are you talking about? Come on. Use your brain cells. Use your brain cells. Like, to be clear, just so that you don't get confused, I'm not saying it's... I think this is what people have problems, have like a, a tr trouble, I don't know why this is difficult, but it's not that the Giga Chad thing is like fake or real. Like the guy is a real guy who is a bodybuilder. Like he is a really fit, really, you know, bodybuildery guy. But the pictures are also photoshopped on top of that, which is why they look, you know, realistic because it's taking someone who's already, you know, peak bodybuilder physique and enhancing them rather than like trying to turn some some nerd into a, a body or a physique like I, I, that's i think the thing that people have trouble understanding is they look at the pictures then they look it up and they're like oh he's a real guy and he's a bodybuilder therefore it must all be real but it's not true like no one could possibly you look at i mean it takes two seconds to look at the like i don't understand you just have to have like a basic level of brain to look at these pictures and think oh yeah obviously no human could look like that Yesterday, I went and touched some grass, uh, but right now I don't want to talk about that. I'll talk about that in a bit when I have more energy. I just feel like I got to talk about something about uh, <clears throat> maybe something that you don't care about, but I'm, I'm going to try and tie it back around to something that, that we all care about, and that is uh, the, the, the streamer XQC uh, signed a contract with kick.com if you don't follow any of this shit i will give you a very brief explanation of what this means i know it's boring if you don't care i will just give you a very brief explanation so xqc streams on twitch which is the biggest streaming site owned by amazon uh, kick.com is another streaming site uh, but it's owned by a company called stake which is an online casino, an online gambling company. And Kick's whole deal is, uh, well, it's a couple of things. They, at first, were kind of marketing themselves as Twitch with less censorship, which is a good marketing strategy because Twitch's moderation policies are god-awful and everyone knows it. Uh, just look at, I mean, Destiny being banned is probably the biggest example. He, he got, he, I mean, it's just ridiculous. Uh, so they were kind of doing that, but they got a little too much pushback from being a, from, from being way too loosey goosey with their moderation. So they've tightened it up a bit. Um, they, they just like Twitch enforce their moderation policies, uh, not very even handedly, uh, in particular, uh, so, one of their biggest streamers is a guy called Aiden Ross. I don't really know much about this guy, but he's very edgy. He has a very edgy fan base. He likes to talk to, like, far-right people and say really edgy shit on stream. So, that, like, stuff that should probably go against their TOS, but they just don't do anything because he's, you know, they're a fledgling streaming platform and they can't afford to lose him. Uh, so they don't do anything. Anyway, uh, so that's the first thing about Kick. The second thing about Kick is they're big. They're, 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 they're Twitch, if you're a small streamer, has a 50 50 revenue split. So they take half and you get half of whatever revenue you make via Twitch. Ads, subscriptions, bit donations, 50 50 with Twitch. Uh, if you're a bigger streamer, you can get a deal which is a 70-30 split, I believe. Um, so, yeah, you get 70%, Twitch takes 30. Kick's revenue split is something fucking insane, like 95-5%, where they only take 5%. And, you like, it's something really high, way higher than literally any other content platform, which is a fucking phrase I hate saying, uh, on the internet. 
Uh, and the reason for this is that the, 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 the purpose that kick really serves is that uh, this, comp this website stake was, well, must have been getting a lot of traffic from Twitch streams of people who had streamed themselves gambling on stake. These streams are pretty popular. XQC was doing it, a guy called Trainrex, who's uh, heavily involved in the upkeep of kick.com and the creation. He's doing it. He's a big, uh, someone that gets sponsored by cake a lot or by, by stake a lot. Like they, they, they used to get, he used to gamble on stake all the time. They had a big like relationship with each other and, um, on, and he used to stream it. And so when he, you know, when Twitch banned that, he's, he's one of the people that I believe is like working in some ways behind the scenes or as like, you know, on, on this cake platform. Uh, so the point of kick originally is it's Twitch, but you can gamble. You're allowed to do gambling streams. Um, and the idea being it will drive traffic to stake.com, which is actually the money maker. Um, now what's particularly notable about this XQC thing. So this is not the first time that streamers have been bought out. Uh, it's kind of a strange situation because this stuff doesn't happen with like YouTubers or anything like this. But previously, you know, there was a Microsoft owned website called Mixer. Um, and they paid a bunch of money to Ninja, who's a Fortnite streamer, to come and stream over there. Mixer eventually shut down and Ninja just went back to Twitch 90 million dollars richer or something. Uh, the same things happened with YouTube. So YouTube has bought multiple Twitch streamers like Ludwig, I think Saikuno, I think Valkyrie uh, are all contracted to stream on YouTube exclusively and they get big deals, although they don't say exactly how much they got. It's definitely in the millions, probably tens of millions. Uh, so, you know, this is like a thing that happens. But what's and so there have been streamers who have been contracted to stream on Kick as well, and they're pro uh, although I'm not sure how much money they they've gotten to stream on Kick, you know, it is what it is. But the interesting thing about this XQC thing is that Kick gave him a hundred million dollars, or at least that's what the contract is. the The contract to stream on Kick is a hundred million dollars which is a fucking insane amount of money. To put that into perspective, that is more than LeBron James's contract. Like, that is... I'm, I'm just going to be real with you. I don't understand how XQC is worth $100 million to anyone because that's, that's just too much fucking money. $100 million is just a ridiculous amount of money. <laughs> Like, it's way more than has ever happened. I think the Ninja contract... Let me let me check. How much was the Ninja Mixer contract? 20 million to 30 million. It was somewhere between 20 million to 30 million. So, like... 100 million is fucking insane. There's just no way he's worth that much. But what this really means... Is that, like... I mean, this is... Th the reason I'm bringing this up... The reason I'm even talking about this is like this has this strategy of just buying up streamers has never been shown to work. Like YouTube's done it, and they're streaming. Like although they get more view, you know, people watch those streams. Each of those streamers gets less views than they used to get on Twitch. So XUC is going to get less views than he used to get on Twitch, and I think is going to happen. Um, but more importantly. None of that's it's never been shown to be a sustainable strategy for actually growing your business because what you really need in order to have a success, successful streaming ecosystem, the reason why Twitch is still the king of the streaming world, is what you really need is a bunch of small to mid sized streamers, like a bunch, not just the biggest. You don't just need the 10 biggest streamers, you need the 100 middle tier streamers because that's the next generation. And also, that's, you know, what's gonna, 
that's that's what's going to make up the majority of these things you know like uh that's what that's what gives you longevity because you know these some of these really successful streamers anything could happen to them they could decide to quit they could uh get cancelled you know they could get scooped up by another platform any of these sorts of things could happen uh or they could just like slowly fall off which happens you know all the time there has to be sort of a cycle like for example a lot of streamers get successful playing one particular game and then that particular game gets less and less popular and then you know they don't pivot properly or they do pivot and their audience doesn't follow them there's a lot of situations like this which is why you need a really healthy bed of mid-tier streamers you need like a lot of them and those people are mainly going to twitch still uh kick does have a, an advantage in that unlike mixer and youtube kick is actually offering this 90 95 5 split to smaller streamers which is gonna push them over to kick i mean at least in theory so that's the new thing they're doing the problem is uh that the kick is not gonna make any fucking money like that this is not a sustainable business model like really obviously not you can't just be throwing out hundreds of million dollars and then not taking anyone like when you it, it's not a thing you can't do this uh so the only explanation is that stake must just have infinite fucking money it must be so profitable with such low upkeep costs that the people who own stake and the, 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 this this whole situation just have so much money they don't even know what to do with it like they because you know stakes a gambling website it takes nothing to keep that shit running they must just be they must just be literally swimming in ridiculous amounts of cash that they just don't know what to do with and so they're just like we can afford to spend probably close to a billion dollars at this point like let's see kick they're many many million dollar deals with these streamers you know with the upkeep costs it's i mean it's got to be like at least 500 million that they've spent on kick i would say probably more uh like they're spending shitloads and it must just be worth it for them where they're like uh, i mean you know remember that kick isn't their only advertising they have like an ad on a fucking f1 car like they have they have ads like everywhere like this gambling industry must just be so ridiculously profitable with such low overhead that they just have insane amounts of money to throw around it's ridiculous and this is the the big thing that that is actually different between kick and every other platform in the world not just youtube not just uh twitch but also facebook twitter everything because kick is the only one that isn't funded by third party advertisers entirely or almost entirely the kick this is like the actual interesting thing about kick is that like every single other content platform which is again saying the word content platform makes me want to fucking shoot myself but all of the other ones are funded by advertisers they're owned by multi-billion companies but they're not you know they're supposed to be a source of profit for those companies whereas for kick or for stake kick is an advertising expense they are the sole advertiser of kick i mean kick does run third party ads but 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 kick themselves aren't making money from that 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 money is basically just to keep the streamers around so it will advertise stake like the their entire business model is this is our advertising costs this we run this entire website at a massive loss because it drives some percentage of people to a gambling site that makes us so much money we don't care that's the bet they're taking i mean they're a gambling company they take bets uh and i am very skeptical about this i don't know if it's going to work out uh, i don't know who's worse to be running major platforms tech companies and advertisers and these tech companies you know again they don't really it's mainly the ad advertisers that have most of the power uh to determine like platform uh, that you know policies and, and so on of these tech companies like you think youtube removed the dislike because they thought it would make them more like it make the product better no 
the reason YouTube removed the dislike button is because YouTube makes money from advertisers and advertisers don't like their ads getting dislike bombed. So that's why they removed it. Obviously, everyone knows that. Um, so, you know, YouTube doesn't have any leverage here. Like, not really. YouTube doesn't have much leverage, whereas all the advertisers have all the leverage. In this situation, there are no third-party advertisers on Kick who have a shitload of leverage. It's just stake that have all the leverage in this situation. Um, obviously, the streamers don't have any leverage and the viewers don't have any leverage in any situation. So it's only... it's The power is actually centralized in one place, which is a new thing. Like, this hasn't... To be a profitable, large-scale... I'm going to say a, a, a fucking phrase that is, oh my god, it's such a bad phrase. Content delivery platform, to be to be a, a, a large-scale, popular content delivery platform with mainstream e-celebs that is actually, you know, under centralized power and not dependent on advertisers is something completely new. Um... Is it good or bad? I mean, I don't know. It 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 means they can be a bit more loosey goosey with their TOS. But it also means, uh, well, I don't know what it means to be honest. I although I do think that this this the situation that Kick has going on right now is not going to last. I do not think that. I mean, there's just simply no shot that Kick is seeing a, a an ROI big enough to justify what they're doing. Like, I don't fucking believe it. They're not saying an immediate ROI big enough to justify what they're doing. It's not fucking happening. I don't buy it. I do not believe it. Um, the only reason they're doing it is someone somewhere has convinced people that, uh, oh, if you invest all your money in this right now, it will serve as the best advertising platform for Gamba. And secondly, that, oh, as long as we build it and we push everyone over here, we can then slowly, you know, roll back the advantages. So we'll go from a, uh, you know, we'll take more of a split from ads. Well, because they can do that, right? If they, if they like, let's say five years from now, <laughs> when no one gives a shit, let's say somehow Kick establishes itself as a viable platform. Kick is a viable platform. And then they're like, we're rolling it back to, uh, instead of a 95, and maybe not five years, we'll say three years, right? They, they're like, we're rolling it back instead of a 95-5% split is now an 80-40 split. That's my math right there. 80-20. Fuck. It's an 80-20. I'm fucking exhausted. Uh, yeah, it's like an 80-20 split. And they'll be like, well, look, it's still, like, way higher than any other platform. Like, what are you complaining about? We need to cover the... Exp and people will probably be like, yeah, they'll complain, but they'll also be like, yeah, fair, I mean... It, they can still argue it's better than every other platform. And then eventually, you know, they can just put it back to like 50-50, except for high levels. They could do anything, right? As long as they take their time doing it. It won't actually work. You know, all of these, this this business model is like a very hit or miss. Uh, but it's common in the tech sphere. Except in this situation, who knows if they're, like, they must have investors but are they actually, how much are they reliant on investor money versus m gamba money? I'm assuming the gambling industry is like one of the most profitable industries. So I'm assuming they just have shit loads of money, like incomprehensible amounts of money. And it's probably good for them to reinvest because they don't want to be paying like massive taxes on it. I don't know. Uh, but it's whatever it is, it's an insane situation. I don't know whether it's good or bad. I just know it's a it's a it's a like unprecedented thing to happen on the internet. Nothing like this has happened. There's never been a a mainstream or semi mainstream platform that's had an alternative like this. For some reason, live streaming is the one space where comp competition actually exists. Uh, except none of it's really viable, but it's way better than the competition for like YouTube, for example. Like, where if you're not hosting your video on YouTube, what other option do you have? Odyssey, Vimeo, like Vimeo doesn't market itself as a YouTube competitor, not really, right? 
um, so Odyssey is the real YouTube competitor, and Odyssey is okay. Look, I'm not like super against Odyssey, but I'm not super in favor of Odyssey either. The only, the, the real YouTube alternative is PeerTube, but PeerTube has so many fucking problems. <sighs> yeah, I don't know. And I mean, when it comes to other st- stuff, I mean, there's no Facebook alternative, but who uses Facebook anymore? There's no Instagram alternative that anyone cares about. There's no Reddit alternative that anyone cares about. There's no Twitter alternative. I guess Mastodon. People, like, Mastodon's bigger now, right? But what I I heard... Tell me if I'm wrong in the comments. I heard that when Elob took over, and every time he makes a change, a bunch of people flood flood over to Mastodon, and then they use it for, like, two weeks, and then they go back to Twitter. That's what I heard has, like, been actually happening. Is that true? Let me know. Uh, That, like... People don't stick around on Mastodon very much. I've been thinking about moving to Mastodon recently. Um, I, I'll have to see if things have changed. Because last time I was on Mastodon, like f- four years ago, or f- a little less, uh, I remember I was on Mastodon. I posted one edgy joke. The guy who runs the instant I've said this before. A guy who ran the instance replied to me and said, Nope, you don't, you're not allowed to make jokes like that here. To which I literally just posted, that guy is a state actor. They then banned me uh, from the entire instance. So I went to another instance with the same name. And the second I made my account, I got banned. And that's how I found out that uh, although it claims to be this federated, decentralized thing, actually many moderators are moderators of multiple different instances. Moderators of all the different instances are friends. They all share these blacklists or block lists, which they claim is just to ban the like right wing uh, instances or porn instances. But they actually just ban any like they do that. But they also just ban anyone they don't like. I mean, it kind of brings me back to the old school forum days, where you'd you'd be in some forum and you you'd just piss off some mod and they just ban you forever, just because they're power tripping. Like it's the same kind of deal. At least on Twitter, if you post some retarded shit, no one cares. On Mastodon, if you post some retarded shit, you know, some fucking mod, who, by the way, just to remind you, they do it for free, uh, is going to notice, because they're instant, you know, and it's just ridiculous. Like, the, the I don't know, man. I, I don't like that aspect of it. <laughs> I, I also, I mean, I remember when I was on Mastodon, everyone just talked about Mastodon. I hope it's changed now. It's because it was a relatively novel thing. I guess it's much bigger now, so it's probably changed. Yeah, I'll think about making an account on some sort of Mastodon instance. I don't know. You know what it probably is, I've just realized? Maybe what's worth 100 million isn't... (laughs) This is actually wild. Maybe it isn't that they're paying for XQC. Maybe they're paying for the ability to tell Aiden Ross to fuck off. Because having Aiden Ross on their site is... While it's pub, you know, there's an argument that all publicity is good publicity. They don't want to be. I don't think they want to be Rumble, which if you it, Rumble is a streaming site for like, I think like Nick Fuentes streams on there, right? Like it's that kind of thing. Like I don't think they, I don't think they want to be Rumble. I think they want to get serious investors and stuff. But they can't right now because Aiden Ross is the figurehead of their site, and Aiden Ross is very edgy right wing guy <clears throat> although he wasn't originally he's just sort of become that um and so like i think they want to be able to like not necessarily ban him but be able to clamp down a little more on him uh so that and if it was like oh he's on they just don't want him to be the the face of the site having xqc be the face of the site lends them a shitload of lo- of um legitimacy over having Aiden be their most popular streamer. That makes a lot of sense. I think it's like they're just paying, I will pay a hundred million dollars for you to fuck off kind of deal. That they, they, I think that's the actual reason. I don't think they, they paid for XQC. I think they paid to get rid of Aiden. Which makes, now that I've thought of that, that makes a lot more sense. Okay, it's also, and this is the last thing I will say on this subject, uh, this is the last thing, unless there's an update. 
Uh, it's also possible that the $100 million number is just incorrect. Uh, it seems like the source of the number is a leak from XQC's agent, which you think is legitimate, but both XQC and Trainwreck both say, like, they they haven't explicitly said it's not true, but they've also said, like, that, like you should be, like, take it with a grain of salt, basically. Uh, I think it's good publicity for Kick to say that it's $100 million. But I don't know if it actually is. It could be lower than that. I don't see how X would move for like less than quite a lot though. I said I'd talk about touching grass. I don't have that much to actually talk about, really. I just went out with a friend to go to a naturey place. Saw a couple of deers. The place is ridiculously picturesque. Uh, yeah, saw some deers. Saw some some animals and shit uh but mainly just walking around in this naturey place and when i say walking around i mean fucking walking around because i still feel exhausted we're also drinking the whole time and just like chain smoking cigarettes for some reason i don't even smoke cigarettes <laughs> we're just chain smoking cigarettes for some reason and drinking the whole time uh but yeah, I think we ended up walking for, I mean, man, we were just walking for so fucking long, because this place is massive, like, this place is fucking huge, and we basically walked all the way across it, um, and most of it's uphill, like, it's kind of one, on average, it's like one giant hill, and we were going up it, so it was a lot of walking. Like, I still feel exhausted. Man, my legs, I feel like I did leg day yesterday. Like, you know when you're at the gym, you do leg day? Like, that's how my legs feel, just from walking. Oh, just from, like, basically casually strolling, but just for so many hours. Uh, Yeah. And I didn't really eat the whole time as well. Because I had like a sandwich. The, and I, I didn't even have much for breakfast. Because we were out in the middle of fucking nowhere. So nothing to eat. So we didn't really eat anything the whole time. Just walked. And and chatted. And uh. Yeah. I would say it was fun. But also. Pain. I'm in pain. I'm still in. My legs are still in pain. My feet especially. By the end of it, my feet hurt so much. Uh, yeah. Fucked, really. Because not only do we have to walk all the way there, but by the time you get to the other side, you're kind of in the middle of nowhere. Like, there's not much public transport around there, because you're right on the outskirts of London. So we then had to walk, like, another 20 minutes to get to the train station, which was fucking... Long. <laughs> uh, there were other options, but we they weren't available to us for some reasons. Complicated, annoying reasons. Yeah, anyway. That was me going outside. And touching grass. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that was me going outside and touching grass. I don't know what else to add on to it. But... About, you know, towards the end when we were walking through this place, and we were both starting to get pretty hungry, I was like, god damn, if I had fucking Subway right now, I would annihilate a Subway meatball marinara right now. That's what I was thinking. In the end, when we got back to mine, I just made... Food. I just made rice and chicken, and peas and vegetables and stuff. Nothing crazy, but ever since then, I've been thinking, man, if only I had a f- subway meatball marinara. And then today, I fucking caved, and I was like, fuck it, I'm gonna get a meatball marinara. So I ordered one. Honestly, I don't know why, but this one. It, normally they have like sauce on them, right? Like tomato sauce. 
this one, it didn't have, it was just meatballs, no marinara. <laughs> it was just meatballs, no marinara. That was kind of annoying, because I like that sauce. Uh, but yeah, it was still pretty good. I wouldn't, I don't know, for some reason, everyone shits on Subway. I've never understood it. Subway is literally good. Like, what's bad about Subway? They give you loads of food. It's not, look, I'm not saying it's cheap, but it's not exactly expensive. It's not, like, particularly expensive. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's what you'd, ex- it's, it's how, it, it costs about how much I would expect it to cost. It, it It's consistent. And the food's not, I don't know, the, the food, and the f- fucking cost aside, the, the, the taste... It tastes like what's wrong with the taste? What do people not like about it? I don't understand. It generally tastes pretty good to me. I don't know if I'm missing something. Maybe if you live in a place like New York where you can get like really good deli sandwiches everywhere, that's not really a culture here. At least not. It depends where you are in London. Like there are some places that have that and they're like. Italian areas mainly, but I don't live in the Italian areas. Uh, so yeah, there's not really a big like big deli sandwich type culture here. Uh, so I don't know. What do you like? What do you want from me? <laughs> yeah, maybe if you live in New York and you can get like really great deli subs, then there's no point going to Subway. But if you don't, then what's bad? I don't understand. Why is everyone complaining about it? Like, it's not like a you go to a fucking burger fast food place and you get a tiny, like, basically what you're actually buying is, like, a tiny little cube of meat in bread and then a bunch of chips to fill you up. And the chips are just mid, they just exist to, to be carbs to fill you up. And, the like, that's really what you're getting. At least the Subway, you know, the meat, you're getting a bunch of meat, a bunch of vegetables, and some bread. And it's all balanced. It's all the right amount of everything. You know? Like, am I missing out on something here? Am I crazy? Yeah, it's not the best bread you you can get. That's definitely the worst part of a Subway sandwich, the bread quality. Bread quality, not great. But, I mean, it's, it's, it's fine. It's not like unappetizing, it's just not the best bread ever. I don't understand, I don't, I, I see all these Subway haters. Is it because people, like, hyped Subway at some point? Like, obviously it's not healthy. But, that's the other thing, though, actually, is I hear, like, I've seen people say, like, describe Subway as the fast food chain that, that people think is healthier than the others, even though it actually isn't. And the thing is, it just completely depends what you order. Like, is obvious, if you're ordering, I mean, if you're getting McDonald's or something, the only vegetables you're eating is, like, one slice of lettuce. Whereas if you go to Subway, you can order, like, a shitload of vegetables on your thing. I do. I get, like, you know, I get my meatball marinara with, what did I get? I had uh, lettuce, I had peppers, I had onions, sometimes I get olives, sometimes I get jalapenos. Like, you can put vegetables on it, right? More vegetables than you get on a burger. And they're not the highest quality vegetables, but there's definitely less... There's definitely not... Like, any vegetables is better than nothing. And now, I'm not saying that the Subway is healthy. I think the main point they're trying to make is in terms of, like, it being, like, empty calories. And that's definitely true. In terms of nutrition... I would be willing to bet the Subway is maybe, like, very slightly more nutritionally dense than a McDonald's or Burger King or any sort of burger-based fast food place. Uh, That's not really a plus for Subway. It's more of a point out how, you know, non-nutritionally dense the burger places are. Uh... But yeah, I don't know, I thought the sub, like, you can call Subway mid, I'm not gonna say it's a fucking amazing place, like, if you wanna say, yeah, it's just mid, that's fine, 
but I don't understand all the sh- the all the, the 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 trash talk about Subway like it's disgusting or terrible. It's perfectly serviceable. I don't I don't get it. It 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 they they give you plenty. Of, you know I get them if you get a foot long, that's like two meals. No one's eating a foot. Long. I mean unless you're really fat, like a foot long Subway sandwich. That's two meals worth of food. That's loads of food. You know, that's that. Like, it may not be that cheap, but you get what you pay for in terms of quantity. Like that's literally two meals worth of food, and then, you know, they give you a cookie. The cookies, they they're nice. I like the cookies. I don't know. I'm kind of a, I'm kind of pro Subway as a guy. I'm not so, again. There's better options in the world. There's tastier things, but, you know. It's it's not bad. I don't I don't understand all the shit talk. It's it's like perfectly fine. Sorry, this was not supposed to be a subway rant. But what I meant to say is I what I've done to myself here is after being super exhausted from all that walking and then I just had eggs for breakfast today. Um and then uh yeah, my body's just been like, you gotta eat, you gotta stuff your safe face with Subway meatball. So I just decided, fuck it, I bought Footlong. And I bought foot, Footlong with a drink and some crisps and a cookie for a deal. And, uh, yeah, that's all I've eaten. And man, I'm full as fuck. And that was, that's, I'm, I've been super full the entire time. And that's been... Oh, wait, I did eat something else. Okay, yeah, no, I'm just fat. <laughs> I actually did eat something else. That's why I feel crazy full. I forgot I had a little snack. It wasn't a little snack. It it was like an awkwardly sized snack that's like halfway between a snack and a meal. I had eggs for breakfast, and I had a frozen chicken and vegetable pie. I forgot I even had that. Because I wasn't planning on having Subway. So I made a chicken and vegetable load. They're not very big. They're like, I don't know how to describe the size. They're maybe, uh, what's that? Let's see. About that big, which is like, what, four centimeters across? Circle? What's that, diameter? Yeah. Four centimeters in diameter, circle? Type of pie? So not super big. Uh... Yes, yeah, so I guess I did eat a, eat a pretty reasonable amount of food today. Quite a lot, actually. Well, I wouldn't say quite a lot, but more than average. Which probably explains why I'm so full. What I'm saying is, normally... This is what I actually wanted to talk about. Normally, I eat way too much. I feel like shit. I feel like I'm dying. But but today, I've eaten, way, I've eaten too much. I feel really full. But my body is telling me, you needed this. <laughs> You know, <laughs> my body is telling me, like, uh, good job. Which I guess means I need to exercise more. Yeah, I don't know, man. That was too much walking. I can't do that on a regular fuck. I can't, there's no way I can do that on a regular... I mean, I, I, my feet are, like, fucking bleeding. It's crazy. But... It was a nice, it was a nice day day out. Someone told me if you get this browser extension, which I believe is called Blue Blocker, uh, which automatically blocks all of the Twitter Blue subscribers in your feed as you scroll, uh, the Twitter actually becomes way better and more usable. Uh, so I try. I've been trying it out for the past two days. Not true <laughs> it has changed absolutely or very little about the quality of post not it's not i wouldn't say it's had no effect stuff has changed like it's it's different i get lower you know i see more tweets with less likes and stuff fewer likes and stuff but i don't fucking know it's it Twitter algorithm is just nuts. It's like schizophrenic. It just thinks... It thinks I'm, like, changing... 
I don't know, it, it thinks it's fucking, like, I, I'm this insane person, like, if I, okay, here's what, ha- like, for example, I, I click on, I see, I see a, a, a video of, like, the Love Live, live performance of some kind, and I fucking click on it, because I'm like, let me remember what this, what Snow Halation sounds like, because it's been many years, so I fucking click on it, and then Twitter just recommends me Love Live videos for the rest of the day. It just thinks I've suddenly become really interested. Like, the algorithm's terrible. It, 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 I don't understand. It's, how is it so, I don't know, whatever, man. Why am I complaining about t- fucking Twitter here? I don't know what's going on. My album came out. I put an album out. Go listen to it. It's on my, no, it's on, you can find it in many, in many ways, in many places. No thank you. That's my name. Um, I think it's a pretty good album. I think it's pretty good. First album with a twist ending. First album ever made that has a plot twist at the end. Never expect it. Uh, that's my marketing tactic that I just made up right now. And, uh, yeah, I think it's pretty good. But I don't know what I'm going to do next with my life. I don't know what I'm going to do next with my life. i got to think about life and next... What I really need, I'll tell you what I really need, okay? I need a couple things. First thing, I need to buy a guitar. Because I just have the bass now. I need to buy a guitar, I think. Or something like this. And I need to have a guitar. That's one thing I need. Guys, I have solved politics and I'm going to tell you about it. I just had this thought, okay? Millions of people voted for a guy who's literally called Donald. Like, think about it for a second. And this isn't some libtard take, okay? Just hear me out. Donald. Imagine voting for someone <laughs> called Donald. It's so bad. And then, you know what's crazy? This is literally it. No one would have voted for him if 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 the, the libs... Had just started calling him Donald. Instead, they called him Trump and they made this whole Trump thing up like that was some crazy thing. But listen, referring to someone by their second name is like, like, you know, how you refer to someone in a position of authority. Note that in the 2016 election, everyone referred to Hillary as Hillary, but not Donald as Donald. Okay? No one called him Donald. I think it's because Donald is such a silly, fucking stupid name. <laughs> then, I don't know. Everyone was like, some, like, like, you can chant the name Trump. You can be in a crowd and be like, Trump, Trump, Trump. And it's, you know, Trump even has a meaning. A Trump card, you know? He, it, it's, it's like, uh, or, or uh, we're going to... You know, it it has a meaning of, like, overcoming something with an element of surprise, right? Which is very much exactly what his campaign was. And for some reason, the libs just just bought into this without even realizing that it was ideology. What they should have done is just called him Donald. If they just... if, If every single libtard TV host and whatever, instead of making fun of the word Trump, or making fun of Orange Man, or whatever, if they had just done normal coverage, but just always referred to him as simply Donald and nothing else, he would have lost the election, he wouldn't have even got the Republican nomination. Okay, he would have been so fucked. The fact that they called him Trump is what killed it. That's that's what made him that's what made him win. If if I think that ninety percent of Americans just don't even because Donald Trump, you know, all one word. Donald Trump, Donald Trump, it sounds okay, right? Donald Trump, right? It's kind of like Obama. Good, good, good sound, like it feels good to say out of your mouth. Obama, Donald Trump, Obama, Donald Trump, you know? (laughs) It sounds good. Joe Biden, it's okay, but Joe is good. I like Joe as a first name. 
Biden, it sounds like something Trump would say. Biden, you know, this is, I'm doing like some sort of terrible millennial comedy bit right now. I'm not doing it on purpose. I'm just thinking things through. I feel like I'm doing like a terrible something you'd see in like, like two 35 year olds in, in like LA who have a podcast that no one listens to. They would run this bit. And one of the, you know, and then th th this is the sort of bit I'm doing right now, but I'm not trying to do a bit. I'm just trying to express my genuine thoughts on this issue. I hope... I hope you'll listen to me, and, and I hope that you'll listen to me twice, actually, I'll say that. Um, you know, Joe is a good name. We love Joe. I think everyone can agree Joe is a good name. Not just for a president, but for anyone. Because it's literally an average Joe, Is it right? You know what I'm saying? Everyone, anyone called Joe... I used to know a kid called Joe back in school. He was chill. We weren't super close. But, you know, that's what Joe is. That's exactly the sort of person that Joe is. Someone you used to know... They were pretty chill. That's a Joe, right? Joe, J-O, girl's name, do not trust them. But you, you, you will know that already. Um, but Joe, like Biden Joe, is fine. Biden, I don't like that name, but it is what it is, okay? Trump is not a bad name. Donald Trump works. But if you were to just call him Donald, and you, you always pronounce the, far, the last D, you just put, call him Donald it doesn't work, you know what I'm saying? Like, it doesn't feel like a good name. <laughs> it's a terrible name for a person. Like, no one would have voted for this guy if they really thought about the fact that they're voting for Donald, you know? Like, this guy, and the thing about Trump is he's, you see, even I'm doing it, the thing about Donald is he's, he's good at this name thing, right? Like, the second he's up against Ron DeSantis, he's out here calling him Rob, he's out here calling him DeSanctimonious, he's out here calling him tiny he said tiny rob DeSantis is only five foot seven okay you can't beat this guy unless you just call him donald because the, the thing is there's nothing worse than that there's nothing worse than that because it's not making fun of him it's just his actual name like his parents just called him that he's already fucked he shouldn't exist because his name's donald that's, that's the whole point that's what i'm saying um look i'm not saying like i'm, I'm not here doing libtard shit what I'm saying is, I think that this is the key to winning elections. I think it's all about names. Everyone knows Obama won that election because Obama is a really fun word to say. Obama. Obama. Everyone, like, that's not even a question in anyone's mind. Everyone knows that. Every, everyone, fuck, every single person knows that Obama is a really fun word to say. I mean, even there's a meme of Donald Trump saying, Obama, because it's that funny. It's just a great word. Donald is the opposite of a good word, okay? It has a consonant cluster at the end. It's it's it has a long vowel at the end. It's got it's two it's like lopsided, you know? It's got don don very short staccato percussive vowel at the beginning. And then old. It's got this long vowel followed by a consonant cluster. No one wants to be saying it. Um, but he won anyway, because everyone called him Trump. I think if he'd ran, it, you know, meanwhile, Hillary, a.k.a. Shillery, you know, they, he, she couldn't run as Clinton, because there'd already been a Clinton. So that's where she fucked up. Um, I, I don't know. If, if she'd run as, if there hadn't been already a bill, if she'd just been Clinton, I don't know, Clinton, it's not, I don't know, but he won. Bill Clinton won. Maybe my theory's wrong, because Clinton's kind of an unpleasant word to say as well. I don't like saying Clinton, Clinton. It's too sharp, Clinton. No, I don't like it. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think DeSantis will win, because his name, I, I don't know, his name's, his name's just not good enough. It's too, just call him Rob. Trump goes on stage, just calls him Rob. He's fucked, he can't do anything about it. He's just dead in the water. Yeah, policies, obviously policies don't matter in modern American politics. No one thinks they do. Uh, and everyone thinks it's all about rapport and all of this stuff. But what it's actually about is names. This is what I figured out. This is what I figured out. My theory is if I, I, I look, I'm, I'm not here. I'm, I keep saying I'm not trying to do some libtard shit. What I mean by this is... This electoral politics stuff is very non... It's not super consequential. Everyone's shit, right? Everyone know. I don't know why I'm even mentioning this, because it's such a common sentiment these days. Like, 
you're you're not voting even for the lesser of two evils. They're just all evil. You know, ever obviously. <clears throat> but it is a very fascinating game of public relations. I think people don't because everyone takes it so seriously, people aren't willing to step back. I mean, this is why this is what what the whole why why Trump was so big on 4chan back in the day because like, 4chan was like this disconnected. Now it's not. You know, after that they could never go back because they became connected. And so, you know, I don't know if I don't know what's going to go on next time, but like that sort of person that like the sort of poll users in that that era I think they the reason that they started in the first place to and it became such a a, a cultural moment in that particular place is because what they were doing was taking this pulled back disconnected look at least at first at this weird ass game of public relations where where they were considering it to be you know just a, a very disconnected or or they weren't looking at the real politic. They weren't looking at the politics. They were just looking at the marketing. And that's what was interesting. And it, it, if you can take that attitude, it's still very interesting. I mean, you know, I'm over here in a whole different country, so it doesn't really bother me whoever wins in America. The, you know, it doesn't... Who cares? Um, so, you know, I think I'm going to... Next election cycle, I'm going to try and pay more attention to it, not as a, a political event, not as a TV spectacle, but as a battle of names. Bro, I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. What am I what am I on? What am I on? Am I smoking crack cocaine? Where did this idea that there are a whole bunch of secret weebs that never interact with anyone or are ever seen to exist who think they speak Japanese because they watched a bunch of anime and go to Japan and get disappointed when it's not exactly like anime and talk like anime characters. Like when did, this must have come out of somewhere and I know that there's at least one example of a person like this having existed. But I I do not think that this has ever been a widespread trend. Now as someone who consumes a lot of Japanese media, there is a trope of foreigner character who is really, really into Japanese history or Japan Japanese culture and knows more about Japanese culture than the main characters who are Japanese. Like, this happens in Kinino Mosaic, for example. There's a moment in that anime where uh oh, fuck it's been many years since i watched it but i remember it like starts raining and the blonde girl starts talking about some obscure uh like shinto myth or something and then the main girls are like what the fuck are you talking about i i know that it also happens in uh senden banker which i was just reading recently where the western finnish girl says like just again, knows a bunch of Japanese mythology and obscure words. Uh, and it also happens in Kinkoi, where... Uh, oh, fuck, I don't remember what it was. It was a minor thing. It was about food. Um, uh, it was something about food. It was something about uh, how there's a particular Japanese food... But when people say, the people normally talk about it, they use a simplified version of the name. And she was saying that she'd like the, the official name is this more complex thing with very complex kanji. And I've forgotten what it fucking was. But like what I'm saying is that trope exists in Japan. So according to Japanese people, that's the more common experience because they were there when the whole Japan cool uh, or cool Japan marketing, you know, tourism thing you know, well, maybe some of them were too young, but you know what I'm saying, right? The point being, Japanese people know that uh, there's this weird phenomenon of Westerners who are obsessed with Japan, but that's how they see it. They don't, at, at least, that's how I always see it being portrayed in media. I have never in my life seen uh, a piece of Japanese media portray this as some, like, negative stereotype, where it's like, I mean... 
there's loud obnoxious foreigners who don't try and like care for the customs or you know just come in and say some dumb shit that's a common trope as well but foreigner who goes to japan and knows too much is never portrayed as a bad thing now i'm not saying this is free reign to to be a degen weeb and you know all of this shit i'm just saying i don't think this this like trope that we have is like a thing in the real world and i know a lot of people are thinking maybe well yeah no one thinks it's it's really real it's all exaggeration and hyperbole but that's not true a lot of people do think this is like a real type of guy that exists which is very confusing to me anyway that's all i want to say Okay, I want to complain about something that is just extremely petty. There's these Cruelty Squad prints that have been made. And, I don't know, the artist of these, Esteban Sanchez, great art, okay? The shit looks like the, they made the Cruelty Squad guy just look so fucking cool. And that's what I want to complain about, is that I feel like the Cruelty Squad guy shouldn't look cool. Like, I feel like he's supposed to be kind of a lame guy. Like, he's just a lame corpo drone. He's literally a lame corpo drone. He's not a cool, swagged out action hero guy smoking a cigarette. He's a, a boring corpo drone who's like, keeps, you know, getting fucking Cronenberg looking ass. Which is an extremely petty, because no one wants to put a poster on there. Like, if, look, these are all extremely cool posters. Uh, I might even buy one. But I feel like it shouldn't be cool. Like, it's the wrong thing to be cool, if you know what I'm saying. It's extremely petty. It's great, great job. Um, Esteban Sanchez on the art. It looks, it looks very cool. I'm going to try and do something really stupid, which is I'm going to... I've, I've been trying to learn about something, and I'm going to try and do the thing where I try and explain it to someone else in a way of hoping that it will make it stick in my brain. So, dark matter. I'm not a physicist. Let me just get this out of the way first. Okay, I'm not a physicist. I don't understand any of this stuff. I don't know the maths. I didn't go to school for physics. If you actually want to learn about dark matter... You should go and find a physicist, and not a pop science physicist, edutainment. You should go and like read a textbook or something, because uh, this is the, you know the the whole idea that like this is something that average people are supposed to understand is insane. Like, this is a, this is you know re relatively advanced cosmological dynamic physics. I don't know if that's not a fucking name, is it? Anyway, whatever. Uh, so the way I understand it, a lot of people. They look at dark matter and dark energy and they're like, oh, you're telling me that there's all this stuff in the universe that just is that we can't see and, like, you just had to make this up to fill your models out because your models are wrong? Ha ha ha, right? A lot of people say this sort of thing. It's it's a pretty common sentiment. Now, I don't know shit about dark energy. Um, I'm not going to comment on that. But dark matter, I have a vague understanding of. And I think that the people who say that stuff... Again, I don't know anything about dark energy, but dark matter, it, like, that's not how it works. Because dark matter, it's not something some people, it, it doesn't make the models work, it does the opposite, it fucks up the models. <laughs> so, uh, it's just something that has been observed, right, like, okay, here's how it works. There's a, there's stuff, you look outside with a telescope, you look at the galaxy, and you see a bunch of stuff in the galaxy. And the stuff's like gas and asteroids and, you know, all of this stuff in the galaxy. And you look at it and you can tell what it's made of. And so because you know what it's made of, you also know how much it should weigh, right? Because you we know how much various... Get, uh, if you have a bunch of hydrogen, you can see how much of it is there is. And we know what hydrogen is. We know how much hydrogen weighs. You have a bunch of... Uh, you know, other gas clouds, or, you know, that's the sort of thing I'm talking about. It, obviously, you can do this. Um, so you can look at a bunch of stuff, and you can be like, okay, looks like there's a bunch of stuff over there. 
we can look at it and we can we can judge how much of that stuff is there because we can see it and we can also see what it's made of so we know how much stuff and what it is and therefore we know what it should weigh like how much mass it should have but then you go to confirm that by measuring the mass which you can do with some really i don't understand i'm not even going to pretend to understand this okay but there's some ways you can do that by measuring like changes in velocity and stuff by just looking at it um, again, that's not some abstract scientific model or whatever. That's like hard math. Okay, like this is not. That's not the part. That, if there's anything that's being fucked up, it's not that. Nothing's being fucked up here. Nothing's like weird. Nothing's broken. This is like a, a base to these people, to people who know their shit. This is like basic stuff that you do on it on the daily. That is like fucking ancient maths that's been known about for centuries. This isn't like complicated stuff. It's like Newtonian stuff, right? at, at least to these people. To me, this is ridiculously complicated, but you know what I'm saying, right? So, you can look at this this cloud, this this gathering of stuff, and you can measure its its mass using these calculations from velocity and stuff, and then you'll, you'll look at it, and you'll be like, well, hold on a second. I know how much it should weigh from what I can see, but when I actually measure it, it weighs way fucking more. So there must be something else there that I can't see. That's literally all dark matter is. Is like, well, there's this observation that we've made, and it clearly points to the fact that there's something there that we can't see what it is. Right? This is not some crazy, like, oh, we have all these abstract theories about the universe, and to make them add up, we have to create this, invent this thing called dark matter. No. It's the opposite. No one no one was went out to invent it to fill in a gap in a theory, it just happens that when you're doing measurements about the universe, you, you're you like, well, we know how much this stuff should... And, I'm, you know, these people are smart, okay? You don't get to be a, a physicist, an astrophysicist, if you're not smart. So I'm sure the first thing they did was be like, okay, well, let me go back and recheck my calculations, because that's not a normal thing to happen, right? I, I'm, sure, I'm pretty sure that when stuff gets accepted into peer-reviewed papers and becomes widely accepted science, it has to go through a couple of checks where people are like, let's make sure that your models are correct. So I believe that, you know, it's. It, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's how it works. Alright, that's my point. That's that's what I'm... So, that's what, that's what the deal is. It's not... It's not this thing. And the, the reason it's annoying is because sometimes it is that thing, but not with dark matter. Like, string theory is like that, where it's just made up to fill in a hole in the model. But dark matter is not made up to fill a hole in the model. It's it's just something people have observed. Dark energy, I have no fucking clue about. I'm not... I don't know anything about it. There's a discussion happening on my Discord about accelerationism, as there often is. And uh, it's reminding me of just this... This thing, and I don't know if I've misunderstood something here, or if everyone else has misunderstood something here. Uh, But as far as I understand, accelerationism, at least in the in the Landian sense, is not normative, right? Like this is, I think, what's maybe I'm wrong about this. It's not even really making value judgments. Sometimes it is, but not, like, a lot. Like, it's not like, oh, what's your political affiliation? I'm an accelerationist. That means I prescribe these policies for these problems. It's not how, it's not what it's about. It's more like... It's just a descriptive theory, as far as I understand it. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. But it's just saying... Like, it, there's no use saying... Because the, the fundamental sort of prescriptive action you could be saying would be... Um, techno capital is accelerating and we need to or we need to accelerate technology or something that is fundamentally antithetical to land's anti-anthropocentrism though no 
Like, the whole point is human agency doesn't have a massive role here. You're taking this and applying it to the old Marxist frameworks, but that's not the that's not the case here, right? Like the whole point is that you you can't do shit about this. It's this Lovecraftian dealio, much bigger than you that you have little to no impact on. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's absolutely wild to me that porch pirates are a thing in America. Because, yeah, if you leave your fucking package out in the front of your house, someone's going to fucking take it. What the fuck do you think is going to happen? That's why no one does it anywhere except America. It, you know what happens if you get a package delivered here and you're not in? They just leave it. They give you a little note and they just leave it with your neighbors. And then you get home, you find the note, you knock on the door, and you say, hey, do you have a package for me? They go, oh yeah, sure, here's your package. Except, in this situation, I'm the one that's always home, because I'm a neat. So I'm I'm the one that's always getting getting packages for my neighbors. And, and, and they come over and they're like, do you have my package? And I'm like, yeah. It's not difficult. As like I'm I'm not someone who particularly enjoys social interactions with random people. I don't know my neighbors very well, so you know, I'm I'm it's not my favorite thing to do, but it's 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 not a big deal. Like one time, my package got delivered to my my neighbor. I was really nervous, but I went over there, and it was it was, she was just she was just like yeah here it is, like nothing bad's gonna happen. Why don't they just do that? Or if none of your neighbors are in. They just put it at the depot, and you just have to go collect it, which is kind of annoying. Um, or, actually, what mostly happens is they just deliver, they just try and deliver it on another day. Uh, that's, that's the most common thing. I don't, I don't understand why, why would they would just, no one's ever done that. Just left it, just left it on the porch? That's fucking wild. That's an insane thing to do. Why would they do that? That's fucking insane. It's crazy because it's such an easily solvable problem by just not doing the obviously stupid thing. It's like, how could we avoid this? How can we stop these people from stealing shit off of our porches? Well, what if... And and hear me out here. This is crazy. What if there was some sort of letter box <laughs> in your door... For people to post shit through. Wow. Wouldn't that be fucking insane. I'm like what the hell. I went to the store earlier today. And I saw this. This thing. And it's called. Bowl. One pot meal. Japanese katsu curry. And it says high in protein. 23 grams of protein. Per meal. So I'm like looking at this and it's on sale as well I see this on the shelf and I'm like huh I love Japanese curry curry rice um I love you know if this is depending on if it has a lot of protein you know it has a lot of chicken in it this is actually not a bad deal at all and it's a one pot meal you just put it in the pot and boil it and it's done you know what it's maybe not the most cost effective thing to do in the universe but it's not a bad deal. So I bought it. I have now boiled the meal and have it in a bowl here. And I'm eating it. And uh, I gotta say, I was fucking scammed. Because this is vegan. <laughs> this is a vegan meal. There is no meat in it or anything it just has beans it has chickpeas it has black beans and it has lentils in it so that's the first aspect of it it's a scam and you might think oh by the way it doesn't say that it's vegan anywhere clearly on the front that i could see it just says one pot meal japanese katsu curry now 
some of you who are more adept at Nihongo might have already noticed the problem with this. Which is that this is not a katsu curry. Because katsu means cutlet. There's no cutlet. It's just a vaguely curry sauce with beans and shit in it. There's no katsu. It's not a katsu curry. I've been absolutely fucking lied to. I need to send a complaint to the fucking consumer standards people. Because this is goddamn nonsense. I bet they've looked this up and it turns out katsu curry is not like a protected term or whatever. But, I mean, look, this is literally what that stuff's for. I hate it when people do shit like this. Like, this is like the... How do you... What the fuck? There's no way this isn't on purpose. You're putting... You're saying it's gonna have katsu in it. It doesn't have fucking katsu. Now I'm like, I paid too much for something just beans. I could have made my own shitty curry sauce with beans in it. The fuck is this? This is not worth it at all. Absolutely fucking taking me for a mug. You kidding me? This is insane. And to top it off... It tastes absolutely nothing like any sort of curry. <laughs> it just kind of tastes like mush. I don't think this tastes like Japanese curry at all. It doesn't have the flavor profile. It doesn't really taste of much. It tastes like baby food. Oh, so right on the back... On the back, it says vegan approved. There you go. Oh, okay. So, it does say all this vegan stuff. It's just on the back. I just noticed this. On the packaging. On the back of the packaging, there's there's all this vegan stuff. Now, look. Okay. In the end, this is probably a good thing. It's not a bad thing for me to eat some some good pulses and beans and shit. Okay, I like that. I I'm a, I'm I need to be eating more of that to be honest. And uh, if this is a good way to get more of that into my diet, then fine. That's not necessarily a bad thing. I guess you know what? Maybe you can argue that this is like a a, a strange moral good. Because would I have bought this if it had said it was a bean curry? Maybe not. You know, I probably would have ignored it the second I saw it was a vegan product, just like I ignore every other vegan product. But, you know, it's getting me to eat pulses, and that's good for you. So, in the end, something good has come of this. Even if it's not particularly tasty, and slightly overpriced for what it is, at least I'm eating something that maybe I wouldn't have eaten Otherwise, my actual plans for dinner tonight were going to be uh, actually even, you know, arguably as healthy as this. I was just going to have chicken with salad and no carbs because I have a bunch of salad I have to use. Um, so in this particular situation, it didn't really keep me from eating something unhealthy, but Yeah, maybe the false advertising can be justified by the fact that it's getting me to eat healthy foods that I otherwise wouldn't have eaten. I do eat beans. It's not like I don't eat beans. But I probably don't eat enough beans. It tastes kind of bad. The more I'm eating of this, there's just like metallic taste to it. I don't know about this one, Chief. I don't know if any of you guys have noticed, but I am actually British. I know. I know, it's weird. It's fucked up. And I feel... I feel kind of like... I need to address the meme of British food being bad. I just... Look, I need to address it. In some senses... I don't think it's completely off the mark. A lot of British food is very simple, and a lot of it is thing in pastry. 
or thing topped with mashed potatoes and baked. Uh, the sort of traditional British food, right? Like, that's a lot of British food. Uh, uh, like, lots of different pies, uh, and lots of different, also pies, but with, like, like you know, shepherd's pie type of deal. Um, it's pretty common. I think everyone agrees that, like, a Sunday roast is a good form of British food. I think if you like the sort of flavors you're going to find in that, you're going to like a good chunk of traditional British food. But I think the meme about British food being, like, bad can basically be split into three categories. Um, one is the obvious one, which is there are certain meals that are, like, post-war or wartime, you know, rationing uh, inventions, right? When there just wasn't much food around and people had to make do with what they had. They're, they're just sort of hangovers from that. These things are pretty rare. Almost no one eats them. Uh, but some of them are considered, like, you know, they're very often, like, simple and plain. So some of them are sort of considered comfort foods. Let me think. Let me actually do some Googling. Uh, bad British food. Uh, yeah, what have we got? Six BuzzFeed, 16 British foods that people actually eat. Uh, I mean, black pudding, this is just a blood sausage, this is a thing in, like, half of Europe. I don't think most people have a problem with black pudding. Blood sausages are very common. Uh, pork pies? What the fuck is wrong with a pork pie? I think the thing, the reason that people think pork pies are weird is because they, they don't understand the scale of a pork pie. Pork pies are small. Like, you're not eating a giant thing that's just full of pork. It's just a it's 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 a small little thing with pork in it. And they're really tasty. I don't know why anyone complains about that. Uh Okay, this is one this is like a very obvious one. This is a very obvious one to complain about. Jelly deals. Okay. I have some complex thoughts about jelly deals. I've never had them, but I really wanna try them. Um, first of all, let me just make sure this is clear. No one eats this, right? Like, this is, like, a a really, really old, like, Victorian food that no one eats anymore because it's fucking jellied eels. Secondly, it might sound really insane, like, the concept of why would you put eels in jelly? That's weird. Um, uh, by the way, for Americans, I think Americans use jelly to mean different like we we mean jello when we say jelly so it's like imagine a bunch of jello filled with eels i think most people don't eat eel very often and i think the idea of putting a fish especially an eel in jelly is really weird um but it makes a lot more sense once you realize that you're not putting no one's putting eels in jelly you're just boiling the eels and they just have so much fish gelatin in their bones that it just leaches into the water and then when it cools it automatically becomes jelly. Some places add gelatin to make it firmer but that's where the dish originates is it's just you throw eels in a pot and boil them the pot will naturally fill with gelatin and if you just leave it to cool it will naturally set and you get jelly eels. Not exclusively a British thing either I believe this is also a thing in Norway or some other Scandinavian country. I'm pretty sure it's Norway, though. Um, again, I've never had it. I also think that mo a lot of people think of eels as, like, gross, slimy creatures and don't really know what it tastes like. Uh, eel is fucking delicious. Uh, eel is annoying to eat, lots of small bones, but if you get rid of them, it's really good. It's really tender, tasty, delicate flavor. Nice. Also, eels, very, very, very popular food throughout British history until very recently. European history, in fact, until very recently. Uh, people used to eat shitloads of eel. Used to be a super important thing back in the Middle Ages, but that's kind of not relevant. So yeah, I think people think jellied eels are weird, mainly because it is kind of weird. It's a weird texture thing. 
But it also, I mean, it just kind of makes sense as a part of the product production of like how eels exist. They just have a, they they just make jelly when you boil them. Um, so yeah, so I think that combined with the fact that no one eats this, most Brits find it gross as an idea, and only eat it as a novelty or out of curiosity, or they're really old people. Like, there are some really old, like, 90-year-old at this point, 80, 80, 90-year-olds who might have grown up eating it and just kept eating it, but very, very, very few. Uh, It is not a commonly eaten thing, which I think is unfortunate because eels are, as as far as I understand, a sustainable fish to eat these days, I think. I might be wrong about that. Fact check me in the comments. I don't know if jellied is the best form to get people to eat more eel. I think the best um, best eel dish is Japanese unagi-don. Eel with rice and a really nice sauce on it. One of my favorite foods ever. Uh, next is haggis. I've never eaten haggis, but... Um, haggis is basically peasant food. This is the another common type of, like, oh, disgusting British food is just, like... Thing that peasants ate back in the day. Uh, yeah, again, very few people eat. I mean, the, yeah, few people eat haggis. Uh, mushy peas. I've never understood this one either. I don't know why anyone eats mushy peas. Uh, that's that's weird to me. I don't get it. However, in in slight defense, there's not that much difference on a technical level between mushy peas and like Mexican refried beans. They're the same concept. But, no, I also, I don't like mushy peas very much. Uh, next up is Marmite. I absolutely fucking love Marmite. Um, literally get filtered if you don't like Marmite. It's delicious. It's, like, perfect. It's just like an umami bomb. You know what, you know, you want to know what the tr- tricks? A little bit of Marmite, like a little bit, very subtle amount, in your, in, in gravy. So good. It will boost the umami of your gravy. I mean, no, Marmite's great. It's just a, it's just an umami bomb. Like it's, it's just a umami paste. Like I, I don't understand what's gross about it. I think pe- people just, I don't even understand. Is it that you're eating something salty on toast? You eat cheese on toast all the time. That's salty, and umami. Like what's weird about it? Maybe people are putting too much, so it's like, oh, it's too salty. Yeah, you don't put very much on. You just put a little bit, and loads of butter, and it's super nice. I don't understand why, but this is a fucking weird thing to complain about. Never understood it. Uh, scotch eggs? What the fuck is... Why, how is a scotch egg bad? It's deep-fried sausage wrapped around an egg. It's like something Americans would come up with these days. It's, 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 it's not... I wouldn't call it, like, a fucking culinary masterpiece, but it's a nice snack. It's nice, especially if you make it or get it fresh and the egg's runny in the center, which is hard to do because you're frying it. But even with a hard-boiled egg bought from the store, like when you buy a scotch egg from the store, it's nice. It's like sausage meat wrapped around an egg. You would eat those two things separately. Why wouldn't you eat them together? Like, yeah, if there was a plate, it was like a full English breakfast and it had eggs and sausages, you would eat that. Why is it weird if they're just put together? I don't understand what's bad about that. Rice pudding? Rice pudding is popular all around the world. I don't know what's... I don't think Brits do it very well. But, uh, yeah. Not super crazy. Oh, yeah, this one gets brought up all the time. Stargazy pie. If you don't know, this is a fish pie where you put the fish heads sticking out the top of it and looking up like this, stargazing. Uh, No one eats this. This is just a made-up, this is just like some ancient medieval recipe that people have decided to resurrect. I don't know why. Yeah, no, this is not a thing. No, this this doesn't exist. No one, no one knew what stargazy pie was before the internet. Um, okay, most of these are fucking stupid. Licorice all sorts? I agree, I don't like licorice. Uh, da-da-da, yeah, most of this is just fucking, that's, that's, that's terrible article. I don't know what I was expecting. It's just a fucking 
BuzzFeed article. Okay, we're looking at some more. 50 worst rated British food and beverages. Uh, let's go to number one. Scroll down to number one. Uh, next page, 10 to 1. Okay. Number one worst one is deviled kidneys. I have never heard of that in my life. Scottish deep fried pizza. Okay, listen, I'm English. You can't blame us for what the fucking crazy ass motherfuckers up there get up to. Okay. Don't ask me what the Scots are deep frying. I have no idea. Um, Scouse? This just looks like a stew. I've never had that. What is this? Celery? This is just celery. This isn't even a meal. This is just literally celery. What's wrong with celery? Marmite again? Marmite's good. Why is anyone complaining about Marmite? Wait, are these supposed to be good or bad? I don't understand. Oh, these are the worst rated British food and beverages. Okay. Savaloy? Never heard of it. It looks like a completely normal sausage. Oh, originally it was made with pork brains, but nowadays is beef, pork, spices, and rusk. I mean, that's just a normal... People compare its flavors with frankfurters. This is just... This is just a fucking sausage. What, what are you complaining about here? Some sort of pie I've never heard of. I, I don't know what the fuck this is. This just looks like something made up. Like, cucumber sandwich? Okay, I don't particularly like a cucumber sandwich, but there is a reason these things exist. This is something that people would have with a traditional afternoon tea, which is like a thing that very rich people have. And um, the idea is you, you have a, a cup of tea or a, a pot of tea that you, you share and lots of little small snacks with it. And it's supposed to be refreshing and light and kind of like not super savory. So uh, like there's lots of sweets, like scones or scones, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Traditionally, it's an afternoon tea thing. Like lots of little tiny cakes and little tiny sandwiches. Like you'd eat, you have a cup of tea, you have a chat, you eat some sandwiches, uh, and you eat some, some little cakes. And honestly, you know, I'm not the biggest cucumber fan, but it's not supposed to be, because the, the, the point of afternoon tea is actually the tea itself. It's supposed to be stuff that doesn't distract from it and is like light and refreshing which is what cucumbers are. And so a little small, ti uh, when, like if you look at a cucumber sandwich, they're, they're very small. Like, yeah. Christmas pudding, I mean, this is cool. You set it on fire. You set it on, f it's a food you set on fire. Um, mushy peas again. Okay, that one, I mean, yeah, I agree. I'm not, not a fan of, of mushy peas. Oh, this is a fun one. Let's hope YouTube doesn't ban me for this one. Faggots. Uh, yes, that is a food. Laugh away. Because uh, it's very... It's a, it's an old name. That's the other... So that I was going to actually say this. All of the... I wanted to find articles with examples, but none of these are, like, very good. Because um, they're all just nice foods that people are just making up the fact that they're bad. Um, I don't think anyone thinks that any of this stuff is bad. Like, if you actually tasted it. Um, but yeah, so the thing, th I, I have three categories of, um, three categories of, of internet British food that is supposed to be bad. Category one, I already said, is like post-war poverty food that most people either don't eat or only eat because they have it as like a childhood nostalgia comfort food. Um, and yeah, almost no one still eats like that. Uh, number two is... Uh, <clears throat> just like ancient medieval food or just very, very old-fashioned food from when people's tastes were very different and what was available was very different and also no one eats these anymore. So that's like jelly deals, uh, that's like faggots, that's like all the, you know, stuff that's just like really old. 
I mean, even haggis fits into this. Very few people, I, as far as I know, few people actually eat haggis like on a day-to-day -day basis. It's more of like a, a or a stargazy pie also fits into this. It's just like really, really old shit. And um, yeah, some of that's gross, but most of it is just like probably not, probably fine. Just people with different tastes to modern palates. Um, like a lot of stuff, like I've seen offal brought up, or, um, or what the, like, you know, there's offal and haggis. What the fuck is the thing I'm, tripe, tripe. So tripe is like stomach. Um, like you eat, you eat, you, you eat the stomach. And the thing about tripe is a lot of people don't like it. And it's a really, really cheap cut of meat that's generally just thrown away these days. But there's absolutely nothing wrong with, like, firstly, I've literally never had it in my life, and I don't know anyone who has. But secondly, that's a bad thing, because we're just wasting perfectly edible part of an animal that we're slaughtering for meat. Like, you should, you should probably be, we should all probably be eating more tripe, you know? I've, I'm sure it tastes fine. Um, I should go to the butcher and ask for some tripe, because I bet it's cheap. I have no idea what to do with it, but, yeah. If, if you're arguing against that, like, you're arguing, you're saying just waste perfectly edible parts of an animal. That, that's weird to me. Uh, but, yeah, a lot of that, a lot of these, like, really old foods that people think are disgusting are stuff like that, where it's just uh, parts of an animal that we consider off-cuts because this is, like, peasant food. Um, yeah. <clears throat> So faggots are basically just meatballs made with offal and tripe. Because um, what are you going to do if you have a bunch of offcuts of meat? You're going to put them in a sausage or are you going to roll them up into a bowl of some kind? Like that's what people have always done. You know? it's not. That's not weird. That's normal. Every, literally every single country on earth has food like this. Uh, yeah, that's not a real thing. No one eats that. Oh, I see beans on toast brought up a lot in the like these sorts of things. Like, oh my god, British people eat beans on toast? Like it's some crazy thing. Motherfucker, what's wrong with beans on toast? Literally ex explain it with words. Like explain to me why that's like somehow gross to you. It's just baked beans in a tomato sauce on toast with normally butter and cheese on the bread or on top of the you know, some, so it melts. Literally, what is bad about that? Beans on some sort of bread product is a perfectly normal food. That's like 90% of what they eat in Mexico. Obviously, it's a different flavor profile, but I don't understand, like, lit expl this has never made any sense to me. Like, explain why that's bad. How is it, it doesn't taste bad, it's just beans. Beans taste, you know, are they saying it, it's like bland? It's not particularly bland. It has a, a, a sauce, you know. It's not the, I, you know, it's not the most fucking culinarily adventurous food out there. No one's claiming it is. It's like a quick meal because the the beans are canned, right? Like, it's not. No one would go to a restaurant and eat beans on toast. That would be absurd. It's it's like a. I don't know. I don't understand it. What do people? Uh, maybe the maybe that's what they think. But no, it's like a. It's not that. I've never understood any of the hate for beans on toast. And it also, it's quite tasty if you know what you if you make it right. Never made any sense to me. Um. This is just a perfectly normal sausage. I don't understand. Okay, so we've talked about the the, the, the first two types of, of weird British food, which is it's either post-war poverty stuff that no one eats anymore or really old traditional medieval stuff, which is either perfectly fine or even at some points delicious to, um, you know, stuff made from offcuts because it's peasant food and it's just not, no one really eats it anymore, uh, which is probably a bad thing. And the third type of British food that people insult has absolutely nothing to do with the food itself. It's just a thing with a silly name. Uh, you know, faggots is one of them. Eaton mess is one of them. Um, uh, Cullen skink, that's a classic. Uh, you know, these, these sorts of things. 
I'm seeing a cockaliki soup. Um, that's a funny name. Definitely a funny name. Uh, you know, it's just stuff with silly names. And again, nothing to do with the food, first of all. Secondly, it's just old shit. It's just old language that stuck around. Like, uh, Cullen Skink sounds like a weird fucking name for a thing until you remember or realize that, if I remember, and I might be getting this wrong, but I'm pretty sure Cullen is just a, the place where it came from. It's just a place in Scotland. And I believe skink just means, like, fish or smoked fish, maybe. Um, like, Eton Mess... I mean, it's messy. It's 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 from the mess hall at Eton College, is where it was invented. Not weird. That's like a very normal thing. It's just calling a food after where it was from, and British place names just sound weird because they're old. That's literally it. They're just old language. I don't understand. So I I mean honestly, this stuff is really weird to me. Like none of the there is no British food, I mean, look, some of it's bad, every country has bad or bland food sometimes, like even, you know, I've, uh, let's actually go on the offensive here, okay, I've been playing defense for too fucking long, let's go on the offensive here, there's this fucking, I don't know where this comes from, this idea that like everyone who isn't English is eating, you know, they're like, oh, we have all of these crazy spiced dishes and fancy. You're not eating that every day. I know because I go to your houses. I'm friends with you. I'm friends with you people from all of these different countries who don't fucking, you know, like, okay, for example, uh, India and Pakistan, great, amazing variety of, of crazy colony tradition. And you eat their family home cooked meals and they're delicious. Don't get me wrong, okay? Some of the best food I've ever had has been just like a basic lentil dal at my Pakistani friend's house, right? Like that shit, really good. But it's bland. I mean, not bland, but basic because it's just normal home cooking. No one's going out of their way to make crazy advanced wacky foods just on a day-to-day -day cooking. It's just lentils and rice in a sauce with like a masala. You know, it's nothing super fucking insane. Cause it doesn't have to be, because no one eats that like that every day. No one around the world does this. Like, Japanese food is widely, you know, one of the best foods in the world. A lot of people consider it, right? 90% of Japanese food is just some rice and some fish. That's it. That's, like, that's 90% of it. Um, like, what do Japanese people eat on a day-to-day? -day? Probably some ramen if you're out somewhere or, or cup ramen you know maybe some some rice f some rice and some rice <laughs> it's just rice it's a lot of rice i mean the word for meal in japanese is literally rice a chinese food okay again china amazing variety of of foods and a lot of it is incredibly delicious uh, I think we just think that this is what they eat all the time because that's what they, ha they serve at restaurants. And to be fair, China has a much stronger um, culture of eating out on a regular basis where like eating out in these like fast food, it, it's not like fast food like burgers, but the Chinese literally translates to fast food. Um, but they're like sit, they're more like diners, like they're sit down restaurant things where like cheap sit down restaurants um like that's a very common thing in china so you're eating you know that's the that's a big difference it's just that that's cheap and common in china and so you're getting restaurant prepared food more often than you would be in the west where home cooking is much more common same in japan same in most of asia actually um and also a lot of these foods uh in every country except america really actually even america like Italian-American food. A lot of this food was developed when people had much bigger families and a stay-at-home, like, the, the women in, of the family would be at home all day. So uh, they had time and motivation to cook gig stuff in gigantic portions that took all day to do. 
and no one has the time or motivation to do that anymore because we live in small families where both parents are working, both adults are working. So, you know, no one's going to be making a bolognese that, that has to cook all day on a weeknight, you know. Um, whereas that's a great meal if you have to feed seven people and you have people to, do, to make it all day. Uh, not a great meal if you have to feed two people. I mean, it's still good, but, you know, a four-hour-long boiling, simmering bolognese is more of a weekend meal than a weeknight meal. I think we all agree on that. Uh, so yeah, definitely there's, yeah, what I'm saying is, average person home cooking is making basic relatively plain foods no matter where the fuck you go. Literally everywhere in the world. I've tried foods from all over the world, I've had friends from all over the world, and I've eaten their home cooking, you know, and, and most of the time, it's nothing fucking crazy, just like most Brits aren't eating crazy shit. I don't understand where this idea comes from. If you now you and I'm going to continue to go on the offensive here because if you want to really know, you want to really talk about who has absolute dog shit food culture, is those fucking Nords, the Nordic countries. Nothing fucking grows up there, so all of their food is just gross. It's fucked up. I'm going to be real with you. Like, you got Swedish meatballs, that shit's good. That's it. <laughs> That's the only good thing they have in all of those countries. All of Scandinavia's food. It, like, these motherfuckers, they just be eating pickled herring and calling that food. I'm telling you, these people are crazy. They've never figured out spices. They've never figured out flavors. Like, it's crazy. What the stuff that passes for food up there. You go to Finland, you know what's breakfast in Finland? Let me tell you breakfast in Finland. Breakfast in Finland is a cigarette and a shot of vodka. And any Finns listening can can 100% confirm this in my comments, okay? I know this for a fact. Like, I know it's just a joke that British food is bad, but, like, it's not. <laughs> it's just something made up. I don't understand it. And, you know, there's also this thing like, oh, well, no one in Britain actually eats British food anymore because it's so bad. They just eat, like, you know, other foods, the Indian and, and stuff. Yeah, because of the reasons I explained, that most of the traditional British food was created in a time before modernity, when people had big families and uh, the women would be at home all day. So it was practical. Uh, it's not practical to make pie dough from scratch and make a big pie with side dishes and all of this crazy shit enough to feed seven people. It doesn't make any sense to do anymore, so no one does it. That's 90% of like British food is stuff like that. Um, you know, yeah. Uh, a lot of the more modern British foods, you know what's like super underrated is just all of the different interesting mashed potato stuff. Like, they got all the stuff in Wales and Scotland was just, just mashed potatoes with shit in it. And goddamn, it's good. They know what they're doing. Um, yeah, I don't know, man. I, I just... It's, I, I don't understand. Look, I'm not complaining. You can keep making the jokes. Right? Like, it's a, I understand. It's a funny joke. But don't forget that it's a joke like I just want to make it I just want to like try and figure this out like, okay when I was in Estonia like they just don't have good food there you can't go like places to get good food like in Britain you can go anywhere and get good food like good food is just very common in Estonia no one knows how to cook there are no like ingredients <laughs> at the shops like, just no one's figured it out. There's just not... They just haven't got food over there. It's, like, nice. I don't know, man. I just... I'm just... I'm just trying to, to... To to make sure that people don't take the meme seriously. That, like... British food is actually bad. What is this? 
why is British food why British food is terrible it has nothing to do with World War II and by the way the picture they've chosen to use at the top of this article is a plate of food that looks fucking delicious it's from what I can see four tasty looking sausages doused in onion gravy which if you've never had sausages in onion gravy like I am telling you it is the nicest thing ever onion gravy takes forever to make though because you have to caramelize onions but um, yeah so it's four sausages in onion gravy with a large portion of what looks like mashed potato with stuff in it I can't really tell what that stuff is and then some peas like that's fine what the fuck is wrong with that meal that, that looks good People think British food is bland, soggy, overcooked, and visually unappealing. I will admit, some of it's, it's a lot of brown. <laughs> it's definitely a lot of brown. But, but uh, let me tell you something secret. Brown means flavor. Brown means Maillard reaction. Okay? I also see some people... Okay, here we go. Best British foods. We got Yorkshire pudding. Everyone, like, no one in the world would not enjoy a Yorkshire pudding. Not a single person in the universe would, 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 eat, would taste Yorkshire pudding and not think it was God tier. I'm telling you. Uh, Sunday roast, obviously good. Fish and chips. It's fucking fish and chips. Crumpets. Crumpets are absolutely delicious and amazing and the best thing ever. A full English breakfast. No one can complain about that. Bacon sandwich. I don't know if I'd put that in God tier, frankly. It's not bad, but it's a bit basic. It's not as good as a New York bacon, egg, and cheese. I'll tell you that much. But it's not bad either. Bangers and mash. Again, relatively straightforward. But this is like a, it's like a weeknight, you know, just and stuff together, cheap meal. Not supposed to be anything crazy. Cottage pie and shepherd's pie. I don't think anyone dislikes those. Toad in the hole. I've never liked toad in the hole. Cauliflower cheese. I think lots of people eat that. It's pretty tasty. Uh, Cornish pasties are delicious. If you don't know what a Cornish pasty is, let me explain it to you. So, uh, back in the day, there's a place called Cornwall. Used to be a lot of coal mines there. A lot of coal mines in Cornwall. And the miners, you know, they'd, they'd, they'd go for lunch and they'd have coal dust all over their hands. So they couldn't eat, you know, if your wife packs you a sandwich, you eat, you're eating the sandwich, grabbing it with your hands, and your hands have got coal all over them. So, you know, you get coal all over your food and it's fucked. So what they invented was this pastry, which is like a stuffed, filled pastry. It normally has, you know, some sort of meat and gravy in it, and uh, often, like, potatoes and stuff like that, you know. It's a, a filling, hearty meal. And the pastry has a big, thick rim around the outside, and the idea being you grab the rim and you sort of use that as, like, a, make a built-in handle. Um, it's made out of pastry, and you would eat the pasty and then throw the, the handle away because it would be covered in coal. And back in the day when it was first invented, they would put, like, one side would be all the meats and fillings and vegetables and stuff, and then the other side would be, like, jams, and, like, so it would basically be a full meal. Like, you'd, you'd eat the, the savory side, and then you'd get down to the sweet side at the end. These days, uh, that's evolved, so most of the time they, they don't put the sweet side in anymore, that no one does that. So it's just, just the meats and savory fillings. And then the, the sort of handle section has become much, much shrunken down and more edible. And now, now you eat that. So it's basically just a, 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 a pastry you hold in your hands. It's tasty. Pie and mash. Again, this is like a very working class poor people food from the Victorian era. It's pie. You get pie. You get pie, right? Normal pie. You get some mashed potatoes. And you get some sauce. It's simple, it's effective. Chicken tikka is, you know, I think everyone knows what... Uh, do, do, wait, 
does everyone know? Do people eat chicken tikka outside of the UK? I have no idea. Not my favorite, but it's still nice. Um, what's at the bottom of these? Bubble and squeak. Beef Wellington is low tier. Yeah, beef Wellington's not that good. It's overrated as fuck. I don't understand why people hate on scotch eggs. Scotch eggs are nice. And pork pies and steak and kidney pie. I like all of this. Kippers? I love kippers. I don't, I don't understand. I don't understand all the hate. I'm, I'm trying to read this article. British food is bad because British people are too repressed to cook food correctly? What the fuck are you talking about? That is absolutely not true. People in... There's not... All of the British food is fine. I don't understand. I think people are just insane. I've, that's what the conclusion I've come to. People are just insane. British food is not bad. I don't understand it. Look, this is, you can call this a copium. You can, you can go in your comments and type copium or whatever. But there is, there is literally nothing that stands out as either particularly terrible or particularly amazing about British food. It is just fine. It is just good. It's just normal levels of goodness. It's not delicious. It, well, sometimes it can be, but it's, you know, not, like, especially delicious or creative or inventive or whatever. And it's not especially disgusting or especially bland. It's just normal. Maybe that's why. Maybe it's, maybe that's why people complain. I don't know. So London has this thing called the ultra low emission zone, and they've been like expanding this for a while. And the the idea behind it is, uh, there are basically cameras. It's a really, it's a very strange system. So there is this big sign that says "You Les," right? "You Les," and then there's a cameras, and if your car is like there are basically these emission standards and if you're whatever you're driving doesn't meet the emission standards you're charged like a, a small fine like 12 pounds something um this is such a weird system like i there are gonna be people i guess the i like i don't know if i, I can't decide whether this is like a, a good or bad system because, th- like, you want to be discouraging people from using cars as much as possible. And you can't just do this with positively, you know, creating more alternatives. You also, sadly, you know, like, just, uh, well, I say sadly, but whatever. Like, you also have to make it not just easier to not use your car, but harder to actually use your car. You want to make, if you really want to encourage people to use public transport and cycling and walking to get places you it's not enough just to make those methods of transport easier you also have to make it harder to use a car um and that pisses a lot of car drivers off but it's also true um however this is very you know this does this I don't know if this is a good idea. Like, if what? I guess, I guess, you know, if you're paying, if let's say you have to commute in every day into the zone, then you might. I mean, I don't know what would happen. Would your would your your work like if you didn't have a compliant car, would your work just pay for it? Because a lot, like, for example, there's a, there's also a thing called the congestion charge in London. Because like, if you go to central London, you have to basically pay money to enter. Uh, and, uh, the reason that doesn't work is because, uh, everyone's, everyone who works in, like, in central London, their job just pays for it. Like, they n- no one pays for it themselves, right? Like, if you're, if you're commuting in, you, your, your job just pays for it. So it's a, it's a really, I mean, it's basically just a tax. Like, it doesn't actually stop anyone from commuting into the city by car. Um... And the other people, the sort of people who aren't commuting, but are just on like a one-off trip to the city for some reason, aren't going to be dissuaded because it's, yeah, it's a charge, but it's not like that much. So it's, I don't think it actually eases congestion at all in the center of the city. 
um, it's a dumb system. But it does make the government money, so, you know, it's basically just a tax. <clears throat> uh, so this is like a similar thing, I guess. I'm trying to think, figure out if this is like a good or bad idea. Like, I guess it does discourage people from using cars. I'm wondering if people's jobs would just pay for it. Um, I also, you know, I, I think I said this before, that what most people's journey, like main journey they do in their life is their commute, right? And the, like, in rush hour, all of the trains and buses are basically at capacity. Like, there's there's no... I mean, you know, I used to go to... I've, 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 it's, it's very obvious. If you're just in London during rush hour trying to get anywhere, like, you cannot fit more people on these trains. You cannot fit more people on these buses. Um, now, it very, very quickly drops off after, like, you know, like, 9 o'clock. Suddenly, no one's there, which is why I, I, I think that there should be tax incentives to stagger opening hours for businesses so that you spread out this commuting... Um, Surge. No one else seems to like that idea, though, for some reason. Uh, but yeah, so you can't, like, even if you're going to maybe get a few people to switch from, like, really, I'm okay with this. I'm okay with this as long as I know where the money from it is going. Like, if you're taking the money from the, the ultra-low emission zone scheme, and you're like, okay, we're going to... I, like, I want to see. It's probably there. I'm sure there are transparency laws about this. But, like, I want to see money from this goes into building cycle infrastructure. That's If that was the case, this would be the best policy in any city in the world. I highly doubt that's the case, though. Um, and, you know, they're probably just, like, fucking embezzling all the money or something. Uh, I, w I wonder if there's some sort of way I can find out where the money goes. Okay, well, I found an I found the annual report from last year, and I want to point out this is like a two hundred page long PDF. I have not read the whole thing because fuck that. It's not. It's also like, you know, small text. <laughs> this is a big, big document. Um, they give the way it's set out is they have like the first, uh, like sixty pages or or. 50 pages is basically like clearly supposed to be the public facing part of it where it's like formatted nicely with pictures and infographics and they're all trying to make themselves look good and then the rest of it is all the like super dense technical stuff uh, I tried to skim both parts they don't it they don't like have I mean, as you should expect, right, it's not like they they are strictly, like, taking the exact amount of money from the ultra-low emission zone, tracking that through their thing, and then, like, no, it all goes into, like, the massive pot and gets distributed. Um, I, a lot of people really hate the, the ultra-low emission zone because, again, it's just a tax on people for owning uh, certain amounts of cars. Like, you can... They, they they can say that it's an ultra low emission zone and it's some environmentalism thing. It's not. It's just uh, they lost a bunch of money because it's all TFL, right? Uh, which also runs the tube and the buses and everything. Um, and they lost a bunch of money during the pandemic and they just spent all of their money building the Elizabeth line. So they are in debt uh, or at least they are not doing super well. Uh, even though they're making a shitload of money from the Elizabeth line right now, because um, it's, like, massively popular. And tube tickets are about, well, from what they say, I believe it was 73% of their annual revenue comes from tube tickets. They're supposed to be a non-profit, so all of their money is supposed to be reinvested back in. Um, so... Yeah, I don't know why people are... Compl I mean, I understand why people are complaining about this thing, but also, I feel like the standards... I, I need to check the standards for these... Um, what sort of cars are affected. Um, by the low emission zone. Uh... P 
people are very people don't well obviously no one's gonna like it because it's making people pay more money for stuff uh so you know obviously people are gonna complain um but personally i don't have a car so I don't give a shit. <laughs> if this is more money going towards cycle infrastructure and train infrastructure, then, you know, fucking count me in. I don't give a fuck, fucking car drivers. Kill yourself, car drivers. Why do you have a super polluting car in London anyway? Like, what are you doing? How are you finding a parking space? Get, get, get rid of it. Just take the bus. Take the fucking bus. What are you doing? Uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe this is a, a harsh, maybe this is harsh, but, what well, well, okay, let, let me be actually real here, which is that, like, I don't think that this is good, because, uh, I, I think there's, there's a push to get more people cycling right now, there's a pretty big push, um, to get people cycling, but I don't think that they're doing enough in terms of infrastructure. Uh, like, I think there needs to be proper separated cycle paths, like, in every cycling-centric country. There can't just be lines painted on a super busy fucking road because people are going to die, and that's the number one reason people don't cycle. And if people feel super unsafe, they're not going to cycle, and if people feel the need to carry a helmet with them everywhere, they're not going to cycle because they don't want to carry a helmet around if they just want to go somewhere. Uh, it needs, you know, everyone, this is like widely known. You need to have physically separated bike lanes. You can't just paint a fucking line on the pavement uh, on the road. Uh, and I think they're trying to do that in some places, but they are absolutely not doing enough. This needs, it needs to be like, you can't just charge people for using cars. You need to give them an alternative as well, because most of these people, they're not going to buy a whole, it's, they're not going to buy a whole new car just to, to get, uh, that meets the emissions, right? If you're, if you already own a car, you're not going to sell your car and buy a cheap one or a, a, a smaller one. No one's going to do that just to avoid a, a relatively small emissions charge. Absolutely no one's going to do that. Um, I mean, maybe some small percentage of people, but I, I don't buy it. I don't think that's going to happen. Like, in reality, this has nothing to do with emissions. It's all just to do with getting revenue for the TFL. Um, and none of it matters because they're already a fucking scam because they the government doesn't subsidize our train tickets like that's the number one thing i think if there's actually two main issues for london transport it's it's cycle infrastructure and train ticket prices are way too fucking high highest in europe because we're the only european country where our train prices are not subsidized by the government um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, I feel like we're just never going to see the actual results of this ultra low emission zone. Like, like this money's just going to sort of go into the pot and get distributed into everything and not really, ha I don't know, it's just gonna, that's, that's my, con that's my, my concern is that like, this isn't actually going to make any real improvement to most people's lives because what most people want is cheaper train tickets. Oh. Cheaper train tickets and more cycle infrastructure. Look, I don't watch any Twitch streamers, at least not on Twitch. The only streamers that I watch are uh, Poke, Poke Lols. I watch his YouTube channel, he has good YouTube videos. And uh, Ludwig also has a good YouTube channel, although it's kind of gone downhill. Uh, I mainly watch his podcast, The Yard. <clears throat> I think that's actually it, honestly. Uh, yeah, I I don't think I watch any other popular Twitch streamer. To, oh, Northern Lion, of course, who's fucking based. Uh, but yeah, Northern Lion's based. Uh, that's it. Um, so I don't really give a shit about any of this because it doesn't involve any of the people I care about and it's like very obviously retarded. 
But I do want to just say something about this. The fake non-drama around Kick, the alternate streaming platform owned by the gambling company, which I already talked about. XQC moved there. Um, and there's a lot of fake non-drama around this, mainly involving... I don't know why I'm talking about this. this is a, it's it's just fake. It's not real. This drama doesn't matter or exist. Um, <clears throat> the reason being, the move is controversial, obviously, because Kick is a platform that exists pretty much to drive traffic towards a crypto gambling website. Um, and even if it didn't, you know, because you can't prove that, even if it's not, it's at least owned by a crypto gambling website, which most people consider to be a bad thing. You're supporting a platform that is directly owned by a crypto gambling website that, that preys off of people who get gambling addictions and takes their money. Okay, motherfucker, you're on Twitch. Like, this is the thing I don't understand. Why does no one bring this up? You're literally on Twitch. It's owned by Amazon, motherfucker. What are you talking about? Are you responsible, uh, uh, Hassan or whatever, when Amazon does, like, union busting and directly benefits from forced labor in China and, uh, you know, all of this other fucking shit? All of that. I mean, go on the Wikipedia page for criticism of Amazon. It's fucking massive <laughs> there's a lot okay there is a lot of criticisms of amazon this is not like I, I i don't need to tell you this you don't need me to tell you this um that amazon is is has done some fucked up shit and continues to do some fucked up shit i don't if i had to say which company is worse i think probably amazon frankly versus kick or or stake like stakes a gambling company sure Gambling, you probably shouldn't gamble, guys. But none of, you know, every single streamer who's complaining about this has at some point played a game with gambling loot boxes in it, right? Like, they're not... And it's retarded. It's just non-drama. It's fake. No one actually cares. Like, they just, they just... It's weird. Like, I'm not saying it's a good thing to promote gambling. Anyone who gambles is probably retarded. Uh, and look, I don't know much about this stuff, but as far as I understand it, Pokimane is like really close to the Twitch people. Like, Pokimane has a completely different relationship with Twitch's stuff and the website compared to pretty much every other streamer because they see her as like a really positive face for the platform. Since she's like a large non-white woman streamer, who, or well, I guess she is, she looks white. But she's not European. It's white men. Large non-European female streamer who doesn't do sexual content. So that's like a really good look, and she's like relatively family friendly and whatever. She's a very brand friendly personality, and it's been you know. It's very common knowledge that, that Twitch particularly likes Pokimane. Uh, and that Pokimane particularly likes Twitch. Which is fine. I mean, I don't know if it's fine. But it's whatever. But who cares, is what I'm saying. Who gives a shit? It's just fucking football teams at this point. It's just sports teams. But now your sports team is morally bad. No, your sports team is morally bad. It's dumb. Like, why single out gambling as this central moral failing... When, compared to the shit Amazon's done, I mean, it's at least equivalent. And I think Amazon's fucked up shit is probably on a much larger scale than, than Kik's gambling stuff. Like, the majority of people who use Kik to gamble probably don't have a problem. They definitely lose money, but they probably don't have a gambling problem. Gambling addiction is a, a some small percentage of these people. Now, it's a serious problem, you know. I don't understand it personally. It never been something that makes sense to me. I don't see how you can get addicted to gamp. Like, I don't. But you know, I'm sure people. I've seen the toll it takes on people's lives. It's not good, right? Uh, 
So I'm not saying that that's like a, a good thing. I'm, what I'm saying is you're you're on the fucking corpo internet, motherfucker. None of these you're you're you're, you're getting paid in blood money. <laughs> like, what do you think this is? No matter who you are, you're getting paid in blood money. No matter where you go, it, like, why can't they just accept this? Why can't streamers just accept this? That they're getting paid in, in blood money. That like they're not bastions of morality or whatever. It's it's very strange. These fucking celebrities. I hate them. I just watched Dungeons and Dragons Honor Among Thieves. And I've got to say, while the movie itself was just pretty good, you know, I wouldn't say it was amazing or anything, I am very glad to have seen it. Never before have I gone into a movie hoping that it would be something, and then it is exactly what I'd hoped it would be. Like, I was like, this better be a fun, high fantasy romp for the whole family with lots of banter and, and good action scenes. Like a D&D &D game be. And it was exactly like that. It was a fun, high fantasy action romp for the whole family. Uh, you know, I gotta thank Marvel movies for priming mainstream audiences to accept a level of fantasy that they just would never have bought into before. Like, the fact that this movie did well at the box office makes me very happy. Like, also, great casting. Chris Pine, correct casting choice for that guy. I liked the movie well enough. Do I think it's amazing? No, it's not amazing. Uh, I don't. I think it 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 is what it try what it's trying to be. I don't think it's trying to be amazing. It's exactly what I thought it would be going in, which is like semi forgettable, relatively generic, but also relatively, you know, with with enough unique parts that are surprising. It's exactly what I wanted it to be. I I have zero complaints. It, I watched the movie. And I was like, best case scenario, well, best case scenario, it's an amazing movie, but I was never expecting that. You're not expecting Citizen Kane when you go in to watch Dungeons and Dragons Honor Among Thieves. I've heard some people say that this is like a Marvel-ified dialogue film. I don't agree with that at all. I, th I think this is just the, the tone of a D&D &D game, at least the ones I've played, which is not that many. Um, but I think they hit the, like, tone. They just got it right. That's my opinion. I liked it. <sighs> it's a little hard for me to come up with, like, flaws in the movie. Because I just don't think the movie was, like, trying to be anything more than it was. You know? Like, it's not trying to be a masterpiece. And so it it obviously isn't. But I feel like everything the movie tried to be, which is like maybe a 7 out of 10 at best, it like kind of did well. I mean, I guess there's some stuff that's a bit clunky. There's definitely some stuff that's a bit clunky. Some of the comedy doesn't work. Some of the dialogue is a bit, bit, bit weird. So definitely some of the story beats. Like, the thing is, you can't really complain about it being cliche because the whole point is to play on, like, fantasy cliches. In a fun... Like, you, you, you like it. It kind of reminds me of Knives Out. It's like, here's a genre piece. It is unapologetically the genre piece and it's not taking itself too seriously. Now, if actually, if anything, I, I, I kind of wish that this movie took itself a little more seriously. Not in a dramatic way, just in a, like, tension in places other than the fight scenes way. And, you know, like, just a, just like a, like, 3% more, more self-serious. That, that, it's not a huge problem. Uh... Yeah, a lot of the comedy did work for me. 
I, if, I mean, if I'm really nitpicking, there's a couple of directing decisions that I thought were a bit strange and edit. I mean, especially there's a few editing decisions in this movie that I thought were quite strange. There's a few cuts that were quite jarring. Um, like, I mean, the big one for me that is still in my head because it was so distracting. Again, I'm. I know I'm the editing guy. Like no one else probably even notices this stuff. Uh, so spoiler alert: there's a scene where they're in a cave escaping from. I'll try and be relatively subtle here. They're in a. They're in a cave escaping from a, a big, a big scary monster, and, um, the cave. Let's just say they escape the cave somehow with an explosion. And in order to survive the explosion, they'd, like, all duck underwater, which wouldn't work, because they would just be boiled, but, you know, fantasy logic, it's okay. Um, and, you know, maybe I can, maybe I can, maybe, you know what, being underwater would help you get less burned in an explosion or fire. Um, can you hear that? What the fuck? Animals. Anyway, they duck their heads under the water. The cave sort of caves in. And then the ocean is above them. But the cuts are like a close-up of the guy ducking his head underwater... Then, I believe it, like, cuts to black, and then cuts to a wide shot of them swimming up from the ocean, which feels like there's a VFX shot missing, because there's a lot of action there that's being cut out, right? Like, to me, it felt like a little too... Because they, they weren't just, like, swimming up. It was like they were already near the surface in the wide shot. Um... And yeah, to me, it feels like there's a VFX shot that's just missing there, like, of the cave caving in and them actually escaping. Because all it shows is that they ducked their heads underwater, and then it literally cuts to black and then fades back in, and then they're, they're already near the surface. And it's kind of like, well, how, th there's definitely a, a lot of stuff that I, that you missed out on there. Like, how did they specifically, with all the rocks and rubble above them, escape that? I'm not saying it's, like, a super complicated thing. Like, they just sw swam, I guess. It's just that the, the, the time and spatial difference between the two sides of the edit are just too far. And the fact that it's, like, a cut to black sort of draws attention. I, I think it's supposed to... I don't know. To me, that edit was very distracting. <laughs> um, the other thing in this movie that is definitely worth pointing out is loads of practical effects. Love it. Amazing. Great. Good thing. Generally speaking, production design, top level, top tier. Um, it was a good film. I liked it. Uh, the actual, like, the main problem, like, the main thing keeping... The film is, like, clearly made by very talented people. There are a lot of interesting shot choices. Um, some of the music is, like, surprisingly out there and weird. Uh, with, like, weird pitched-up vocals on it. it. I don't know, I liked it. Action scenes, really well choreographed. Like, surprisingly good. John Wick-esque. Made me think to myself, man, I want... I want a fucking John Wick, but he's a fucking knight. Or... John Wick, but he's a, 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 a shinobi. Like, can you imagine historical drama? Historical John Wick movie? That would be fucking sick. But, yeah, the action was surprisingly good. Um, basically, you can tell talented people all around. It's just... The thing keeping the movie from being, like, excellent is just the plot of the movie itself and the general kind of writing, I guess, is that it's just not really aspiring to be excellent. 
um, at least that's how I felt. Like the main character's backstory and motivations are pretty bland and one dimensional. Um, the other character, I mean, all, yeah, none of the characters are super well fleshed out. Uh, but you don't really want, I don't know, like, I, I feel like the movie would be worse if it was more dramatic. I'm not asking for it to be more dramatic. I'm not really sure what I want. But what I'm saying is the movie was exactly what I wanted. It's just that, like, from a Dungeons and Dragons movie, when you watch a Dungeons and Dragons movie, you don't want it to be, like, a fucking epic drama. Or you, maybe epic, you do, but you don't want it to be, like, a, a serious character drama. I mean, you, right? You, yeah, I don't think you want that. So, yeah. I don't know what else to say. It's like an Undertale reference in it. That's weird. Apparently this is like a media review podcast now. Um, and goddamn, it's fucking hot in here, man. It's hot in my room. It gets hot in my fucking room, man. Open the curtains, maybe, or the blinds. Maybe they'll let some wind in. <clears throat> and open the door. Maybe, uh, maybe that'll do something. Anyway, I just watched Sheen Ultraman. Uh, yeah, apparently this is uh, where I review movies now. That's why you come here, right? To listen to me review mu- 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 movies. <laughs> listen to me review mu- movies. <laughs> <laughs> this is where you come to listen to me review mu mews. And uh, today we're reviewing. We we reviewed Dungeon and Dragon Honor Among Thieves. Now we're reviewing Shin Ultraman. <clears throat> okay, so Shin Ultraman. Uh, if you don't know this exists, uh, it's directed by Hideaki Anno better known for his work on probably Neon Genesis Evangelion and if you're a nerd you also know him for working on for directing Katakano and Love and Pop and maybe some other stuff <clears throat> and also Shin Godzilla which was a big crossover hit in the west uh, because it's a great fucking movie uh, so he directed Shin Godzilla, but I think a lot of people in the West don't realize that Shin Godzilla was just part one of a trilogy. That he's, that Shin Godzilla, it, it's, he, he's making revival reboot movie versions of the three major tokusatsu franchises. So which is Godzilla, then there's Shin Ultraman, and Shin Kamen Rider. Now of the three franchises, of the three properties, if you want to call them that or whatever... Kamen Rider is definitely my favorite, and the Shin Kamen Rider movie is out, but it's not on streaming yet, there's no, I, I can't find anywhere to watch it with subtitles online, so it comes out on streaming almost exactly a month from now, so <clears throat> I guess I'll have to wait till then to watch it. Um, but I've seen some other Godzilla films, I have never seen a single piece of Ultraman media in my life except for Shin Ultraman. Uh, so, this is definitely an interesting experience. <clears throat> uh, okay, th- th- that's the background details. Let's get on to the actual movie. Uh, let's start off with just an overview. <clears throat> Should you watch this movie? Uh, well, I will simply say, this movie is a mess. It's a complete mess. I'll tell you what it feels like watching it. It feels like someone took a, like, 20 episode TV show, then picked the first episode, the last episode, and then some three random episodes from the middle of the season. And then each episode they edited down to be half the length that it was supposed to be, and then they just mashed them all together. That's kind of how the movie feels, <laughs> because unlike Godzilla, which is a movie franchise, Ultraman is a TV franchise, and it's a Monster of the Week TV show. Uh, and so, 
Arno has tried to translate this into film form, and structure-wise, it it's not. I'm telling. I'm, I'm just. It's just not working. <laughs> it's just not working. <clears throat> I don't know. I don't know. Weird choices were made with the structure of this film. Very strange choices were made with the structure of this film. I'm just gonna be honest. It's all over the fucking place, and a lot of times it really feels like a TV show. Uh, it feels like episodes of a TV show, like str- somehow like mishmashed together. Like sections of the plot just have absolutely nothing to do with each other. <clears throat> okay. Now that that's out of the way, just so that you know, if you're watching this film, don't expect it to be a good film. It is weird, very strangely and awkwardly structured. And that is the main issue throughout the entire film. Uh, but I'm also very glad this film exists, and it's kind of fascinating at the same time. Obviously... This movie, nowhere near as big in the West as Shin Godzilla. I think mainly because Godzilla is just a much more well-known thing in the West than Kamen Rider and, Sh- and Ultraman. Uh, uh, Ultraman is very goofy. And also, Arno is like really very much so taking the, the older versions of all of these franchises. Like the Ultraman and the, the Kamen Rider Shin versions. He's rebooting them as their 70s implementations, not their modern implementations. I don't even know if Ultraman has a modern... I, I don't know if Ultraman even, it like, exists. <laughs> what is Ultraman? Did they, did they keep making them? Or is it just in the 70s and 80s? <clears throat> yeah, I guess they just stopped stopped making... Oh, no, they, they, they exist in the 90s. Oh, and the 2000s. What are these, movies? They're still making Ultraman movies. I have absolutely... I guess the, I guess Ultraman still exists to some extent. Uh, but in movie forms. Ultraman Saga? Ultraman Saga is this film. Wait, is Ultraman films? I thought it was TV shows. Are these all film? Wait, am I just looking at the films? I have no fucking clue what's going on, okay? I don't know shit about Ultraman. Maybe I should look into it. <clears throat> Either way, yeah, the structure of the film's weird as shit, and it's it's very goofy, because Ultraman looks like Ultraman does in the 70s versions, and the, the really old versions. So he looks goofy as shit. He looks like a guy in spandex with a weird face. <laughs> um, it looks very goofy, uh, but it's also cool. Sometimes. Sometimes it's cool. Sometimes I th- was like, this is not a very cool fight scene. But some of the fights were cool. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's my opinion on that. And now to get into some some notes that I took while watching the movie. Okay, so first of all, the geeky character, the nerd otaku character, when they're talking about him being a nerd and an otaku, it cuts to his desk, and on his desk, he specifically has Thunderbirds and Star Trek toys. Um, now, I also happen to be a fan of both Thunderbirds and Star Trek, although I I watched both of them when I was a kid. I kept up, I kept watching Star Trek into adulthood. I did not keep watching Thunderbirds into adulthood. Thunderbirds kind of stayed in my childhood. Uh, I assume many of you don't even know what Thunderbirds is, so uh, just just look it up, I guess. Just look up Thunderbirds. <clears throat> um, which, it's always, this is like confirmed something in my mind, which I've always been curious about, is that look, I, I was realizing a couple years ago, like, the appeal of Thunderbirds is very similar to the appeal of mecha, anime, and tokusatsu. Like, they're a very similar kind of vibe. And I was wondering if, like, Thunderbirds has any Japanese fan base because it's the sort of thing that would definitely appeal, I feel like, to, like, some sections of the the Japanese otaku community. <clears throat> so I guess this kind of confirms it, that there is some, some niche for Thunderbirds and Star Trek, I guess. But I already knew Star Trek was popular in Japan. Uh, <clears throat> 
or relatively popular in the the the, the more hardcore otaku or old school otaku demographics. But yeah, Thunderbirds is fucking sick. Um, and funny enough, I have the exact same toy set, or I had when I was a kid, the exact same toy set as the guy in the movie, where you have like all of the, well, he has more toys than me, but the main one where you get like the big models of the, the main four Thunderbirds, uh, I had that exact thing, which is kind of a blast from the past just to randomly see this in a movie, because these are toys I used to play with all the time as a kid. I should get my hand. I wonder where they are. I bet my dad still has them somewhere. I would hella put them in my room somewhere. They would look sick. Um, but yeah, Thunderbirds. Just an unexpected reference in this movie. Another unexpected reference in this movie is Madoka. Randomly, out of fucking nowhere, someone has a mug with Kubei on it. Like, there's. The, <laughs> I don't feel like this has anything to do with... I mean, maybe you could, as a stretch come up with some themes that have to do with Madoka, but I feel like, I don't know why it's in there, it's just like a random easter egg, that someone just has a mug with like Kyubei's silhouette on it, for Madoka uh, so that was cool but, I feel like the Thunderbirds and Star Trek thing, is actually very relevant to the movie at least at the start of the movie, for the first, like, third maybe um <clears throat> Kind of the appeal of the movie is very similar to the appeal of Thunderbirds and Star Trek, which is there's a bunch of cool technology and techno babble shit with big machines, or in this case, of big guys, <laughs> um, and uh, it's just very satisfying. Oh, there's something really loud on the spectrogram here. Let me check that out. Make sure it's not like air raid. Okay, I, I went back and lowered the volume of that because it was really fucking loud. But you might not be able to hear what I said. What I was saying was, the appeal of the first part of the movie is very similar to the appeal of Thunderbirds and Star Trek. Uh, you heard the rest. Uh, and that appeal is not just that there's big thing, big sci-fi thing, uh, but also that it is just satisfying to... It's, it's just satisfying to watch a group of highly competent people coordinate in a high pressure situation well and that's that's the also the appeal of star trek at least tng i I don't really know about the original series and it's also the appeal of thunderbirds to some extent that has like this military-esque organization and everyone in it is the top of their field and they're all human so they make mistakes they're not perfect but they're just they're just smart intelligent highly trained military-esque people who are trying their best and coordinating well to do a very specific high stress high importance high stakes job which is some i think the the film did that very well and that 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 watching that is just innately satisfying and it's something you don't really get out of a lot of like media you know there's like very specific nerdy franchises, sci-fi franchises that do this, and then very little else. Uh, so I, I don't think that that's a mistake, that those are the particular franchises that they chose to put on this guy's desk. I also don't think it's a mistake that they're all older shit, <laughs> right? That like, Thunderbirds and the original series are both like late 60s, and I believe the original Ultraman is also late 60s. So, uh, is, is, is the original series late 60s or just, like, mid... When did, when did Star Trek even come out? I actually have no idea. 1966. Okay, that counts. That's past 65, so that counts as late 60s. <laughs> I'll count it. When did, when did Thunderbirds come out? 65? Okay, and when did Ultraman come out? Is Ultraman not TV shows? It's all movies? Wait, it consists of television shows, films, comic books, novels, video games, and other merchandise. So there is television shows. 1966. Okay, so definitely not a coincidence. It's 100% not a coincidence that you've got Star Trek, Ultraman, and Thunderbirds 
all the same time, all vaguely nerdy kids franchises, sci-fi children's franchises. Well, I guess Star Trek's maybe not children's, but yeah. What I'm saying here is that that's very interesting. I like that. That's cool. That's a cool detail. That all of that stuff's there. Other things that I've said while watching the movie. Uh, Ultraman moves in a completely unnatural way, and this effect, which was taken from the limited effects capabilities of the old shows and movies and stuff, translates into a feeling that Ultraman is truly alien. The way he moves and fights is as if he's subject to an entirely different set of physical laws than us, which I think is cool. It can look very goofy. I imagine wide audiences would not be accepting of this, and it's definitely goofy, but it also does create a cool effect when when it works. Um, <clears throat> so that's neat. I don't really have anything to add to that. Uh, it, it either works for you or it doesn't. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> uh, excuse me. And then, uh, I also said that the movie has a bunch of commentaries about Japan's relationship to the U.S. Uh, Shin Godzilla, I mean, this is just how Arno's doing this, I guess, is, like, involving a lot of government and satire, sort of, political satire, talking about, like, how governments act in these sorts of things. Um, I mean, it's very obvious that that's the case in this, I mean, in both movies, that there's a heavy focus on the, the high-level government bureaucrats and, and all of these, the, the politicians, versus the <coughs> people who are actually doing shit, and how that, like, gels. I mean, Arnold's clearly very critical of, the, in this movie, they're like, they're all just thirsting for power, and, like, military dominance, and they, like, are basically, like, just pawns. <clears throat> but I feel like there was a lot of stuff about the U.S. here. So spoilers for the end of the movie. Big spoilers for the end of the movie. Um, there's a lot of parallels. Okay, here's what I wrote. Um, throughout the movie, Japan is sublimated to U.S. authority. They even directly complain about it at, at like multiple points. Like I think one of the, one of the characters literally says, "Like man, it must be must be great to be a, a dominant world power or <laughs> something like that." <clears throat> um, I think um, there's parallels here to like not just the fact that the U.S. is the current dominant world power, but the the history of Japan's relationship to the U.S. is basically two major events that are just massive shows of military force for the U.S. that have completely fucked Japan. So first, you've got the the arrival of of Perry's black ships, uh, <clears throat> which ended. Japan's period of isolation, which I believe is called, like, Kokaku or something. I might be wrong about that. Kankoku? It's something, something, something with a bunch of Ks. Uh. <coughs> Sakoku, that's what it's called. Sakoku. Uh, there you go. Uh, so basically, so there was this, there, during the Edo period, Japan was just like, fuck off the rest of the world, only the Dutch can trade with us in this one particular port, everyone else fuck off. And then America just showed up with a bunch of guns, uh, and was like, hey yo, uh, oh, you've all watched the, the history of Japan, I guess, you, you know all of this, what am I talking about, why am I explaining this? Uh, so yeah, that's the first thing, <clears throat> which is like, hey, we, we, we have all the sound, like, like, if you think about this from the, the position of Japan, it's like, oh, we have all these, uh, Technologies we've been importing from the Dutch. We're a peaceful nation. We have, like, relatively decent military might. You know, we have wars. We, we manage to do shit. And then all of a sudden, here comes a force that you can't even comprehend the military power of. Just shows up from the outside world. And you're like, oh, fuck. It turns out we're actually small and insignificant. Then, the same thing happens in World War Two. Uh... Japan's like, we're fucking Imperial Japan, we can do whatever the fuck we want. America shows up and is like, I've got a couple of bombs of the nuclear kind which disagree with you. And then Japan's like, oh fuck, overwhelming military might, ridiculous, incomprehensible levels of power, and to, to just kill everyone. 
Uh, we can't do anything about this. Fuck. Turns out we're small and insignificant. And then in the movie, uh, you have the the same thing happens, basically, but to the entire world. Where, like, human- it's, it's kind of a commentary on hubris, I guess. Where, you know, there's all of these extraterrestrials who are just ridic- incomprehensibly powerful. The, nothing can do any. No human military might can stop them. Right, where like humanity is entirely dependent on Ultraman to fight these guys. Uh, nothing humans can do can have, has any effect, especially on the last guy, the final big bad of the movie, <clears throat> Zeton, who uh, is just like, I I'm just gonna fire this bomb that's big enough to wipe out the entire entire solar system in one shot, and literally even Ultraman is powerless to stop me, basically. Uh, and then you get this whole thing where it's like, oh, turns out we're small and insignificant, we thought we could... Do so I feel like there's some commentary here, right, about Japan's sort of isolation, and then every time it comes in contact with the outside world, specifically America, it's like, oh, turns out we're fucked, turns out we're weak. Uh, but, obviously, the messaging of the movie is like, you know, you're not actually weak. Uh... <coughs> So there's definitely something there. Uh, overall, fucking weird movie. Very Japanese. Um, and very strange. <laughs> but, did I like it? I honestly can't even say I liked it. It was kind of a slog. It was kind of boring to sit through. Um, there were highlights, and there were some interesting, like, you know, political commentary and stuff. But, like, as a movie... I honestly don't think I really enjoyed it. Like the car- most of like the vast majority of the cast spends almost the entire movie just helplessly watching from the sidelines as Ultraman is does the fighting, and then somehow they still have jobs, <laughs> as if they're like capable of doing anything. It's very strange. A lot of the like stuff dealing with the government is like way more on the nose and less interesting than it was in Shin Godzilla. Uh, like a lot of the more more obvious stuff that happens in the movie, then like the plot beats, often just come out of nowhere. Stuff happens as if it's like really obvious that that's the only solution. When in reality, it's like, well, why would they choose to do that when they could have done any number of other things? Very strange. There's a lot of stuff that's explained away with techno babble. There's a lot of techno babble in this movie. There is also very bad English and um. I don't even know what to call it when a, a Japanese person speaks Russian badly, but there's that as well. Uh, <clears throat> um, some of the VFX is distractingly bad. Most of it is, you know, fine. Uh, and, yeah, I guess the main problem is just the structure of the movie. is just fucking... It's just completely fucked. <laughs> just for, everything takes simultaneously too long. Like, all the stuff that you want to, to be quick and punchy and snappy drags on for too long and all of the stuff that you want to be like quick in and out you know to get to the next interesting part uh wait what am i talking about i got confused all of the stuff that's supposed to be quick and snappy takes on takes too long and all the stuff that you want to be longer is over too quickly Uh, and it's often over for completely stupid reasons like one of the fights ultraman just about to get fucking wrecked and then another guy just shows up doesn't even do anything, and the the bad guy is just like, I, I'm out, I'm, I could kill you right now, but I'm just not going to for no apparent reason. And it's never really explained, uh, so it's kind of annoying. Like, there's a, that, that's just emblematic of how a lot of the movie is. is I don't know. I like, I like the fact that it exists, but as a movie, I don't think, it, I don't think it's very good, to be honest. Probably Anno's worst thing he's ever made. Uh, which I'm not saying that the movie's actually, like, terrible or unwatchable, but Arrow is just generally good, so, yeah. Uh, maybe if you're a hardcore Ultraman fan, there's a bunch of references and shit that I'm not getting that make it make way more sense, but, I mean, I'm not, and to me the movie just seemed very muddled and poorly structured. 
you guys don't understand how annoyed I am about the fact that whatever superpower was allowing me to play visual novels has left my body. It was like day and night. It was like I was capable and then one day I try and it's just not happening. It was it was just like a switch flipped off in my brain. Because I'd try and sit down to play fucking Kinkoi the last couple days. I get through like two scenes and my mind just starts wandering and then I realize like I'm not even reading the lines. I'm just clicking through and like skimming the first two words and then I, I'd like try and pay attention to what's actually happening. I'm like I I realize I just haven't even been reading the words because my mind is just like thinking about other things. Where the fuck did my shit go? So that's the one annoying thing, is that I just can't pay attention to reading anymore. Which is very annoying, um, and I'm not sure what to do about it. I think it's also maybe because this this character isn't that interesting. Like, I know I'm super close to the end of her arc. I must be super close. Um, but then I'm like, oh, I gotta do another one. And then I get to the one that's actually interesting. Rhea. Uh, so I don't quite know what to do about this situation. Um, I don't, yeah, I'll sort it out in my own brain at some point. So that's a thing. And then I think it's time we admit to ourselves that we're not watching Strike Witches. That the the watching, because t- today, I was like, you know what? We're like 10 hours into the podcast. What if I just, like, went and watched all of Luminous Witches right now? I just go and watch all of Luminous Witches right now, and then I come back, and I'm like, guys, I just watched Luminous Witches, and I didn't even tell you, and that's it, we've watched every season of Strike Witches that isn't a special or weird thing, um, but I tried to fucking watch it, and I couldn't even make it through the first episode, it's actually really bad, <laughs> it's definitely the worst Strike Witches of any of them, by like a long shot, the characters are bad, it looks like shit, they wear skirts and trousers now, like, they're, they're not pantsless. It's not even fucking... How is it even Strike Witches if they're not pantsless? Like, what the hell? That's blasphemy. That's sacrilege. I don't want to watch Strike Witches if they're not pantsless. What the fuck? Disgusting. Get the shit out of here. Like, I hate idol shit. I don't like idol music most of the time. There's, like, a couple of idol groups that I that kind of like. But, yeah, I mean, it's, it's fucking Garbanzo. Garbaggio. I couldn't, I couldn't do it, I couldn't make it through the first episode, I was like, do I really wanna, like, I'm committing to a full season, this four hours of this, can I, can I actually last through that, I don't know, what's the fucking point of doing that, and then I thought, you know what, I would rather be fucking watching Kamen Rider right now, because I've had Kamen Rider on the brain for a while, and so I'm thinking, maybe I watch some Kamen Rider, maybe that's what this is about, but the problem with Kamen Rider is each season is like, 10 episodes longer than it needs to be, and this is not just a me thing, okay, I know I complain about this, but I have seen Kamen Rider fans complain about this too, that the seasons are, like, too long, a lot of the time, um, so I watched Kamen Rider W, like, a while ago, and I never actually finished it, because, not for any real legitimate reason, but simply because I forgot, I, I, like, took a break for a while, because I'd been marathoning it, and I, I know I got, like, decently far in, like, probably more than halfway through, and, uh, but, yeah, then I, like, took a week off watching it, just to do other shit, and I was like, huh, you know what, I want to go back and watch Kamen Rider, and I realized I had no idea what episode I was on, and I just have not been bothered to go back through and try and figure out what episode I was on when I stopped, but I was really enjoying Kamen Rider W, like, it's, it's really good, I feel like I can claim I've watched it, Because I've watched, like, a really good chunk of it. I just haven't finished it, which is really annoying. And at some point, I'm going to have to go back and do that. Um, But that time is not now. Instead, I'm going to watch Kamen Rider O's, which is, uh, I think, the season that came out just before W. It's also considered to be really good. Um, I actually have already watched the first episode, and to be real with you, I didn't think the first episode was that special. Or I thought it was a little boring. But I will I will stick with it for like three episode test. See if I'm enjoying it. And uh, I guess I'll let you know. Because apparently this is a media criticism and a review 
podcast, just like Boat Knife. I'm like Boat Knife. This is the, this is, what if Boat Knife was like relatively heterosexual? <laughs> That's the slice of life, unwatchable 12 hour podcasts. <sighs> I got a, a join button on my channel now, maybe. Allegedly it's there. Allegedly, YouTube tells me it's there. But I don't fucking see it. Unless it's showed up now. Yeah, it doesn't show up for me, but YouTube tells me I have it, so... I don't fucking know what that's about. Let me let me check on, on a, a browser that I'm not logged into. Google on... Uh... Yeah, there we go. Join button. It's there. It exists. You can join my channel now. And I will maybe be making join content. I might do that. It depends. I mean, the thing is that's really annoying. I guess... I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how strongly I care about monetizing any of this shit. Um... I also don't really think anyone would be particularly interested in, like, exclusive content, you know? Uh, but money is nice. It's nice to have money. <laughs> it's nice to, like, not die. Not be in, like, existential terror for money. Uh, so I could definitely... I don't know. I'll think about it. I would need to do something interesting with it. I don't want it to just be, like, you know, stupid shit. Uh... But anyway, yeah, fucking Kamen Rider, I guess I'll do that. Okay, let me tell you uh, a very niche pro tip that's only relevant to people who live in the UK. So, if you don't know, because I, I feel like this stuff doesn't hit international news, uh, the UK is currently in what they call, and they being the government, uh, uh, a cost of living crisis or the cost of living crisis. The government and the media have somehow coordinated to make this what they're calling it. You know, I feel like we already had a name for this. It was called a recession, but uh, apparently no, it's just a cost of living crisis. Now, you know, if you really think about that phrase, it becomes very dystopian, <laughs> you know? Like the cost, it's a cost of living crisis. The cost to just live has just, is in crisis. It's insane. It's a, it's a wild situation. Uh, but yeah, the UK has very high inflation, and uh, people have very little spending power. Everyone is poorer. That's the real thing. Uh, you know, they 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 want to make it seem like everything has gotten more expensive, which it has. But what that really means is everyone's also gotten poorer because inflation's so high. Uh, you know, in my opinion, okay, I'm not going to tell you what I think the Bank of England should be doing because I don't know shit about economics. But anyway. Uh, this is being driven by food prices right now. Food prices are, they have, like, more than doubled over the past eight months. It's insane. Like, food is so much more expensive now, and it's very noticeable. Um, it's pretty ridiculous. Uh, now, I've read that apparently the UK had, like, like ex exceptionally cheap food for Western Europe. Like, some of the cheapest food prices in Western Europe. And that this is, like sort of Brexit adjusting our prices to be more in line with what the rest of Western Europe has. That feels like cope to me, but I'll allow it. Whatever the case may be, uh, food prices have gone up. So I'm now going to give you one tip. You get one cost-saving, food-saving tip from me if you live in the UK. So... Firstly, you should be buying food sometimes from Iceland. There is no reason not to buy food from Iceland. Uh, Iceland is a, a shop that specializes in frozen foods. Cheap value frozen foods. Um, uh, Iceland is good. The other super cheap um, shops in, in Britain, which is like Little and Aldi, they're good, but they don't do delivery. So you have to like physically go to the store not something I'm up for. Iceland does do delivery. Something's burning. Is that... Oh, fucking toast. Uh, burn my toast a tiny bit, but we're fine. We're fine. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so Iceland is good because they do delivery and everything's frozen and cheap. Uh, it's pretty good. 
you know, if you really want to be maximizing your, your cheapness, you can go and physically shop, but since I don't have a car, and there's no Lidl's or Aldi's that are close to me, um, not really worth doing like a weekly shop. I mean, it's just not possible. It's not feasible for me. I basically need to order delivery. And Iceland does free delivery if you order more than forty pounds worth of stuff. Which you know, if you if you just order a week's worth of groceries, it's pretty much guaranteed to be over forty pounds. So here's my tip for Iceland shoppers. Um, throughout this whole cost of living, food inflation prices thing, potatoes have been relatively stable. I don't know why, but potatoes are cheap uh, as a carb. Um, now the best way I've found, so the problem with me is if I buy a big bag of potatoes, I will eat potatoes like three times and then get bored of them, mainly because they just take longer than any other carb to cook, which is just kind of annoying to me. But here's my pro tip for cheap, cheap ass carbs. Iceland chips they have these big value pack chips now in my opinion these chips taste fine they're not going to be good right and they also have doubled in price they used to be one pound now they're two pounds they have doubled in price but in my opinion they are fine they are not good they are definitely not great but they're also not bad and they're definitely not terrible that is my opinion some people don't agree with me don't smite tried these chips and hated them uh, so, you know, that is just my opinion. But in my opinion, this is like one of the best ways to get cheap carbs that, that cook in quick times and don't require any prep. You just buy these big bags of chips and you're getting like at least like seven meals, maybe even ten meals for two pounds. Like it's not bad. It's definitely not bad. Um, but here's my pro tip. So you, you get those, but the thing they try and hide from you is they have four different kinds. They have steak cut, crinkle cut, straight cut, and thin and crispy. Now, I had been getting the thin and crispy kind just because that's what shows up most readily on the website. They're very, they, they shill it. They shill that one harder than they shill the other ones. And also because they look the most like regular normal chips. But, I have discovered they're actually slightly more expensive than the other ones because they give you slightly fewer chips, or at least it looked that by weight. So, the don't buy the steak cut ones because they have really shitty reviews. But the other ones, you're getting 1.5 kilos, and but the thin and crispy ones, you're only getting 1.25 kilos. So there, there's clearly something suspicious going on there. I've been buying these thin and crispy ones thinking I was getting a good deal. Which, I mean, you're probably getting more than 10 meals out of it, now that I think about it. It's a lot of chips. It's a big bag. Uh, I, I don't know if I can go back and count how many meals I've made with this, but, you know, it's 1.25 kilos of chips. It's a big bag of chips. You're getting plenty of chips, right? But, apparently, if I, if I just switch to crinkle cut which I like crinkle cut chips as much as the next man, apparently I'll be getting more chips for my chips. So that's my tips for chips, is to switch to crinkle cut chips to save money. I have a problem and you're the solution. You're going to be the solution. I have two problems actually. My first problem is that I've got a runny nose for some reason. Very annoying. I took an antihistamine to solve my problems, uh, but that hasn't kicked in yet. Okay, so here's my problem. Uh, this is not a problem you should care about. I'm just using you to think out loud. Hope you don't mind. Uh, my problem is that I'm bored, and I'm between activities, and I have been between activities for the past, like, 45 minutes or so, uh, and I haven't been able to choose what to do next. Uh, here's the situation. It's like maybe two, three hours before I'm going to be going to sleep, so I can't like commit to something that's going to be uh, longer than that. Like, for example, well, I don't know what would be longer than that, but yeah, can't commit to something that would be longer than that. Uh, I I'm having somewhat trouble focusing, but not like too much trouble, just like a little bit. So probably not visual novel reading time. Uh, 
but it's I guess technically a possibility. Uh, so here I'm just going to run through my options and weigh up the pros and cons. So option one would just to, which is like the do nothing option, would just be to like watch YouTube and maybe like scroll Twitter or something. This is like the the, the worst morally, the worst option. Uh, but it's also not a particularly good option because there's not that much content. There's not that much harvest. I haven't said that for a while. Remember I used to call it that? I'm going to go back to doing that. It was a funny phrase. There's not that much harvest. I mean, I have like this video. It's like 15 minutes long that I want to watch. And then like what else even? Like that's about it <laughs> to be honest with you. I guess there's a new Northern Lion Bits and Banter on the... Uh, Excuse me, on the uh, the Library of Laterno. That's like two hours long. But I don't know if I want to sit down and just watch just raw dog a bits and banter. You know, they're good for uh, falling asleep to. And they're good for having on the second monitor. And I, I can raw dog them. It's not impossible to just raw dog it. but And it's sometimes good. But I don't know if I necessarily want to do that right now. But that's one option. I could feasibly fill up my time and then maybe in that time another video gets posted i doubt it but it's possible and actually there is a couple of things in my watch later playlist that i could probably dip into if i needed to so not completely infeasible uh okay next options would be playing team fortress 2 uh, now, the computer, I played TF2 earlier today and actually got, got bored of playing it. Played for a few hours, got kind of bored. Uh, I could go back, turn the computer on, that would require a migration, which is a little bit of a hassle, but not too much of a hassle. Uh, in which case, I would be playing TF2 and I would probably be watching the bits and banter in the background, which then precludes me from being able to use that to sleep. Which is not a big deal because there's plenty of other sleeping content on the internet. I'll probably watch a uh, GoldenEye Speed Lore episode, which is some of the best sleeping content around. If you're interested, go on YouTube, look up uh, Speed Lore. Lore is in L O R E, Speed Lore. Uh, excellent sleeping content. But So that's definitely feasible, that's viable, it's a possibility. Uh, but I again, I already played TF2 earlier, and I got kind of bored of playing TF2. And in fact, I got so bored that I reinstalled CSGO and started playing a bit of CSGO. But then CSGO just started crashing for no reason that I could understand. Like it just mid-match crashed, and then every time I tried to boot it, it would it would crash on the the boot screen before even loading into the main menu. So then I reinstalled Source and 1.6. Played a bit of 1.6, couldn't find a server I was enjoying, and uh, played a bit of Source. Realized that my Source config is set up for surfing. Uh, if you don't know, when you're trying, when you're tryharding surf, you bind left and ma- right mouse buttons to be. Uh, I, I don't know what to even what the 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 word is like. I mean, it's your basically like Y A W your. Uh, So, like, when you press the mouse button, it turns your camera, and then you use that to do big turns without running out of mouse pad space. Which I did, and I loaded up the first surf server I found, which was running Surf Kitsune, and I beat Surf Kitsune for the hundredth time. Uh, And then I got bored, because I've beat Surf Kitsune a million times, and I didn't care enough. So I'd have to go in and... I mean, either I'd have to hope that restarting my computer has fixed whatever was happening with CSGO. Uh, And then there's the question of if I would even have fun playing CSGO, which I don't even know if I would. Or I'd have to jump into a different Counter-Strike game, which is just kind of annoying because my config in both both 1.6 and Source is fucked right now. Like, I don't know why, but I can't get... I I need to go through and create like an auto exec or something for one point six because because my fucking config is completely fucked in, in in minor ways that aren't annoying to anyone except me but are annoying to me. And uh, yeah, my source config is also fucked up because it's set up for surfing, so I can't really play normal games. So that would be kind of a pain to do either of those things. Another option would be to play a normal video game, like a single player game. I still haven't beat Neon White. 
but I also found that Neon White was becoming less and less fun the more I was playing. Uh, so I might, I mean, not that it was bad yet, but I don't know if I necessarily want to play Neon White right now. Other video games are available. Um, I don't know which other video games I have. I actually found a game today that looks kind of interesting. It's called That Which Gave Chase. It's like a little PS1 style horror game. Uh, I have enough in my Steam monies that I can afford that uh, without having to actually pay real money. I just have to pay p fake money that I got from Counter Strike cases. Uh, so I could buy that game and play it, but it, there's no guarantee it would be any good. Uh, also, I have no idea how long it is. It could be. I don't really want to play a game that I'll have to finish on another day because there's no shot I will do it, but I also. I, I don't know. No idea. I guess I could check it out. Uh, if I do, I might even turn it into content. I might even record it as a Let's Play or streamer or something. That could be fun. But So that's definitely a possibility. But again, it's kind of a... It's kind of annoying. To have to go into the other room. Ideally, I just want something I can do here. Ideally on my ThinkPad. Because uh, I'm in a ThinkPad mood, for whatever reason. So, ThinkPad stuff. ThinkPad stuff is going to be watching things. ThinkPad stuff is going to be watching something. Excuse me for blowing my nose. Someone type bless you in the comments, please. I need one person to type bless you, I need another person to type gesundheit, and then I'll be happy, okay? These are your instructions. Uh, I could, I feel like I've given up on this strike, which is mean, because I tried to watch fucking the, the other one, and it was the Luminous Witches, and it, I couldn't even get through the first episode, I just hated it, like, I don't want to put myself through that, and I definitely don't want to put myself through that sober, okay, maybe if I have a, sh a bunch of alcohol, I'll, I'll, I can watch that, but I don't want to drink today, I'm not in the mood, uh, so, yeah, not really Strike Witch is pilled. I watched one episode of Cardcaptor Sakura today out of fucking nowhere because I was randomly was like, I want to watch Sakura. But I watched one episode and I was like, I felt satisfied with that. I didn't, I don't necessarily feel like I want to watch more Sakura than that, but it, I could. And another option would be Kamen Rider. Um, I could either continue Kamen Rider O's, which I have been watching on episode 6, I think, um, and Kamen Rider O's is more like Kamen Rider OK. It's not as good as W, by any means. Um, frankly, I don't know how much I care about Kamen Rider right now. Uh, so that's one option would be to try and keep watching O's, even though I'm not sure why I'm committing to it. I know that it's popular in Japan, but I have multiple Kamen Rider fans who are friends of mine who aren't particularly big fans of it. It's one option. Uh, another option would be, and I'm include like so far it's not that good is what I'm getting at. Uh, I could watch a different Kamen Rider series, uh or season, uh, top of my list would probably be zero one, I guess, uh, because it has a cute android girl in it, apparently, uh, but I watched the first, like, minute of zero one, and the acting was just, like, really bad, like, really, really distractingly bad, which is not unusual for Japanese TV shows, uh, so, I don't necessarily know if I want to put myself through that. Uh, but again, also a possibility. Another possibility would be a different anime. Uh, I don't know what anime I would watch, but there's also the problem of I don't have enough time to finish a whole se series right now. Um, and I also don't know if I could focus on an anime or the Kamen Rider. I don't know if I could focus on, on any of that. Uh Another possibility, which I hadn't thought of until just now, would be to watch a movie. Just a regular-ass movie. Now, are there any movies that I want to watch in my life? Um, I could watch a movie. Huh. 
but nothing's coming to mind that I'm like been meaning to watch or anything like that. Um, yeah, nothing's coming to mind. So we're kind of in a pickle here, because none of these options seem great to me. What is going on with... Um, I feel like I'm getting an electric shock in my leg somehow. Strange. <sighs> yeah, we're kind of in a pickle here. I guess hidden option would be read manga. Um, I do have some manga I could read. I have plenty of manga I can read. Actually... Uh, catch up on some manga. That could be. F I don't really want to do that right now. I want. I want. I'm. I'm too fucking ADHD to to sit down and read in silence right now. I need something that's flashing, dangling keys in front of my face. God damn, we're in a pickle. See, nothing. This is the problem. Nothing seems appealing to me right now. Uh, like in terms of doing stuff, even. Like, what would I even do? I don't really have anything that I need to or particularly want to do. Uh, like, it's too late to record music. I mean, I can record... I could make an electronic song. Uh, I suppose I could do that, but I, I don't know what I would do with it. The only musical idea I've had lately is... Or today. The only musical idea I've had today is... Do you know the song Bolero? Uh... It's 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 a fucking terrible. I hate it, but uh, you might like it. There's a song called Bolero, a classical piece. Uh, it goes like, bum ba ba bum ba ba bum 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 ba ba bum ba ba da ba ba da ba 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 da 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 but I was thinking, because a lot of people compare that song to techno, or like house, because it has like a lot of loops in it. Uh, so I was thinking, what if I, if, uh, you know what, it'd be kind of cool to make a techno song, that where the kicks are in the the pattern of the snare from Bolero. They're like, I don't know how that would sound on a techno song. I mean, it, it would be a weird song. It would definitely be a weird song. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe I'll do that. Let's see where that takes me. I just realized that Bolero is in 3-4. Uh, I've never never had a techno song in 3-4 before. I don't think I've ever heard one. I've definitely never made one. I feel like 4-4, four, four, you can fuck with the the kick pattern, but I feel like... Techno song outside of 4-4 four, four time is is no longer a techno song. I'll see what happens, but I am not thinking that this will turn out to be a good song that sounds good. Okay, I did that. I made it. You know what? I'm going to play some for you. I'm going to play some for you. Uh, hold on. I'm just going to play it through the speakers. I'm just going to play it through the speakers. Okay, it goes on for a while, but let me just skip to the bit where I can read.
feel like there might be a little too much going on in that song, but fuck it. Fuck it. Okay. So that killed like an hour. Now I need to find other shit to do. Okay, TF2 pet peeve that doesn't bother anyone except me. No one else cares. It's stupid. It shouldn't bother me. Uh, there's a primary for heavy, which no one uses because it's absolute garbage compared to heavy's other primaries. And everyone calls it the Hue Long Heater or the Hu Long Heater or the Huo Long Heater. It is pronounced Hua Long. Okay, Hua Long. Right? You don't have to call it, you don't have to bother with the tones. You don't have to bother with the tones. I'll forgive you. You don't have to bother with the tones. But at least Hua. 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 Not Hu. Hua. It's pretty easy. Hua. Hua Long Heater. Hua Long. If you really want to be accurate, but you don't, obviously, who gives a shit? Let me complain about Team Fortress 2 real quick again. Uh, this is not, this is this is Valve, T- dear Valve. I know you're you're eleven hours into my podcast. Thank you for listening to my podcast, Valve employees. Uh, the gas passer for Pyro. Uh, I'm pretty sure that it's just a mistake that it doesn't count players as wet in the wet state with the gas passer because gas passer dog shit like considered one of the worst weapons in the game because it has no use case. Neon Annihilator. Also considered one of the worst weapons in the game because it has the most hyper-specific situational use case of any weapon in the game. If the gas passer, which throws people and covers them in liquid, just like Madmo and Jurati, those count as wet. Gas passer doesn't count as wet. If the gas passer counted as wet, then you could have... Luf- it, it wouldn't be good, but you could do funny neon annihilator gas passer combos. I would do that. That sounds like a fun playstyle. Put it in the game, Valve. There's no, like, it's it's weird. It's like, it's like they thought about it, because it's the only throwable liquid weapon in the game. You know, as I said, Mad Milk and Jurati, very similar concepts to the Gas Passer. It, the Gas Passer is the only one that does it. It's like, either they thought it would be OP, or they just forgot. Um... I don't understand it. I don't know if anyone else has, like, paid attention to this. I only just, like, noticed this in my memory. Is the weird way that that Counter-Strike players and fans' opinions about Valorant have shifted over the years? Like, I remember when Valorant was announced, and everyone in the Counter-Strike community was fucking, like, pogging. Everyone was really hyped for, for a few different reasons. Firstly, because, uh... Uh, it was supposed to be, like, more competitive. Like, you could see from the art style that didn't have, like, visibility issues like Counter-Strike or CSGO d- does. CS2 doesn't really have any of them. Uh, like, CSGO has some visibility issues. Valorant clearly designed to fix that. Um, a lot of people were talking about how the gunplay in Valorant in the, like, beta was way closer to 1.6. And CSGO players who have never played 1.6... For some reason, think that the gunplay in 1.6 is supposed to be like the god tier gunplay of all video games. Not realizing that 1.6 actually feels good to play because of the movement. The gunplay is actually the worst part of the game. <laughs> it's not true. The grenades are the worst part of 1.6. Uh, but whatever. The guns in 1.6 do not feel anywhere near as good as the guns in Source or CSGO. Like, I've played plenty of all of those games, and I can trust me, okay? Uh, but the movement in 1.6 is fucking god tier. Uh, but people were convinced that Valorant was going to be more inspired by 1.6, and all Counter Strike players have this weird nostalgia for 1.6, even though the vast, vast majority of them never played the game. Uh, and people think that 1.6 is like the holy grail of what Counter Strike is supposed to be. Um, so people were really hyped for Valorant for that. Uh, they were really hyped for the the visual design, and then and they were really hyped for the anti cheat because. Everyone who plays Counter-Strike is obsessed with this idea that everyone except me is a cheater, everyone who wins a game is a cheater, that the cheating problem is massive, even though I don't think that's the case. I think the cheating problem in uh, decent prime matchmaking with decent trust factor is basically non-existent. Uh, I, I, there's like, I think the thing is people... People who complain about cheaters, they're clearly just in low trust factor matchmaking, and 
can't get out, which must be very frustrating for them, but never been a problem for me. I mean, I do come across cheaters, but it's not super common. But yeah, people were very hyped for the anti-cheat, people were very hyped, so all of this stuff, right? Everyone was super impressed by Valorant. And then it came out, and for a while, there was, I sort of, it was kind of a weird situation, because it didn't seem like there was that much argument like, it wasn't like there were two sides and they hated each other, which is normally what you see in this situation. Um, but it was just that there were two... Like, it was mainly the abilities that that divided people. But it, I didn't see much infighting about it, which is weird. Like, uh, I guess what it turned out to be is that a lot of people saw Valorant as this more... This, the version of CSGO or CS, that had more competitive integrity. But then, once they actually played the game, and they found out abilities are lowering the skill ceiling, right? Like, the, it, it, the, that, that whole aspect of the game is, is kind of like Overwatch, right? Like, they're, they're taking this sort of pure game and then lo- adding some, some, some floofy, low-skill alts to it, to, uh, you know, lower the skill ceiling and make it make everything close together so that you can still pop off even if you're shit. Which is fine. You know, some people like that. Uh, and I'm sure the skills... I've never played Valorant. I'm sure it takes skill to use if to actually get, like, genuinely good at it. I'm sure it does. Uh, but, I see, you know, some people saw it like that. Other people were like, but look, the, if you ignore all of that, the gunplay is really good and all of this stuff. Uh, and, like, the game is really good. Um, I think the number one problem with Valorant, and I think Valorant players would agree with me here, is the maps. I mean, compared to Counter-Strike, Counter-Strike has the best maps of any first-person shooter in history, without question, in my opinion. Aside from Inferno. (laughs) But, uh, you know, like, you can play Dust 2, Mirage, Nuke, and, uh, you know, maybe Overpass. Uh, You know, you can play these maps forever and never get bored of them. Like, okay, maybe you can get bored of them, but it just, the map design is unmatched because they've had longer than any other video game to perfect it, and they have a bigger community of map designers than any other video game uh, with higher standards uh, and freely available mapping tools and a large community surrounding it, lots of time to, perf- like, figure out what works and doesn't work, lots of time to perfect the mapping tools and this whole community content generation aspect of it which as far as i understand doesn't exist in valorant uh everyone thinks the valorant maps are bad the worst part of the game uh abilities are actually you know not that important compared to the map design in terms of the quality of the game but what i'm talking about is the way that this transition has happened see at first it was like valorant is like counter-strike if it wasn't counter-strike if it didn't have to if it didn't have to adhere to this history of being a military shooter and was just optimized for being a modern esport, which is how people actually play Counter Strike these days, and it's like, okay, Counter Strike community is this like competitive focused, esports focused. You know, CS:GO tournaments are fucking massive in terms of viewership and people caring about them, right? Like, it's this whole thing. It's it's more competitive focused. It's more esports focused. The gun, the the gameplay is closer to like the. The, the essence of the game, which everyone knows is 1.6. Um, the maps will get improved as the game comes out. And then it has these abilities, which just, you know, they're just fancy stuff that just sort of does whatever. And then over time, what's happened is it's it's flipped completely. Now, it's like Valorant. Oh, Valorant's the baby game with anime-looking characters who do stupid shit with dumbass abilities, no balance, and crazy you know, weapon skins that, that completely break the art style of the game, with, like, animations uh, and ubu gamer couples in every, uh, you know, match. Whereas Counter-Strike is the hardcore gamer, you know, stripped-down, gameplay-oriented, eSport-focused game, which is crazy, right? Like, the, the, this flip happened at some point, where... And it wasn't just when, before Valorant came out or while it was in beta. Like, this happened slowly over the course of years that this, this sort of switcheroo has taken place. And I just think that's really interesting that now the opinion is generally... I mean, you see these memes. It's like average Valorant match and it's, it, you know, uh, some eagle saying, 
for every kill you get, I'll give you an oo um, you know, and then it goes to the, the CSGO average match, and it's just a Russian guy going like, you know, which is, t- a tip, that is how Counter-Strike is, <laughs> that is accurate, um, I know so many Russian soil words, it's amazing, if I ever go to Russia, well, I guess, it's a bit, the situation in Russia has changed a bit. <laughs> it's a little bit different now than it used to be uh, when I was playing Counter-Strike more intently. The situation in Russia has slightly changed. Um, but, hey, who knows? Uh, so, I don't know. I just thought it was an interesting phenomenon. Damn, we're getting close to the end of this 12-hour podcast. Damn. 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 I played Dust Bowl for 12 hours yesterday. I played CP Dust Bowl for 12 hours straight yesterday. Well, not straight. I took breaks to eat. But, uh, yeah, that was a, a wild experience. That was a, a transcend a, to transcend life. I played CP Dust Bowl until I transcended life. And what's crazy about it is I, ha- I actually did transcend life now. I'm now transcended life. Uh, I don't know what to even, like, I don't, I don't know what... Uh, what to even say about it, like, this is a very intense experience, right, like, a a very important, uh, life event for me, I feel like, uh, in terms of, in terms of experience, it was, it was, it was, uh, I don't know, something about it felt like that, but really, I, like, I want to, I want to say something, which I didn't say on stream, which is that the difficult part about it, was not actually playing Dust Bowl for 12 hours. Like, that wasn't... That was difficult. But it wasn't that difficult. The To me, the actual difficult part was was streaming for 12 hours. Like, having to actually talk actively for 12 hours and keep an eye on a chat and interact with people and, like, commentate what I'm doing. I mean, I know by the end of it, I kind of gave up and was just sort of letting the music play. Uh, like, I wasn't talking that much. But still, like... I was at the back of my mind the whole time. I'm like, I got to try and be entertaining somehow. And it is just, that is the hard part. Like, that is what's actually tiring, is just being in, like, a sort of pseudo-social situation or streaming, trying to be vaguely entertaining for 12 hours. That's 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 too difficult. I don't know how streamers do this. Like, you look at XQC and all of these people, they stream for, like, 16 hours a day every day. I, it's a, It's actually an insane skill set. I don't understand how they do it. Well, I guess stimulant drugs. <laughs> Ad- Adderall, I guess. But, uh, yeah, maybe maybe next time I do a 12-hour d- dust ball stream, I'll, d- I'll pop some Adderall first. Uh, yeah, I, I feel like I've le- I learned things about dust ball um, in terms of, like, tricks and tips on the map. Like, I, I mean, my favorite thing I learned is a really cool dispenser spot for holding the second point on the second stage, uh, which I don't know if I'll ever actually use, but it is a really cool dispenser spot. Um, But, you know, and I learned some other tricks, but I feel like what I really learned was more about the essence of Dust Bowl, stuff that's harder to communicate. Both the essence of Dust Bowl and the essence of Team Vordress 2. You know, I learned learned something about the the pyramids of Giza. I learned something about the great pyramids of Giza. My real question to myself, though, is: Am I going to go through this? Am I going to download this VOD and try and edit this into an actual video? Because, like, that would be fucking editing hell. I think it might take me longer than 12 hours to edit that video um, if I were to make it. And probably no one would watch it. So I don't I don't really know. Like, it, it would probably be a good video. Like, there were definitely funny moments, notable moments. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, oh, actually, bigger problem, even bigger problem is I don't think I have the storage space on my computer to do that. Uh, oh, yeah, that's... I think that makes it impossible. Because the, the footage is all, like, uh, 1080p, 60fps. 
I don't think I have the storage space to do that. Yeah, that's a shame. Okay, I need to actually... If we're talking about... Speaking of making videos, I need to sit down and write this fucking TF2 video that I've had in my head for ages, which is just explaining every competitive game mode. Maybe I do that today. Today, for breakfast, I decided to make a burger. It was a scuffed burger. Um... So I bought this, when I went to the store, the, the mints, the beef mints was on sale. It was relatively cheap. Um, uh, uh, yeah, relatively cheap for a decent amount. So I just decided to buy it, even though I didn't really have any plans for what to do with mints. Um, <clears throat> obviously, normally I would just put it into a pasta sauce, but um, I kind of not, I don't really want like bolognese. I, I kind of not really feeling it recently. So I, I was like, I, I it's been sitting there in my fridge for two days, and I'm like, well, I have to, I have like only three more days to use this, so I guess I'm just going to be making a, a burgers a bunch, but I don't have any burger buns, what I have is cheap, the cheapest brown bread I can buy, which is what I always get, because it's like, look, I, I don't like the taste of the cheapest brown, but I've got, I've gone through every bread in my local shop and checked the fiber content of every bread and the highest fiber per slice is actually the cheapest brown bread that you can buy which surprised me because i used to think it was the slightly more actually significantly more expensive uh slightly fancy seeded bread which is what i got for ages and that tastes pretty good actually it's actually pretty nice bread i i've got i've, I've become quite a fan of that bread but uh, I've actually found out that the cheaper brown, just normal brown bread is actually has more fiber. So uh, I'm sacrificing my enjoyment for fiber content, which is 100% worth it because bread, bread is bread. That, to me, there are two kinds of, of breads. There's, there's recreational bread and just standard bread. Like standard bread just just is just there to act as a, a medium for stuff it doesn't have to taste good it doesn't have to do anything all it has to do is just sit there when you put stuff on it right because the stuff is the focus ideally it tastes like very little that's the whole point of that of the standard bread and in that case this brown bread is basically perfect because it, it, it doesn't taste great and it doesn't have a very nice texture but it's cheap as shit and it has lots of fiber, which is exactly what I want, because I can convince myself that it's somehow healthy. Uh, but then you have the luxury bread, which is normally for me. This is bread where you're making a recipe, where you're you're like you're buying it not just because like oh I need to have bread around in the house just as a as a an essential item like the way I, I always have eggs, I always have butter, I always have egg bread, you know, you always have rice, always have pasta. Like, the sort of essential items you always have. That's the standard bread. The luxury bread is like, I'm going to the store specifically to buy ingredients because I want to make this recipe. So that's normally either ciabatta to make a panini or um, some sort of, uh, like, uh, what's it called? Sourdough bread to make, like, some sort of fancier sandwich or something like that. And that's a rare luxury item. That's something I get maybe once every couple months, or something like that, uh, crumpets also fit into this, crumpets, ciabatta, sourdough, these are, like, special breads that you buy, because you're, like, I have a particular recipe in mind that I want to make, that requires nicer bread, where the bread is, like, a main ingredient, but no, brown bread, why was I talking about this, oh, yeah, because, so my burger was two slices of brown bread, I don't have buns, because I wasn't planning on making burger. It was two slices of brown bread, not even buns. And then I just grabbed some meat out of the package with my hands and just made it into a smash burger. But I didn't do a very good job of it because this is not burger mix beef mince. This is just whatever I picked up at the store. It doesn't have enough fat in it to really be good for a burger. So uh, that caused two problems. Firstly, it, the texture is not great. It's fine because it's a smash burger. And it pretty much doesn't super matter the bigger problem was it stuck to the pan surface because it wasn't leaching enough of its own fat into the pan to to you know lift itself out which is a problem i need to figure out the solution to and the third problem with this is that i didn't use very much meat um and so i don't know 
I'm going to have to eat a lot of burgers to get through all of this meat before it goes off. Uh, which is fine by me. <laughs> I can definitely do that. Uh, so yeah, scuffed as burger. And then another reason the burger was scuffed is because I forgot to fucking season it. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, it was just two slices of brown bread, uh, Amer- one slice of American cheese, a, th- a really thin smash burger, was patty, and some mayo and ketchup. Uh, so I guess I'm gonna, since I fucked it up so bad, I'm gonna try it again today, maybe in an hour or so. I'm gonna try it again. This time I'm gonna make a, either a thicker patty or do like a double. Uh, it's still going to be on this brown bread, because I also have to use this brown bread by, like, soon. So I'm trying to get through it. So that's not going to be great. But, hey, the original the original hamburger was on bread, not on a bun, okay? The original, the OG, was on two slices of toasted white bread. Uh, so, there you go. We can just call this OG. Um... But yeah, so it's, I'm going to use more meat, either two patties or just one thicker patty. I'll probably go with two to maximize browning. But then the real question is, how do I make it so it doesn't stick to the pan? That's something I need to figure out, and I'm not sure how to do it. Because you don't really... Maybe if I put a really thin coating of oil... That's the plate. Okay, I'll get some oil, and I'll put it on a paper towel and get a really thin coating of oil on the pan. Okay, that's how I'll do it. That makes sense to me. I figured it out. Genius. And also, I'll put mustard on it this time, and I won't forget to season it. Okay, I will report back. I'm going to end this video with this. Uh, so I made a video basically completely on a whim, uh, where I go through some of the differences. I don't even go through the differences. I really just watched a video about Half-Life 1 and was like, whoa, I didn't know those settings existed. I want to play Half-Life 1 on those settings now. Um, and then I was like, you know what? I'll record this and post it on YouTube. That'll be fun. Uh, so I did that. And I accidentally, I guess, gave it a really good title and thumbnail for me, for my standards. Um, because it got picked up by the algorithm and it currently has, what, 2,000 views or so? 2,300, maybe more? Uh, because the view count's kind of off compared to the YouTube Studio. YouTube Studio says it says so it has 2.6k. Um, but the YouTube page says it has 2.3k. Anyway, not relevant. Either way, it's not showing any signs of slowing down in, in, in popularity. Let me check, actually. Oh, it is. It's starting to round off now. Okay, that's good. That's nice. But at some point it, around... Uh, a few hundred views it got picked up by the algorithm and skyrocketed to like one of my biggest videos um now this is unfortunate because i made this video i mean i just played half-life for fun and then i was like well i can't even be bothered to bring the footage off of my desktop and onto my mac so i can edit it properly so I'll just give it like a quick run through in Caden Live, just to like edit it down to be watchable. I considered just posting it unedited, but there's some embarrassing fails where I'm bad at the game and I wanted to edit them out. <laughs> so uh, I ed- yeah, just sort of went through, did one quick editing pass, probably took me half an hour, uh, and then posted the video. Never expecting, I was thinking this will probably get 300 views. And so, yeah, then the algorithm picked it up, and it now has way more views than I ever expected it to get. Now, 2.6 thousand is not that many on the scale of YouTube, uh, of course, but it is a lot on the scale of me. Um, And here's what I want to actually talk about, is the comments I'm getting on this video. So, um, I'm getting quite a few comments that are, I don't want to call them hate comments, because they're not hate comments. Like, that's too way too strong of a word. Just, like, very critical comments. Particu- I mean, one guy, I, I think, I never noticed this about myself, but there's a comment with 50 likes that says I sound like Snape from Harry Potter. Uh, that was my Discord notification, not yours. Uh, 
I didn't I never didn't know I sounded like Snape, but that's cool. I'm glad. I like I like that. I like Snape's voice. So that that's not a hate comment. I'm just talking about a bunch of people who are like um I don't know, semi sarcastically saying talking about how I have the HD models still enabled um or that I didn't understand why my HEV suit had disappeared at some point in the video. Um, and like, none of these are inaccurate, right? Like, this is true. I made a mistake when recording the video. I accidentally left the HD models turned on for the first, like, two thirds of the video and then, then realized and turned them off. It's been like a year since I last played Half-Life, probably longer. So I didn't even remember the original models. So I didn't even notice that I had the HD models on until I noticed it in the settings. Um... But uh, the point being, I guess it's it's fair. Like n none none of what anyone's saying is mean or rude. Really, it's fine. What I want to complain about is not these people. What I want to complain about is YouTubers, and YouTube as a platform has set the standard of video to be just too high. As in, like people can't tell the difference. Maybe it's my fault for like making a thumbnail. So people think it's going to be something with effort. But, like, I don't think people can tell when someone just made a video for fun. It's, like, probably not worth going down into the comments section and, and, and giving criticism. It's not really relevant. I'm not, I'm not going to care. <laughs> I'm probably never going to make a video about Half-Life 1 again in my life. Uh, you know, like, the, the, the idea that every YouTube video has to be this curated thing that is super polished and well edited. I will say the the only actual mean comment I got is uh, someone said me when I forgot how to edit. It's like, yeah, I spent half an hour editing this. Like, it's like probably an hour. It was almost exactly an hour of footage, actually, I remember. Um, it was just over an hour of footage, and I spent maybe half an hour editing it down. So, yeah, I... I I didn't try to edit. Also, I did it in Caden Live, which is not my preferred software for editing. Nothing I'm very fast with. Uh, nothing the super advanced editing software. I didn't even bother to check my mic settings so the audio is like clipping throughout the whole video. Because it's just a fun video I'm posting on my channel with like 900 subscribers. It shouldn't matter. Um, like, I, I guess what I'm thinking to myself is, like, when I see a video like this, because I stumble across similar kinds of things where it's just, like, some guy who clearly just made a video for fun, not expecting anyone to watch it, and it happened to show up on my recommended. You know, I watch it, and even if the video is bad, like, even if it's really egregiously bad, no part of me would ever think to go down into the comments and criticize them, because it's very obvious, like, oh, well, this person just made this for fun, so... What's the point of criticizing them? They're not trying to get better at making polished YouTube videos. They just made something for fun and posted it on YouTube. And it's... I, I, I feel kind of cringe complaining about this, right? Because, like, who cares if a few people complain in my comment section? I mean, uh, I don't want to be... I know you're not supposed to say this, but I kind it kind of does affect me in a, in a small way, yes... But it does, it, it does make me think a little bit, like, it, 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 right? It does have some, albeit minor, emotional impact. I don't know how big YouTubers deal with this sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> but, like, yeah, I don't know. I think it's this, this idea that every, like, I think it's got to be Zoomers, right? It's got to be Zoomers. Like, who's, because I grew up watching YouTube where... This video that I just made would have been a high effort, like, this would have been, like, a a, a, pro, a relatively high effort video for the, the older days of YouTube, right? Like, the the idea that YouTube is, like, a TV show now, that, like, if, if some random guy with not even a thousand subscribers wants to make a fun video and it happens to get picked up by the evils of the algorithm, it has to be, like up to these standards of quality. It's like, no, let people just make videos for fun. It's weird. I don't understand it. 
and this really makes me feel like I gotta go back. I gotta go back to making insane vlogs. I gotta go back to making uh, <laughs> fucking Digi Bro style vlogs where no one watches them. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Also, someone called me a streamer. Someone commented and called, referred to me as 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 the streamer, which I thought was very funny. I'm not a fucking streamer. I mean, I guess I did do a 12-hour live stream the other day, but that's that's an exception, not the rule. Um, I've made look, I've made polished videos before. This wasn't one of them, so I don't know. Should I be complaining? It, like it, it feels cringe for me to complain about this, but also. Let's just put the cringe aside. Embrace the cringe. Em embrace the cringe. I understand everyone is cringe. I'm cringe for, for reading YouTube comments on my video and caring about what random strangers on the internet say. And they're cringe for... I mean, look. Is it constructive criticism? No. Because literally in the video, I noticed that I have the HD models turned on. And I also... But okay, this is my fault for editing it out. I did say while I was recording that the reason my HEV suit went away while I was recording was because I changed the map. I I said that, but I cut it out because I thought everyone would understand it. I guess I should have left that in. But I wasn't think I wasn't imagining that this would get any views, so I have no reason to expect to leave this it to leave that in. So really, what I'm complaining about is not these people. I want to make that clear. Like, it's not their fault for, for expecting a certain level of quality out of a video that they get recommended. Because generally speaking, 99% of the time, YouTube's recommendation algorithm is recommending you high-quality videos on a relative scale, right? So it's not their fault. They came in expecting what they've been trained to expect. The problem is the algorithm that's training them to do that and the standards of the website being so, I mean, in my opinion, ridiculously high. Like, the Mr. Beast videos, each one has the budget of, like, an indie movie. And they're, like, ten minutes long. You know, this stuff, like... The fact that I'm posting something I made in... For fun, to ma for maybe a few friends to watch, right? Is on the same platform, getting recommended by the same features as something that costs multiple millions of dollars to produce. It's just an insane system. So it's it's, you know, as usual... Everyone who's uh, more successful than me is evil, and I'm the only cool guy. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I just wanted to. I just thought this was an interesting thing to like point out that this is like an interesting observation that like I remember back in the days of YouTube, there was no expectation for videos to be flawless or be edited well or anything like that because it was all amateurs just doing it for fun, um, and now it's the opposite. It's like. If you're an amateur doing it for fun, you're weird. You're supposed to be trying to get famous. You're supposed to be trying to game the algorithm and, and you know, do this sort of thing. And that's that's just strange. It's, it's not how I use the website. And it's everyone else's expectation that that's how I'm using the website. So that's, uh, yeah. I mean, look, I feel like I made it very clear in the video. I explicitly say, I'm going to be honest, this video is just an excuse to play Half-Life 1 which is the honest truth. This video is just an excuse to play Half-Life 1. I just want to, I want it, look, I'm, I ha am like above average skill level at this game, okay? And I've been wanting to make a video where I do some, a little bit of flexing of my bunny hopping skills uh, for, for ages. Um, I just like source movement. So this was the video. <sighs> it's fucking weird. This is the second of my videos recently to get picked up by the algorithm. You've got this Half-Life 1 and the gum base one. Both got picked up somewhat by the algorithm. And the gum base one is also, like, not super polished. But I guess people who, people who are into the music side of YouTube are more... This, I mean, this is fascinating to me. People who are into the music side of YouTube are clearly more ready to accept, like... Weird artist guy is not super good at editing versus the gaming side of YouTube. Everyone expects like high quality video essay style stuff or high quality gameplay that's edited from like 
hours of footage with just the funniest moments down or something like that, you know? Not like casual gameplay, barely edited kind of situation. Um, I don't know. I just think that's interesting. I just think that's notable somehow. Uh, it's weird. I don't know how like anyone who's semi-famous on the internet deals with hate comments. Like, because these aren't hate comments, right? These, as I said, these are just like, f to be honest, fair criticisms, right? Th this is just people who went into a video ex probably expecting one thing and get got something else, right? They probably expected a higher production quality, maybe a video essay, and what they got was a gameplay video I made in like a few hours, right? Less than a few hours, like a, like an hour and a half, right? <laughs> like, uh, and that gameplay video has multiple obvious mistakes in it. So from their perspective, you know, I understand it. It's just weird. Like I, the situation is just weird. I don't know. I thought this. I thought I just kind of wanted to point it out that the situation is weird. <sighs> but it is gaining me subscribers, and now you know I'm like sitting here like, do I even want to be gaining subscribers? Because I don't. I don't want this. You know, I don't want this. I don't want. I don't want strangers. Like I go into my comment section. Okay, I click on uh, one of the ones for my 12-hour podcast, right? And it's all people I recognize. Well, majority people I recognize. And everyone who I don't recognize has an anime profile picture, so I know they're chill. Um, you know, it's all people I recognize from streams or from other comment sections or from Discord. It's like, that's, that's cool. They're all part of, part of the sphere. I can, I can count on them. This is the point of gatekeeping, right? Is that when I see that, I know... I can count on these people to get it, at least on some level. Like, I don't think I have anyone who hangs around my channel and I see in, like, multiple comment sections or anything who doesn't, at least on some level, get it. They may not agree with me on everything. Lots of people don't. But th th they're approaching it in the right sense. Um, you're probably one of these people, given that you've listened to all of this. But these people... That's what... I think this is really what I'm getting at here. Is like, a lot of these people, I can tell... Like, some of these people are criticizing the video, right? Like, um, uh, for example, a censored terminal autism. Okay, this guy isn't super criticizing the video. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, he makes a, a, a good point about Half-Life 1 being better than Half-Life 2, which is true and correct. Uh... It's this guy. And honestly, it's just like two guys. <laughs> and I'm just blowing this out of proportion. Because <laughs> I'm fucking stupid. I don't know. This is just something that's never happened to me before. That's really it. That's really the deal here. It's just something that I've never run into before. And it's kind of, kind of interesting to me. It's also interesting that this is affecting me on some emotional level. Even though not a particularly intense one. I'll probably forget about it by tomorrow enough of an emotional reaction to open up my podcast recording audacity project and talk about it you know it's it's had some impact on me and it's weird that that's the case right like why should i care and how has this not happened before you know um so that yeah i don't know i just i just think it's 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 notable I'm kind of tempted to, like, switch out the thumbnail to a worse thumbnail to stop it from getting more views. Uh, I'm thinking about it. Because I don't... I mean... I, I don't think it's necessarily worth doing that. Like, the question is... Do I, like... I've been thinking for the past, like, six months as I've approached a thousand subscribers like, kind of hyped about this, this situation, like, hell yeah, I'm going to hit a thousand subs, and I can finally monetize my videos, um, but the question is, like, will I start making 
videos because I want to make money when that happens. I, I mean, I don't think so. I hope not. But, like, that's kind of a scary prospect to me. It's like, right now, I can sit here without the ability to make money and be like, oh, I will continue to make whatever videos I want. But let's say in a year's time, two years' time, I might, I might be like, look, I can clickbait this thumbnail a little more if it drives more views. I'm, uh, that turns into money. I can put some of my principles behind me for a little bit of cash. I might, I might do that in a couple years. I don't know. Um, so, definitely in a strange, uh, strange situation, I will say. A strange situation. I do plan to make another um, Denpa vlog soon. I'm, I'm accumulating footage for it slowly. Uh, so for fans of the Denpa vlog content, that will happen. Uh, all the, you know, a lot of people liked the uh, Mario 64 video I made. Like, people who also liked my, my vloggy content. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm definitely... I just feel like I'm in a weird place. Especially because I have another video in the works that is at least theoretically going to accumulate views as well over time. Um... And it's also a Source Engine gaming related video. So, yeah, I'm in a weird spot. All I can hope for is to drive these people away um, with 12 hour long podcasts. And if they don't get driven away, then hopefully, after listening to my voice for 12 hours, they get it. And now, now they're chill. I've indoctrinated them successfully into the cult. Um, so welcome, if that's you. I don't think it is, but uh, welcome to the cult. Discord server in the description. Part of the cult. Um, you are now classified as a Denpa. If you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. Um, and yeah, you now have autism. I've infected you with the virus. The autism virus. Welcome. Welcome to the club. Uh, you get to choose. Do you want to get into trains, Sonic the Hedgehog, or anime? Those are your options. Um, I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. Now I'm in that weird situation where I'm like, okay, I have five minutes left. I have to keep talking for five minutes because I don't think I'm going to have something else to say that's short enough to fit into a five minute segment uh so now i'm just you know what maybe we should end the video here